Book 7. 1.1 Now that I have described Iberia and the Celtic and Italian tribes, along with the islands nearby, it will be next in order to speak of the remaining parts of Europe, dividing them in the approved manner. The remaining parts are, first, those towards the east, being those which are across the Rhenus and extend as far as the Tanais and the mouth of Lake Meotis, and also all those regions lying between the Adrius and the regions on the left of the Pontic Sea that are shut off by the Ister and extend towards the south as far as Greece and the Propontis. 5. For this river divides very nearly the whole of the aforesaid land into two parts. It is the largest of the European rivers, at the outset flowing towards the south and then turning straight from the west towards the east and the Pontus. It rises in the western limits of Germany, as also near the recess of the Adriatic, at a distance from it of about 1,000 stadia, and comes to an end at the Pontus not very far from the outlets of the Tyras and the Baristhenes, bending from its easterly course approximately towards the north. Now the parts that are beyond the Rhenus and Celtica are to the north of the Ister, these are the territories of the Galatic and the Germanic tribes, extending as far as the Bastronians and the Tyrigetans and the river Baristhenes. And the territories of all the tribes between this river and the Tanais and the mouth of Lake Meotis extend up into the interior as far as the ocean and are washed by the Pontic Sea. But both the Illyrian and the Thracian tribes, and all tribes of the Celtic or other peoples that are mingled with these, as far as Greece, are to the south of the Ister. But let me first describe the parts outside the Ister, for they are much simpler than those on the other side. 1.2 Now the parts beyond the Rhenus, immediately after the country of the Celti, slope towards the east and are occupied by the Germans, who, though they vary slightly from the Celtic stock in that they are wilder, taller, and have yellower hair, are in all other respects similar, for in build, habits, and modes of life they are such as I have said the Celti are. And I also think that it was for this reason that the Romans assigned to them the name Germani, as though they wished to indicate thereby that they were genuine Galati, for in the language of the Romans Germani means genuine. 1.3 The first parts of this country are those that are next to the Rhenus, beginning at its source and extending afar as its outlet, and this stretch of riverland taken as a whole is approximately the breadth of the country on its western side. Some of the tribes of this riverland were transferred by the Romans to Celtica, whereas the others anticipated the Romans by migrating deep into the country, for instance, the Marsi, and only a few people, including a part of the Shugambri, are left. After the people who live along the river come the other tribes that live between the Rhenus and the river Albus, and traverses no less territory than the former. Between the two are other navigable rivers also, among them the Amasias, on which Drusus won a naval victory over the Bructory, which likewise flow from the south towards the north and the ocean, for the country is elevated towards the south and forms a mountain chain that connects with the Alps and extends towards the east as though it were a part of the Alps, and in truth some declare that they actually are a part of the Alps, both because of their aforesaid position and of the fact that they produce the same timber. However, the country in this region does not rise to a sufficient height for that. Here, too, is the Hercunian forest, and also the tribes of the Suebi, some of which dwell inside the forest, as, for instance, the tribes of the Coldi, in whose territory is Boemum, the domain of Morabitus, the place whither he caused to migrate, not only several other peoples, but in particular the Marcomanni, his fellow tribesmen. For after his return from Rome this man, who before had been only a private citizen, was placed in charge of the affairs of state, for, as a youth he had been at Rome and had enjoyed the favour of Augustus, and on his return he took the rulership and acquired, in addition to the peoples aforementioned, the Lugiae, a large tribe, the Zumi, the Butones, the Mugilones, the Sibini, and also the Semnons, a large tribe of the Suebi themselves. However, while some of the tribes of the Suebi dwell inside the forest, as I was saying, others dwell outside of it, and have a common boundary with the Gidi. Now as for the tribe of the Suebi, it is the largest, for it extends from the Rhenus to the Albus, and a part of them even dwell on the far side of the Albus, as, for instance, the Hermondori and the Langoverdi, and at the present time these latter, at least, have, to the last man, been driven in flight out of their country into the land on the far side of the river. It is a common characteristic of all the peoples in this part of the world that they migrate with ease, because of the meagerness of their livelihood and because they do not till the soil or even store up food, but live in small huts that are merely temporary structures, and they live for the most part off their flocks, as the nomads do, so that, in imitation of the nomads, they load their household belongings on their wagons and with their beasts turn whithersoever they think best. But other German tribes are still more indigent. I mean the Cherusci, the Chadi, the Gamabrivii and the Chatterai, and also, near the ocean, the Shugambri, the Shobi, the Bructeri, and the Simbri, and also the Kossi, the Kalsi, the Kampsiani, and several others. Both the Visurgis and the Lupias rivers run in the same direction as the Amasias, the Lupias being about 600 stadia distant from the Rhenus and flowing through the country of the Lesser Bructeri. 
Germany has also the Salus River, and it was between the Salus and the Rhenus that Drusus Germanicus, while he was successfully carrying on the war, came to his end. He had subjugated, not only most of the tribes, but also the islands along the coast, among which is Burchanis, which he took by siege. 1.4 These tribes have become known through their wars with the Romans, in which they would either yield and then later revolt again, or else quit their settlements, and they would have been better known if Augustus had allowed his generals to cross the Albus in pursuit of those who emigrated thither. But as a matter of fact he supposed that he could conduct the war in hand more successfully if he should hold off from those outside the Albus, who were living in peace, and should not incite them to make common cause with the others in their enmity against him. It was the Shugambri, who lived near the Rhenus, that began the war, Melo being their leader, and from that time on different peoples at different times would cause a breach, first growing powerful and then being put down, and then revolting again, betraying both the hostages they had given and their pledges of good faith. In dealing with these peoples distrust has been a great advantage, whereas those who have been trusted have done the greatest harm, as, for instance, the Cherusci and their subjects, in whose country three Roman legions, with their general Quintilius Verus, were destroyed by ambush in violation of the treaty. But they all paid the penalty, and afforded the younger Germanicus a most brilliant triumph that triumph in which their most famous men and women were led captive, I mean Segimentus, son of Segestes and chieftain of the Cherusci, and his sister Thusnelda, the wife of Arminius, the man who at the time of the violation of the treaty against Quintilius Verus was commander-in-chief of the Cheruscan army and even to this day is keeping up the war, and Thusnelda's three-year-old son Thumelicus, and also Suzithicus, the son of Segimerus and chieftain of the Cherusci, and Ramis, his wife, and a daughter of Ucromerus chieftain of the Chadi, and Doidorix, a Shugambrian, the son of Beterix the brother of Melo. But Segestes, the father-in-law of Arminius, who even from the outset had opposed the purpose of Arminius, and, taking advantage of an opportune time, had deserted him, was present as a guest of honour at the triumph over his loved ones. And Libus too, a priest of the Chadi, marched in the procession, as also other captives from the plundered tribes the Colsi, Campsani, Brookdery, Usipi, Cheruski, Chadi, Chatterai, Landi, Tubatai. Now the Rhenus is about 3,000 stadia distant from the Albus, if one had straight roads to travel on, but as it is one must go by a circuitous route, which winds through a marshy country and forests. 1.5 The Hercunian forest is not only rather dense, but also has large trees, and comprises a large circuit within regions that are fortified by nature, in the center of it, however, lies a country, of which I have already spoken, that is capable of affording an excellent livelihood. And near it are the sources of both the Ister and the Rhenus, as also the lake between the two sources, and the marshes into which the Rhenus spreads. The perimeter of the lake is more than 300 stadia, while the passage across it is nearly 200. There is also an island in it which Tiberius used as a base of operations in his naval battle with the Vendelisi. This lake is south of the sources of the Ister, as is also the Hercunian forest, so that necessarily, in going from Celtica to the Hercunian forest, one first crosses the lake and then the Ister, and from there on advances through more passable regions plateaus to the forest. Tiberius had proceeded only a day's journey from the lake when he saw the sources of the Ister. The country of the Redia joins the lake for only a short distance, whereas that of the Helvetia and the Vindelici, and also the desert of the Boy, adjoin the greater part of it. All the peoples as far as the Pananii, but more especially the Helvetia and the Vindelici, inhabit plateaus. But the countries of the Redi and the Norisai extend as far as the passes over the Alps and verge toward Italy, a part thereof bordering on the country of the Insabri and a part on that of the Carni and the legions about Aquileia. And there is also another large forest, Gabrida, it is on this side of the territory of the Suevi, whereas the Hercunian forest, which is also held by them, is on the far side. 2.1 As for the Cimbri, some things that are told about them are incorrect and others are extremely improbable. For instance, one could not accept such a reason for their having become a wandering and piratical folk as this that while they were dwelling on a peninsula they were driven out of their habitations by a great flood tide, for in fact they still hold the country which they held in earlier times, and they sent as a present to Augustus the most sacred kettle in their country, with a plea for his friendship and for an amnesty of their earlier offences, and when their petition was granted they set sail for home, and it is ridiculous to suppose that they departed from their homes because they were incensed on account of a phenomenon that is natural and eternal, occurring twice every day. And the assertion that an excessive flood tide once occurred looks like a fabrication, for when the ocean is affected in this way it is subject to increases and diminutions, but these are regulated and periodical. And the man who said that the Cimbri took up arms against the flood tides was not right, either, nor yet the statement that the Kelti, as a training in the virtue of fearlessness, meekly abide the destruction of their homes by the tides and then rebuild them, and that they suffer a greater loss of life as the result of water than of war, as Ephorus says. 
Indeed, the regularity of the flood tides and the fact that the part of the country subject to inundations was known should have precluded such absurdities, for since this phenomenon occurs twice every day, it is of course improbable that the Simbri did not so much as once perceive that the reflux was natural and harmless, and that it occurred, not in their country alone, but in every country that was on the ocean. Neither is Cletarchus right, for he says that the horsemen, on seeing the onset of the sea, rode away, and though in full flight came very near being cut off by the water. Now we know, in the first place, that the invasion of the tide does not rush on with such speed as that, but that the sea advances imperceptibly, and, secondly, that what takes place daily and is audible to all who are about to draw near it, even before they behold it, would not have been likely to prompt in them such terror that they would take to flight, as if it had occurred unexpectedly. 2.2 Poseidonius is right in censuring the historians for these assertions, and his conjecture is not a bad one, that the Cimbri, being a piratical and wandering folk, made an expedition even as far as the region of Lake Meotis, and that also the Cimmerian Bosporus was named after them, being equivalent to Cimbrian, the Greeks naming the Cimbri Cimmeriae. And he goes off to say that in earlier times the boy dwelt in the Hercunian forest, and that the Cimbri made a sally against this place, but on being repulsed by the boy, went down to the Ister and the country of the Scordiscan Galati, then to the country of the Turisti and Taurisi, these, too, Galati, and then to the country of the Helveshi men rich in gold but peaceable. However, when the Helveshi saw that the wealth which the Cimbri had got from their robberies surpassed that of their own country, they, and particularly their tribes of Tigerini and of Toigini, were so excited that they sallied forth with the Cimbri. All, however, were subdued by the Romans, both the Cimbri themselves and those who had joined their expeditions, in part after they had crossed the Alps into Italy and in part while still on the other side of the Alps. 2.3 Writers report a custom of the Cimbri to this effect, their wives, who would accompany them on their expeditions, were attended by priestesses who were seers, these were grey-haired, clad in white, with flaxen cloaks fastened on with clasps, girt with girdles of bronze, and barefooted, now sword in hand these priestesses would meet with the prisoners of war throughout the camp, and having first crowned them with wreaths would lead them to a brazen vessel of about twenty amphorae, and they had a raised platform which the priestess would mount, and then, bending over the kettle, would cut the throat of each prisoner after he had been lifted up, and from the blood that poured forth into the vessel some of the priestesses would draw a prophecy, while still others would split open the body and from an inspection of the entrails would utter a prophecy of victory for their own people. And during the battles they would beat on the hides that were stretched over the wicker bodies of the wagons and in this way produce an unearthly noise. 2.4 of the Germans, as I have said, those towards the north extend along the ocean, and beginning at the outlets of the Rhenus, they are known as far as the Albus, and of these the best known are the Shugambri and the Cimbri but those parts of the country beyond the Albus that are near the ocean are wholly unknown to us. For of the men of earlier times I know of no one who has made this voyage along the coast to the eastern parts that extend as far as the mouth of the Caspian Sea, and the Romans have not yet advanced into the parts that are beyond the Albus, and likewise no one has made the journey by land either. However, it is clear from the climata and the parallel distances that if one travels longitudinally towards the east, one encounters the regions that are about the Baristhenes and that are to the north of the Pontus, but what is beyond Germany and what beyond the countries which are next after Germany whether one should say the Bastarnae, as most writers suspect, or say that others lie in between, either the Iasages, or the Roxolani, or certain other of the wagon dwellers it is not easy to say, nor yet whether they extend as far as the ocean along its entire length, or whether any part is uninhabitable by reason of the cold or other cause, or whether even a different race of people, succeeding the Germans, is situated between the sea and the eastern Germans. And this same ignorance prevails also in regard to the rest of the peoples that come next in order on the north, for I know neither the Bastarnae, nor the Soromati, nor, in a word, any of the peoples who dwell above the Pontus, nor how far distant they are from the Atlantic Sea, nor whether their countries border upon it. 3.1 GD As for the southern part of Germany beyond the Albus, the portion which is just contiguous to that river is occupied by the Suevi, then immediately adjoining this is the land of the Gidi, which, though narrow at first, stretching as it does along the Ister on its southern side and on the opposite side along the mountainside of the Hercunian forest, for the land of the Gidi also embraces a part of the mountains, afterwards broadens out towards the north as far as the Tyrigeti, but I cannot tell the precise boundaries. It is because of men's ignorance of these regions that any heed has been given to those who created the mythical Rypean mountains and Hyperboreans, and also to all those false statements made by Pythias the Massalian regarding the country along the ocean, wherein he uses as a screen his scientific knowledge of astronomy and mathematics. So then, those men should be disregarded, in fact, if even Sophocles, when in his role as a tragic poet he speaks of Orethuia, tells how she was snatched up by Boreas and carried over the whole sea to the ends of the earth and to the sources of night and to the unfoldings of heaven and to the ancient garden of Phoebus, 
his story can have no bearing on the present inquiry, but should be disregarded, just as it is disregarded by Socrates in the Phaedrus. But let us confine our narrative to what we have learned from history, both ancient and modern. 3.2 Now the Greeks used to suppose that the Gedi were Thracians, and the Gedi lived on either side the Ister, as did also the Messi, these also being Thracians and identical with the people who are now called Messi. From these Messi sprang also the Messi who now live between the Lydians and the Phrygians and Trojans. And the Phrygians themselves are Brygians, a Thracian tribe, as are also the Migdonians, the Bibritians, the Medobathinians, the Bithynians, and the Thynians, and, I think, also the Marianians. These peoples, to be sure, have all utterly quitted Europe, but the Messi have remained there. And Poseidonius seems to me to be correct in his conjecture that Homer designates the Messi in Europe, I mean those in Thrace, when he says, but back he turned his shining eyes, and looked far away towards the land of the horse-tending Thracians, and of the Messi, hand-to-hand fighters for surely, if one should take Homer to mean the Messi in Asia, the statement would not hang together. Indeed, when Zeus turns his eyes away from the Trojans towards the land of the Thracians, it would be the act of a man who confuses the continents and does not understand the poet's phraseology to connect with Thrace the land of the Asiatic Messi, who are not far away, but have a common boundary with the Troad and are situated behind it and on either side of it, and are separated from Thrace by the broad Hellespont, for back he turned generally means to the rear, and he who transfers his gaze from the Trojans to the people who are either in the rear of the Trojans or on their flanks, does indeed transfer his gaze rather far, but not at all to the rear. Again, the appended phrase is testimony to this very view, because the poet connected with the Messi the Hippomalgi and Galactophagi and Abai, who are indeed the wagon-dwelling Scythians and Sarmatians. For at the present time these tribes, as well as the Bastronian tribes, are mingled with the Thracians, more indeed with those outside the Ister, but also with those inside. And mingled with them are also the Celtic tribes the Boi, the Scourgeshi, and the Taurusai. However, the Scourgeshi are by some called Scourgesti, and the Taurusai are called also Ligurusai and Tauristi. 3.3 Poseidonius goes on to say of the Mysians that in accordance with their religion they abstain from eating any living thing, and therefore from their flocks as well, and that they use as food honey and milk and cheese, living a peaceable life, and for this reason are called both God-fearing and Capnobati, and there are some of the Thracians who live apart from womankind, these are called Ktisti, and because of the honor in which they are held, have been dedicated to the gods and live with freedom from every fear, accordingly, Homer speaks collectively of all these peoples as proud Hippomalgi, Galactophagi, and Abai, men most just, but he calls them Abai more especially for this reason, that they live apart from women, since he thinks that a life which is bereft of woman is only half complete, just as he thinks the house of Protesilaus is only half complete, because it is so bereft, and he speaks of the Mysians as hand-to-hand fighters because they were indomitable, as is the case with all brave warriors, and Poseidonius adds that in the thirteenth book one should read Mesi, hand-to-hand fighters instead of Messi hand-to-hand fighters. 3.4 However, it is perhaps superfluous to disturb the reading that has had approval for so many years, for it is much more credible that the people were called Messi at first and that later their name was changed to what it is now. And as for the term Abai, one might interpret it as meaning those who are without hearth, and live on wagons quite as well as those who are bereft, for since, in general, injustices arise only in connection with contracts and a too high regard for property, so it is reasonable that those who, like the Abai, live cheaply, on slight resources, should have been called most just. In fact, the philosophers who put justice next to self-restraint strive above all things for frugality and personal independence, and consequently extreme self-restraint diverts some of them to the cynical mode of life. But as for the statement that they live bereft of women, the poet suggests nothing of the sort, and particularly in the country of the Thracians and of those of their number who are Gedi. And see the statement of Menander about them, which, as one may reasonably suppose, was not invented by him but taken from history all the Thracians, and most of all we Gedi, for I too boast that I am of this stock, are not very continent, and a little below he sets down the proofs of their incontinence and their relations with women, for every man of us marries ten or eleven women, and some, twelve or more, but if any one meets death before he has married more than four or five, he is lamented among the people there as a wretch without bride and nuptial song. Indeed, these facts are confirmed by the other writers as well. Further, it is not reasonable to suppose that the same people regard as wretched a life without many women, and yet at the same time regard as pious and just a life that is wholly bereft of women. And of course to regard as both God-fearing and capnobati those who are without women is very much opposed to the common notions on that subject, for all agree in regarding the women as the chief founders of religion, and it is the women who provoke the men to the more attentive worship of the gods, to festivals, and to supplications, and it is a rare thing for a man who lives by himself to be found addicted to these things. 
See again what the same poet says when he introduces as speaker the man who is vexed by the money spent by the women in connection with the sacrifices, the gods are the undoing of us, especially as married men, for we must always be celebrating some festival, and again when he introduces the woman hater, who complains about these very things, we used to sacrifice five times a day, and seven female attendants would beat the symbols all round us, while others would cry out to the gods. So, then, the interpretation that the wifeless men of the GD are in a special way reverential towards the gods is clearly contrary to reason, whereas the interpretation that zeal for religion is strong in this tribe, and that because of their reverence for the gods the people abstain from eating any living thing, is one which, both from what Poseidonius and from what the histories in general tell us, should not be disbelieved. 3.5 In fact, it is said that a certain man of the GD, Zamoxis by name, had been a slave to Pythagoras, and had learned some things about the heavenly bodies from him as also certain other things from the Egyptians, for in his wanderings he had gone even as far as Egypt, and when he came on back to his homeland he was eagerly courted by the rulers and the people of the tribe, because he could make predictions from the celestial signs, and at last he persuaded the king to take him as a partner in the government, on the ground that he was competent to report the will of the gods, and although at the outset he was only made a priest of the god who was most honoured in their country, yet afterwards he was even addressed as god, and having taken possession of a certain cavernous place that was inaccessible to anyone else he spent his life there, only rarely meeting with any people outside except the king and his own attendants, and the king cooperated with him, because he saw that the people paid much more attention to himself than before, in the belief that the decrees which he promulgated were in accordance with the counsel of the gods. This custom persisted even down to our own time, because some man of that character was always to be found, who, though in fact only a counsellor to the king, was called God among the Gedi and the people took up the notion that the mountain was sacred and they so call it, but its name is Kogionum, like that of the river which flows past it. So, too, at the time when Byrbistas, against whom already the deified Caesar had prepared to make an expedition, was reigning over the Gedi, the office in question was held by Decinius, and somehow or other the Pythagorean doctrine of abstention from eating any living thing still survived as taught by Zamoxis. 3.6 Now although such difficulties as these might fairly be raised concerning what is found in the text of Homer about the missions and the proud Hippomalgi, yet what Apollodorus states in the preface to the second book of his work on ships can by no means be asserted, for he approves the declaration of Eratosthenes, that although both Homer and the other early authors knew the Greek places, they were decidedly unacquainted with those that were far away, since they had no experience either in making long journeys by land or in making voyages by sea. And in support of this Apollodorus says that Homer calls Aulus rocky, and so it is, and Edeonus place of many ridges, and Thisbe haunt of doves, and Halyardus grassy, but, he says, neither Homer nor the others knew the places that were far away. At any rate, he says, although about forty rivers now into the Pontus, Homer mentions not a single one of those that are the most famous, as, for example, the Ister, the Tanais, the Baristhenes, the Hypones, the Phossus, the Thermoden, the Elise, and, Besides, he does not mention the Scythians, but invents certain proud Hippomalgi and Galactophagi and Abai, and as for the Paplagonians of the interior, he reports what he has learned from those who have approached the regions afoot, but he is ignorant of the seaboard, and naturally so, for at that time this sea was not navigable, and was called Axene because of its wintry storms and the ferocity of the tribes that lived around it, and particularly the Scythians, in that they sacrificed strangers, ate their flesh, and used their skulls as drinking cups, but later it was called Euxen when the Ionians founded cities on the seaboard. And, likewise, Homer is also ignorant of the facts about Egypt and Libya, as, for example, about the risings of the Nile and the silting up of the sea, things which he nowhere mentions, neither does he mention the isthmus between the Erythrean Sea and the Egyptian seas, nor the regions of Arabia and Ethiopia and the ocean, unless one should give heed to Zeno the philosopher when he writes, and I came to the Ethiopians and Sidonians and Arabians. 9 But this ignorance in Homer's case is not amazing, for those who have lived later than he have been ignorant of many things and have invented marvellous tales, Hesiod, when he speaks of men who are half-dog, of long-headed men, and of pygmies, and Alcman, when he speaks of web-footed men, and Aeschylus, when he speaks of dog-headed men, of men with eyes in their breasts, and of one-eyed men, in his Prometheus it is said, and a host of other tales. From these men he proceeds against the historians who speak of the Rypean mountains, and of Mount Ogium, and of the settlement of the Gorgons and Hesperides, and of the land of Meropus and Theopompus, and the city of Simaris and Hecateus, and the land of Pankia and Euhemerus, and in Aristotle the river stones, which are formed of sand but are melted by the rains. And in Libya, Apollodorus continues, there is a city of Dionysus which it is impossible for the same man ever to find twice. He censures also those who speak of the Homeric wanderings of Odysseus as having been in the neighborhood of Sicily, 
for in that case, says he, one should go on and say that, although the wanderings took place there, the poet, for the sake of mythology, placed them out in Oceanus. And, he adds, the writers in general can be pardoned, but Callimachus cannot be pardoned at all, because he makes a pretense of being a scholar, for he calls Gautos the Isle of Calypso and Corsiriscaria. And others he charges with falsifying about Gerena, and Eocesium, and Damus in Ithaca, and about Pelithronium in Pelion, and about Glaucopium in Athens. To these criticisms Apollodorus adds some petty ones of like sort and then stops, but he borrowed most of them from Eratosthenes, and as I have remarked before they are wrong. For while one must concede to Eratosthenes and Apollodorus that the later writers have shown themselves better acquainted with such matters than the men of early times, yet to proceed beyond all moderation as they do, and particularly in the case of Homer, is a thing for which, as it seems to me, one might justly rebuke them and make the reverse statement, that where they are ignorant themselves, there they reproach the poet with ignorance. However, what remains to be said on this subject meets with appropriate mention in my detailed descriptions of the several countries, as also in my general description. 3.7 Just now I was discussing the Thracians, and the Mysians, hand-to-hand fighters, and the proud Hippomalgi, Galactophagi, and Abai, men most just, because I wish to make a comparison between the statements made by Poseidonius and myself and those made by the two men in question. Take first the fact that the argument which they have attempted is contrary to the proposition which they set out to prove, for although they set out to prove that the men of earlier times were more ignorant of regions remote from Greece than the men of more recent times, they showed the reverse, not only in regard to regions remote, but also in regard to places in Greece itself. However, as I was saying, let me put off everything else and look to what is now before me, they say that the poet through ignorance fails to mention the Scythians, or their savage dealings with strangers, in that they sacrifice them, eat their flesh, and use their skulls as drinking cups, although it was on account of the Scythians that the Pontus was called Axene, but that he invents certain proud Hippomalgi, Galactophagi, and Abai, men most just people that exist nowhere on earth, how, then, could they call the sea Axene if they did not know about the ferocity or about the people who were most ferocious? And these, of course, are the Scythians. And were the people who lived beyond the Mysians and Thracians and Gedi not also Hippomalgi, not also Galactophagi and Abai? In fact, even now there are wagon dwellers and nomads, so called, who live off their herds, and on milk and cheese, and particularly on cheese made from mare's milk, and know nothing about storing up food or about peddling merchandise either, except the exchange of wares for wares. How, then, could the poet be ignorant of the Scythians if he called certain people Hippomalgi and Galactophagi? For that the people of his time were wont to call the Scythians Hippomalgi, Hesiod, too, is witness in the words cited by Eratosthenes, the Ethiopians, the Ligurians, and also the Scythians, Hippomalgi. Now wherein is it to be wondered at that, because of the widespread injustice connected with contracts in our country, Homer called most just and proud those who by no means spend their lives on contracts and money getting but actually possess all things in common except sword and drinking cup, and above all things have their wives and their children in common, in the platonic way? Aeschylus, too, is clearly pleading the cause of the poet when he says about the Scythians, but the Scythians, law-abiding, eaters of cheese made of mare's milk. And this assumption even now still persists among the Greeks, for we regard the Scythians the most straightforward of men and the least prone to mischief, as also far more frugal and independent of others than we are. And yet our mode of life has spread its change for the worse to almost all peoples, introducing amongst them luxury and sensual pleasures and, to satisfy these vices, base artifices that lead to innumerable acts of greed. So then, much wickedness of this sort has fallen on the barbarian peoples also, on the nomads as well as the rest, for as the result of taking up a seafaring life they not only have become morally worse, indulging in the practice of piracy and of slaying strangers, but also, because of their intercourse with many peoples, have partaken of the luxury and the peddling habits of those peoples. But though these things seem to conduce strongly to gentleness of manner, they corrupt morals and introduce cunning instead of the straightforwardness which I just now mentioned. 3.8 Those, however, who lived before our times, and particularly those who lived near the time of Homer, were and among the Greeks were assumed to be some such people as Homer describes. And see what Herodotus says concerning that king of the Scythians against whom Darius made his expedition, and the message which the king sent back to him. See also what Chrysippus says concerning the kings of the Bosporus, the house of Leuco. And not only the Persian letters are full of references to that straightforwardness of which I am speaking but also the memoirs written by the Egyptians, Babylonians, and Indians. And it was on this account that Anacharsis, Abari, and other men of the sort were in fair repute among the Greeks, because they displayed a nature characterized by complacency, frugality, and justice. But why should I speak of the men of olden times? For when Alexander, 
the son of Philip, on his expedition against the Thracians beyond the Hemus, invaded the country of the tribal lions and saw that it extended as far as the Ister and the island of Pus in the Ister, and that the parts on the far side were held by the Gedi, he went as far as that, it is said, but could not disembark upon the island because of scarcity of boats, for Sirmus, the king of the tribally had taken refuge there and resisted his attempts, he did, however, cross over to the country of the Gedi, took their city, and returned with all speed to his homeland, after receiving gifts from the tribes in question and from Sirmus. And Ptolemaeus, the son of Logus, says that on this expedition the Celti who lived about the Adriatic joined Alexander for the sake of establishing friendship and hospitality, and that the king received them kindly and asked them when drinking what it was that they most feared, thinking they would say himself, but that they replied they feared no one, unless it were that heaven might fall on them, although indeed they added that they put above everything else the friendship of such a man as he. And the following are signs of the straightforwardness of the barbarians. First, the fact that Sirmus refused to consent to the debarkation upon the island and yet sent gifts and made a compact of friendship, and, secondly, that the Kelty said that they feared no one, and yet valued above everything else the friendship of great men. Again, Dramacates was king of the Gedi in the time of the successors of Alexander. Now he, when he captured Lysimachus alive, who had made an expedition against him, first pointed out the poverty both of himself and of his tribe and likewise their independence of others, and then bade him not to carry on war with people of that sort but rather to deal with them as friends, and after saying this he first entertained him as a guest, and made a compact of friendship, and then released him. Moreover, Plato in his Republic thinks that those who would have a well-governed city should flee as far as possible from the sea, as being a thing that teaches wickedness, and should not live near it. 3.9 Ephorus, in the fourth book of his history, the book entitled Europe, for he made the circuit of Europe as far as the Scythians, says towards the end that the modes of life both of the Soromati and of the other Scythians are unlike, for, whereas some are so cruel that they even eat human beings, others abstain from eating any living creature whatever. Now the other writers, he says, tell only about their savagery, because they know that the terrible and the marvelous are startling, but one should tell the opposite facts to and make them patterns of conduct, and he himself, therefore, will tell only about those who follow most just habits, for there are some of the Scythian nomads who feed only on mare's milk, and excel all men in justice, and they are mentioned by the poets, by Homer, when he says that Zeus espies the land of the Galactophagi and Abai, men most just, and by Hesiod, in what is called his circuit of the earth, when he says that Phineas is carried by the storm winds to the land of the Galactophagi, who have their dwellings in wagons. Then Ephorus reasons out the cause as follows, since they are frugal in their ways of living and not money-getters, they not only are orderly towards one another, because they have all things in common, their wives, children, the whole of their kin and everything, but also remain invincible and unconquered by outsiders, because they have nothing to be enslaved for. And he cites Chorilus also, who, in his The Crossing of the Pontoon Bridge which was constructed by Darius, says, the sheep tending Saka, of Scythian stock, but they used to live in wheat-producing Asia, however, they were colonists from the nomads, law-abiding people. And when he calls Anacharsis wise, Ephorus says that he belongs to this race, and that he was considered also one of seven wise men because of his perfect self-control and good sense. And he goes on to tell the inventions of Anacharsis the bellows, the two-fluked anchor and the potter's wheel. These things I tell knowing full well that Ephorus himself does not tell the whole truth about everything, and particularly in his account of Anacharsis, for how could the wheel be his invention, if Homer, who lived in earlier times, knew of it? as when a potter his wheel that fits in his hands, and so on, but as for those other things, I tell them because I wish to make my point clear that there actually was a common report, which was believed by the men of both early and of later times, that a part of the nomads, I mean those who had settled the farthest away from the rest of mankind, were galactophagi, abai, and most just, and that they were not an invention of Homer. 3.10 It is but fair, too, to ask Apollodorus to account for the missions that are mentioned in the verses of Homer, whether he thinks that these two are inventions, when the poet says, and the missions, hand-to-hand fighters and the proud Hippomalgi, or takes the poet to mean the missions in Asia. Now if he takes the poet to mean those in Asia, he will misinterpret him, as I have said before, but if he calls them an invention, meaning that there were no missions in Thrace, he will contradict the facts, for at any rate, even in our own times, Aelius Catus transplanted from the country on the far side of the Ister into Thrace 50,000 persons from among the Gedi, a tribe with the same tongue as the Thracians and they live there in Thrace now and are called Mesi whether it be that their people of earlier times were so called and that in Asia the name was changed to Mesi, or, what is more apposite to history in the declaration of the poet, that in earlier times their people in Thrace were called Mesi. Enough, however, on this subject. I shall now go back to the next topic in the general description. 3.11 As for the Gedi, 
then, their early history must be left untold, but that which pertains to our own times is about as follows. Bora Beast is a Gatan, on setting himself in authority over the tribe, restored the people, who had been reduced to an evil plight by numerous wars, and raised them to such a height through training, sobriety, and obedience to his commands that within only a few years he had established a great empire and subordinated to the Gidi most of the neighboring peoples. And he began to be formidable even to the Romans, because he would cross the Ister with impunity and plunder Thrace as far as Macedonia and the Illyrian country. And he not only laid waste the country of the Celti who were intermingled with the Thracians and the Illyrians, but actually caused the complete disappearance of the boy who were under the rule of Critosiris, and also of the Taurisi. To help him secure the complete obedience of his tribe he had as his coadjutor Decinius, a wizard, a man who not only had wandered through Egypt, but also had thoroughly learned certain prognostics through which he would pretend to tell the divine will, and within a short time he was set up as God, as I said when relating the story of Zamalxis. The following is an indication of their complete obedience, they were persuaded to cut down their vines and to live without wine. However, certain men rose up against Borobistas and he was deposed before the Romans sent an expedition against him and those who succeeded him divided the empire into several parts. In fact, only recently, when Augustus Caesar sent an expedition against them, the number of parts into which the empire had been divided was five, though at the time of the insurrection it had been four. Such divisions, to be sure, are only temporary and vary with the times. 3.12 But there is also another division of the country which has endured from early times, for some of the people are called Dossi, whereas others are called Gidi Gidi those who incline towards the Pontus in the east, and Dossi, those who incline in the opposite direction towards Germany and the sources of the Ister. The Dossi, I think, were called Dai in early times, whence the slave names Geta and Dawes which prevailed among the Attic people, for this is more probable than that Dawes is from those Scythians who are called Dai, for they live far away in the neighborhood of Hyrcania, and it is not reasonable to suppose that slaves were brought into Attica from there, for the Attic people were wont either to call their slaves by the same names as those of the nations from which they were brought, as Lydus or Cyrus, or address them by names that were prevalent in their countries, as Meneser else Midas for the Phrygian, or Tibius for the Paplagonian. But though the tribe was raised to such a height by Borobistas, it has been completely humbled by its own seditions and by the Romans, nevertheless, they are capable, even today, of sending forth an army of 40,000 men. 3.13 The Marissus River flows through their country into the Danuvius, on which the Romans used to convey their equipment for war, the Danuvius I say, for so they used to call the upper part of the river from near its sources on to the cataracts, I mean the part which in the main flows through the country, of the Dossi, although they give the name Ister to the lower part, from the cataracts on to the Pontus, the part which flows past the country of the Gidi. The language of the Dossi is the same as that of the Gidi. Among the Greeks, however, the Gidi are better known because the migrations they make to either side of the Ister are continuous, and because they are intermingled with the Thracians and Mysians. And also the tribe of the Tribali, likewise Thracian, has had this same experience, for it has admitted migrations into this country, because the neighboring peoples force them to emigrate into the country of those who are weaker, that is, the Scythians and Bastronians and Sormatians on the far side of the river often prevail to the extent that they actually cross over to attack those whom they have already driven out, and some of them remain there, either in the islands or in Thrace, whereas those on the other side are generally overpowered by the Illyrians. Be that as it may, although the Gidi and Dossi once attained to very great power, so that they actually could send forth an expedition of 200,000 men, they now find themselves reduced to as few as 40,000, and they have come close to the point of yielding obedience to the Romans, though as yet they are not absolutely submissive, because of the hopes which they base on the Germans, who are enemies to the Romans. 3.14 In the intervening space, facing that part of the Pontic Sea which extends from the Ister to the Tyras, lies the desert of the Gidi, wholly flat and waterless, in which Darius the son of Hystaspis was caught on the occasion when he crossed the Ister to attack the Scythians and ran the risk of perishing from thirst, army and all. However, he belatedly realized his error and turned back. And, later on, Lysimachus, in his expedition against the Gedi and King Dramacates, not only ran the risk but actually was captured alive, but he again came off safely, because he found the barbarian kind-hearted, as I said before. 3.15 Near the outlets of the Ister River is a great island called Puce, and when the Bastronians took possession of it they received the appellation of Puceni. There are still other islands which are much smaller, some of these are farther inland than Puce, while others are near the sea, for the river has seven mouths. The largest of these mouths is what is called the Sacred Mouth, on which one can sail inland 120 stadia to Puce. It was at the lower part of Puce that Darius made his pontoon bridge, although the bridge could have been constructed at the upper part also. 
The sacred mouth is the first mouth on the left as one sails into the Pontus, the others come in order thereafter as one sails along the coast towards the Tyras, and the distance from it to the seventh mouth is about 300 stadia. Accordingly, small islands are formed between the mouths. Now the three mouths that come next in order after the sacred mouth are small, but the remaining mouths are much smaller than it, but larger than any one of the three. According to Ephorus, however, the Ister has only five months. Thence to the Tyrus, a navigable river, the distance is 900 stadia. And in the interval are two large lakes one of them opening into the sea, so that it can also be used as a harbour, but the other mouthless. 3.16 At the mouth of the Tyrus is what is called the Tower of Neoptolemus, and also what is called the village of Hermonax. And on sailing inland 140 stadia one comes to two cities, one on each side, Niconia on the right and Ophissa on the left. But the people who live near the river speak of a city 120 stadia inland. Again, at a distance of 500 stadia from the mouth is the island called Luz, which lies in the high sea and is sacred to Achilles. 3.17 Then comes the Baristhenes River, which is navigable for a distance of 600 stadia, and, near it, another river, the Hyponis, and off the mouth of the Baristhenes, an island with a harbour. On sailing up the Baristhenes 200 stadia one comes to a city of the same name as the river, but the same city is also called Albia, it is a great trading centre and was founded by Milesians. Now the whole country that lies above the said seaboard between the Baristhenes and the Ister consists, first, of the desert of the Gedi, then the country of the Tyrigetans, and after it the country of the Eozygian Sarmatians and that of the people called the Basileans and that of the Urgi, who in general are nomads, though a few are interested also in farming. These people, it is said, dwell also along the Ister, often on both sides. In the interior dwell, first, those Bastionians whose country borders on that of the Tyrigetans and Germans they also being, one might say, of Germanic stock, and they are divided up into several tribes, for a part of them are called Atmoni and Sidoni, while those who took possession of Puce, the island in the Ister, are called Pusini, whereas the Roxolani, the most northerly of them all, roam the plains between the Tanais and the Baristhenes. In fact, the whole country towards the north from Germany as far as the Caspian Sea is, so far as we know it, a plain, but whether any people dwell beyond the Roxolani we do not know. Now the Roxolani, under the leadership of Tasius, carried on war even with the generals of Mithridates Eupater, they came for the purpose of assisting Pelicus, the son of Silurus, as his allies, and they had the reputation of being warlike, yet all barbarian races and light-armed peoples are weak when matched against a well-ordered and well-armed phalanx. At any rate, those people, about 50,000 strong, could not hold out against the 6,000 men arrayed with Diophantus, the general of Mithridates, and most of them were destroyed. They use helmets and corselets made of raw ox hides, carry wicker shields, and have for weapons spears, bow, and sword, and most of the other barbarians are armed in this way. As for the nomads, their tents, made of felt, are fastened on the wagons in which they spend their lives, and round about the tents are the herds which afford the milk, cheese, and meat on which they live, and they follow the grazing herds, from time to time moving to other places that have grass, living only in the marsh meadows about Lake Meotis in winter, but also in the plains in summer. 3.18 The whole of the country has severe winters as far as the regions by the sea that are between the Baristhenes and the mouth of Lake Meotis, but of the regions themselves that are by the sea the most northerly are the mouth of the Meotis and, still more northerly, the mouth of the Baristhenes, and the recess of the Gulf of Tamurises, or Carsonites, which is the isthmus of the Great Chersonesus. The coldness of these regions, albeit the people live in plains, is evident, for they do not breed asses, an animal that is very sensitive to cold, and as for their cattle, some are born without horns, while the horns of others are filed off, for this part of the animal is sensitive to cold, and the horses are small, whereas the sheep are large, and bronze water jars burst and their contents freeze solid. But the severity of the frosts is most clearly evidenced by what takes place in the region of the mouth of Lake Meotis, the waterway from Panicopeian across to Phanagoria is traversed by wagons, so that it is both ice and roadway. And fish that become caught in the ice are obtained by digging with an implement called the gangame, and particularly the antaque, which are about the size of dolphins. It is said of Neoptolemus, the general of Mithridates, that in the same strait he overcame the barbarians in a naval engagement in summer and in a cavalry engagement in winter. And it is further said that the vine in the Bosporus region is buried during the winter, the people heaping quantities of earth upon it. And it is said that the heat too becomes severe, perhaps because the bodies of the people are unaccustomed to it, or perhaps because no winds blow on the plains at that time, or else because the air, by reason of its density, becomes superheated, like the effect of the parhelia in the clouds. It appears that Atis, who waged war with Philip the son of Amentus, ruled over most of the barbarians in this part of the world. 
3.19 after the island that lies off the Baristhenes, and next towards the rising sun, one sails to the cape of the racecourse of Achilles, which, though a treeless place, is called Alsos and is sacred to Achilles. Then comes the racecourse of Achilles, a peninsula that lies flat on the sea, it is a ribbon-like stretch of land, as much as 1,000 stadia in length, extending towards the east, its maximum breadth is only 2 stadia, and its minimum only 4 plethora, and it is only 60 stadia distant from the mainland that lies on either side of the neck. It is sandy, and water may be had by digging. The neck of the isthmus is near the center of the peninsula and is about 40 stadia wide. It terminates in a cape called Tamiris, which has a mooring place that faces the mainland. And after this cape comes the Carsonites Gulf. It is a very large gulf, reaching up towards the north as far as 1,000 stadia. Some say, however, that the distance to its recess is three times as much. The people there are called Tafrians. The gulf is also called Tamiris, the same name as that of the Cape. 4.1 Chersonese here is the isthmus which separates what is called Lake Sopper from the sea, it is 40 stadia in width and forms what is called the Tauric, or Scythian, Chersonese. Some, however, say that the breadth of the isthmus is 360 stadia. But though Lake Sopra is said to be as much as 4,000 stadia, it is only a part, the western part, of Lake Meotis, for it is connected with the latter by a wide mouth. It is very marshy and is scarcely navigable for sown boats, for the winds readily uncover the shallow places and then cover them with water again, and therefore the marshes are impassable for the larger boats. The gulf contains three small islands, and also some shoals and a few reefs along the coast. 4.2 As one sails out of the gulf, one comes, on the left, to a small city and another harbour belonging to the Cherson sites. For next in order as one sails along the coast is a great cape which projects towards the south and is a part of the Chersonesis as a whole, and on this cape is situated a city of the Heraclaudi, a colony of the Heraclaudi who live on the Pontus, and this place itself is called Chersonesis, being distant as one sails along the coast 4,400 stadia from the Tyrus. In this city is the sanctuary of Parthenos, a certain daimon, and the cape which is in front of the city, at a distance of 100 stadia, is also named after this daimon, for it is called the Parthenium and it has a temple in Zoanan of her. Between the city and the cape are three harbours. Then comes the old Chersonesis, which has been raised to the ground, and after it comes a narrow-mouthed harbour, where, generally speaking, the Tauri, a Scythian tribe, used to assemble their bands of pirates in order to attack all who fled thither for refuge. It is called Symbolon Lyman. This harbour forms with another harbour called Tenus Lyman and Isthmus 40 stadia in width, and this is the isthmus that encloses the little Chersonesis, which, as I was saying, is a part of the great Chersonesis and has on it the city of Chersonesis, which bears the same name as the peninsula. 4.3 This city was at first self-governing, but when it was sacked by the barbarians it was forced to choose Mithridates Eupater as protector. He was then leading an army against the barbarians who lived beyond the isthmus as far as the Baristhenes and the Adrius. This, however, was preparatory to a campaign against the Romans. So, then, in accordance with these hopes of his he gladly sent an army to Chersonesis, and at the same time carried on war against the Scythians, not only against Silurus, but also the sons of Silurus Palicus and the rest who, according to Poseidonius were fifty in number, but according to Apollonides were eighty. At the same time, also, he not only subdued all these by force, but also established himself as lord of the Bosporus, receiving the country as a voluntary gift from Perisides who held sway over it. So from that time on down to the present the city of the Chersonesites has been subject to the potentates of the Bosporus. Again, Tenus Lyman is equidistant from the city of the Chersonesites and Symbolon Lyman. And after Symbolon Lyman, as far as the city Theodosia, lies the Tauric seaboard, which is about 1,000 stadia in length. It is rugged and mountainous, and is subject to furious storms from the north. And in front of it lies a promontory which extends far out towards the high sea and the south in the direction of Paphlagonia and the city of Mastris it is called Cryomitopin. And opposite it lies the promontory of the Paplagonians, Carambis, which, by means of the strait, which is contracted on both sides, divides the Euxin Pontus into two seas. Now the distance from Carambis to the city of the Cherson sites is 2,500 stadia, but the number to Cryomitopin is much less, at any rate, many who have sailed across the strait say that they have seen both promontories, on either side, at the same time. In the mountainous district of the Taurians is also the mountain, which has the same name as the city in the neighborhood of Tabarania and Colchis. And near the same mountainous district is also another mountain, Samirius, so called because the Samirians once held sway in the Bosporus, and it is because of this fact that the whole of the strait which extends to the mouth of Lake Meotis is called the Samirian Bosporus. 
4.4 after the aforesaid mountainous district is the city Theodosia. It is situated in a fertile plain and has a harbour that can accommodate as many as a hundred ships. This harbour in earlier times was a boundary between the countries of the Bosporians and the Taurians. And the country that comes next after that of Theodosia is also fertile, as far as Panicopeian. Panicopeian is the metropolis of the Bosporians and is situated at the mouth of Lake Meotis. The distance between Theodosia and Panicopeian is about 530 stadia. The district is everywhere productive of grain, and it contains villages, as well as a city called Nymphaean, which possesses a good harbour. Panicopeian is a hill inhabited on all sides in a circuit of 20 stadia. To the east it has a harbour, and docks for about 30 ships, and it also has an acropolis. It is a colony of the Milesians. For a long time it was ruled as a monarchy by the dynasty of Luco, Satyrus, and Perisides, as were also all the neighbouring settlements near the south of Lake Meotis on both sides, until Perisides gave over the sovereignty to Mithridates. They were called tyrants, although most of them, beginning with Perisides and Luco, proved to be equitable rulers. And Perisides was actually held in honour as God. The last of these monarchs also bore the name Perisides, but he was unable to hold out against the barbarians, who kept exacting greater tribute than before, and he therefore gave over the sovereignty to Mithridates Eupater. But since the time of Mithridates the kingdom has been subject to the Romans. The greater part of it is situated in Europe, although a part of it is situated in Asia. 4.5 The mouth of Lake Meotis is called the Sumerian Bosporus. It is rather wide at first about 70 stadia and it is here that people cross over from the regions of Panicopeian to Phanagoria, the nearest city of Asia, but it ends in a much narrower channel. This strait separates Asia from Europe, and so does the Tanais River, which is directly opposite and flows from the north into the lake and then into the mouth of it. The river has two outlets into the lake which are about 60 stadia distant from one another. There is also a city which has the same name as the river, and next to Panicopeian is the greatest emporium of the barbarians. On the left, as one sails into the Sumerian Bosporus, is a little city, Myrmisium, at a distance of 20 stadia from Panicopeian. And twice this distance from Myrmisium is the village of Parthenium. Here the strait is narrowest about 20 stadia and on the opposite side, in Asia, is situated a village called Achilleum. Thence, if one sails straight to the Tanais and the islands near its outlets, the distance is 2200 stadia, but if one sails along the coast of Asia, the distance slightly exceeds this, if, however, one sails on the left as far as the Tanais, following the coast where the Isthmus is situated, the distance is more than three times as much. Now the whole of the seaboard along this coast, I mean on the European side, is desert, but the seaboard on the right is not desert, and, according to report, the total circuit of the lake is 9,000 stadia. The Great Chersonesus is similar to the Peloponnesus both in shape and in size. It is held by the potentates of the Bosporus, though the whole of it has been devastated by continuous wars. But in earlier times only a small part of it that which is close to the mouth of Lake Meotis and to Panicopeian and extends as far as Theodosia was held by the tyrants of the Bosporians, whereas most of it, as far as the Isthmus and the Gulf of Carsonites, was held by the Taurians, a Scythian tribe. And the whole of this country, together with about all the country outside the Isthmus as far as the Baristhenes, was called Little Scythia. But on account of the large number of people who left Little Scythia and crossed both the Tyras and the Ister and took up their abode in the land beyond, no small portion of Thrace as well came to be called Little Scythia, the Thracians giving way to them partly as the result of force and partly because of the bad quality of the land, for the greater part of the country is marshy. 4.6 But the Chersonesus, except for the mountainous district that extends along the sea as far as Theodosia, is everywhere level and fertile, and in the production of grain it is extremely fortunate. At any rate, it yields thirtyfold if furrowed by any sort of a digging instrument. Further, the people of this region, together with those of the Asiatic districts round about Sindus, used to pay as tribute to Mithridates 180,000 medimni and also 200 talents of silver. And in still earlier times the Greeks imported their supplies of grain from here, just as they imported their supplies of salt fists from the lake. Luco, it is said, once sent from Theodosia to Athens 2,100,000 medimni. These same people used to be called Georgi, in the literal sense of the term, because of the fact that the people who were situated beyond them were nomads and lived not only on meats in general but also on the meat of horses, as also on cheese made from mare's milk, on mare's fresh milk, and on mare's sour milk, which last, when prepared in a particular way, is much relished by them. And this is why the poet calls all the people in that part of the world Galactophagi. Now although the nomads are warriors rather than brigands, yet they go to war only for the sake of the tributes due them, for they turn over their land to any people who wish to till it, 
and are satisfied if they receive in return for the land the tribute they have assessed, which is a moderate one, assessed with a view, not to an abundance, but only to the daily necessities of life, but if the tenants do not pay, the nomads go to war with them. And so it is that the poet calls these same men at the same time both just and resourceless, for if the tributes were paid regularly, they would never resort to war. But men who are confident that they are powerful enough either to ward off attacks easily or to prevent any invasion do not pay regularly, such was the case with Asander, who, according to Hypsicrates, walled off the isthmus of the Chersonesus which is near Lake Meotis and is 360 stadia in width, and set up ten towers for every stadium. But though the Georgi of this region are considered to be at the same time both more gentle and civilized, still, since they are money-getters and have to do with the sea, they do not hold aloof from acts of piracy, nor yet from any other such acts of injustice and greed. 4.7 In addition to the places in the Chersonesus which I have enumerated, there were also the three forts which were built by Silurus and his sons the forts which they used as bases of operations against the generals of Mithridates I mean Palacium, Shibum, and Neapolis. There was also a fort Eupatorium, founded by Diophantus when he was leading the army for Mithridates. There is a cape about 15 stadia distant from the wall of the Chersonesites, it forms a very large gulf which inclines towards the city. And above this gulf is situated a lagoon which has salt works. And here, too, was the Ktenya's harbour. Now it was in order that they might hold out that the besieged generals of the king fortified the place, established a garrison on the Cape aforesaid, and filled up that part of the mouth of the gulf which extends as far as the city, so that there was now an easy journey on foot and, in a way, one city instead of two. Consequently, they could more easily beat off the Scythians. But when the Scythians made their attack, near Ktenya's, on the fortified wall that extends across the isthmus, and daily filled up the trench with straw, the generals of the king set fire by night to the part thus bridged by day, and held out until they finally prevailed over them. And today everything is subject to whatever kings of the Bosporians the Romans choose to set up. 4.8 It is a peculiarity of the whole Scythian and Sarmatian race that they castrate their horses to make them easy to manage, for although the horses are small, they are exceedingly quick and hard to manage. As for game, there are deer and wild boars in the marshes, and wild asses and roe deer in the plains. Another peculiar thing is the fact that the eagle is not found in these regions. And among the quadrupeds there is what is called the kolos, it is between the deer and ram in size, is white, is swifter than they, and drinks through its nostrils into its head, and then from this storage supplies itself for several days, so that it can easily live in the waterless country. Such, then, is the nature of the whole of the country which is outside the Ister between the Rhenus and the Tanais rivers as far as the Pontic Sea and Lake Meotis. 5.1 The remainder of Europe consists of the country which is between the Ister and the encircling sea, beginning at the recess of the Adriatic and extending as far as the sacred mouth of the Ister. In this country are Greece and the tribes of the Macedonians and of the Aperotes, and all those tribes above them whose countries reach to the Ister and to the seas on either side, both the Adriatic and the Pontic to the Adriatic, the Illyrian tribes, and to the other sea as far as the Propontis and the Hellespont, the Thracian tribes and whatever Scythian or Celtic tribes are intermingled with them. But I must make my beginning at the Ister, speaking of the parts that come next in order after the regions which I have already encompassed in my description. These are the parts that border on Italy, on the Alps, and on the counties of the Germans, Dacians, and Gedans. This country also might be divided into two parts, for, in a way, the Illyrian, Peonian, and Thracian mountains are parallel to the Ister, thus completing what is almost a straight line that reaches from the Adrius as far as the Pontus, and to the north of this line are the parts that are between the Ister and the mountains, whereas to the south are Greece and the barbarian country which borders thereon and extends as far as the mountainous country. Now the mountain called Hemus is near the Pontus, it is the largest and highest of all mountains in that part of the world, and cleaves Thrace almost in the center. Polybius says that both seas are visible from the mountain, but this is untrue, for the distance to the Adrius is great and the things that obscure the view are many. On the other hand, almost the whole of Ardia is near the Adrius. But Peonia is in the middle, and the whole of it too is high country. Peonia is bounded on either side, first, towards the Thracian parts, by Rhodope, a mountain next in height to the Hemus, and secondly, on the other side, towards the north, by the Illyrian parts, both the country of the Autoriadi and that of the Dardanians. So then, let me speak first of the Illyrian parts, which join the Ister and the part of the Alps which lies between Italy and Germany and begins at the lake which is near the country of the Vindelici, Reedi, and Tenii. 5.2 A part of this country was laid waste by the Dacians when they subdued the Boi and Taurusi, Celtic tribes under the rule of Critosiris. They alleged that the country was theirs, although it was separated from theirs by the river Parisis, which flows from the mountains to the Ister near the country of the Scordsci who are called Galati. 
for these two lived intermingled with the Illyrian and the Thracian tribes. But though the Dacians destroyed the boy and Taurisi, they often used the Scorgi as allies. The remainder of the country in question is held by the Pananii as far as Sagestica and the Ister, on the north and east, although their territory extends still farther in the other directions. The city Sagestica, belonging to the Pannonians, is at the confluence of several rivers, all of them navigable, and is naturally fitted to be a base of operations for making war against the Dacians, for it lies beneath that part of the Alps which extends as far as the country of the Eopodes, a tribe which is at the same time both Celtic and Illyrian. And thence, too, flow rivers which bring down into Sagestica much merchandise both from other countries and from Italy. For if one passes over Mount Acre from Aquileia to Nauportius, a settlement of the Taurisi, whither the wagons are brought, the distance is 350 stadia, though some say 500. Now the Acre is the lowest part of that portion of the Alps which extends from the country of the Reedy to that of the Eopodes. Then the mountains rise again, in the country of the Eopodes, and are called Albion. In like manner, also, there is a pass which leads over Acre from Trajest, a Carnic village, to a marsh called Lusium. Near Nauportius there is a river, the Corcoras, which receives the cargoes. Now this river empties into the Saws, and the Saws into the Drivus, and the Drivus into the Noaris near Sagestica. Immediately below Nauportius the Noaris is further increased in volume by the Calapis, which flows from the Albion mountain through the country of the Eopodes and meets the Danubius near the country of the Scorgi. The voyage on these rivers is, for the most part, towards the north. The road from Trajes to the Danubius is about 1,200 stadia. Near Sagestica, and on the road to Italy, are situated both Sisha, a fort, and Sirmium. 5.3 The tribes of the Pananii are, the Brusi, the Andizidii, the Dicians, the Perusti, the Mazii, and the Dezishidi, whose leader is Bado, and also other small tribes of less significance which extend as far as Dalmatia and, as one goes south, almost as far as the land of the Argiae. The whole of the mountainous country that stretches alongside Pannonia from the recess of the Adriatic as far as the Rhizonic Gulf and the land of the Argiae is Illyrian, falling as it does between the sea and the Pannonian tribes. But this is about where I should begin my continuous geographical circuit though first I shall repeat a little of what I have said before. I was saying in my geographical circuit of Italy that the Istrians were the first people on the Illyrian seaboard, their country being a continuation of Italy and the country of the Carni and it is for this reason that the present Roman rulers have advanced the boundary of Italy as far as Pola, an Istrian city. Now this boundary is about 800 stadia from the recess, and the distance from the promontory in front of Pola to Ancona, if one keeps the Hanetic country on the right, is the same. And the entire distance along the coast of Istria is 1,300 stadia. 5.4 Next in order comes the voyage of 1,000 stadia along the coast of the country of the Eopodes, for the Eopodes are situated on the Albion mountain, which is the last mountain of the Alps, is very lofty, and reaches down to the country of the Pannonians on one side and to the Adrius on the other. They are indeed a war-mad people, but they have been utterly worn out by Augustus. Their cities are Machelum, Arupini, Monetium, and Vendo. Their lands are poor, the people living for the most part on spelt and millet. Their armor is Celtic, and they are tattooed like the rest of the Illyrians and the Mauritians. After the voyage along the coast of the country of the Eopodes comes that along the coast of the country of the Liburni, the latter being 500 stadia longer than the former, on this voyage is a river, which is navigable inland for merchant vessels as far as the country of the Dalmatians, and also a Liburnian city, Scardo. 5.5 There are islands along the whole of the aforesaid seaboard. First, the Absertides, where Medea is said to have killed her brother Absertus who was pursuing her, and then, opposite the country of the Eopodes, Syrictica, then the Liburnides, about forty in number, then other islands, of which the best known are Issa, Tragurium, founded by the people of Issa, and Pharos, formerly Paros, founded by the Parians, the native land of Demetrius the Pharian. Then comes the seaboard of the Dalmatians, and also their seaport, Salona. This tribe is one of those which carried on war against the Romans for a long time, it had as many as fifty noteworthy settlements, and some of these were cities Salona, Priamo, Ninia, and Synodium, both the old and the new all of which were set on fire by Augustus. And there is Andricium, a fortified place, and also Dalmium, whence the name of the tribe, which was once a large city, but because of the greed of the people Nausicaa reduced it to a small city and made the plain a mere sheep pasture. The Dalmatians have the peculiar custom of making a redistribution of land every seven years, and that they make no use of coin money as peculiar to them as compared with the other peoples in that part of the world, although as compared with many other barbarian peoples it is common. And there is Mount Adrium, which cuts the Dalmatian country through the middle into two parts, one facing the sea and the other in the opposite direction. 
Then come the river Naro and the people who live about it the Darazi, the Argiae, and the Plurae. An island called the Black Corsair and also a city founded by the Nidians are close to the Plurae, while Pharos, formerly called Peros, for it was founded by Parians, is close to the Argiae. 5.6 The Argiae were called by the men of later times for Dia. Because they pestered the sea through their piratical bands, the Romans pushed them back from it into the interior and forced them to till the soil. But the country is rough and poor and not suited to a farming population, and therefore the tribe has been utterly ruined and in fact has almost been obliterated. And this is what befell the rest of the peoples in that part of the world, for those who were most powerful in earlier times were utterly humbled or were obliterated, as, for example, among the Galati the boy and the Scourgesti, and among the Illyrians the Autariati, Argiae, and Dardanii, and among the Thracians the Triboli, that is, they were reduced in warfare by one another at first and then later by the Macedonians and the Romans. 5.7 Be this as it may, after the seaboard of the Argiae and the Plurae come the Rhysonic Gulf, and the city Rizo, and other small towns and also the river Drilo, which is navigable inland towards the east as far as the Dardanian country. This country borders on the Macedonian and the Paeonian tribes on the south, as do also the Autariati and the Dasaritiae, different peoples on different sides being contiguous to one another and to the Autariati. To the Dardaniati belong also the Galabriae, among whom is an ancient city, and the Thunati, whose country joins that of the Medi, a Thracian tribe on the east. The Dardanians are so utterly wild that they dig caves beneath their dunghills and live there, but still they care for music, always making use of musical instruments, both flutes and stringed instruments. However, these people live in the interior, and I shall mention them again later. 5.8 After the Rhizonic Gulf comes the city of Lysus, and Acrolysis, and Epidamnus, founded by the Cursirians, which is now called Dirachium, like the peninsula on which it is situated. Then comes the Opsis River, and then the Us, on which is situated Apollonia, an exceedingly well-governed city, founded by the Corinthians and the Cursirians, and ten stadia distant from the river and sixty from the sea. The Us is called Eas by Hecateus, who says that both the Inachus and the Eas flow from the same place, the region of Lachmus, or rather from the same subterranean recess, the former towards the south into Argos and the latter towards the west and towards the Adrius. In the country of the Apollonians is a place called Nymphaean, it is a rock that gives forth fire, and beneath it flow springs of warm water and asphalt probably because the clods of asphalt in the earth are burned by the fire. And nearby, on a hill, is a mine of asphalt, and the part that is trenched is filled up again in the course of time, since, as Poseidonius says, the earth that is poured into the trenches changes to asphalt. He also speaks of the asphaltic vine earth which is mined at the Pyrian Seleucia as a cure for the infested vine, for, he says, if it is smeared on together with olive oil, it kills the insects before they can mount the sprouts of the roots, and, he adds, earth of this sort was also discovered in Rhodes when he was in office there as Pritinus, but it required more olive oil. After Apollonia comes Biliaca, and Oricum and its seaport Panormus, and the Ciraunian mountains, where the mouth of the Ionian Sea and the Adrius begins. 5.9 Now the mouth is common to both, but the Ionian is different in that it is the name of the first part of the sea, whereas Adrius is the name of the inside part of the sea as far as the recess, at the present time, however, Adrius is also the name of the sea as a whole. According to Theopompus, the first name came from a man, a native of Issa, who once ruled over the region, whereas the Adrius was named after a river. The distance from the country of the Liburnians to the Ciraunian mountains is slightly more than 2,000 stadia Theopompu states that the whole voyage from the recess takes six days, and that on foot the length of the Illyrian country is as much as 30 days, though in my opinion he makes the distance too great. And he also says other things that are incredible. First, that the seas are connected by a subterranean passage, from the fact that both Cayenne and Thasian pottery are found in the Naro River. Secondly, that both seas are visible from a certain mountain. And thirdly, when he puts down a certain one of the Libernides islands as large enough to have a circuit of 500 stadia, and fourthly, that the Ister empties by one of its mouths into the Adrius. In Eratosthenes, also, are some false hearsay statements of this kind popular notions, as Polybius calls them when speaking of him and the other historians. 5.10 Now the whole Illyrian seaboard is exceedingly well supplied with harbours, not only on the continuous coast itself but also in the neighbouring islands, although the reverse is the case with that part of the Italian seaboard which lies opposite, since it is harbourless. But both seaboards in like manner are sunny and good for fruits, for the olive and the vine flourish there, except, perhaps, in places here or there that are utterly rugged. But although the Illyrian seaboard is such, people in earlier times made but small account of it perhaps in part owing to their ignorance of its fertility, though mostly because of the wildness of the inhabitants and their piratical habits. 
but the whole of the country situated above this is mountainous, cold, and subject to snows, especially the northerly part, so that there is a scarcity of the vine, not only on the heights but also on the levels. These latter are the mountain plains occupied by the Pannonians, on the south they extend as far as the country of the Dalmatians and the RGIA, on the north they end at the Ister, while on the east they border on the country of the Scordshi, that is, on the country that extends along the mountains of the Macedonians and the Thracians. 5.11 Now the Atariadi were once the largest and best tribe of the Illyrians. In earlier times they were continually at war with the RGIA over the salt works on the common frontiers. The salt was made to crystallize out of water which in the springtime flowed at the foot of a certain mountain glen, for if they drew off the water and stowed it away for five days the salt would become thoroughly crystallized. They would agree to use the salt works alternately, but would break the agreements and go to war. At one time when the Atariadi had subdued the tribally, whose territory extended from that of the Agrianes as far as the Ister, a journey of fifteen days, they held sway also over the rest of the Thracians and the Illyrians, but they were overpowered, at first by the Scordshi, and later on by the Romans, who also subdued the Scourgeshi themselves, after these had been in power for a long time. 5.12 The Scourgeshi lived along the Ister and were divided into two tribes called the Great Scourgeshi and the Little Scourgeshi. The former lived between two rivers that empty into the Ister the Noaris, which flows past Sagestica, and the Margus, by some called the Bargus, whereas the Little Scourgeshi lived on the far side of this river, and their territory bordered on that of the Tribali and the Messi. The Scourgeshi also held some of the islands, and they increased to such an extent that they advanced as far as the Illyrian, Peonian, and Thracian mountains, accordingly, they also took possession of most of the islands in the Ister. And they also had two cities Hiorta and Cappadunum. After the country of the Scourgeshi, along the Ister, comes that of the Tribali and the Messi, whom I have mentioned before, and also the marshes of that part of what is called Little Scythia which is this side the Ister, these two I have mentioned. These people, as also the Krabatsi and what are called the Troglodyte, live above the region round about Calidus, Thomas, and Ister. Then come the peoples who live in the neighborhood of the Hemus mountain and those who live at its base and extend as far as the Pontus I mean the Corali, the Bessai, and some of the Medi and Danthalidi. Now these tribes are very brigandish themselves, but the Bessai, who inhabit the greater part of the Hemus mountain, are called brigands even by the brigands. The Bessai live in huts and lead a wretched life, and their country borders on Mount Rodope, on the country of the Peonians, and on that of two Illyrian peoples the Autariadi, and the Dardanians. Between these and the RGIA are the Dasarishii, the Hybrians, and other insignificant tribes, which the Scourgeshi kept on ravaging until they had depopulated the country and made it full of trackless forests for a distance of several days' journey. 6.1 Pontic Seaboard The remainder of the country between the Ister and the mountains on either side of Peonia consists of that part of the Pontic Seaboard which extends from the sacred mouth of the Ister as far as the mountainous country in the neighborhood of the Hemus and as far as the mouth at Byzantium. And just as, in traversing the Illyrian Seaboard, I proceeded as far as the Sirionian Mountains, because, although they fall outside the mountainous country of Illyria, they afford an appropriate limit, and just as I determined the positions of the tribes of the interior by these mountains, because I thought that marks of this kind would be more significant as regards both the description at hand and what was to follow, so also in this case the seaboard, even though it falls beyond the mountain line, will nevertheless end at an appropriate limit the mouth of the Pontus as regards both the description at hand and that which comes next in order. So, then, if one begins at the sacred mouth of the Ister and keeps the continuous seaboard on the right, one comes, at a distance of 500 stadia, to a small town, Ister, founded by the Milesians, then, at a distance of 250 stadia, to a second small town, Thomas, then, at 280 stadia, to a city Calidus, a colony of the Heraclaudi, then, at 1300 stadia, to Apollonia, a colony of the Milesians. The greater part of Apollonia was founded on a certain isle, where there is a sanctuary of Apollo, from which Marcus Lucullus carried off the colossal statue of Apollo, a work of Calamus, which he set up in the Capitolium. In the interval between Calidus and Apollonia come also by zone, of which a considerable part was engulfed by earthquakes, Crini, Odessus, a colony of the Milesians, and Nolacus, a small town of the Mesembriani. Then comes the Hemus Mountain, which reaches the sea here, then Mesembria, a colony of the Megarians, formerly called Menebria, that is, city of Manus, because the name of its founder was Manus, while Bria is the word for city in the Thracian language. In this way, also, the city of Salis is called Salibria and Enus was once called Paltiobria. Then come Anchiali, a small town belonging to the Apolloniidae, and Apollonia itself. On this coastline is Cape Terizes, a stronghold, which Lysimachus once used as a treasury. Again, 
from Apollonia to the Cyanii the distance is about 1,500 stadia, and in the interval Arthinias, a territory belonging to the Apolloniidae, Anchiali, which also belongs to the Apolloniidae, and also Phinopolis and Andriake, which border on Samedesis. Samedesis is a desert and stony beach, harborless and wide open to the north winds, and in length extends as far as the Cyanii, a distance of about 700 stadia, and all who are cast ashore on this beach are plundered by the Estae, a Thracian tribe who are situated above it. The Cyanii are two islets near the mouth of the Pontus, one close to Europe and the other to Asia, they are separated by a channel of about 20 stadia and are 20 stadia distant both from the sanctuary of the Byzantines and from the sanctuary of the Chalcedonians. And this is the narrowest part of the mouth of the Euxine, for when one proceeds only 10 stadia farther one comes to a headland which makes the strait only 5 stadia in width, and then the strait opens to a greater width and begins to form the Propontis. 6.2 Now the distance from the headland that makes the strait only 5 stadia wide to the harbour which is called under the fig tree is 35 stadia, and thence to the horn of the Byzantines, 5 stadia. The horn, which is close to the wall of the Byzantines, is a gulf that extends approximately towards the west for a distance of 60 stadia, it resembles a stag's horn, for it is split into numerous gulfs branches, as it were. The Pelamids rush into these gulfs and are easily caught because of their numbers, the force of the current that drives them together, and the narrowness of the gulfs, in fact, because of the narrowness of the area, they are even caught by hand. Now these fish are hatched in the marshes of Lake Meotis, and when they have gained a little strength they rush out through the mouth of the lake in schools and move along the Asian shore as far as Trapezus and Pharnacia. It is here that the catching of the fish first takes place, though the catch is not considerable, for the fish have not yet grown to their normal size. But when they reach Sinope, they are mature enough for catching and salting. Yet when once they touch the Cyanii and pass by these, the creatures take such fright at a certain white rock which projects from the Chalcedonian shore that they forthwith turn to the opposite shore. There they are caught by the current, and since at the same time the region is so formed by nature as to turn the current of the sea there to Byzantium and the horn at Byzantium, they naturally are driven together thither and thus afford the Byzantines and the Roman people considerable revenue. But the Chalcedonians, though situated nearby, on the opposite shore, have no share in this abundance, because the Pelamids do not approach their harbours, hence the saying that Apollo, when the men who founded Byzantium at a time subsequent to the founding of Chalcedon by the Megarians consulted the oracle, ordered them to make their settlement opposite the blind, thus calling the Chalcedonians blind, because, although they sailed the regions in question at an earlier time, they failed to take possession of the country on the far side, with all its wealth, and chose the poorer country. I have now carried my description as far as Byzantium, because a famous city, lying as it does very near to the mouth, marked a better known limit to the coasting voyage from the Ister. And above Byzantium is situated the tribe of the Este, in whose territory is a city Calibi, where Philip the son of Amintas settled the most villainous people of his kingdom. 7.1 Epirus. These alone, then, of all the tribes that are marked off by the Ister and by the Illyrian and Thracian mountains, deserve to be mentioned, occupying as they do the whole of the Adriatic seaboard beginning at the recess, and also the seaboard that is called the left parts of the Pontus, and extends from the Ister River as far as Byzantium. But there remain to be described the southerly parts of the aforesaid mountainous country and next thereafter the districts that are situated below them, among which are both Greece and the adjacent barbarian country as far as the mountains. Now Hecateus of Miletus says of the Peloponnesus that before the time of the Greeks it was inhabited by barbarians. Yet one might say that in the ancient times the whole of Greece was a settlement of barbarians, if one reasons from the traditions themselves, Pelops brought over peoples from Phrygia to the Peloponnesus that received its name from him, and Danius from Egypt, whereas the Dryopes, the Caucones, the Pulaski, the Lelages, and other such peoples, apportioned among themselves the parts that are inside the Isthmus and also the parts outside, for Attica was once held by the Thracians who came with Eumalpus, Daulis in Phocis by Terius, Cadmia by the Phoenicians who came with Cadmus, and Boeotia itself by the Ones and Temeses and Hyants. According to Pindar, there was a time when the Boeotian tribe was called Size. Moreover, the barbarian origin of some is indicated by their names Cecrops, Godrus, Aeclus, Cadus, Drymas, and Crinicus. And even to the present day the Thracians, Illyrians, and Aperotes live on the flanks of the Greeks, though this was still more the case formerly than now. Indeed most of the country that at the present time is indisputably Greece is held by the barbarians Macedonia and certain parts of Thessaly by the Thracians, and the parts above Acarnania and Aetolia by the Thesproti, the Cassipii, the Amphilochi, the Molossi, and the Athamanes Aperotic tribes. 7.2 As for the Pulaski, I have already discussed them. As for the Lelages, some conjecture that they are the same as the Carians, and others that they were only fellow inhabitants and fellow soldiers of these, and this, they say, 
is why, in the territory of Miletus, certain settlements are called settlements of the Leliges, and why, in many places in Caria, tombs of the Leliges and deserted forts, known as Lelegian forts, are so called. However, the whole of what is now called Ionia used to be inhabited by Carians and Leliges, but the Ionians themselves expelled them and took possession of the country, although in still earlier times the captors of Troy had driven the Leliges from the region about Ida that is near Petasus and the Satniois River. So then, the very fact that the Leliges made common cause with the Carians might be considered a sign that they were barbarians. And Aristotle, in his Polities, also clearly indicates that they led a wandering life, not only with the Carians, but also apart from them and from earliest times, for instance, in the polity of the Acarnanians he says that the Curetes held a part of the country, whereas the Leliges, and then the Telebai, held the westerly part, and in the polity of the Aetolians, and likewise in that of the Apuntai and the Megarians, he calls the Locri of today Leliges and says that they took possession of Boeotia too, again, in the polity of the Leucadians he names a certain indigenous Lelix, and also Teleboas, the son of a daughter of Lelix, and twenty-two sons of Teleboas, some of whom, he says, dwelt in Lucas. But in particular one might believe Hesiod when he says concerning them, for verily Locris was chieftain of the peoples of the Leliges, whom once Zeus the son of Cronus, who knoweth devices imperishable, gave to Deucalion peoples picked out of earth, for by his etymology he seems to me to hint that from earliest times they were a collection of mixed peoples and that this was why the tribe disappeared. And the same might be said of the Caucones, since now they are nowhere to be found, although in earlier times they were settled in several places. 7.3 Now although in earlier times the tribes in question were small, numerous, and obscure, still, because of the density of their population and because they lived each under its own king, it was not at all difficult to determine their boundaries, but now that most of the country has become depopulated and the settlements, particularly the cities, have disappeared from sight, it would do no good, even if one could determine their boundaries with strict accuracy, to do so, because of their obscurity and their disappearance. This process of disappearing began a long time ago and has not yet entirely ceased in many regions because the people keep revolting. Indeed, the Romans, after being set up as masters by the inhabitants, encamp in their very houses. Be this as it may, Polybius says that Paulus, after his subjection of Perseus and the Macedonians, destroyed seventy cities of the Aperotes, most of which, he adds, belonged to the Molossi, and reduced to slavery 150,000 people. Nevertheless, I shall attempt, in so far as it is appropriate to my description and as my knowledge reaches, to traverse the several different parts, beginning at the seaboard of the Ionian Sea that is, where the voyage out of the Adrius ends. 7.4 of the seaboard, then, the first parts are those about Epidamnus and Apollonia. From Apollonia to Macedonia one travels the Ignatian Road, towards the east, it has been measured by Roman miles and marked by pillars as far as Sipsala and the Hebrus River a distance of 535 miles. Now if one reckons as most people do, 8 stadia to the mile, there would be 4,280 stadia, whereas if one reckons as Polybius does, who adds two plethora, which is a third of a stadium, to the 8 stadia, one must add 178 stadia the third of the number of miles. And it so happens that travellers setting out from Apollonia and Epidamnus meet at an equal distance from the two places on the same road. Now although the road as a whole is called the Ignatian Road, the first part of it is called the road to Candavia, an Illyrian mountain, and passes through Lycnitis, a city, and Pylon, a place on the road which marks the boundary between the Illyrian country and Macedonia. From Pylon the road runs to Barnas through Heraclea and the country of the Lincesti and that of the Ordi into Edessa and Pella and as far as Thessalonicea, and the length of this road in miles, according to Polybius, is 267. So then, in travelling this road from the region of Epidamnus and Apollonia, one has on the right the Aperotic tribes whose coasts are washed by the Sicilian Sea and extend as far as the Ambracian Gulf, and, on the left, the mountains of Illyria, which I have already described in detail, and those tribes which live along them and extend as far as Macedonia and the country of the Paeonians. Then, beginning at the Ambracian Gulf, all the districts which, one after another, incline towards the east and stretch parallel to the Peloponnesus belong to Greece, they then leave the whole of the Peloponnesus on the right and project into the Aegean Sea but the districts which extend from the beginning of the Macedonian and the Paeonian mountains as far as the Strymon River are inhabited by the Macedonians, the Paeonians, and by some of the Thracian mountaineers, whereas the districts beyond the Strymon, extending as far as the mouth of the Pontus and the Hemus, all belong to the Thracians, except the seaboard. This seaboard is inhabited by Greeks, some being situated on the Propontis, others on the Hellespont and the Gulf of Melis, and others on the Aegean. The Aegean Sea washes Greece on two sides, first, 
the side that faces towards the east and stretches from Sunyo, towards the north as far as the Thermian Gulf and Thessalonicea, a Macedonian city, which at the present time is more populous than any of the rest, and secondly, the side that faces towards the south, I mean the Macedonian country, extending from Thessalonicea as far as the Strymon. Some, however, also assigned to Macedonia the country that extends from the Strymon as far as the Nestus River, since Philip was so specially interested in these districts that he appropriated them to himself, and since he organized very large revenues from the mines and the other natural resources of the country. But from Sunio to the Peloponnesus lie the Myrtoan, the Cretan, and the Libyan seas, together with their gulfs, as far as the Sicilian Sea, and this last fills out the Ambracian, the Corinthian, and the Chrysian gulfs. 7.5 Now as for the Aparotes, there are 14 tribes of them, according to Theopompus, but of these the Kaons and the Molossi are the most famous, because of the fact that they once ruled over the whole of the Aparot country the Kaons earlier and later the Molossi, and the Molossi grew to still greater power, partly because of the kinship of their kings, who belonged to the family of the Iacidae, and partly because of the fact that the oracle at Dodona was in their country, an oracle both ancient and renowned. Now the Kaons and the Thesprotii end, next in order after these, the Cassipii, these, too, are Thesprotii, inhabit the seaboard which extends from the Sirounian mountains as far as the Ambracian Gulf, and they have a fertile country. The voyage, if one begins at the country of the Kaons and sails towards the rising sun and towards the Ambracian Gulf and Corinthian Gulf, keeping the Ausonian Sea on the right and Aparis on the left, is 1,300 stadia, that is, from the Sirounian mountains to the mouth of the Ambracian Gulf. In this interval is Panormus, a large harbour at the centre of the Sirounian mountains, and after these mountains one comes to Onxmus, another harbour, opposite which lie the western extremities of Cursyria, and then still another harbour, Cassiop, from which the distance to Brentesium is 1,700 stadia. And the distance to Terras from another cape, which is farther south than Cassiop and is called Philacrum, is the same. After Onxmus comes Poseidium, and also Buthrodum, which is at the mouth of what is called Pelodes Harbour, is situated on a place that forms a peninsula, and has alien settlers consisting of Romans, and the Sibota. The Sibota are small islands situated only a short distance from the mainland and opposite Lusima, the eastern headland of Cursyria. And there are still other small islands as one sails along this coast, but they are not worth mentioning. Then comes Cape Chimerium, and also Glissis Lyman, into which the river Acheron empties. The Acheron flows from the Etrusian lake and receives several rivers as tributaries, so that it sweetens the waters of the gulf. And also the Thyamis flows nearby. Sic Iris, the Ephora of former times, a city of the Thesprotians, lies above this gulf, whereas Phoenike lies above that gulf which is at Buthrotum. Near Sicyrus is Bukitium, a small town of the Cassipians, which is only a short distance above the sea, also Elatria, Pandosia, and Badii, which are in the interior, though their territory reaches down as far as the gulf. Next in order after Glissis Lyman come two other harbours Comoros, the nearer and smaller of the two, which forms an isthmus of sixty stadia with the Ambracian Gulf, and Nicopolis, a city founded by Augustus Caesar, and the other, the more distant and larger and better of the two, which is near the mouth of the gulf and is about twelve stadia distant from Nicopolis. 7.6 Next comes the mouth of the Ambracian Gulf. Although the mouth of this gulf is but slightly more than four stadia wide, the circumference is as much as three hundred stadia, and it has good harbours everywhere. That part of the country which is on the right as one sails in is inhabited by the Greek Acarnanians. Here too, near the mouth, is the sacred precinct of the action Apollo a hill on which the sanctuary stands, and at the foot of the hill is a plain which contains a sacred grove and a naval station, the naval station where Caesar dedicated as first fruits of his victory the squadron of ten ships from vessel with single bank of oars to vessel with ten. However, not only the boats, it is said, but also the boathouses have been wiped out by fire. On the left of the mouth are Nicopolis and the country of the Aparot Cassipians, which extends as far as the recess of the gulf near Ambracia. Ambracia lies only a short distance above the recess, it was founded by Gorgas, the son of Sipsilus. The river Arachus flows past Ambracia, it is navigable inland for only a few stadia, from the sea to Ambracia, although it rises in Mount Timphi and the Peroria. Now this city enjoyed an exceptional prosperity in earlier times, at any rate the gulf was named after it, and it was adorned most of all by Pyrrhus, who made the place his royal residence. In later times, however, the Macedonians and the Romans, by their continuous wars, so completely reduced both this and the other apparent cities because of their disobedience that finally Augustus, seeing that the cities had utterly failed, 
settled what inhabitants were left in one city together the city on this gulf which was called by him Nicopolis, and he so named it after the victory which he won in the naval battle before the mouth of the gulf over Antonius and Cleopatra the queen of the Egyptians, who was also present at the fight. Nicopolis is populous, and its numbers are increasing daily, since it is not only a considerable territory and the adornment taken from the spoils of the battle, but also, in its suburbs, the thoroughly equipped sacred precinct one part of it being in a sacred grove that contains a gymnasium and a stadium for the celebration of the quinquennial games, the other part being on the hill that is sacred to Apollo and lies above the grove. These games the Aksha, sacred to action Apollo have been designated as Olympian, and they are superintended by the Lacedaemonians. The other settlements are dependencies of Nicopolis. In earlier times also the action games were wont to be celebrated in honor of the god by the inhabitants of the surrounding country games in which the prize was a wreath but at the present time they have been set in greater honor by Caesar. 7.7 After Ambracia comes Argos Amphilococcum, founded by Alcmean and his children. According to Ephorus, at any rate, Alcmean, after the expedition of the Epigoni against Thebes, on being invited by Diomedes, went with him into Aetolia and helped him acquire both this country and Acarnania and when Agamemnon summoned them to the Trojan War, Diomedes went, but Alcmean stayed in Acarnania, founded Argos, and named it Amphilococcum after his brother, and he named the river which flows through the country into the Ambracian Gulf Inachus, after the river in the Argean country. But according to Thucydides, Amphilochus himself, after his return from Troy, being displeased with the state of affairs at Argos, passed on into Acarnania, and on succeeding to his brother's dominion founded the city that is named after him. 7.8 The Amphilochians are Aperotes, and so are the peoples who are situated above them and border on the Elyrian mountains, inhabiting a rugged country I mean the Molossi, the Athamanes, the Ethuses, the Timphue, the Oresti, and also the Prurii and the Atintanes, some of them being nearer to the Macedonians and others to the Ionian Sea. It is said that Orestes once took possession of Orestes when his, exile on account of the murder of his mother and left the country bearing his name, and that he also founded a city and called it Argos Oresticum but the Illyrian tribes which are near the southern part of the mountainous country and those which are above the Ionian Sea are intermingled with these peoples, for above Epidamnus and Apollonia as far as the Ceraunian mountains dwell the Biliones, the Talanti, the Parthini, and the Brygi. Somewhere nearby are also the silver mines of Damascene, where the Parasades and the Incalae, also called Caesarethii, together establish their dominion, and near these people are also the Lincesti, the territory Duriopus, the Pelagonian Tripolitus, the Orti, Elymia, and Eretyra. In earlier times these peoples were ruled separately, each by its own dynasty. For instance, it was the descendants of Cadmus and Harmonia who ruled over the Incalae, and the scenes of the stories told about them are still pointed out there. These people, I say, were not ruled by men of native stock, and the Lincesti became subject to Arabaeus, who was of the stock of the Bacchiads, Eurydice, the mother of Philip, Amintus' son, was Arabaeus' daughter's daughter and Syrah was his daughter, and again, of the Aperotes, the Molossi became subject to Pyrrhus, the son of Neoptolemus the son of Achilles, and to his descendants, who were Thessalians. But the rest were ruled by men of native stock. Then, because one tribe or another was always getting the mastery over others, they all ended in the Macedonian Empire, except a few who dwelt above the Ionian Sea. And in fact the regions about Lyncus, Pelagonia, Restes, and Elymia, used to be called Upper Macedonia, though later on they were by some also called Free Macedonia but some go so far as to call the whole of the country Macedonia, as far as Corsera, at the same time stating as their reason that in tonsure, language, short cloak, and other things of the kind, the usages of the inhabitants are similar, although, they add, some speak both languages. But when the empire of the Macedonians was broken up, they fell under the power of the Romans. And it is through the country of these tribes that the Ignatian road runs, which begins at Epidamnus and Apollonia. Near the road to Candavia are not only the lakes which are in the neighborhood of Lycnitis, on the shores of which are saltfish establishments that are independent of other waters, but also a number of rivers, some emptying into the Ionian Sea and others flowing in a southerly direction I mean the Inachus, the Aratus, the Achaloas and the Avenus, formerly called the Lycormas, the Aratus emptying into the Ambracian Gulf, the Inachus into the Achaloas, the Achaloas itself and the Avenus into the sea the Achaloas after traversing Acarnania and the Avenus after traversing Aetolia. But the Arigon, after receiving many streams from the Illyrian mountains and from the countries of the Lincesti, Brygi, Diuriopes, and Pelagonians, empties into the Axius. 7.9 In earlier times there were also cities among these tribes, at any rate, Pelagonia used to be called Tripolitis, one of which was Azorus, and all the cities of the Diuriopes on the Arigon River were populous, among which were Bryanium, 
Alalcamini, and Stibera. And Sidre belonged to the Brygians, while Aeginium, on the border of Ethitia and Trica, belonged to the Timfue. When one is already near to Macedonia and to Thessaly, and in the neighborhood of the Poos and the Pindus Mountains, one comes to the country of the Ethuses and to the sources of the Peneus River, the possession of which is disputed by the Timfue and those Thessalians who live at the foot of the Pindus, and to the city Oxania, situated on the Ion River 120 stadia from Azorus and Tripolitis. Nearby are Alalcamini, Aeginium, Europus, and the confluence of the Ion River with the Peneus. Now although in those earlier times, as I have said, all of Paris and the Illyrian country were rugged and full of mountains, such as Tomaris and Polyanus and several others, still they were populous, but at the present time desolation prevails in most parts, while the parts that are still inhabited survive only in villages and in ruins. And even the oracle at Dodona, like the rest, is virtually extinct. 7.10 This oracle, according to Ephorus, was founded by the Pulaski. And the Pulaski are called the earliest of all peoples who have held dominion in Greece. And the poet speaks in this way, O Lord Zeus, Dodonian, Pelasgian, and Hesiod, he came to Dodona and the oak tree, seat of the Pulaski. The Pulaski I have already discussed in my description of Tyrrhenia, and as for the people who lived in the neighborhood of the sanctuary of Dodona, Homer too makes it perfectly clear from their mode of life, when he calls them men with feet on washing, men who sleep upon the ground, that they were barbarians, but whether one should call them heli, as Pindar does, or Selly, as is conjectured to be the true reading in Homer, is a question to which the text, since it is doubtful, does not permit a positive answer. Philochorus says that the region round about Dodona, like Euboea, was called Helopia, and that in fact Hesiod speaks of it in this way, there is a land called Helopia, with many a cornfield and with goodly meadows, on the edge of this land a city called Dodona hath been built. It is thought, Apollodorus says, that the land was so called from the marshes around the sanctuary, as for the poet, however, Apollodorus takes it for granted that he did not call the people who lived about the sanctuary Heli, but Selly, since, Apollodorus adds, the poet also named a certain river Selius. He names it, indeed, when he says, from afar, out of Ephra, from the river Selius, however, as Demetrius of Skepsis says, the poet is not referring to the Ephra among the Thesprotians, but to that among the Eleans, for the Selius is among the Eleans, he adds, and there is no Selius among the Thesprotians, nor yet among the Molossi. And as for the myths that are told about the oak tree and the doves, and any other myths of the kind, although they, like those told about Delphi, are in part more appropriate to poetry, yet they also in part properly belong to the present geographical description. 7.11 In ancient times, then, Dodona was under the rule of the Thesprotians, and so was Mount Tomaris, or Tomaris, for it is called both ways, at the base of which the sanctuary is situated. And both the tragic poets and Pindar have called Dodona Thesprotian Dodona. But later on it came under the rule of the Molossi. And it is after the Tomaris, people say, that those whom the poet calls interpreters of Zeus whom he also calls men with feet on washing, men who sleep upon the ground were called Tomaroi, and in the Odyssey some so write the words of Amphinomus, when he counsels the wooers not to attack Telemachus until they inquire of Zeus, if the Tomaroi of great Zeus approve, I myself shall slay, and I shall bid all the rest to aid, whereas if God averts it, I bid you stop. For it is better, they argue, to write Tomaroi than Themists, at any rate, nowhere in the poet are the oracles called Themists, but it is the decrees, statutes, and laws that are so called, and the people have been called Tomaroi because Tomaroi is a contraction of Tomaroi, the equivalent of Tomarophilakes. Now although the more recent critics say Tomaroi, yet in Homer one should interpret Themists, and also Boli, in a simpler way, though in a way that is a misuse of the term, as meaning those orders and decrees that are oracular, just as one also interprets Themists as meaning those that are made by law. For example, such is the case in the following, to give ear to the decree of Zeus from the oak tree of lofty foliage. 7.12 At the outset, it is true, those who utter the prophecies were men, this too perhaps the poet indicates, for he calls them hypophyte, and the prophets might be ranked among these, but later on three old women were designated as prophets, after Dione also had been designated as temple sharer of Zeus. Suetus, however, in his desire to gratify the Thessalians with mythical stories, says that the sanctuary was transferred from Thessaly, from the part of Pelasgia which is about Scotusa, and Scotusa does belong to the territory called Thessalia Pelasgatus, and also that most of the women whose descendants are the prophetesses of today went along at the same time, and it is from this fact that Zeus was also called Pelasgian. But Sinius tells a story that is still more mythical. 8.1 Fragments. Sinius says that there was a city in Thessaly, and that an oak tree and the oracle of Zeus were transferred from there to Epirus. 1a, 
In earlier times the oracle was in the neighborhood of Skadasa, a city of Pelasgadis, but when the tree was set on fire by certain people the oracle was transferred in accordance with an oracle which Apollo gave out at Dodona. However, he gave out the oracle, not through words, but through certain symbols, as was the case at the oracle of Zeus Ammon in Libya. Perhaps there was something exceptional about the flight of the three pigeons from which the priestesses were wont to make observations and to prophesy. It is further said that in the language of the Molossans and the Thesprotians old women are called Pelii and old men Pelioi. And perhaps the much talked of Peleides were not birds, but three old women who busied themselves about the sanctuary. 1b. I mentioned Scotus also in my discussion of Dodona and of the oracle in Thessaly, because the oracle was originally in the latter region. 1c. According to the geographer, a sacred oak tree is revered in Dodona, because it was thought to be the earliest plant created and the first to supply men with food. And the same writer also says in reference to the oracular doves there, as they are called, that the doves are observed for the purposes of augury, just as there were some seers who divined from ravens. 8.2 Among the Thesprotians and the Molossans old women are called Pelii and old men Pelioi, as is also the case among the Macedonians, at any rate, those people call their dignitaries Pelagons, compare the Gerontes among the Laconians and the Massaliotes. And this, it is said, is the origin of the myth about the pigeons in the Dodonian oak tree. 8.3 The proverbial phrase, the copper vessel in Dodona, originated thus, in the sanctuary was a copper vessel with a statue of a man situated above it and holding a copper scourge, dedicated by the Cursyrians, the scourge was threefold and wrought in chain fashion, with bones strung from it, and these bones, striking the copper vessel continuously when they were swung by the winds, would produce tones so long that anyone who measured the time from the beginning of the tone to the end could count to 400. Whence, also, the origin of the proverbial term, the scourge of the Cursyrians. 8.4 Peonia is on the east of these tribes and on the west of the Thracian mountains, but it is situated on the north of the Macedonians, and, by the road that runs through the city Gortinium and Stobi, it affords a passage to, through which the Axius flows, and thus makes difficult the passage from Peonia to Macedonia just as the Peneus flows through Tempe and thus fortifies Macedonia on the side of Greece. And on the south Peonia borders on the countries of the Autoriati, the Dardanii, and the Argiae, and it extends as far as the Strymon. 8.5 The Haliachman flows into the Thermian Gulf. 8.6 Orestes is of considerable extent, and has a large mountain which reaches as far as Mount Corax in Aetolia and Mount Parnassus. About this mountain dwell the Oresti themselves, the Timfue, and the Greeks outside the Isthmus that are in the neighborhood of Parnassus, Oita, and Pindus. As a whole, the mountain is called by a general name, Beum, but taken part by part, it has many names. People say that from the highest peaks one can see both the Aegean Sea and the Ambracian and Ionian Sea, but they exaggerate, I think. Mount Telium, also, is fairly high, it is situated around the Ambracian Gulf, extending on one side as far as the Corsirian country and on the other to the sea at Lucas. 8.7 Corsira is proverbially derided as a joke because it was humbled by its many wars. 8.8 Corsira in early times enjoyed a happy lot and had a very large naval force, but was ruined by certain wars and tyrants. And later on, although it was set free by the Romans, it got no commendation, but instead, as an object of reproach, got a proverb, Corsira is free, dung where thou wilt. 8.9 There remain of Europe, first, Macedonia and the parts of Thrace that are contiguous to it and extend as far as Byzantium, secondly, Greece, and thirdly, the islands that are close by. Macedonia, of course, is a part of Greece, yet now, since I am following the nature and shape of the places geographically, I have decided to classify it apart from the rest of Greece and to join it with that part of Thrace which borders on it and extends as far as the mouth of the Euxen and the Propontis. Then, a little further on, Strabo mentions Sipsala and the Nebrus River, and also describes a sort of parallelogram in which the whole of Macedonia lies. 8.10 Macedonia is bounded, first, on the west, by the coastline of the Adrius, secondly, on the east, by the meridian line which is parallel to this coastline and runs through the outlets of the Nebrus River and through the city Sipsala, thirdly, on the north, by the imaginary straight line which runs through the Bertiscus Mountain, the Scardus, the Orbalus, the Rhodope, and the Hemus, for these mountains, beginning at the Adrius, extend on a straight line as far as the Euxin, thus forming towards the south a great peninsula which comprises Thrace together with Macedonia, Epirus, and Achaea, and fourthly, on the south, by the Ignatian Road, which runs from the city Dyrrhachium towards the east as far as Thessalonica. And thus the shape of Macedonia is very nearly that of a parallelogram. 8.11 What is now called Macedonia was in earlier times called Amathia. And it took its present name from Macedon, 
one of its early chieftains. And there was also a city Amadia close to the sea. Now a part of this country was taken and held by certain of the Aperotes and the Illyrians, but most of it by the Badi Ei and the Thracians. The Badi Ei came from Bred originally, so it is said, along with Button as chieftain. As for the Thracians, the Piers inhabited Pyeria and the region about Olympus, the Peones, the region on both sides of the Axius River, which on that account is called Amphaxitis, the Edni, and Bisalti, the rest of the country as far as the Strymon. Of these two peoples the latter are called Bisalti alone, whereas a part of the Edni are called Migdones, a part Adones, and a part Scythones. But of all these tribes the Argidae, as they are called, establish themselves as masters, and also the Chalcidians of Euboea. For the Chalcidians of Euboea also came over to the country of the Scythones and jointly peopled about thirty cities in it, although later on the majority of them were ejected and came together into one city, Olynthus, and they were named the Thracian Chalcidians. 11a, the ethnic of Batia is spelled with the I, according to Strabo in his seventh book. And the city is called after Button the Cretan. 11b, Amphaction. Two parts of speech. A city. The ethnic of Amphaction is Amphaxites. 8.12 The Peneus forms the boundary between Lower Macedonia, or that part of Macedonia which is close to the sea, and Thessaly and Magnesia, the Haliachman forms the boundary of Upper Macedonia, and the Haliachman also, together with the Arigon and the Axius and another set of rivers, form the boundary of the Aperotes and the Peonians. 12a, for if, according to the geographer, Macedonia stretches from the Thessalian Pelion and Peneus towards the interior as far as Peonia and the Aperot tribes, and if the Greeks had a Trojan allied force from Peonia, it is difficult to conceive that an allied force came to the Trojans from the aforesaid more distant part of Peonia. 8.13 of the Macedonian coastline, beginning at the recess of the Thermian Gulf and at Thessalonicea, there are two parts one extending towards the south as far as Sunio and the other towards the east as far as the Thracian Chersonese, thus forming at the recess a sort of angle. Since Macedonia extends in both directions, I must begin with the part first mentioned. The first portion, then, of this part I mean the region of Sunio has above it Attica together with the Megarian country as far as the Chrysian Gulf, after this is that Boeotian coastline which faces Euboea, and above this coastline lies the rest of Boeotia, extending in the direction of the west, parallel to Attica. And he says that the Ignatian road, also, beginning at the Ionian Sea, ends at Thessalonike. 8.14 As for the ribbon-like stretches of land, he says, I shall first mark off the boundary of the peoples who live in the one which is beside the sea near the Peneus and the Haliachman. Now the Peneus flows from the Pindus mountain through the middle of Thessaly towards the east, and after it passes through the cities of the Lapithi and some cities of the Peribians, it reaches Tempe, after having received the waters of several rivers, among which is the Europus, which the poet called Titerius, since it has its sources in the Titerius mountain the Titarius mountain joins Olympus, and thence Olympus begins to mark the boundary between Macedonia and Thessaly, for Tempe is a narrow glen between Olympus and Asa, and through these narrows the Peneus flows for a distance of forty stadia with Olympus, the loftiest mountain in Macedonia, on the left, and with Asa, near the outlets of the river, on the right. So then, Girton, the Peribian and Magneton city in which Perithus and Exion reigned, is situated near the outlets of the Peneus on the right and the city of Cranon lies at a distance of as much as 100 stadia from Girton, and writers say that when the poet says, Verily these twain from Thrace and what follows, he means by Ephri the Crananians and by Phlegi the Girtonians. But Pyria is on the other side of the Peneus. 8.15 The Peneus river rises in the Pindus mountain and flows through Tempe and through the middle of Thessaly and of the countries of the Lapithi and the Peribians, and also receives the waters of the Europus river, which Homer called Titerasius. It marks the boundary between Macedonia on the north and Thessaly on the south. But the source waters of the Europus rise in the Titerius mountain, which is continuous with Olympus. And Olympus belongs to Macedonia, whereas Asa and Pelion belong to Thessaly. 15a, the Peneus rises, according to the geographer, in that part of the Pindus mountain about which the Peribians live. And Strabo also makes the following statements concerning the Peneus. The Peneus rises in the Pindus, and leaving Trica on the left it flows around Atrax and Larissa, and after receiving the rivers in Thessaly passes on through Tempe. And he says that the Peneus flows through the center of Thessaly, receiving many rivers, and that in its course it keeps Olympus on the left and Asa on the right. And at its outlets, on the right, is a Magneton city, Girton, in which Perithus and Exion reigned, and not far from Girton is a city Cranon, whose citizens were called by a different name, Ephri, just as the citizens of Girton were called Phlegi. 8.16 Below the foothills of Olympus, along the Peneus River, lies Girton, the Peribian and Magneton city, in which Perithus and Exion ruled, 
and Cranon is at a distance of 100 stadia from Girton, and writers say that when the poet says, Verily these twain from Thrace, he means by Ephri the Crananians and by Phlegi the Girtonians. 16a, the city of Cranon is at a distance of 100 stadia from Girton, according to Strabo. 16b, Homilium, a city of Macedonia and Magnesia. Strabo in his seventh book. 16c, I have said in my description of Macedonia that Homilium is close to Asa and is where the Peneus, flowing through Tempe, begins to discharge its waters. 16d, there were several different Ephiras, if indeed the geographer counts as many as nine. 16e, he, the geographer, speaks of a city Girton, a magneton city near the outlets of the Peneus. 8.17 The city Diem, in the foothills of Olympus, is not on the shore of the Thermian Gulf, but is at a distance of as much as seven stadia from it. And the city Diem has a village nearby, Pimplia, where Orpheus lived. 8.18 At the base of Olympus is a city Diem. And it has a village nearby, Pimplia. Here lived Orpheus, the Siconian, it is said a wizard who at first collected money from his music, together with his soothsaying and his celebration of the orgies connected with the mystic initiatory rites, but soon afterwards thought himself worthy of still greater things and procured for himself a throng of followers and power. Some, of course, received him willingly, but others, since they suspected a plot and violence, combined against him and killed him. And near here, also, is Lebethra. 8.19 In the early times the soothsayers also practiced music. 8.20 After Diem come the outlets of the Haliachman, then Pidna, Methoni, Aloris, and the Arigon and Ludias rivers. The Arigon flows from the country of the Triclari through that of the Oresti and through Pelea, leaves the city on the left, and meets the Axius, the Ludias is navigable inland to Pella, a distance of 120 stadia. Methoni, which lies between the two cities, is about 40 stadia from Pidna and 70 from Aloris. Aloris is in the inmost recess of the Thermian Gulf, and it is called Thessalonicea because of its fame. Now Aloris is regarded as a Bataean city, whereas Pydna is regarded as a Pyrian. Pella belongs to Lower Macedonia, which the Bataea used to occupy, in early times the treasury of Macedonia was here. Philip enlarged it from a small city, because he was reared in it. It has a headland in what is called Lake Ludias, and it is from this lake that the Ludias River issues, and the lake itself is supplied by an offshoot of the Axius. The Axius empties between Shalastra and Therma, and on this river lies a fortified place which now is called Abaddon, though Homer calls it a midden, and says that the Peonians went to the aid of Troy from there, from afar, out of a midden, from wide flowing Axius. The place was destroyed by the Argidi. 8.21 The Axius is a muddy stream, but Homer calls it water most fair, perhaps on account of the spring called Ea, which, since it empties purest water into the Axius, proves that the present current reading of the passage in the poet is faulty. After the Axius, at a distance of 20 stadia, is the Eschadorus, then, 40 stadia farther on, Thessalonicea, founded by Cassander, and also the Ignatian Road. Cassander named the city after his wife Thessalonis, daughter of Philip son of Amentus, after he had raised to the ground the towns in Cruces and those on the Thermian Gulf, about 26 in number, and had settled all the inhabitants together in one city, and this city is the metropolis of what is now Macedonia. Among those included in the settlement were Apollonia, Shalastra, Therma, Gariscus, Aenea, and Sissus, and of these one might suspect that Sissus belonged to Sissus, whom the poet mentions in speaking of Iphidamus, whom Sissus reared. 8.22 After the city Diem comes the Haliachman River, which empties into the Thermian Gulf. And the part after this, the seaboard of the gulf towards the north as far as the Axius River, is called Pyria, in which is the city Pydna, now called Sidrum. Then come the cities Methoni and Aloris. Then the rivers Arigon and Ludias, and from Ludias to the city of Pella the river is navigable, a distance of 120 stadia. Methoni is 40 stadia distant from Pydna and 70 stadia from Aloris. Now Pydna is a Pyrian city, whereas Aloris is Bataean. Now it was in the plain before Pydna that the Romans defeated Perseus in war and destroyed the kingdom of the Macedonians, and it was in the plain before Methoni that Philip the son of Amentus, during the siege of the city, had the misfortune to have his right eye knocked out by a bolt from a catapult. 8.23 As for Pella, though it was formerly small, Philip greatly enlarged it, because he was reared in it. It has a lake before it, and it is from this lake that the Ludias River flows, and the lake is supplied by an offshoot of the Axius. Then the Axius, dividing both Bataea and the land called Amphaxitis, and receiving the Arigon River, discharges its waters between Shalastra and Therma. And on the Axius River lies the place which Homer calls a midden, saying that the Peonians went to the aid of Troy from there, from afar, out of a midden, from wide-flowing Axius. 
But since the axius is muddy and since a certain spring rises in a midden and mingles water most fair with it, therefore the next line, axius, whose water most fair is spread or ia, is changed to read thus, axius, or which is spread ia's water most fair, for it is not the water most fair of the axius that is spread over the face of the earth, but that of the spring or the axius. 8.24 After the Axius River comes Thessalonica, a city which in earlier times was called Therma. It was founded by Cassander, who named it after his wife, the daughter of Philip the son of Amentus. And he transferred to it the towns in the surrounding country, as, for instance, Shalastra, Aenea, Sissus, and also some others. And one might suspect that it was from this Sissus that Homer's Iphidamus came, whose grandfather Sisius reared him, Homer says, in Thrace, which now is called Macedonia. 8.25 Mount Bermium, also, is somewhere in this region. In earlier times it was occupied by Bridges, a tribe of Thracians, some of these crossed over into Asia and their name was changed to Phrygis. After Thessalonica come the remaining parts of the Thermian Gulf as far as Canastron, this is a headland which forms a peninsula and rises opposite to Magnetus. The name of the peninsula is Polini, and it has an isthmus five stadia in width, through which a canal is cut. On the isthmus is situated a city founded by the Corinthians, which in earlier times was called Potidaea, although later on it was called Cassandria, after the same king Cassander, who restored it after it had been destroyed. The distance by sea around this peninsula is 570 stadia. And further, writers say that in earlier times the giants lived here and that the country was named Phlegra. The stories of some are mythical, but the account of others is more plausible for they tell of a certain barbarous and impious tribe which occupied the place but was broken up by Heracles when, after capturing Troy, be sailed back to his homeland. And here, too, the Trojan women were guilty of their crime, it is said, when they set the ships on fire in order that they might not be slaves to the wives of their captors. 8.26 The city Baroia lies in the foothills of Mount Bermium. 8.27 The peninsula Polini, on whose isthmus is situated the city formerly called Potidaea and now Cassandria, was called Phlegra in still earlier times. It used to be inhabited by the giants of whom the myths are told, an impious and lawless tribe, whom Heracles destroyed. It has four cities, Aphidus, Mend, Scione, Sane. 27a, the Skepsian apparently accepts the opinion neither of this man nor of those who suppose them to be the Elizoni near Polini, whom I have mentioned in my description of Macedonia. 8.28 Olynthus was 70 stadia distant from Potidaea. 8.29 The naval station of Olynthus is Macyperna, on the Tyranian Gulf. 8.30 Near Olynthus is a hollow place which is called Cantharolethron from what happens there, for when the insect called the Cantharos, which is found all over the country, touches that place, it dies. 8.31 After Cassandria, in order, comes the remainder of the seaboard of the Tyranian Gulf, extending as far as Darius. Darius is a headland that rises opposite to Canastron and forms the Gulf, and directly opposite Darius, towards the east, are the Capes of Athos, and between is the Singitic Gulf, which is named after Singus, the ancient city that was on it, now in ruins. After this city comes Acanthus, a city situated on the Isthmus of Athos, it was founded by the Andri, and from it many call the Gulf the Acanthian Gulf. 8.32 Opposite Canistrum, a Cape of Polini, is Darius, a headland near Kofus Harbour, and these two mark off the limits of the Tyranian Gulf. And towards the east, again, lies the Cape of Athos, which marks off the limit of the Singitic Gulf. And so the gulfs of the Aegean Sea lie in order, though at some distance from one another, towards the north, as follows, the Maliac, the Pagasitic, the Thermian, the Tyranian, the Singitic, the Strymonic. The capes are, first, Poseidium, the one between the Maliac and the Pagasitic, secondly, the next one towards the north, Sepias, then the one on Polini, Canistrum, then Darius, then come Nymphaean, on Athos on the Singitic Gulf, and Acrathos, the cape that is on the Strymonic Gulf, Mount Athos is between these two capes, and Lemnos is to the east of Mount Athos, on the north, however, the limit of the Strymonic Gulf is marked by Neapolis. 8.33 Acanthus, a city on the Singitic Gulf, is on the coast near the canal of Xerxes. Athos has five cities, Diem, Clenai, Thesis, Olifixes, Acrothoi, and Acrothoi is near the crest of Athos. Mount Athos is breast-shaped, has a very sharp crest, and is very high, since those who live on the crest see the sun rise three hours before it rises on the seaboard. And the distance by sea around the peninsula from the city Acanthus as far as Stagirus, the city of Aristotle, is 400 stadia. On this coast is a harbour, Capris by name, and also an awe with the same name as the harbour. Then come the outlets of the Strymon, then Figures, Galepsis, Apollonia, all cities, 
Then the mouth of the Nestus, which is the boundary between Macedonia and Thrace is fixed by Philip and his son Alexander in their times. There is also another set of cities about the Strymonic Gulf, as, for instance, Mersinus, Argilus, Drabescus, and Datum. The last named has not only excellent and fruitful soil but also dockyards and gold mines, and hence the proverb, a datum of good things, like that other proverb, spools of good things. 8.34 There are very many gold mines in Cronides, where the city Philippi now is situated, near Mount Pangaean. And Mount Pangaean as well has gold and silver mines, as also the country across, and the country this side, the Strymon River as far as Peonia. And it is further said that the people who plough the Peonian land find nuggets of gold. 8.35 Mount Athos is high and breast-shaped, so high that on its crest the sun is up and the people are weary of ploughing by the time Cockro begins among the people who live on the shore. It was on this shore that Phamirus the Thracian reigned, who was a man of the same pursuits as Orpheus. Here, too, is to be seen a canal, in the neighbourhood of Acanthus, where Xerxes dug a canal across Athos, it is said, and, by admitting the sea into the canal, brought his fleet across from the Strymonic Gulf through the Isthmus. Demetrius of Skepsis, however, does not believe that this canal was navigable, for, he says, although as far as ten stadia the ground is deep soiled and can be dug, and in fact a canal one plethrum in width has been dug, yet after that it is a flat rock, almost a stadium in length, which is too high and broad to admit of being quarried out through the whole of the distance as far as the sea, but even if it were dug thus far, certainly it could not be dug deep enough to make a navigable passage, this, he adds, is where Alexarchus, the son of Antipater, laid the foundation of Aronopolis, with its circuit of thirty stadia. Some of the Pulaski from Lemnos took up their abode on this peninsula, and they were divided into five cities, Clenai, Olifixes, Acrothoi, Diem, Thysus. After Athos comes the Strymonic Gulf extending as far as the Nestus, the river which marks off the boundary of Macedonia as fixed by Philip and Alexander. To be accurate, however, there is a cape which with Athos forms the Strymonic Gulf, I mean the cape which has had on it a city called Apollonia. The first city on this gulf after the harbour of the Acanthians is Stagira, the native city of Aristotle, now deserted, this too belongs to the Chalcidians and so do its harbour, Capris, and an all bearing the same name as the harbour. Then come the Strymon and the inland voyage of twenty stadia to Amphipolis. Amphipolis was founded by the Athenians and is situated in that place which is called Eniahadoi. Then come Galepsis and Apollonia, which were raised to the ground by Philip. 8.36 From the Peneus, he says, to Pydna is 120 stadia. Along the seaboard of the Strymon and the Dotany are, not only the city Neapolis, but also Datum itself, with its fruitful plains, lake, rivers, dockyards, and profitable gold mines, and hence the proverb, a datum of good things, like that other proverb, spools of good things. Now the country that is on the far side of the Strymon, I mean that which is near the sea and those places that are in the neighbourhood of Datum, is the country of the Odamons and the Edni and the Bisalti, both those who are indigenous and those who crossed over from Macedonia, amongst whom Rhesus reigned. Above Amphipolis, however, and as far as the city Heraclea, is the country of the Bisalti, with its fruitful valley, this valley is divided into two parts by the Strymon, which has its source in the country of the Agrianes who live round about Rhodope, and alongside this country lies Perabilia, a district of Macedonia, which has in its interior, along the valley that begins at Idomeni, the cities Calipolis, Orthopolis, Philippopolis, Gariscus. If one goes up the Strymon, one comes to Berg, it, too, is situated in the country of the Bisalti, and is a village about 200 stadia distant from Amphipolis. And if one goes from Heraclea towards the north and the narrows through which the Strymon flows, keeping the river on the right, one has Peonia and the region round about Doberus, Rhodope, and the Hemus mountain on the left, whereas on the right one has the region round about the Hemus. This side the Strymon are Scotusa, near the river itself, and Arethusa, near Lake Balbi. Furthermore, the name Migdones is applied especially to the people round about the lake. Not only the Axius flows out of the country of the Peonians, but also the Strymon, for it flows out of the country of the Agrianes through that of the Medi and Sindi and empties into the parts that are between the Bisalti and the Odamots. 8.37 The Strymon River rises in the country of the Agrianes who live round about Rhodope. 8.38 Some represent the Peonians as colonists from the Phrygians, while others represent them as independent founders. And it is said that Peonia has extended as far as Pelagonia and Pyuria, that Pelagonia was called Arestia in earlier times, that Asteropaeus, one of the leaders who made the expedition from Peonia to Troy, was not without good reason called son of Pelagon, and that the Peonians themselves were called Pelagonians. 8.39 The Homeric Asteropaeus son of Pelagon was, as history tells us, 
from Peonia and Macedonia, where for son of Pelagon, for the Peonians were called Pelagonians. 8.40 Since the Peonismos of the Thracians is called Titanismus by the Greeks, in imitation of the cry uttered in Peons, the Titans too were called Pelagonians. 8.41 It is clear that in early times, as now, the Peonians occupied much of what is now Macedonia, so that they could not only lay siege to Perinthus but also bring under their power all Crestonia and Migdanus and the country of the Agrianes as far as Pangorum. Philippi and the region about Philippi lie above that part of the seaboard of the Strymonic Gulf which extends from Galepsis as far as Nestus. In earlier times Philippi was called Cronides, and was only a small settlement, but it was enlarged after the defeat of Brutus and Cassius. 8.42 What is now the city Philippi was called Cronides in early times. 8.43 Off this seaboard lie two islands, Lemnos and Thassos. And after the Strait of Thassos one comes to Abdera and the scene of the myths connected with Abderus. It was inhabited by the Bystonian Thracians over whom Diomedes ruled. The Nestus River does not always remain in the same bed, but oftentimes floods the country. Then come Dicea, a city situated on a gulf, and a harbour. Above these lies the Bystonies, a lake which has a circuit of about 200 stadia. It is said that, because this plain was altogether a hollow and lower than the sea, Heracles, since he was inferior in horse when he came to get the mares of Diomedes, dug a canal through the shore and let in the water of the sea upon the plain and thus mastered his adversaries. One is shown also the royal residence of Diomedes, which, because of its naturally strong position and from what is actually the case, is called Cartera Cum. After the lake, which is midway between, come Xanthia, Moronea, and Ismarus, the cities of the Sicones. Ismarus, however, is now called Asmara, it is near Moronea. And near here, also, Lake Asmari sends forth its stream, this stream is called Odysseum. And here, too, are what are called the Thasian Cephali. But the people situated in the interior are Sawe. 8.44 Tapera is near Abdera and Moronea. 44a, the aforesaid Ismarus, in later times called Asmara, is, they say, a city of the Sicones, it is near Moronea, where is also a lake, the stream of which is called Odysseum. Here too is a hero sanctuary of Marin, as the geographer records. 8.45 The Sinti, a Thracian tribe, inhabit the island Lemnos, and from this fact Homer calls them Sintis, when he says, Where meet the Sintis? 45a, Lemnos, first settled by the Thracians who were called Sintis, according to Strabo. 8.46 After the Nestus River, towards the east, is the city Abdera, named after Abderus, whom the horses of Diomedes devoured. Then, nearby, the city Picia, above which lies a great lake, by Stonies, then the city Moronia. 8.47 Thrace as a whole consists of 22 tribes. But although it has been devastated to an exceptional degree, it can send into the field 15,000 cavalry and also 200,000 infantry. After Moronia one comes to the city Orthogoria and to the region about Sirium, a rough coasting voyage, and to Tempira, the little town of the Samothracians, and to Karakoma, another little town off which lies the island Samothrace, and to Imbros, which is not very far from Samothrace. Thassos, however, is more than twice as far from Samothrace as Imbros is. From Karakoma one comes to Doriscus, where Xerxes enumerated his army, then to the Hebrus, which is navigable inland to Sipsala, a distance of 120 stadia. This, he says, was the boundary of the Macedonia which the Romans first took away from Perseus and afterwards from the Pseudo-Philip. Now Paulus, who captured Perseus, annexed the Aparotic tribes to Macedonia, divided the country into four parts for purposes of administration, and apportioned one part to Amphipolis, another to Thessalonicea, another to Pella, and another to the Pelagonians. Along the Hebrus live the Corpeli, and, still farther up the river, the Brenne, and then, farther most of all, the Bessai, for the river is navigable thus far. All these tribes are given to brigandage, but most of all the Bessai, who, he says, are neighbours to the Odrysi and the Sawe. Busy was the royal residence of the Este. The term Odrysi is applied by some to all the peoples living above the seaboard from the Hebrus and Sipsala as far as Odessus the peoples over whom Amidicus, Circebleps, Barisades, Soothes, and Cotus reigned as kings. 47a, Odrysi, a tribe of Thrace, Strabo in his seventh book. 47b, the geographer, in pointing out the great extent of Thrace, says also that Thrace as a whole consists of 22 tribes. 8.48 The river in Thrace that is now called Reginia used to be called Arigon. 8.49 Iasian and Dardanus, two brothers, used to live in Samothrace. But when Iasian was struck by a thunderbolt because of his sin against Demeter, Dardanus sailed away from Samothrace, 
went and took up his abode at the foot of Mount Ida, calling the city Dardania, and taught the Trojans the Samothracian mysteries. In earlier times, however, Samothrace was called Samos. 8.50 Many writers have identified the gods that are worshipped in Samothrace with the Kaberi, though they cannot say who the Kaberi themselves are, just as the Serbants and Koribants, and likewise the Curides and the Idaean Dactyli, are identified with them. This Thracian island, according to the geographer, is called Samos because of its height, for Sama, he says, means heights. And the geographer says that in olden times Samians from Mikali settled in the island, which had been deserted because of a dearth of crops, and that in this way it was called Samos. And the geographer records also that in earlier times Samothrace was called Melidi, as also that it was rich, for Cilician pirates, he says, secretly broke into the sanctuary in Samothrace, robbed it, and carried off more than a thousand talents. 8.51 Near the outlet of the Hebrus, which has two mouths, lies the city Enos, on the Melis Gulf, it was founded by Mytilenians and Cumaeans, though in still earlier times by Alapecanzians. Then comes Cape Sarpedon, then what is called the Thracian Chersonesus, which forms the Propontis and the Melis Gulf and the Hellespont, for it is a cape which projects towards the southeast, thus connecting Europe with Asia by the strait, seven stadia wide, which is between Abydus and Cestus, and thus having on the left the Propontis and on the right the Melis Gulf so called, just as Herodotus and Eutyxus say, from the Melis River which empties into it. But Herodotus, he says, states that this stream was not sufficient to supply the army of Xerxes. The aforesaid cape is closed in by an isthmus forty stadia wide. Now in the middle of the isthmus is situated the city Lysmachia, named after the king who founded it, and on either side of it lies a city on the Melis Gulf, Cardia, the largest of the cities on the Chersonesus, founded by Milesians and Clasomenians but later refounded by Athenians, and on the Propontis, Pacti. And after Cardia come Drabus and Limni, then Alapeconesus, in which the Melis Gulf comes approximately to an end, then the large headland, Mazusia, then, on a gulf, Ilias, where is the sanctuary of Protesilaus, opposite which, forty stadia distant, is Sigaeum, a headland of the Trode, and this is about the most southerly extremity of the Chersonesus, being slightly more than four hundred stadia from Cardia, and if one sails around the rest of the circuit, towards the other side of the isthmus, the distance is slightly more than this. 51a, Enos, a city of Thrace, called Absinthus. Strabo in his seventh book. The city Enos is in the outlet of the Hebrus, which has two mouths, and was founded by Cumaeans, and it was so called because there was an Aeneas river and also a village of the same name near Asa. 8.52 The Thracian Chersonesus forms three seas, the Propontis in the north, the Hellespont in the east, and the Melis Gulf in the south, into which empties the Melis River, which bears the same name as the Gulf. 8.53 On the isthmus of the Chersonesus are situated three cities, near the Melis Gulf, Cardia, and near the Propontis, Pacti, and near the middle, Lysimachia. The length of the isthmus is 40 stadia. 8.54 The name of the city Elias is masculine, and perhaps also that of the city Trapezus. 8.55 On this voyage along the coast of the Chersonesus after leaving Elias, one comes first to the entrance which leads through the narrows into the Propontis, and this entrance is called the beginning of the Hellespont. And here is the cape called the Sinish Sema, though some call it Hecabe Sema, and in fact her tomb is pointed out after one has doubled the cape. Then one comes to Matitus, and to Cape Cestus, where the pontoon bridge of Xerxes was built, and, after these, to Cestus. The distance from Elias to the place of the pontoon bridge is 170 stadia. After Cestus one comes to Egospotami, 80 stadia, a town which has been raised to the ground, where it is said, the stone fell at the time of the Persian War. Then comes Calipolis, from which the distance across to Lampsicus in Asia is 40 stadia. Then Crithote, a little town which has been raised to the ground, then Pacti, then Macron Ticos, Lusoct, Ieranoros, and Perinthus, founded by the Samians, then Salibria. Above these places lies Silta, and the Ieranoros is revered by all the natives and is a sort of acropolis of the country. The Ieranoros discharges asphalt into the sea, near the place where the Proconesus, only 120 stadia distant, is nearest to the land, and the quarry of white marble in the Proconesus is both large and excellent. After Salibria come the rivers Athyras and Bathynias, and then, Byzantium and the places which come in order thereafter as far as the Cyanean rocks. 55a, as for Cestus and the whole of the Chersonesus, I have already discussed them in my description of the regions of Thrace. 55b, Cestus, a colony of the Lesbians, as is also Matitus, as the geographer says, is a Chersonesian city 30 stadia distant from Abydus, from harbour to harbour. 8.56 The distance from Perinthus to Byzantium is 630 stadia 
but from the Hebrus and Sipsala to Byzantium, as far as the Cyanean rocks, 3,100, as Artemidorus says, and the entire distance from the Ionian Gulf at Apollonia as far as Byzantium is 7,320 stadia, though Polybius adds 180 more, since he adds a third of a stadium to the eight stadia in the mile. Demetrius of Skepsis, however, in his work on the marshalling of the Trojan forces calls the distance from Perinthus to Byzantium 600 stadia and the distance to Perium equal thereto, and he represents the Propontis as 1,400 stadia in length and 500 in breadth, while as for the Hellespont, he calls its narrowest breadth 7 stadia and its length 400. 8.57 There is no general agreement in the definition of the term Hellespont, in fact, there are several opinions concerning it. For some writers call Hellespont the whole of the Propontis, others, that part of the Propontis which is this side parenthes, others go on to add that part of the outer sea which faces the Melis Gulf and the open waters of the Aegean Sea, and these writers in turn each comprise different sections in their definitions, some the part from Sigaeum to Lampsicus and Sisychus, or Perium, or Priapus, another going on to add the part which extends from Sigrium and the Lesbian Isle. And some do not shrink even from applying the name Hellespont to the whole of the high sea as far as the Myrtoan Sea, since, as Pindar says in his hymns, those who were sailing with Heracles from Troy through Hell's maidenly strait, on touching the Myrtoan Sea, ran back again to Kos, because Zephyrus blew contrary to their course. And in this way, also, they require that the whole of the Aegean Sea as far as the Thermian Gulf and the sea which is about Thessaly and Macedonia should be called Hellespont, invoking Homer also as witness, for Homer says, Thou shalt see, if thou dost wish and hast to care therefore, my ships sailing or the fishy Hellespont at very early morn. Book 8. 1.1 Akarnania I began my description by going over all the western parts of Europe comprised between the inner and the outer sea, and now that I have encompassed in my survey all the barbarian tribes in Europe as far as the Tanais and also a small part of Greece, Macedonia, I now shall give an account of the remainder of the geography of Greece. This subject was first treated by Homer, and then, after him, by several others, some of whom have written special treatises entitled Harbors, or Coasting Voyages, or General Descriptions of the Earth, or the like, and in these is comprised also the description of Greece. Others have set forth the topography of the continents in separate parts of their general histories, for instance, Ephorus and Polybius. Still others have inserted certain things on this subject in their treatises on physics and mathematics, for instance, Poseidonius and Hipparchus. Now although the statements of the others are easy to pass judgment upon, yet those of Homer require critical inquiry, since he speaks poetically, and not of things as they now are, but of things as they were in antiquity which for the most part have been obscured by time. Be this as it may, as far as I can I must undertake the inquiry, and I shall begin where I left off. My account ended, on the west and the north, with the tribes of the Aperotes and of the Illyrians, and, on the east, with those of the Macedonians as far as Byzantium. After the Aperotes and the Illyrians, then, come the following peoples of the Greeks, the Acarnanians, the Aetolians, and the Ozolian Locrians, and, next, the Phocians and Boeotians and opposite these, across the arm of the sea, is the Peloponnesus, which with these encloses the Corinthian Gulf, and not only shapes the Gulf but also is shaped by it, and after Macedonia, the Thessalians, extending as far as the Malians, and the countries of the rest of the peoples outside the Isthmus, three is also of those inside. 1.2 There have been many tribes in Greece, but those which go back to the earliest times are only as many in number as the Greek dialects which we have learned to distinguish. But though the dialects themselves are four in number, we may say that the Ionic is the same as the ancient Attic, for the Attic people of ancient times were called Ionians, and from that stock sprang those Ionians who colonized Asia and used what is now called the Ionic speech, and we may say that the Doric dialect is the same as the Ialic, for all the Greeks outside the Isthmus, except the Athenians and the Megarians and the Dorians who live about Parnassus, are to this day still called Aeolians. And it is reasonable to suppose that the Dorians too, since they were few in number and lived in a most rugged country, have, because of their lack of intercourse with others, changed their speech and their other customs to the extent that they are no longer a part of the same tribe as before. And this was precisely the case with the Athenians, that is, they lived in a country that was both thin-soiled and rugged, and for this reason, according to Thucydides, five their country remained free from devastation, and they were regarded as an indigenous people, who always occupied the same country, since no one drove them out of their country or even desired to possess it. This, therefore, as one may suppose, was precisely the cause of their becoming different both in speech and in customs, albeit they were few in number. And just as the Aeolic element predominated in the parts outside the Isthmus, so too the people inside the Isthmus were in earlier times Aeolians, and then they became mixed with other peoples, since, in the first place, Ionians from Attica seized the Aegilus, and, secondly, 
the Heraclidae brought back the Dorians, who founded both Megara and many of the cities of the Peloponnesus. The Ionians, however, were soon driven out again by the Achaeans, an Aeolic tribe, and so there were left in the Peloponnesus only the two tribes, the Aeolian and the Dorian. Now all the peoples who had less intercourse with the Dorians as was the case with the Arcadians and with the Eleans, since the former were holy mountaineers and had no share in the allotments of territory, while the latter were regarded as sacred to the Olympian Zeus and hence have long lived to themselves in peace, especially because they belonged to the Aeolic stock and had admitted the army which came back with Oxalus aid about the time of the return of the Heraclidae these peoples, I say, spoke the Aeolic dialect, whereas the rest used a sort of mixture of the two, some leaning more to the Aeolic and some less. And, I might almost say, even now the people of each city speaks a different dialect, although, because of the predominance which has been gained by the Dorians, one and all are reputed to speak the Doric. Such, then, are the tribes of the Greeks, and such in general terms is their ethnographical division. Let me now take them separately, following the appropriate order, and tell about them. 1.3 Ephorus says that, if one begins with the western parts, Akarnania is the beginning of Greece, for, he adds, Akarnania is the first to border on the tribes of the Aparotes. But just as Ephorus, using the sea coast as his measuring line, begins with Akarnania, for he decides in favor of the sea as a kind of guide in his description of places, because otherwise he might have represented parts that border on the land of the Macedonians and the Thessalians as the beginning, so it is proper that I too, following the natural character of the regions, should make the sea my counselor. Now this sea, issuing forth out of the Sicilian Sea, on one side stretches to the Corinthian Gulf, and on the other forms a large peninsula, the Peloponnesus, which is closed by a narrow isthmus. Thus Greece consists of two very large bodies of land, the part inside the isthmus, and the part outside, which extends through Pylae as far as the outlet of the Peneus, this latter is the Thessalian part of Greece, but the part inside the isthmus is both larger and more famous. I might almost say that the Peloponnesus is the Acropolis of Greece as a whole, for, apart from the splendor and power of the tribes that have lived in it, the very topography of Greece, diversified as it is by gulfs, many capes, and, what are the most significant, large peninsulas that follow one another in succession, suggests such hegemony for it. The first of the peninsulas is the Peloponnesus which is closed by an isthmus 40 stadia in width. The second includes the first, and its isthmus extends in width from Pegae and Megaris to Nisaea, the naval station of the Megarians, the distance across being 120 stadia from sea to sea. The third likewise includes the second, and its isthmus extends in width from the recess of the Chrysian Gulf as far as Thermopylae the imaginary straight line, about 508 stadia in length, enclosing within the peninsula the whole of Boeotia and cutting obliquely Phocis and the country of the Epignomidians. The fourth is the peninsula whose isthmus extends from the Ambracian Gulf through Oita and Trachinia to the Maliac Gulf and Thermopylae the isthmus being about 800 stadia in width. But there is another isthmus, more than 1,000 stadia in width, extending from the same Ambracian Gulf through the countries of the Thessalians and the Macedonians to the recess of the Thermian Gulf. So then, the succession of the peninsulas suggests a kind of order, and not a bad one, for me to follow in my description, and I should begin with the smallest, but most famous, of them. 2.1 Now the Peloponnesus is like a leaf of a plane tree in shape, its length and breadth being almost equal, that is, about 1400 stadia. Its length is reckoned from the west to the east, that is, from Chelonatus through Olympia and Megalopolis to the Isthmus, and its width, from the south towards the north, that is, from Mali through Arcadia to Aegean. The perimeter, not following the sinuosities of the gulfs, is 4000 stadia, according to Polybius, although Artemidorus adds 400 more, but following the sinuosities of the gulfs, it is more than 5600. The width of the Isthmus at the Dialcus, where the ships are hauled over land from one sea to the other, is 40 stadia, as I have already said. 2.2 The western part of this peninsula is occupied by the Eleans and the Messenians, whose countries are washed by the Sicilian Sea. In addition, they also hold a part of the seacoast in both directions, for the Elian country curves towards the north and the beginning of the Corinthian Gulf as far as Cape Araxis, opposite which, across the straits, lie Akarnania and the islands off its coast Zacynthos, Cephalonia, Ithaca, and also the Echinades, among which is Dulichium, whereas the greater part of the Messenian country opens up towards the south and the Libyan Sea as far as what is called Thyrides, near Tynarum. Next after the Elian country comes the tribe of the Achaeans, whose country faces towards the north and stretches along the Corinthian Gulf, ending at Sicyonia. Then come in succession Sicyon and Corinth, the territory of the latter extending as far as the Isthmus. After the Messenian country come the Laconian and the Argive, the latter also extending as far as the Isthmus. The gulfs on this coast are, 
first, the Messinian, second, the Laconian, third, the Argolic, fourth, the Hermionic, and fifth, the Saronic, by some called the Salaminiac. Of these gulfs the first two are filled by the Libyan Sea, and the others by the Cretan and Myrtoan Seas. Some, however, call the Saronic Gulf Strait or Sea. In the interior of the peninsula is Arcadia, which touches as next door neighbor the countries of all those other tribes. 2.3 The Corinthian Gulf begins, on the one side, at the outlets of the Avenus, though some say at the outlets of the Achelous, the river that separates the Acarnanians and the Aetolians, and, on the other, at Araxis, for here the shores on either side first draw notably nearer to one another, then in their advance they all but meet at Rium and Anarium, where they leave between them a strait only about five stadia in width. Rium, belonging to the Achaeans, is a low-lying cape, it bends inwards, and it is in fact called Sickle. It lies between Patri and Aegium, and possesses a sanctuary of Poseidon. Antrium is situated on the common boundary of Aetolia and Locris, and people call it Malikrian Rium. Then, from here, the shoreline on either side again draws moderately apart, and then, advancing into the Chrysian Gulf, it comes to an end there, being shut in by the westerly limits of Boeotia and Megaris. The perimeter of the Corinthian Gulf if one measures from the Avenus to Araxis, is 2,230 stadia, but if one measures from the Achelous, it is about a hundred stadia more. Now from the Achelous to the Avenus the coast is occupied by Acarnanians, and thence to Antrium, by Aetolians, but the remaining coast, as far as the Isthmus, belongs to the Phocians, the Boeotians and Megaris a distance of 1,118 stadia. The sea from Antrium as far as the Isthmus is called Alcyonian, it being a part of the Chrysian Gulf. Again, from the Isthmus to Araxis the distance is 1,030 stadia. Such, then, in general terms, is the position and extent of the Peloponnesus, and of the land that lies opposite to it across the arm of the sea as far as the recess, and such, too, is the character of the gulf that lies between the two bodies of land. Now I shall describe each part in detail, beginning with the Elian country. 3.1 Elia at the present time the whole of the seaboard that lies between the countries of the Achaeans and the Messenians, and extends inland to the Arcadian districts of Philoe, of the Azanes, and of the Parasians, is called the Elian country. But in early times this country was divided into several domains, and afterwards into two that of the Apaeans and that under the rule of Nestor the son of Neleus, just as Homer, too, states, when he calls the land of the Apaeans by the name of Elis, and past goodly Elis, where the Apaeans hold sway, and the land under the rule of Nestor, Pilus, through which, he says, the Alpius flows, of the Alpius, that floweth in wide stream through the land of the Pylians. Of course Homer also knew of Pylus as a city, and they reached Pylus, the well-built city of Nestor, but the Alpius does not flow through the city, nor past it either, in fact, another river flows past it, a river which some call Pamasus and others Amethus, whence, apparently, the epithet Amathaes which has been applied to this Pylus, but the Alpius flows through the Pylian country. 3.2 What is now the city of Elis had not yet been founded in Homer's time, in fact, the people of the country lived only in villages. And the country was called Coel Elis from the fact in the case, for the most and best of it was Coel. It was only relatively late, after the Persian Wars, that people came together from many communities into what is now the city of Elis. And I might almost say that, with only a few exceptions, the other Peloponnesian places named by the poet were also named by him, not as cities, but as countries, each country being composed of several communities, from which in later times the well-known cities were settled. For instance, in Arcadia, Mantinea was settled by Argive colonists from five communities, and Tegea from nine, and also Horea from nine, either by Cleombrotus or by Cleonymus. And in the same way the city Aegeum was made up of seven or eight communities, the city Patri of seven, and the city Dime of eight. And in this way the city Elis was also made up of the communities of the surrounding country, one of these, the Agriades. The Peneus River flows through the city past the gymnasium. And the Eleans did not make this gymnasium until a long time after the districts that were under Nestor had passed into their possession. 3.3 These districts were Pisidus, of which Olympia was a part, Trifolia, and the country of the Cauconians. The Trifolians were so called from the fact that three tribes of people had come together in that country that of the Apaeans, who were there at the outset, and that of the Minyans, who later settled there, and that of the Eleans, who last dominated the country but some name the Arcadians in the place of the Minions, since the Arcadians had often disputed the possession of the country, and hence the same Pylus was called both Arcadian Pylus and Trifolian Pylus. Homer calls this whole country as far as Messene Pylus, giving it the same name as the city. 
but Coel Elis was distinct from the places subject to Nestor, as is shown in the catalogue of ships by the names of the chieftains and of their abodes. I say this because I am comparing present conditions with those described by Homer, for we must needs institute this comparison because of the fame of the poet and because of our familiarity with him from our childhood, since all of us believe that we have not successfully treated any subject which we may have in hand until there remains in our treatment nothing that conflicts with what the poet says on the same subject, such confidence do we have in his words. Accordingly, I must give conditions as they now are, and then, citing the words of the poet, in so far as they bear on the matter, take them also into consideration. 3.4 In the Elian country, on the north, is a cape, Araxis, sixty stadia distant from Dime, an Achaean city. This cape, then, I put down as the beginning of the seaboard of the Elians. After this cape, as one proceeds towards the west, one comes to the naval station of the Elians, Selene, from which there is a road leading inland to the present city Elis, a distance of 120 stadia. Homer, too, mentions this Selene when he says, Otis, a Selenian, a chief of the Apeans, for he would not have represented a chieftain of the Apeans as being from the Arcadian mountain. Selene is a village of moderate size, and it has the Asclepius made by Colotes an ivory image that is wonderful to behold. After Selene one comes to the promontory Chelonatus, the most westerly point of the Peloponnesus. Off Chelonatus lies an isle, and also some shallows that are on the common boundary between Coel Elis and the country of the Pisidae, and from here the voyage to Cephalonia is not more than eighty stadia. Somewhere in this neighborhood, on the aforesaid boundary line, there also flows the river Elison or Elisa. 3.5 It is between Chelonatus and Selene that the river Peneus empties, as also the river Celius, which is mentioned by the poet and flows out of Philoe. On the Celius is situated a city Ephora, which is to be distinguished from the Thesprotian, Thessalian, and Corinthian Ephyras. It is a fourth Ephora, and is situated on the road that leads to Lasian, being either the same city as Bonoa, for thus Oino is usually called, or else near that city, at a distance of 120 stadia from the city of the Eleans. This, apparently, is the Ephora which Homer calls the home of the mother of Lepolemus the son of Heracles, for the expeditions of Heracles were in this region rather than in any of the other three, when he says, whom he had brought out of Ephora, from the river Celius. And there is no river Celius near the other Ephyras. Again, he says of the corslet of Megas, this corslet Phileus once brought out of Ephora, from the river Celius. And thirdly, the man slaying drugs, for Homer says that Odysseus came to Ephora in search of a man slaying drug, that he might have wherewithal to smear his arrows, and in speaking of Telemachus the wooers say, or else he means to go to the fertile soil of Ephora, that from there he may bring deadly drugs, for Nestor, in his narrative of his war against the Apeans, introduces the daughter of Augeus, the king of the Apeans, as a mixer of drugs, I was the first that slew a man, even the spearman Mulius, he was a son-in-law of Augeus, having married his eldest daughter, and she knew all drugs that are nourished by the wide earth. But there is another river Celius near Sikian, and near the river a village Ephora. And in the Agrian district of Aetolia there is a village Ephora, its inhabitants are called Ephori. And there are still other Ephori, I mean the branch of the Peribians who live near Macedonia, the Cranonians, as also those Thesprotian Ephori of Sicyrus, which in earlier times was called Ephora. 3.6 Apollodorus, in teaching us how the poet is wont to distinguish between places of the same name, says that as the poet, in the case of Orcomenos, for instance, refers to the Arcadian Orcomenos as abounding in flocks and to the Boeotian Orcomenos as Minyan, and refers to Samos as the Thracian Samos by connecting it with a neighboring island, betwixt Samos and Imbros, in order to distinguish it from Ionian Samos so too, Apollodorus says, the poet distinguishes the Thesprotian Ephora both by the word distant and by the phrase from the river Celius. 5 In this, however, Apollodorus is not in agreement with what Demetrius of Skepsis says, from whom he borrows most of his material, for Demetrius says that there is no river Celius among the Thesprotians, but says that it is in the Elian country and flows past the Ephora there, as I have said before. In this statement, therefore, Apollodorus was in one of perception, as also in his statement concerning Oihalia, because, although Oihalia is the name of not merely one city, he says that there is only one city of Eurydice the Oechalian, namely, the Thessalian Oihalia, in reference to which Homer says, those that held Oihalia, city of Eurydice the Oechalian. What Oihalia, pray, was it from which Thamaris had set out when, near Dorium, the muses met Thamaris the Thracian and put a stop to his singing. For Homer adds, as he was on his way from Oihalia, from Eurydice the Oechalian. For if it was the Thessalian Oihalia, Demetrius of Skepsis is wrong again when he says that it was a certain Arcadian Oihalia, 
which is now called Andania, but if Demetrius is right, Arcadian Oihalia was also called City of Eurydice, and therefore there was not merely one Oihalia, but Apollodorus says that there was one only. 3.7 It was between the outlets of the Peneus and the Celius, near the Scalium, that Pilus was situated, not the city of Nestor, but another Pilus which has nothing in common with the Alpius, nor with the Pamasus, or Amethyst, if we should call it that. Yet there are some who do violence to Homer's words, seeking to win for themselves the fame and noble lineage of Nestor. 4. Since history mentions three Piluses in the Peloponnesus, as is stated in this verse, there is a Pilus in front of Pilus, yea, and there is still another Pilus, the Pilus in question, the Lepriatic Pilus in Triphalia and Pisidus, and a third, the Messenian Pilus near Coryphasium. The inhabitants of each try to show that the Pilus in their own country is a Mathais and declare that it is the native place of Nestor. However, most of the more recent writers, both historians and poets, say that Nestor was a Messenian, thus adding their support to the Pilus which has been preserved down to their own times. But the writers who follow the words of Homer more closely say that the Pilus of Nestor is the Pilus through whose territory the Alpius flows. And the Alpius flows through Pisidus and Triphalia. However, the writers from Coel Elis have not only supported their own Pilus with a similar zeal, but have also attached to it tokens of recognition, pointing out a place called Gerinus, a river called Gerone, and another river called Geranius, and then confidently asserting that Homer's epithet for Nestor, Gerenian, was derived from these. But the Messenians have done the selfsame thing, and their argument appears at least more plausible, for they say that their own Gerena is better known, and that it was once a populous place. Such, then, is the present state of affairs as regards Coel Elis. 3.8 But when the poet divides this country into four parts and also speaks of the leaders as four in number, his statement is not clear, and they too that inhabited both Buprasium and goodly Elis, so much thereof as is enclosed by Ermine and Mersinus on the borders, and by the Elenian rock and Elysium, of these men, I say, there were four leaders, and ten swift ships followed each leader, and many Apeans embarked thereon. For when he speaks of both the Buprasians and the Eleans as Apeans but without going on and calling the Buprasians Eleans, it would seem that he is not dividing the Elean country into four parts, but rather the country of the Apeans, which he had already divided into only two parts, and thus Buprasium would not be a part of Elis but rather of the country of the Apeans. For it is clear that he calls the Buprasians Apeans, as when the Apeans were burying Lord Amarensis at Buprasium. But Buprasium now appears to have been a territory of the Elean country, having in it a settlement of the same name which was also a part of Elis. And again, when he names the two together, saying both Buprasium and goodly Elis, and then divides the country into four parts, it seems as though he is classifying the four parts under the general designation both Buprasium and goodly Elis. It seems likely that at one time there was a considerable settlement by the name of Buprasium in the Elian country which is no longer in existence, indeed, only that territory which is on the road that leads to Dime from the present city of Elis is now so called and one might suppose that at that time Buprasium had a certain preeminence as compared with Elis, just as the Apeans had in comparison with the Eleans, but later on the people were called Eleans instead of Apeans. And though Buprasium was a part of Elis, they say that Homer, by a sort of poetic figure, names the part with the whole, as for instance when he says, throughout Hellas and Mid-Argos, and throughout Hellas and Thyia, and the Curetes fought and the Aetolians, and the men of Dulichium and the holy Echinades, for Dulichium is one of the Echinades. And more recent poets also use this figure, for instance, Hipponax, when he says, to those who have eaten the bread of the Cyprians and the wheaten bread of the Amethusians, for the Amethusians are also Cyprians, and Alcman, when he says, when she had left lovely Cyprus and Sigurd Paphos and Aeschylus, when he says, since thou dost possess the whole of Cyprus and Paphos as thine allotment. But if Homer nowhere calls the Buprasians Eleans, I will say that there are many other facts also that he does not mention, yet this is no proof that they are not facts, but merely that he has not mentioned them. 3.9 But Hecateus of Miletus says that the Apeans are a different people from the Eleans, that, at any rate, the Apeans joined Heracles in his expedition against Augeas and helped him to destroy both Augeas and Elis. And he says, further, that Dime is an Apean and an Achaean city. However, the early historians say many things that are not true, because they were accustomed to falsehoods on account of the use of myths in their writings, and on this account, too, they do not agree with one another concerning the same things. Yet it is not incredible that the Apeans, even if they were once at variance with the Eleans and belonged to a different race, later became united with the Eleans as the result of prevailing over them, and with them formed one common state, and that they prevailed even as far as Dime. For although the poet has not named Dime, it is not unreasonable to suppose that in his time Dime belonged to the Apeans, and later to the Ionians, or, if not to them, at all events to the Achaeans who took possession of their country. 
Of the four parts, inside which Buprasium is situated, only Ermine and Mersinus belong to the Elian country, whereas the remaining two are already on the frontiers of Pisidus, as some writers think. 3.10 Now Ermine was a small town. It is no longer in existence, but near Selene there is a mountain promontory called Hormina or Hyrmina. Mersinus is the present Mertentium, a settlement that extends down to the sea, and is situated on the road which runs from Dime into Elis, and is 70 stadia distant from the city of the Elians. The Elenian rock is surmised to be what is now called Scalus, for we are obliged to state what is merely probable, because both the places and the names have undergone changes, and because in many cases the poet does not make himself very clear. Scalus is a rocky mountain common to the territories of the Dimians, the Tritians, and the Elaeans, and borders on another Arcadian mountain called Lampia, which is 130 stadia distant from Elis, 100 from Tritia, and the same from Dime, the last two are Achaean cities. Elysium is the present Elysian, a territory in the neighborhood of Amphidolus, in which the people of the surrounding country hold a monthly market. It is situated on the mountain road that runs from Elis to Olympia. In earlier times it was a city of Pisidus, for the boundaries have varied at different times on account of the change of rulers. The poet also calls Elysium Hill of Elysium, when he says, until we caused our horses to set foot on Buprasium, rich in wheat, and on the Elenian rock, and of Elysium where is the place called Hill, we must interpret the words as a case of Hyperbaton, that is, as equivalent to and where is the place called Hill of Elysium. Some writers point also to a river Elysius. 3.11 Since certain people in Trifoli and near Messenia are called Cauconians, and since Dime also is called Cauconian by some writers, and since in the Dimian territory between Dime and Tritia there is also a river which is called Caucon, in the feminine gender, writers raise the question whether there are not two different sets of Cauconians, one in the region of Trifolia, and the other in the region of Dime, Elis, and the river Caucon. This river empties into another river which is called Tutheas, in the masculine gender, Tutheas has the same name as one of the little towns which were incorporated into Dime, except that the name of this town, Tuthea, is in the feminine gender, and is spelled without the S and with the last syllable long. In this town is the sanctuary of the Nemidian Artemis. The Tutheas empties into the Achaloas which flows by Dime and has the same name as the Acarnanian River. It is also called the Perus, by Hesiod, for instance, when he says, he dwelt on the Elenian rock along the banks of a river, wide Perus. Some change the reading to Pyrus, wrongly. They raise that question about the Cauconians, they say, because, when Athene in the guise of Mentor, in the Odyssey says to Nestor, but in the morning I will go to the great-hearted Cauconians, where a debt is due me, in no way new or small. But do thou send this man on his way with a chariot and with thy son, since he has come to thy house, and give him horses, the poet seems to designate a certain territory in the country of the Apaeans which was held by the Cauconians, these Cauconians being a different set from those in Trifolia and perhaps extending as far as the territory of Dime. Indeed, one should not fail to inquire both into the origin of the epithet of Dime, Cauconian, and into the origin of the name of the river Caucon, because the question who those Cauconians were to whom Athene says she is going in order to recover the debt offers a problem, for if we should interpret the poet as meaning the Cauconians in Trifolia near Leprium, I do not see how his account can be plausible. Hence some read, where a debt is due me in goodly Elis, no small one. But this question will be investigated with clearer results when I describe the country that comes next after this, I mean Pisidus and Trifolia as far as the borders of the country of the Messenians. 3.12 After Chelonatus comes the long seashore of the Pisatans, and then Cape Phia. And there was also a small town called Phia, beside the walls of Phia, about the streams of Yardinus, for there is also a small river nearby. According to some, Phia is the beginning of Pisidus. Off Phia lie a little island and a harbour, from which the nearest distance from the sea to Olympia is 120 stadia. Then comes another cape, Ichthus, which, like Chelonatus, projects for a considerable distance towards the west, and from it the distance to Cephalonia is again 120 stadia. Then comes the mouth of the Alpius, which is distant 280 stadia from Chelonatus, and 545 from Araxis. It flows from the same regions as the Eurotus, that is, from a place called Azia, a village in the territory of Megalopolis, where there are two springs near one another from which the rivers in question flow. They sink and flow beneath the earth for many stadia and then rise again, and then they flow down, one into Laconia and the other into Pisidus. The stream of the Eurotus reappears where the district called Bleminitus begins, and then flows past Sparta itself, traverses a long glen near Helus, a place mentioned by the poet, and empties between Jithium, the naval station of Sparta, and Acrea. But the Alpius, after receiving the waters of the Leyden, 
the Arimanthus, and other rivers of less significance, flows through Phrixa, Pisidus, and Trifolia past Olympia itself to the Sicilian Sea, into which it empties between Phia and Epitalium. Near the outlet of the river is the sacred precinct of Artemis Alpionia or Alpheusa, for the epithet is spelled both ways, which is about 80 stadia distant from Olympia. An annual festival is also celebrated at Olympia in honor of this goddess as well as in honor of Artemis Alaphia and Artemis Daphnia. The whole country is full of sanctuaries of Artemis, Aphrodite, and the nymphs, being situated in sacred precincts that are generally full of flowers because of the abundance of water. And there are also numerous shrines of Hermes on the roads, and sanctuaries of Poseidon on the shores. In the sanctuary of Artemis Alpionia are very famous paintings by two Corinthians, Cleanthes and Aragon, by Cleanthes the capture of Troy and the birth of Athene, and by Aragon the Artemis born aloft on a griffin. 3.13 Then comes the mountain of Trifolia that separates Macestia from Pisidus, then another river called Chalcis, and a spring called Cruni, and a settlement called Chalcis, and, after these, Samicum, where is the most highly revered sanctuary of the Samiac Poseidon. About the sanctuary is a sacred precinct full of wild olive trees. The people of Macestum used to have charge over it, and it was they, too, who used to proclaim the armistice day called Samiac. But all the Trifolians contribute to the maintenance of the sanctuary. 3.14 In the general neighborhood of these sanctuaries, above the sea, at a distance of 30 stadia or slightly more, is situated the Trifolian Pilus, also called the Lepriatic Pilus, which Homer calls Imathaes and transmits to posterity as the fatherland of Nestor, as one might infer from his words, whether it be that the river that flows past Pilus towards the north, now called Mamaus, or Arcadikos, was called Amethyst in earlier times, so that Pilus got its epithet Imathaes from Amethyst, or that this river was called Pamasus, the same as two rivers in Messenia, and that the derivation of the epithet of the city is uncertain, for it is false, they say, that either the river or the country about it is Amathodes. And also the sanctuary of Athene Silentia at Silas, in the neighborhood of Olympia near Felon, is one of the famous sanctuaries. Near Pylos, towards the east, is a mountain named after Minthe, who, according to myth, became the concubine of Hades, was trampled underfoot by Kor, and was transformed into garden mint, the plant which some call Hediosmos. Furthermore, near the mountain is a precinct sacred to Hades, which is revered by the Machistians too, and also a grove sacred to Demeter, which is situated above the Pylian plain. This plain is fertile, it borders on the sea and stretches along the whole distance between Samicum and the river Nata. But the shore of the sea is narrow and sandy, so that one could not refuse to believe that Pylos got its epithet Amathaes therefrom. 3.15 Towards the north, on the borders of Pylos, were two little Trifolian cities, Hypana and Tympanii, the former of these was incorporated into Elis, whereas the latter remained as it was. And further, two rivers flow near these places, the Dalian and the Acheron, both of them emptying into the Alpias. The Acheron has been so named by virtue of its close relation to Hades, for, as we know, not only the sanctuaries of Demeter and Kor have been held in very high honor there, but also those of Hades, perhaps because of the contrariness of the soil, to use the phrase of Demetrius of Skepsis. For while Trifolia brings forth good fruit, it breeds red rust and produces rush, and therefore in this region it is often the case that instead of a large crop there is no crop at all. 3.16 To the south of Pylos is Leprium. This city, too, was situated above the sea, at a distance of forty stadia, and between Leprium and the Aeneas is the sanctuary of the Samiac Poseidon, at a distance of one hundred stadia from each. This is the sanctuary at which the poet says Telemachus found the Pylians performing the sacrifice, and they came to Pylos, the well-built city of Neleus, and the people were doing sacrifice on the seashore, slaying bulls that were black all over, to the dark-haired earth shaker. Now it is indeed allowable for the poet even to fabricate what is not true, but when practicable he should adapt his words to what is true and preserve his narrative, but the more appropriate thing was to abstain from what was not true. The Lepratans held a fertile territory, and that of the Cyparissians bordered on it. Both these districts were taken and held by the Cauconians, and so was the Mesistus, by some called Platonistus. The name of the town is the same as that of the territory. It is said that there is a tomb of Caucan in the territory of Leprium whether Caucan was a progenitor of the tribe or one who for some other reason had the same name as the tribe. 3.17 There are several accounts of the Cauconians, for it is said that, like the Pelasgians, they were an Arcadian tribe, and, again like the Pelasgians, that they were a wandering tribe. At any rate, the poet tells us that they came to Troy as allies of the Trojans. But he does not say whence they come, though they seem to have come from Paphlagonia, for in Paphlagonia there is a people called Cauconiati whose territory borders on that of the Marianani, who are themselves Paphlagonians. 
but I shall speak of them at greater length when I come to my description of that region. At present I must add the following to my account of the Cauconians in Triphalia. Some say that the whole of what is now called Elia, from Messenia as far as Dime, was called Cauconia. Antimachus, at any rate, calls all the inhabitants both Apaeans and Cauconians. Others, however, say that the Cauconians did not occupy the whole of Elia, but lived there in two separate divisions, one division in Triphalia near Messenia, and the other in Bupersis and Coel Elis near Dime. And Aristotle has knowledge of their having been established at this latter place especially. And in fact the last view agrees better with what Homer says, and furnishes a solution of the question asked above, for in this view it is assumed that Nestor lived in the Triphalian Pylos, and that the parts towards the south and east, that is, the parts that are contiguous to Messenia and the Laconian country, were subject to him, and these parts were held by the Cauconians, so that if one went by land from Pylos to Lacedaemon his journey necessarily must have been made through the territory of the Cauconians, and yet the sanctuary of the Samiac Poseidon and the mooring place near it, where Telemachus landed, lie off towards the northwest. So then, if the Cauconians live only here, the account of the poet is not conserved. For instance, Athene, according to Sotades, bids Nestor to send Telemachus to Lacedaemon with chariot and son to the parts that lie towards the east, and yet she says that she herself will go to the ship to spend the night, towards the west, and back the same way she came, and she goes on to say that in the morning she will go amongst the great-hearted Cauconians to collect a debt, that is, she will go forward again. How, pray? For Nestor might have said, but the Cauconians are my subjects and live near the road that people travel to Lacedaemon. Why, therefore, do you not travel with Telemachus and his companions instead of going back the same way you came? And at the same time it would have been proper for one who was going to people subject to Nestor to collect a debt no small debt, as she says to request aid from Nestor, if there should be any unfairness, as is usually the case, in connection with the contract, but this she did not do. If, then, the Cauconians lived only there, the result would be absurd, but if some of the Cauconians had been separated from the rest and had gone to the regions near Diamond Elia, then Athene would be speaking of her journey thither, and there would no longer be anything incongruous either in her going down to the ship or in her withdrawing from the company of travellers, because their roads lay in opposite directions. And similarly, too, the puzzling questions raised in regard to Pylos may find an appropriate solution when, a little further on in my choreography, I reach the Messenian Pylos. 3.18 A part of the inhabitants of Triphalia were called Perariati, they occupied mountains, in the neighborhood of Leprium and Maesistum, that reached down to the sea near the Samiac Poseidium. 3.19 At the base of these mountains, on the seaboard, are two caves. One is the cave of the nymphs called Anagriades, the other is the scene of the stories of the daughters of Atlas and of the birth of Dardanus. And here, too, are the sacred precincts called the Ionan and the Eurysidium. Samicum is now only a fortress, though formerly there was also a city which was called Samos, perhaps because of its lofty situation, for they used to call lofty places Sama. And perhaps Samicum was the Acropolis of Erin, which the poet mentions in the catalogue, and those who dwelt in Pylos and lovely Erin. For while they cannot with certainty discover Erin anywhere, they prefer to conjecture that this is its site, and the neighboring river Anagris, formerly called Minyaeus, gives no slight indication of the truth of the conjecture, for the poet says, and there is a river Minyaeus which falls into the sea near Erin. For near the cave of the nymphs called Anagriades is a spring which makes the region that lies below it swampy and marshy. The greater part of the water is received by the Anagris, a river so deep and so sluggish that it forms a marsh, and since the region is muddy, it emits an offensive odor for a distance of twenty stadia, and makes the fish unfit to eat. In the mythical accounts, however, this is attributed by some writers to the fact that certain of the centaurs here washed off the poison they got from the hydra, and by others to the fact that Melampus used these cleansing waters for the purification of the proatides. The bathing water from here cures leprosy, elephantiasis, and scabies. It is said, also, that the Alpius was so named from its being a cure for leprosy. At any rate, since both the sluggishness of the anagris and the backwash from the sea give fixity rather than current to its waters, it was called the Minyaeus in earlier times, so it is said, though some have perverted the name and made it Mindius instead. But the word has other sources of derivation, either from the people who went forth with Chloris, the mother of Nestor, from the Minyan or Komenos, or from the Minyans, who, being descendants of the Argonauts, were first driven out of Lemnos into Lacedaemon, and thence into Triphalia, and took up their abode about Arian in the country which is now called Hypesia, though it no longer has the settlements of the Minyans. Some of these Minyans sailed with Theris, the son of Altesian, who was a descendant of Polynesus, to the island which is situated between Cyrenia and Crete, Callist its earlier name, but Thera its later, as Callimachus says, and founded Thera, 
the mother city of Cyrene, and designated the island by the same name as the city. 3.20 Between the Anagris and the mountain from which it flows are to be seen the meadow and tomb of Yardinus, and also the Achaei, which are abrupt cliffs of that same mountain above which, as I was saying, the city Samos was situated. However, Samos is not mentioned at all by the writers of the circumnavigations perhaps because it had long since been torn down and perhaps also because of its position, for the Poseidium is a sacred precinct, as I have said, near the sea, and above it is situated a lofty hill which is in front of the Samicum of today, on the site of which Samos once stood, and therefore Samos was not visible from the sea. Here, too, is a plain called Samicum, and from this one might get more conclusive proof that there was once a city called Samos. And further, the poem entitled Radin, of which Stesichorus is reputed to be the author, which begins, Come, thou clear-voiced muse, Erato, begin thy song, voicing to the tune of thy lovely lyre the strain of the children of Samos, refers to the children of the Samos in question, for Radin, who had been betrothed to a tyrant of Corinth, the author says, set sail from Samos, not meaning, of course, the Ionian Samos, while the west wind was blowing, and with the same wider brother, he adds, went to Delphi as chief of an embassy, and her cousin, who was in love with her, set out for Corinth in his chariot to visit her. And the tyrant killed them both and sent their bodies away on a chariot, but repented, recalled the chariot, and buried their bodies. 3.21 From this Pilus and Leprium to the Messenian Pilus and Coryphasium, a fortress situated on the sea, and to the adjacent island Sphagia, the distance is about 400 stadia, from the Alpia 750, and from Chelonata's 1030. In the intervening space are both the sanctuary of the Machistian Heracles and the Acidone River. The Acidone flows past the tomb of Yardinus and past Cha a city that was once in existence near Leprium, where is also the Epasian plain. It was for the possession of this Cha, some say, that the war between the Arcadians and Pylians, of which Homer tells us, arose in a dispute, and they think that one should write, would that I were in the bloom of my youth, as when the Pylians and the Arcadians gathered together and fought at the swift-flowing Acidone beside the walls of Cha instead of Celadon and Phia, for this region, they say, is nearer than the other to the tomb of Yardinus and to the country of the Arcadians. 3.22 Cyparitia is on the Trifolian Sea, and so are Pyrgoi, and the Acidone and Nata rivers. At the present time the stream of the Nata is the boundary between Trifolia and Messenia, an impetuous stream that comes down from Lycaeus, an Arcadian mountain, out of a spring, which, according to the myth, Rhea, after she had given birth to Zeus, caused to break forth in order to have water to bathe in, and it flows past Phigalia, opposite the place where the Pyrgadans, last of the Trifolians, border on the Cyparissians, first of the Messenians, but in the early times the division between the two countries was different, so that some of the territories across the Nata were subject to Nestor not only Cyparissius, but also some other parts on the far side. Just so, too, the poet prolongs the Pylian Sea as far as the seven cities which Agamemnon promised to Achilles, and all are situated near the Sea of Sandy Pylus, for this phrase is equivalent to near the Pylian Sea. 3.23b That as it may, next in order after sailing past Cyparisius towards the Messenian Pylus and Coryphasium one comes to Arana, which some wrongly think was in earlier times called Arene by the same name as the Pylian Arene, and also to Cape Platymodes, from which the distance to Coryphasium and to what is now called Pylus is 100 stadia. Here, too, is a small island, Prote, and on it a town of the same name. Perhaps I would not be examining at such length things that are ancient, and would be content merely to tell in detail how things now are, if there were not connected with these matters legends that have been taught us from boyhood, and since different men say different things, I must act as arbiter. In general, it is the most famous, the oldest, and the most experienced men who are believed, and since it is Homer who has surpassed all others in these respects, I must likewise both inquire into his words and compare them with things as they now are, as I was saying a little while ago. 3.24 I have already inquired into Homer's words concerning Coel Elis and Buprasium. Concerning the country that was subject to Nestor, Homer speaks as follows, and those who dwelt in Pylus and lovely Arian and Thrym, fording place of the Alpius, and well-built Epi, and also those who were inhabitants of Cyparisius and Amphigenia and Telian and Helus and Dorium, at which place the Muses met Thomaris the Thracian, and put a stop to his singing while he was on his way from Oihalia from Eurydice the Oechalian. It is Pylus, then, with which our investigation is concerned, and about it we shall make inquiry presently. About Arian I have already spoken. The city which the poet now calls through him he elsewhere calls Thryoessa, there is a certain city, Thryoessa, a steep hill, far away on the Alpius. He calls it fording place of the Alpius because the river could be crossed on foot, as it seems, at this place. But it is now called Epitalium, a small place in Macestia. 
As for well-built EP, some raise the question which of the two words is the epithet and which is the city, and whether it is the Margali of today, in Amphidolia. Now Margali is not a natural stronghold, but another place is pointed out which is a natural stronghold, in Macistia. The man, therefore, who suspects that the latter place is meant by Homer calls the name of the city Epi from what is actually the case in nature, compare Helus, Aegilus, and several other names of places, whereas the man who suspects that Margala is meant does the reverse perhaps. Thrym, or Thryoessa, they say, is Epitalium, because the whole of this country is full of rushes, particularly the rivers, and this is still more conspicuous at the fordable places of the stream. But perhaps, they say, Homer called the ford Thrym and called Epitalium well-built Epi, for Epitalium is fortified by nature. And in fact he speaks of a steep hill in other places, there is a certain city, Thryoessa, a steep hill, far away on the Alpius, last city of Sandy Pilus. 3.25 Cypericeus is in the neighborhood of the Macistia of earlier times, when Macistia still extended across the Nata, but it is no longer inhabited, as is also the case with Macistum. But there is another, the Messinian Cyperitia, it, too, is now called by the same name as the Macistian and in like manner, namely, Cyperitia, in the singular number and in the feminine gender, whereas only the river is now called Cypericeus. And Amphigenia, also, is in Macistia, in the neighborhood of the Hypsaeus River, where is the sanctuary of Leto. Telium was a settlement of the colony from the Thessalian Telium, for, as Homer tells us, there was a Telium in Thessaly too, and Antron, near the sea, and grassy Telium, but now it is a woody, uninhabited place, and is called Telesium. As for Helus, some call it a territory in the neighborhood of the Alpius, while others go on to call it a city, as they do the Laconian Helus, and Helus, a city near the sea, but others call it a marsh, the marsh in the neighborhood of Elorium, where is the sanctuary of the Hellion Artemis, whose worship was under the management of the Arcadians, for this people had the priesthood. As for Dorium, some call it a mountain, while others call it a plain, but nothing is now to be seen, and yet by some the Allurus of today, or Allura, situated in what is called the Aulon of Messenia, is called Dorium. And somewhere in this region is also the Ohelia of Eurydice, the Andania of today, a small Arcadian town, with the same name as the towns in Thessaly and Euboea, whence, according to the poet, Thomaris the Thracian came to Dorium and was deprived of the art of singing. 3.26 From these facts, then, it is clear that the country subject to Nestor, all of which the poet calls land of the Pylians, extends on each side of the Alpius, but the Alpius nowhere touches either Messenia or Coel Elis. For the fatherland of Nestor is in this country which we call Trifolian, or Arcadian, or Leprian, Pylus. And the truth is that, whereas the other places called Pylus are to be seen on the sea, this Pylus is more than thirty stadia above the sea a fact that is also clear from the verses of Homer, for, in the first place, a messenger is sent to the boat after the companions of Telemachus to invite them to an entertainment, and, secondly, Telemachus on his return from Sparta does not permit Pesistratus to drive to the city, but urges him to turn aside towards the ship, knowing that the road towards the city is not the same as that towards the place of anchorage. And thus the return voyage of Telemachus might be spoken of appropriately in these words, and they went past Cruni and fair flowing Chalcis. And the sun set and all the ways grew dark, and the ship, rejoicing in the breeze of Zeus, drew near to Phia, and on past goodly Elis, where the Apeans hold sway. Thus far, then, the voyage is towards the north, but thence it bends in the direction of the east. That is, the ship abandons the voyage that was set out upon at first and that led straight to Ithaca, because there the wooers had set the ambush in the strait between Ithaca and rugged Samos. And thence again he steered for the islands that are Twi, but by Twi the poet means the islands that are pointed. These belong to the Echinades group and are near the beginning of the Corinthian Gulf and the outlets of the Achelous. Again, after passing by Ithaca far enough to put it south of him, Telemachus turns round towards the proper course between Acarnania and Ithaca and makes his landing on the other side of the island not at the Cephalenian Strait which was being guarded by the wooers. 3.27 At any rate, if one should conceive the notion that the Elian Pylus is the Pylus of Nestor, the poet could not appropriately say that the ship, after putting to sea from there, was carried past Cruni and Chalcis before sunset, then drew near to Phia by night, and then sailed past Elia, for these places are to the south of Elia, first, Phia, then Chalcis, then Cruni, and then the Trifoli and Pylus and Samicum. This, then, would be the voyage for one who is sailing towards the south from Elian Pylus, whereas one who is sailing towards the north, where Ithaca is, leaves all these parts behind him, and also must sail past Elia itself and that before sunset, though the poet says after sunset. And further, if one should go on to make a second supposition, 
that the Messinian Pilus and Coriphasium are the beginning of the voyage from Nestor's, the distance would be considerable and would require more time. At any rate, merely the distance to Tripoli and Pilus and the Samiac Poseidium is 400 stadia, and the first part of the coasting voyage is not past Cruni and Chalcis and Fia, names of obscure rivers, or rather creeks, but past the Nata, then past the Acidon, and then past the Alpias and the intervening places. And on this supposition those other places should have been mentioned later, for the voyage was indeed made past them too. 3.28 Furthermore, the detailed account which Nestor recites to Patroclus concerning the war that took place between the Pylians and the Eleans pleads for what I have been trying to prove, if one observes the verses of the poet. For in them the poet says that, since Heracles had ravaged the Pylian country to the extent that all the youth were slain and that of all the twelve sons of Neleus only Nestor, then in his earliest youth, had been left, and since the Epeans had conceived a contempt for Neleus because of his old age and lack of defenders, they began to treat the Pylians in an arrogant and wanton manner. So, in return for this treatment, Nestor gathered together all he could of the people of his homeland, made an attack, he says, upon Elia, and herded together very much booty, fifty herds of cattle, and as many flocks of sheep, and as many droves of swine, and also as many herds of goats, and one hundred and fifty sorrel mares, most of them with foals beneath them. And these, he says, we drove within Nelian Pilus, to the city, in the night, meaning, first, that it was in the daytime that the driving away of the booty and the rout of those who came to the rescue took place, when he says he killed Adaminius, and, secondly, that it was in the night time that the return took place, so that it was night when they arrived at the city. And while the Pylians were busied with the distribution of the booty and with offering sacrifice, the Epeans, on the third day, after assembling in numbers, both footmen and horsemen, came forth in their turn against the Pylians and encamped around Thrym, which is situated on the Alpius River. And when the Pylians learned this, they forthwith set out to the rescue. They passed the night in the neighborhood of the Minyaeus River near Erin, and thence arrived at the Alpius in open sky, that is, at midday. And after they offered sacrifice to the gods and passed the night near the river, they joined battle at early dawn, and after the rout took place, they did not stop pursuing and slaying the enemy until they set foot on Buprasium and on the Alenian rock and where is the place called Hill of Elysium, whence Athene turned the people back again, and a little further on the poet says, but the Achaeans drove back their swift horses from Buprasium to Pylus. 3.29 From all this, then, how could one suppose that either the Elian or Messinian Pylus is meant? Not the Elian Pylus, because, if this Pylus was being ravaged by Heracles, the country of the Epeans was being ravaged by him at the same time, but this is the Elian country. How, pray, could a people whose country had been ravaged at the same time and were of the same stock, have acquired such arrogance and wantonness towards a people who had been wronged at the same time? And how could they overrun and plunder their own homeland? And how could both Augeus and Neleus be rulers of the same people at the same time if they were personal enemies? If to Neleus a great debt was owing and goodly Elis. Four horses, prize winners, with their chariots, had come to win prizes and were to run for a tripod, but these Augeus, lord of men, detained there, though he sent away the driver. And if this is where Neleus lived, Nestor too must have lived there. How, pray, could the poet say of the Eleans and the Buprasians, there were four rulers of them, and ten swift ships followed each man, and many Epeans embarked. And the country, too, was divided into four parts, yet Nestor ruled over no one of these, but over them that dwelt in Pylus and in lovely Erin, and over the places that come after these as far as Messene. Again, how could the Epeans, who in their turn went forth to attack the Pylians, set out for the Alpius and Thrym? And how, after the battle took place, after they were routed, could they flee towards Buprasium? And again, if it was the Messenian Pylus which Heracles had ravaged, how could a people so far distant as the Epeans act wantonly towards them, and how could the Epeans have been involved in numerous contracts with them and have defaulted these by cancelling them, so that the war resulted on that account? And how could Nestor, when he went forth to plunder the country, when he herded together booty consisting of both swine and cattle, none of which could travel fast or far, have accomplished a journey of more than one thousand stadia to that Pylus which is near Coriphasium? Yet on the third day they all came to Thryoessa and the river Alpius to besiege the stronghold. And how could these places belong to those who were in power in Messenia, when they were held by Cauconians and Triphalians and Pisatans? And as for Gerena, or Gerenia, for the word is spelled both ways, perhaps some people named it that to suit a purpose, though it is also possible that the place was by chance so named. And, in general, since Messenia was classified as subject to Menelaus, as was also the Laconian country, as will be clear from what I shall say later, and since the Pamasus and the Dun flow through Messenia, whereas the Alpius nowhere touches it, 
the Alpias that floweth in broad stream through the land of the Pylians, over which Nestor ruled, what plausibility could there be in an account which lands Nestor in a foreign realm and robs him of the cities that are attributed to him in the catalogue, and thus makes everything subject to Menelaus? 3.30 It remains for me to tell about Olympia, and how everything fell into the hands of the Eleans. The sanctuary is in Pisidus, less than 300 stadia distant from Elis. In front of the sanctuary is situated a grove of wild olive trees, and the stadium is in this grove. Past the sanctuary flows the Alpias, which, rising in Arcadia, flows between the west and the south into the Trifolian Sea. At the outset the sanctuary got fame on account of the oracle of the Olympian Zeus, and yet, after the oracle failed to respond, the glory of the sanctuary persisted nonetheless, and it received all that increase of fame of which we know, on account both of the festal assembly and of the Olympian Games, in which the prize was a crown and which were regarded as sacred, the greatest games in the world. The sanctuary was adorned by its numerous offerings, which were dedicated there from all parts of Greece. Among these was the Zeus of beaten gold dedicated by Sipsilus the tyrant of Corinth. But the greatest of these was the image of Zeus made by Phidias of Athens, son of Carmides, it was made of ivory, and it was so large that, although the temple was very large, the artist is thought to have missed the proper symmetry, for he showed Zeus seated but almost touching the roof with his head, thus making the impression that if Zeus arose and stood erect he would unroof the temple. Certain writers have recorded the measurements of the image, and Callimachus has set them forth in an iambic poem. Pananus the painter, who was the nephew and collaborator of Phidias, helped him greatly in decorating the image, particularly the garments, with colors. And many wonderful paintings, works of Pananus, are also to be seen round the temple. It is related of Phidias that, when Pananus asked him after what model he was going to make the likeness of Zeus, he replied that he was going to make it after the likeness set forth by Homer in these words, Cronion spoke, and nodded assent with his dark brows, and then the ambrosial locks flowed streaming from the Lord's immortal head, and he caused great Olympus to quake. A noble description indeed, as appears not only from the brows but from the other details in the passage, because the poet provokes our imagination to conceive the picture of a mighty personage and a mighty power worthy of a Zeus, just as he does in the case of Hera, at the same time preserving what is appropriate in each, for of Hera he says, she shook herself upon the throne, and caused lofty Olympus to quake. What in her case occurred when she moved her whole body, resulted in the case of Zeus when he merely nodded with his brows, although his hair too was somewhat affected at the same time. This, too, is a graceful saying about the poet, that he alone has seen, or else he alone has shown, the likenesses of the gods. The Eleans above all others are to be credited both with the magnificence of the sanctuary and with the honour in which it was held. In the times of the Trojan War, it is true, or even before those times, they were not a prosperous people, since they had been humbled by the Pylians, and also, later on, by Heracles when Augeas their king was overthrown. The evidence is this, the Eleans sent only forty ships to Troy, whereas the Pylians and Nestor sent ninety. But later on, after the return of the Heraclidae, the contrary was the case, for the Aetolians, having returned with the Heraclidae under the leadership of Oxalus, and on the strength of ancient kinship having taken up their abode with the Apeans, enlarged Coel Elis, and not only seized much of Pisidus but also got Olympia under their power. What is more, the Olympian games are an invention of theirs, and it was they who celebrated the first Olympiads, for one should disregard the ancient stories both of the founding of the sanctuary and of the establishment of the games some alleging that it was Heracles, one of the Idaean Dactyli, who was the originator of both, and others, that it was Heracles the son of Alcmene and Zeus, who also was the first to contend in the games and win the victory, for such stories are told in many ways, and not much faith is to be put in them. It is nearer the truth to say that from the first Olympiad, in which the Elian Caribus won the stadium race, until the 26th Olympiad, the Eleans had charge both of the sanctuary and of the games. But in the times of the Trojan War, either there were no games in which the prize was a crown or else they were not famous, neither the Olympian nor any other of those that are now famous. In the first place, Homer does not mention any of these, though he mentions another kind funeral games. And yet some think that he mentions the Olympian games when he says that Augeas deprived the driver of four horses, prize winners, that had come to win prizes. And they say that the Pisatans took no part in the Trojan War because they were regarded as sacred to Zeus. But neither was the Pisidus in which Olympia is situated subject to Augeas at that time, but only the Elian country, nor were the Olympian games celebrated even once in Elia, but always in Olympia. And the games which I have just cited from Homer clearly took place in Elis, where the debt was owing for a debt was owing to him in goodly Elis, four horses, prize winners. And these were not games in which the prize was a crown, for the horses were to run for a tripod, as was the case at Olympia. After the 26th Olympiad, when they had got back their homeland, 
The Pisatans themselves went to celebrating the games because they saw that these were held in high esteem. But in later times Pisatus again fell into the power of the Eleans, and thus again the direction of the games fell to them. The Lacedaemonians also, after the last defeat of the Messenians, cooperated with the Eleans, who had been their allies in battle, whereas the Arcadians and the descendants of Nestor had done the opposite, having joined with the Messenians in war. And the Lacedaemonians cooperated with them so effectually that the whole country as far as Messene came to be called Elia, and the name has persisted to this day, whereas, of the Pisatans, the Triphalians, and the Cauconians, not even a name has survived. Further, the Eleans settled the inhabitants of Sandy Pilus itself in Leprium, to gratify the Lepratans, who had been victorious in a war, and they broke up many other settlements, and also exacted tribute of as many aid they saw inclined to act independently. 3.31 Pisidus first became widely famous on account of its rulers, who were most powerful, they were Oinomaus, and Pelops who succeeded him, and the numerous sons of the latter. And Salmonius, too, is said to have reigned there, at any rate, one of the eight cities into which Pisidus is divided is called Salmone. So for these reasons, as well as on account of the sanctuary at Olympia, the country has gained wide repute. But one should listen to the old accounts with reserve, knowing that they are not very commonly accepted, for the later writers hold new views about many things and even tell the opposite of the old accounts, as when they say that Augeus ruled over Pisidus, but Oinomaus and Salmonius over Elia, and some writers combine the two tribes into one. But in general one should follow only what is commonly accepted. Indeed, the writers do not even agree as to the derivation of the name Pisidus, for some derive it from a city Pisa, which bears the same name as the spring, the spring, they say, was called Pisa, the equivalent of Pistra, that is Pedistra, and they point out the site of the city on a lofty place between Asa and Olympus, two mountains that bear the same name as those in Thessaly. But some say that there was no city by the name of Pisa, for if there had been, it would have been one of the eight cities, but only a spring, now called Pisa, near Sicisium, the largest of the eight cities, and Stasicorus, they explain, uses the term city for the territory called Pisa, just as Homer calls Lesbos the city of Makar, so Euripides in his Ion, there is Euboea, a neighboring city to Athens, and in his Rhadamanthus, who hold the Euboean land, a neighboring city, and Sophocles in his Mysians, the whole country, stranger, is called Asia, but the city of the Mysians is called Mysia. 3.32 Salmone is situated near the spring of that name from which flows the Enipaeus River. The river empties into the Alpius, and is now called the Barnicius. It is said that Tyro fell in love with Enipaeus, she loved a river, the divine Enipaeus. For there, it is said, her father Salmonius reigned, just as Euripides also says in his Elis. Some write the name of the river in Thessaly Anicius, it flows from Mount Othrus, and receives the Apidanus, which flows down out of Pharsalus. Near Salmone is Heraclea, which is also one of the eight cities, it is about forty stadia distant from Olympia and is situated on the Cytherius River, where is the sanctuary of the Ioniades nymphs, who have been believed to cure diseases with their waters. Near Olympia is Arpina, also one of the eight cities, through which flows the river Parthenius, on the road that leads up to Phorea. Phorea is in Arcadia, and it is situated above Dimia and Buprasium and Elis, that is, to the north of Pisidus here, too, is Cisisium, one of the eight cities, and also Despontium, which is situated in a plain and on the road that leads from Elis to Olympia, but it was destroyed, and most of its inhabitants emigrated to Epidamnus and Apollonia. Philoe, an Arcadian mountain, is also situated above Olympia, and very close to it, so that its foothills are in Pisidus. Both the whole of Pisidus and most parts of Triphalia border on Arcadia, and on this account most of the Pylian districts mentioned in the catalogue are thought to be Arcadian. The well-informed, however, deny this, for they say that the Arimanthus, one of the rivers that empty into the Alpius, forms a boundary of Arcadia and that the districts in question are situated outside that river. 3.33 Ephorus says that Aetolus, after he had been driven by Salmonius, the king of the Apaeans and the Pisatans, out of Elia into Aetolia, named the country after himself and also united the cities there under one metropolis, and Oxalus, a descendant of Aetolus and a friend of Temenus and the Heraclady who accompanied him, acted as their guide on their way back to the Peloponnesus, and apportioned among them that part of the country which was hostile to them, and in general made suggestions regarding the conquest of the country, and in return for all this he received as a favour the permission to return to Elia, his ancestral land, and he collected an army and returned from Aetolia to attack the Apaeans who were in possession of Elis, but when the Apaeans met them with arms, and it was found that the two forces were evenly matched, Perichmes the Aetolian and Digmenus the Apaean, in accordance with an ancient custom of the Greeks, advanced to single combat. Digmenus was lightly armed with a bow, thinking that he would easily overcome a heavy-armed opponent at long range, 
but Parikmes armed himself with a sling and a bag of stones, after he had noticed his opponent's ruse, as it happened, the sling had only recently been invented by the Aetolians, and since the sling had longer range, Digmenus fell, and the Aetolians drove out the Apeans and took possession of the land, and they also assumed the superintendence, then in the hands of the Achaeans, of the sanctuary at Olympia, and because of the friendship of Oxalus with the Heraclati, a sworn agreement was promptly made by all that Elia should be sacred to Zeus, and that whoever invaded that country with arms should he under a curse, and that whoever did not defend it to the extent of his power should be likewise under a curse. Consequently those who later founded the city of the Eleans left it without a wall, and those who go through the country itself with an army give up their arms and then get them back again after they have passed out of its borders, and if it has celebrated the Olympian Games, the Eleans now being a sacred people, for these reasons the people flourished, for whereas the other peoples were always at war with one another, the Eleans alone had profound peace, not only they, but their alien residents as well, and so for this reason their country became the most populous of all. But Phidon the Argive, who was the tenth in descent from Temenus and surpassed all men of his time and ability, whereby he not only recovered the whole inheritance of Temenus, which had been broken up into several parts, but also invented the measures called Phidonian, and weights, and coinage struck from silver and other metals, Phidon, I say, in addition to all this, also attacked the cities that had been captured previously by Heracles, and claimed for himself the right to celebrate all the games that Heracles had instituted. And he said that the Olympian games were among these, and so he invaded Elia and celebrated the games himself, the Eleans, because of the peace, having no arms wherewith to resist him, and all the others being under his domination. However, the Eleans did not record this celebration in their public register, but because of his action they also procured arms and began to defend themselves, and the Lacedaemonians cooperated with them, either because they envied them the prosperity which they had enjoyed on account of the peace, or because they thought that they would have them as allies in destroying the power of Phidon, for he had deprived them of the hegemony over the Peloponnesus which they had formerly held, and the Eleans did help them to destroy the power of Phidon, and the Lacedaemonians helped the Eleans to bring both Pisidus and Triphalia under their sway. The length of the voyage along the coast of the Elia of today, not counting the sinuosities of the gulfs, is, all told, 1200 stadia. So much for Elia. 4.1 Messenia Messenia borders on Elia, and for the most part it inclines round towards the south and the Libyan Sea. Now in the time of the Trojan War this country was classed as subject to Menelaus, since it was a part of Laconia, and it was called Messene, but the city now named Messene whose Acropolis was Ithom, had not yet been founded, but after the death of Menelaus, when those who succeeded to the government of Laconia had become enfeebled, the Nelaiti began to rule over Messenia. And indeed at the time of the return of the Heraclati and of the division of the country which then took place, Melanthus was king of the Messenians, who were an autonomous people, although formerly they had been subject to Menelaus. An indication of this is as follows, the seven cities which Agamemnon promised to give to Achilles were on the Messenian Gulf and the adjacent Asinian Gulf, so called after the Messenian Asini. These cities were Cardamile and Enope and Grassy Hire and Sacred Fure and Deep Meadowed Anthea and Beautiful Epia and Vine Clad Pedasus, and surely Agamemnon would not have promised cities that belonged neither to himself nor to his brother. And the poet makes it clear that men from Fure did accompany Menelaus on the expedition, and in the Laconian catalogue he includes Oidalus, which is situated on the Messenian Gulf. Messene comes after Triphalia, and there is a cape which is common to both, and after this cape come Cyparitia and Coryphasium. Above Coryphasium and the sea, at a distance of seven stadia, lies a mountain, Egalium. 4.2 Now the ancient Messenian Pilus was a city at the foot of Egalium, but after this city was torn down some of its inhabitants took up their abode on Cape Coryphasium, and when the Athenians under the leadership of Eurymedon and Stratocles were sailing on the second expedition to Sicily, they reconstructed the city as a fortress against the Lacedaemonians. Here, too, is the Messenian Cyparitia, and the island called Prote, and the island called Sphagia that lies off the coast near Pylos, the same is also called Sphacteria, on which the Lacedaemonians lost by capture 300 of their own men, who were besieged and forced to surrender by the Athenians. Opposite this sea coast of the Cyparissians, out in the high sea, lie two islands called Strophades, and they are distant, I should say, about 400 stadia from the mainland, in the Libyan and southern sea. Thucydides says that this Pylos was the naval station of the Messenians. It is 400 stadia distant from Sparta. 4.3 Next comes Methoni. This, they say, is what the poet calls Pedasus, one of the seven cities which Agamemnon promised to Achilles. It was here that Agrippa, during the war of Actium, after he had taken the place by an attack from the sea, put to death Bogus, the king of the Morusians, who belonged to the faction of Antony. 4.4 Adjacent to Methoni is Acritus, which is the beginning of the Messenian Gulf. But this is also called the Asinian Gulf 
from Assani, which is the first town on the gulf and bears the same name as the Hermionic town. Assani, then, is the beginning of the gulf on the west, while the beginning on the east is formed by a place called Thyrides, which borders on that part of the Laconia of today which is near Synethius and Tynarum. Between Assani and Thyrides, beginning at Thyrides, one comes to Oidalus, by some called Betalus, then to Lugtrum, a colony of the Lugtri in Boeotia, then to Cardamile, which is situated on a rock fortified by nature, then to Ferry, which borders on Thuria and Gerenia, the place from which Nestor got his epithet Gerenian, it is said, because his life was saved there, as I have said before. In Gerenia is to be seen a sanctuary of Trixi and Asclepius, a reproduction of the one in the Thessalian Trica. It is said that Pelops, after he had given his sister Niobe in marriage to Amphion, founded Lugtrum, Sheredra, and Thalami, now called Boote, bringing with him certain colonists from Boeotia. Near Ferry is the mouth of the Ndon River, it flows through Laconia and is a different river from the Nata. It has a notable sanctuary of Athena Naduja. In Piesa, also, there is a sanctuary of Athena Naduja, named after some place called Ndon, from which Teleclus is said to have colonized Piesa and Eshii in Tragium. 4.5 of the seven cities which Agamemnon tendered to Achilles, I have already spoken about Cardamile and Ferry and Pedasus. As for Enope, some say that it is Pelana, others that it is some place near Cardamile, and others that it is Gerenia. As for Hyre, it is pointed out near the mountain that is near Megalopolis in Arcadia, on the road that leads to Andania, the city which, as I have said, the poet called Oihalia, but others say that what is now Messala, which extends to the gulf between Tagadus and Messenia, is called Hyre. And Epia is now called Thuria, which, as I have said, borders on Ferry, it is situated on a lofty hill, and hence the name. From Thuria is derived the name of the Thuriates Gulf, on which there was but one city, Rium by name, opposite Tynarum. And as for Anthea, some say that it is Thuria itself, and that Epia is Methoni, but others say that of all the Messenian cities the epithet Deep Meadowed was most appropriately applied to the intervening Assani, in whose territory on the sea is a city called Coroni. Moreover, according to some writers, it was Coroni that the poet called Pedasus. And all are close to the Salt Sea, Cardamile on it, ferry only five stadia distant, with an anchoring place in summer, while the others are at varying distances from the sea. 4.6 It is near Coroni, at about the center of the gulf, that the river Pamasus empties. The river has on its right Coroni and the cities that come in order after it, of these latter the farthermost towards the west are Pilus and Cyparitia, and between these is Irana, which some have wrongly thought to be the Aryan of earlier time, and it has Thuria and Ferry on its left. It is the largest of the rivers inside the Isthmus, although it is no more than a hundred stadia in length from its sources, from which it flows with an abundance of water through the Messinian plain, that is, through Macaria, as it is called. The river stands at a distance of fifty stadia from the present city of the Messinians. There is also another Pamasus, a small torrential stream, which flows near the Laconian Lugtrum and it was over Lugtrum that the Messenians got into a dispute with the Lacedaemonians in the time of Philip. Of the Pamasus which some call the Amethyst I have already spoken. 4.7 According to Ephorus, when Crisphontes took Messenia, he divided it into five cities, and so, since Stenaiclarus was situated in the center of this country, he designated it as a royal residence for himself, while as for the others Pilus, Rium, Messala, and Hyamitis he sent kings to them, after conferring on all the Messenians equal rights with the Dorians, but since this irritated the Dorians, he changed his mind, gave sanction to Stenaiclarus alone as a city, and also gathered into it all the Dorians. 4.8 The city of the Messenians is similar to Corinth, for above either city lies a high and precipitous mountain that is enclosed by a common wall, so that it is used as an acropolis, the one mountain being called Ithum and the other Acrocorinthus. And so Demetrius of Pharos seems to have spoken aptly to Philip the son of Demetrius when he advised him to lay hold of both these cities if he coveted the Peloponnesus, for if you hold both horns, he said, you will hold down the cow, meaning by horns Ithum and Acrocorinthus, and by cow the Peloponnesus. And indeed it is because of their advantageous position that these cities have been objects of contention. Corinth was destroyed and rebuilt again by the Romans, and Messene was destroyed by the Lacedaemonians but restored by the Thebans and afterward by Philip the son of Amentus. The citadels, however, remained uninhabited. 4.9 The sanctuary of Artemis at Lemni, at which the Messenians are reputed to have outraged the maidens who had come to the sacrifice, is on the boundaries between Laconia and Messenia, where both peoples held assemblies and offered sacrifice in common, and they say that it was after the outraging of the maidens, when the Messenians refused to give satisfaction for the act, that the war took place. And it is after this Lemni, also, that the Limion, the sanctuary of Artemis in Sparta, has been named. 
4.10 Often, however, they went to war on account of the revolts of the Messenians. Tertius says in his poems that the first conquest of Messenia took place in the time of his father's fathers, the second, at the time when the Messenians chose the Argives, Eleans, Pisatans, and Arcadians as allies and revolted the Arcadians furnishing Aristocrates the king of Orchomenos as general and the Pisidae furnishing Pontelay and the son of Omphalion. At this time, he says, he himself was the Lacedaemonian general in the war, for in his elegy entitled Eunomia he says that he came from there, for the son of Cronus, spouse of Hera of the beautiful crown, Zeus himself, hath given this city to the Heraclade, in company with whom I left windy Araneus, and came to the broad island of Pelops. Therefore either these verses of the elegy must be denied authority or we must discredit Philochorus, who says that Tertius was an Athenian from the Deme of Aphidne, and also Callisthenes and several other writers, who say that he came from Athens when the Lacedaemonians asked for him in accordance with an oracle which bade them to get a commander from the Athenians. So the second war was in the time of Tertius, but also a third and fourth war took place, they say, in which the Messenians were defeated. The voyage round the coast of Messenia, following the sinuosities of the gulfs, is, all told, about 800 stadia in length. 4.11 However, I am overstepping the bounds of moderation and recounting the numerous stories told about a country the most of which is now deserted, in fact, Laconia too is now short of population as compared with its large population in olden times, for outside of Sparta the remaining towns are only about 30 in number, whereas in olden times it was called, they say, country of the hundred cities, and it was on this account, they say, that they held annual festivals in which 100 cattle were sacrificed. 5.1 Laconia be this as it may, after the Messenian Gulf comes the Laconian Gulf, lying between Tynarum and Malii, which bends slightly from the south towards the east, and Thyrides, a precipitous rock exposed to the currents of the sea, is in the Messenian Gulf at a distance of 130 stadia from Tynarum. Above Thyrides lies Tagadus, it is a lofty and steep mountain, only a short distance from the sea, and it connects in its northerly parts with the foothills of the Arcadian mountains in such a way that a glen is left in between, where Messenia borders on Laconia. Below Tagadus, in the interior, lies Sparta, and also Amicli, where is the sanctuary of Apollo, and Ferris. Now the site of Sparta is in a rather hollow district, although it includes mountains within its limits, yet no part of it is marshy, though in olden times the suburban part was marshy, and this part they called Limni, and the sanctuary of Dionysus in Limni stood on wet ground, though now its foundations rest on dry ground. In the bend of the seaboard one comes, first, to a headland that projects into the sea, Tynarum, with its sanctuary of Poseidon situated in a grove, and secondly, nearby, to the cavern through which, according to the myth writers, Cerberus was brought up from Hades by Heracles. From here the passage towards the south across the sea to Ficus, a cape in Cyrenia, is 3,000 stadia, and the passage towards the west to Pachinus, the promontory of Sicily, is 4,600, though some say 4,000, and towards the east to Malii, following the sinuosities of the gulfs, 670, and to one Ugnathus, a low-lying peninsula somewhat this side of Malii, 520, off one Ugnathus and opposite it, at a distance of 40 stadia, lies Kathira, an island with a good harbour, containing a city of the same name, which Eurycles, the ruler of the Lacedaemonians in our times, seized as his private property, and round it lie several small islands, some near it and others slightly farther away, and to Coricus, a cape in Crete, the shortest voyage is 700 stadia. 5.2 After Tynarum, on the voyage to one Ugnathus and Malii, one comes to the city Samathus, then to Asini, and to Jithium, the seaport of Sparta, situated at a distance of 240 stadia from Sparta. The roadstead of the seaport was dug by the hand of man, so it is said. Then one comes to the Eurotus, which empties between Jithium and Acrea. Now for a time the voyage is along the shore, for about 240 stadia, then comes a marshy district situated above the gulf, and also a village called Helus. In earlier times Helus was a city, just as Homer says, and they that held Amicli, and Helus, a city by the sea. It is said to have been founded by Helius, a son of Perseus. And one comes also to a plain called Luce, then to a city Cyparitia, which is situated on a peninsula and has a harbour, then to one Ugnathus, which has a harbour, then to the city Bia, and then to Malii. And the distance from one Ugnathus to Malii is 150 stadia, and there is also a city Asopus in Laconia. 5.3 They say that one of the places mentioned in Homer's catalogue, Mess, is nowhere to be seen, and that Messoa was not a part of the country but of Sparta, as was the case with Limion, but some take Mess as an apocopated form of Messene, for, as I have said, Messene too was a part of Laconia. As examples of apocope from the poet himself, writers cite Cree, Du, 
and maps, and also the passage the heroes Automaton and Alcimus, for Alcimedon, then from Hesiod, who uses Bri for Brithu or Bryron, and Sophocles and Ion, Ra for Radian, and Epicarmus, Le for Leon, and Syrico for Syracuse, and in Empedocles, Ops for Opsis, the Ops of both becomes one, and in Antimachus, the sacred Ops of the Eleusinian Demeter, and Alphi for Alphiton, and Euphorion even uses Hell for Helos, and in Philetus, Eri for Erione, maidservants bring white Eri and put it in baskets, and Aratus says Peta for Pedalia, the Peta towards the wind, and Simeus, Dodo for Dodona. As for the rest of the places listed by the poet, some have been destroyed, of others traces are still left, and of others the names have been changed, for example, Augei to e.g., for the Augei in Locris no longer exists at all. As for loss, the story goes, the Dioscuri once captured it by siege, and it was from this fact that they got the appellation Lepersi. And Sophocles says, by the two Lepersi, I swear, by Eurotus III, by the gods in Argos and about Sparta. 5.4 According to Ephorus, Eurysthenes and Procles, the Heraclady, took possession of Laconia, divided the country into six parts, and founded cities, now one of the divisions, Amicli, they selected and gave to the man who had betrayed Laconia to them and who had persuaded the ruler who was in possession of it to accept their terms and emigrate with the Achaeans to Ionia, Sparta they designated as a royal residence for themselves, to the other divisions they sent kings, and because of the sparsity of the population gave them permission to receive as fellow inhabitants any strangers who wished the privilege, and they used Los as a naval station because of its good harbour, and Aegis as a base of operations against their enemies, for its territory bordered on those of the surrounding peoples, and Ferris as a treasury, because it afforded security against outsiders, but though the neighbouring peoples, one and all, were subject to the sparsity, still they had equal rights, sharing both in the rights of citizenship and in the offices of state, and they were called helots, but Agis, the son of Eurysthenes, deprived them of the equality of rights and ordered them to pay tribute to Sparta, now all obeyed except the Hellions, the occupants of Helus, who, because they revolted, were forcibly reduced in a war, and were condemned to slavery, with the express reservation that no slaveholder should be permitted either to set them free or to sell them outside the borders of the country, and this war was called the war against the helots. One may almost say that it was Agis and his associates who introduced the whole system of helot slavery that persisted until the supremacy of the Romans, for the Lacedaemonians held the helots as state slaves in a way, having assigned to them certain settlements to live in and special services to perform. 5.5 Concerning the government of the Laconians and the changes that took place among them, one might omit most things as well known, but there are certain things which it is perhaps worthwhile to mention. For instance, they say that the Achaeans of Thyatis came down with Pelops into the Peloponnesus, took up their abode in Laconia, and so far excelled in bravery that the Peloponnesus, which now for many ages had been called Argos, came to be called Achaean Argos, and the name was applied not only in a general way to the Peloponnesus, but also in a specific way to Laconia. At any rate, the words of the poet, where was Menelaus? Or was he not in Achaean Argos? Are interpreted by some thus, or was he not in Laconia? And at the time of the return of the Heraclady, when Philonomus betrayed the country to the Dorians, the Achaeans emigrated from Laconia to the country of the Ionians, the country that still today is called Achaea. But I shall speak of them in my description of Achaea. Now the new possessors of Laconia restrained themselves at first, but after they turned over the government to Lycurgus they so far surpassed the rest that they alone of the Greeks ruled over both land and sea, and they continued ruling the Greeks until they were deprived of their hegemony, first by the Thebans, and immediately after them by the Macedonians. However, they did not wholly yield even to the Macedonians, but, preserving their autonomy, always kept up a struggle for the primacy both with the rest of the Greeks and with the kings of the Macedonians. And when the Macedonians had been overthrown by the Romans, the Lacedaemonians committed some slight offences against the praetors who were sent by the Romans, because at that time they were under the rule of tyrants and had a wretched government, but when they had recovered themselves, they were held in particular honour, and remained free, contributing to Rome nothing else but friendly services. But recently Eurycles has stirred up trouble among them, having apparently abused the friendship of Caesar unduly in order to maintain his authority over his subjects, but the trouble quickly came to an end, Eurycles retiring to his fate, and his son being averse to any friendship of this kind. And it also came to pass that the Eleuthero Lacones got a kind of republican constitution, since the Piraeici and also the Helots, at the time when Sparta was under the rule of tyrants, were the first to attach themselves to the Romans. Now Hellanicus says that Eurysthenes and Procles drew up the constitution, but Ephorus censures Hellanicus, saying that he has nowhere mentioned Lycurgus and that he ascribes the work of Lycurgus to persons who had nothing to do with it. At any rate, Ephorus continues, 
it is to Lycurgus alone that a sanctuary has been erected and that annual sacrifices are offered, whereas Eurysthenes and Procles, although they were the founders, have not even been accorded the honor of having their respective descendants called Eurysthenidae and Procleidae. Instead, the respective descendants are called Agidae, after Agis the son of Eurysthenes, and Eurypontidae, after Eurypon the son of Procles, for Agis and Eurypon reigned in an honorable way, whereas Eurysthenes and Procles welcomed foreigners and through these maintained their overlordship, and hence they were not even honored with the title of Archegite, an honor which is always paid to founders, and further, Pausanias, after he was banished because of the hatred of the Eurypontidae, the other royal house, and when he was in exile, prepared a discourse on the laws of Lycurgus, who belonged to the house that banished him, in which he also tells the oracles that were given out to Lycurgus concerning most of the laws. 5.6 Concerning the nature of the regions, both Laconia and Messenia, one should accept what Euripides says in the following passages, he says that Laconia has much arable land but is not easy to cultivate, for it is hollow, surrounded by mountains, rugged, and difficult for enemies to invade, and that Messenia is a land of fair fruitage and watered by innumerable streams, abounding in pasturage for cattle and sheep, being neither very wintry in the blasts of winter nor yet made too hot by the chariot of Helios, and a little below, in speaking of the lots which the Heraclitae cast for the country, he says that the first lot conferred lordships over the land of Laconia, a poor country, and the second over Messenia, whose fertility is greater than words can express, and Tertius speaks of it in the same manner. But one should not admit that the boundary between Laconia and Messenia is formed, as Euripides says, by the Pamasus, which rushes into the sea, for it flows through the middle of Messenia, nowhere touching the present Laconia. Neither is he right when he says that to mariners Messenia is far away, for Messenia like Laconia lies on the sea, and he does not give the right boundary of Elis either, and far away, after one crosses the river, lies Elis, the neighbor of Zeus, for if, on the one hand, he means the present Elian country, which borders on Messenia, the Pamasus does not touch this country, any more than it does Laconia, for, as I have said, it flows through the middle of Messenia, or if, on the other hand, he means the old Coel Elis, he deviates much further from the truth for after one crosses the Pamasus there is still a large part of Messenia to traverse, and then the whole of the territories of the Lepridi and the Machisci, which they used to call Trifilia, and then come Pisidus and Olympia, and then, 300 stadia farther on, Elis. 5.7 Since some critics write Lacedaemon Quito Asan and others Keite Asan, the question is asked, how should we interpret Quito Esa, whether as derived from Kete, or as meaning large, which seems to be more plausible. And as for Keite Asan, some interpret it as meaning Kalamanthode, whereas others say that the clefts caused by earthquakes are called Kaetoi, and that from Kaetoi is derived Kaetis, the word among the Lacedaemonians for their prison, which is a sort of cavern. But some prefer to call such cavernous places Kui, and whence, they add, comes the expression Areskoioi monsters. Laconia is subject to earthquakes, and in fact some writers record that certain peaks of Tagetis have been broken away. And there are quarries of very costly marble the old quarries of Tanarian marble on Tynarum and recently some men have opened a large quarry in Tagetus, being supported in their undertaking by the extravagance of the Romans. 5.8 Homer makes it clear that both the country and the city are called by the same name, Lacedaemon, and when I say country I include Messenia with Laconia. For in speaking of the bows, when he says, beautiful gifts which a friend had given him when he met him in Lacedaemon, even if it is the son of Eurytus, and then adds, these twain met one another in Messene in the home of Ortilicus, Homer means the country of which Messenia was a part. Accordingly it made no difference to him whether he said a friend had given him when he met him in Lacedaemon or these twain met in Messene. 4. That Phere is the home of Ortilicus, is clear from this passage, and they, Telemachus and Pesistratus, went to Phere, the home of Diocles, son of Ortilicus, and Phere is in Messenia. But when Homer says that, after Telemachus and his companions set out from Phere, they shook the yoke all day long, and then adds, and the sun set, and they came to hollow Lacedaemon Ketoa San and then drove to the palace of Menelaus, we must interpret him as meaning the city, otherwise it will be obvious that the poet speaks of their arrival at Lacedaemon from Lacedaemon. And, besides, it is not probable that the residence of Menelaus was not at Sparta, nor yet, if it were not there, that Telemachus would say, for I would go both to Sparta and to Pylos. But the fact that Homer uses the epithets of the country is in disagreement with this view unless, indeed, one is willing to attribute this to poetic license as one should do for it were better for Messene to be included with Laconia or with the Pylos that was subject to Nestor, and not to be set off by itself in the catalogue as not even having a part in the expedition. 6.1 Argolid after Mali follows the Argolic Gulf, and then the Hermionic Gulf, the former stretches as far as Silen, 
facing approximately eastward and towards the Cyclades, while the latter is more to the east than the former and extends as far as Aena and Epidoria. Now the first places on the Argolic Gulf are occupied by Laconians, and the rest by the Argives. Among the places belonging to the Laconians is Delium, which is sacred to Apollo and bears the same name as the place in Boeotia, and also Manoa, a stronghold, which has the same name as the place in Megaris, and Epidorus Limera, as Artemidorus says. But Apollodorus observes that this Epidorus Limera is near Cathera, and that, because it has a good harbour, it was called Limonera, which was abbreviated and contracted to Limera, so that its name has been changed. Immediately after sailing from Mali the Laconian coast is rugged for a considerable distance, but still it affords anchoring places and harbours. The rest of the coast is well provided with harbours, and off the coast lie many small islands, but they are not worth mentioning. 6.2 But to the Argives belongs Prazii, and also Temenium, where Temenus was buried, and, still before Temenium, the district through which flows the river Lerna, as it is called, bearing the same name as the marsh in which is laid the scene of the myth of the Hydra. Temenium lies above the sea at a distance of 26 stadia from Argos, and from Argos to Horaeon the distance is 40 stadia, and thence to Mycenae 10. After Temenium comes Noplia, the naval station of the Argives, and the name is derived from the fact that the place is accessible to ships. And it is on the basis of this name, it is said, that the myth of Noplius and his sons has been fabricated by the more recent writers of myth, for Homer would not have failed to mention these, if Polymedes had displayed such wisdom and sagacity, and if he was unjustly and treacherously murdered, and if Noplius wrought destruction to so many men at Cape Capirus. But in addition to its fabulous character the genealogy of Noplius is also wholly incorrect in respect to the times involved, for, granting that he was the son of Poseidon, how could a man who was still alive at the time of the Trojan War have been the son of Amimone? Next after Noplia one comes to the caverns and the labyrinths built in them, which are called Cyclopean. 6.3 Then come other places, and next after them the Hermionic Gulf, for, since Homer assigns this gulf also to Argea, it is clear that I too should not overlook this section of the circuit. The gulf begins at the town of Asini. Then come Hermione and Treason, and, as one sails along the coast, one comes also to the island of Caloria which has a circuit of 130 stadia and is separated from the mainland by a straight 4 stadia wide. 6.4 Then comes the Saronic Gulf, but some call it a sea and others a strait, and because of this it is also called the Saronic Sea. Saronic Gulf is the name given to the whole of the strait, stretching from the Hermionic Sea and from the sea that is at the Isthmus, that connects with both the Myrtoan and Cretan seas. To the Saronic Gulf belong both Epidorus and the island of Aena that lies off Epidorus, then Century the easterly naval station of the Corinthians, then, after sailing 45 stadia, one comes to Shonus, a harbour. From Mali thither the total distance is about 1800 stadia. Near Shonus is the Dialcus, the narrowest part of the Isthmus, where is the sanctuary of the Isthmian Poseidon. However, let us for the present postpone the discussion of these places, for they lie outside of Argea, and let us resume again our description of those in Argea. 6.5 6.5 And in the first place let me mention in how many ways the term Argos is used by the poet, not only by itself but also with epithets, when he calls Argos a Chian, or Iasian, or Hippian, or Pelasgian, or horse pasturing. 4. In the first place, the city is called Argos, Argos and Sparta, and those who held Argos and Turins. And, secondly, the Peloponnesus, in our home in Argos, for the city of Argos was not his home. And, thirdly, Greece as a whole, at any rate, he calls all Greeks Argives, just as he calls them Danaeans and Achaeans. However, he differentiates identical names by epithets, calling Thessaly Pelasgian Argos, now all, moreover, who dwelt in Pelasgian Argos, and calling the Peloponnesus Achaean Argos. And if we should come to Achaean Argos, or was he not an Achaean Argos? And here he signifies that under a different designation the Peloponnesians were also called Achaeans in a special sense and he calls the Peloponnesus Iasian Argos, if all the Achaeans throughout Iasian Argos could see Penelope, she would have still more wooers, for it is not probable that he meant the Greeks from all Greece, but only those that were near. But the epithets horse pasturing and Hippian he uses in a general sense. 6.6 But critics are in dispute in regard to the terms Hellas, Hellenes, and Panhellenes. For Thucydides says that the poet nowhere speaks of barbarians, because the Hellenes had not as yet been designated by a common distinctive name opposed to that of the barbarians. And Apollodorus says that only the Greeks in Thessaly were called Hellenes, and were called Myrmidons and Hellenes. He says, however, that Hesiod and Archilochus already knew that all the Greeks were called, not only Hellenes, but also Panhellenes, for Hesiod, in speaking of the daughters of Proteus, says that the Panhellenes wooed them, 
and Archilochus says that the woes of the Panhellenes centered upon Thassos. But others oppose this view, saying that the poet also speaks of barbarians, since he speaks of the Carians as men of barbarous speech, and of all the Greeks as Hellenes, the man whose fame is wide throughout Hellas and Midagros, and again, if thou wishest to journey throughout Hellas and Midagros. 6.7 Now the city of the Argives is for the most part situated in a plain, but it has for a citadel the place called Larissa, a hill that is fairly well fortified and contains a sanctuary of Zeus. And near the city flows the Inachus, a torrential river that has its sources in Lyrceus, the mountain that is near Sinuria and Arcadia. But concerning the sources of which mythology tells us, they are fabrications of poets, as I have already said. And waterless Argos is also a fabrication, but the gods made Argos well watered, since the country lies in a hollow, and is traversed by rivers, and contains marshes and lakes, and since the city is well supplied with waters of many wells whose water level reaches the surface. So critics find the cause of the mistake in this verse, and in utter shame would I return to Pi Omicron Lambda Upsilon Delta Psi Iota Omicron Nu Argos. Pi Omicron Lambda Upsilon Delta Psi Iota Omicron Nu either is used for Pi Omicron Lambda Upsilon Pi Theta Eta Tau Omicron Nu, i.e., much longed for. Or, omitting the delta, for pi omicron lambda upsilon psi iota omicron nu, i.e., very destructive. In the sense of pi omicron lambda phi theta omicron rho omicron nu, as in the phrase of Sophocles, and the pi omicron lambda phi theta omicron rho omicron nu home of the Pelopidae there, for the words pi rho omicron psi alpha iota and psi alpha iota, and psi alpha sigma theta alpha iota signify a kind of destruction or affliction, now he is merely making trial, but soon he will afflict the sons of the Achaeans, mar her fair flesh, untimely sent to Hades. And besides, Homer does not mean the city of Argos, for it was not thither that Agamemnon was about to return, but the Peloponnesus, which certainly is not a thirsty land either. Moreover some critics, retaining the delta, interpret the word by the figure hyperbaton and as a case of Sinaloefa with the connective delta, so that the verse would read thus, and in utter shame would I return pi omicron lambda delta psi iota omicron nu rho gamma omicron sigma, that is to say, would I return pi omicron lambda upsilon psi iota omicron nu rho gamma omicron sigma delta epsilon, where rho gamma omicron sigma delta epsilon stands for epsilon sigma rho gamma omicron sigma. 6.8 Now one of the rivers that flows through Argea is the Inachus, but there is another river in Argea, the Eresinus. The latter has its source in Stymphalus in Arcadia, that is, in the lake there which is called the Stymphalian Lake, which mythology makes the home of the birds that were driven out by the arrows and drums of Heracles, and the birds themselves are called Stymphalides. And they say that the Eresinus sinks beneath the ground and then issues forth in Argea and waters the plain. The Eresinus is also called the Asinus. And another river of the same name flows from Arcadia to the coast near Bora, and there is another Eresinus in the territory of Eritrea, and still another in Attica near Broron. And a spring of Mimini is also pointed out near Lerna. And Lake Lerna, the scene of the story of the Hydra, lies in Argea and the Mycenaean territory, and on account of the cleansings that take place in it there arose a proverb, a Lerna of ills. Now writers agree that the county has plenty of water, and that, although the city itself lies in a waterless district, it has an abundance of wells. These wells they ascribe to the daughters of Danius, believing that they discovered them, and hence the utterance of this verse, the daughters of Danius rendered Argos, which was waterless, Argos the well watered, but they add that four of the wells not only were designated as sacred but are especially revered, thus introducing the false notion that there is a lack of water where there is an abundance of it. 6.9 The Acropolis of the Argives is said to have been founded by Danius, who is reputed to have surpassed so much those who reigned in this region before him that, according to Euripides, throughout Greece he laid down a law that all people hitherto named Pelusgians should be called Danians. Moreover, his tomb is in the center of the marketplace of the Argives, and it is called Palanthus. And I think that it was the fame of this city that prepared the way, not only for the Pelusgians and the Danians, as well as the Argives, to be named after it, but also for the rest of the Greeks, and so, too, the more recent writers speak of Iacidae, Iasian Argos, Apia, and Apidones, but Homer does not mention the Apidones, though he uses the word Apia, rather of a distant land. To prove that by Argos the poet means the Peloponnesus, we can add the following examples, Argive Helen, and there is a city Ephra in the inmost part of Argos, and mid-Argos, and in that over many islands and all Argos he should be lord. And in the more recent writers the plain, too, is called Argos, but not once in Homer. Yet they think that this is more especially a Macedonian or Thessalian usage. 6.10 After the descendants of Danius succeeded to the reign in Argos, and the Amathanides, 
who were emigrants from Pisidus and Triphalia, became associated with these, one should not be surprised if, being kindred, they at first so divided the country into two kingdoms that the two cities in them which held the hegemony were designated as the capitals, though situated near one another, at a distance of less than fifty stadia, I mean Argos and Mycenae, and that the Horaeon near Mycenae was a sanctuary common to both. In this sanctuary are the images made by Polyclitus, in execution the most beautiful in the world, but in costliness and size inferior to those by Phidias. Now at the outset Argos was the more powerful, but later Mycenae waxed more powerful on account of the removal thereto of the Pelopidae, for, when everything fell to the sons of Atreus, Agamemnon, being the elder, assumed the supreme power, and by a combination of good fortune and valour acquired much of the country in addition to the possessions he already had, and indeed he also added Laconia to the territory of Mycenae. Now Menelaus came into possession of Laconia, but Agamemnon received Mycenae and the regions as far as Corinth and Sicyon and the country which at that time was called the country of the Ionians and Aegilians but later the country of the Achaeans. But after the Trojan times, when the empire of Age Memnon had been broken up, it came to pass that Mycenae was reduced, and particularly after the return of the Heraclidae, for when these had taken possession of the Peloponnesus they expelled its former masters, so that those who held Argos also held Mycenae as a component part of one whole. But in later times Mycenae was raised to the ground by the Argives, so that today not even a trace of the city of the Mycenaeans is to be found. And since Mycenae has suffered such a fate, one should not be surprised if also some of the cities which are catalogued as subject to Argos have now disappeared. Now the catalogue contains the following, and those who held Argos, and Turins of the Great Walls, and Hermione and Asini that occupy a deep gulf, and Treason and Ions and vine-clad Epidorus, and the youths of the Achaeans who held Aena and Mises. But of the cities just named I have already discussed Argos, and now I must discuss the others. 6.11 Now it seems that Turins was used as a base of operations by Pretus, and was walled by him through the aid of the Cyclopes, who were seven in number, and were called Bellyhands because they got their food from their handicraft, and they came by invitation from Lycia. And perhaps the caverns near Noplia and the works therein are named after them. The Acropolis, Lysimna, is named after Lysimnius, and it is about twelve stadia distant from Noplia but it is deserted, and so is the neighbouring Mydea, which is different from the Boeotian Mydia, for the former is Mydea, like Pronia, while the latter is Mydea, like Tegea. And bordering on Mydea is Persimna, this having a sanctuary of Hera. But the Argives laid waste to most of the cities because of their disobedience, and of the inhabitants those from Turins migrated to Epidorus, and those from, to Halyais, as it is called, but those from Asini, this is a village in Argea near Noplia, were transferred by the Lacedaemonians to Messenia, where is a town that bears the same name as the Argolic Asini, for the Lacedaemonians, says Theopompos, took possession of much territory that belonged to other peoples and settled there all who fled to them and were taken in. And the inhabitants of Noplia also withdrew to Messenia. 6.12 Hermione is one of the important cities, and its seaboard is held by the Halyais, as they are called, men who busy themselves on the sea. And it is commonly reported that the descent to Hades in the country of the Hermionians is a short cut, and this is why they do not put passage money in the mouths of their dead. 6.13 It is said that Asini too was a habitation of the Dryopians whether, being inhabitants of the regions of the Spercheius, they were settled here by the Arcadian Dryops, as Aristotle has said, or whether they were driven by Heracles out of the part of Doris that is near Parnassus. As for the Scylla and Hermione, they say that it was named after Scylla, the daughter of Nisus, who, they say, out of love for Minos betrayed Nisia to him and was drowned in the sea by him and was here cast ashore by the waves and buried. Ions was a village, which was depopulated by the Mycenaeans and made into a naval station, but later it disappeared from sight and now is not even a naval station. 6.14 Treason is sacred to Poseidon, after whom it was once called Poseidonia. It is situated 15 stadia above the sea, and it too is an important city. Off its harbour, Pogan by name, lies Caloria, an awe with a circuit of about 130 stadia. Here was an asylum sacred to Poseidon, and they say that this god made an exchange with Leto, giving her Delos for Caloria, and also with Apollo, giving him Pytho for Tynarum. And Ephorus goes on to tell the oracle, for thee it is the same thing to possess Delos or Caloria, most holy Pytho or windy Tynarum. And there was also a kind of Amphictyonic league connected with this sanctuary, a league of seven cities which shared in the sacrifice, they were Hermion, Epidorus, Aena, Athens, Prosiais, Noplaiais, and Orchomenos Minyaeus, however, the Argives paid dues for the Noplians, and the Lacedaemonians for the Prasians. The worship of this god was so prevalent among the Greeks that even the Macedonians, whose power already extended as far as the sanctuary, in a way preserved its inviolability, 
and were afraid to drag away the suppliants who fled for refuge to Caloria, indeed Archias, with soldiers, did not venture to do violence even to Demosthenes, although he had been ordered by Antipater to bring him alive, both him and all the other orders he could find that were under similar charges, but tried to persuade him, he could not persuade him, however, and Demosthenes forestalled him by suiciding with poison. Now treason and Pythias, the sons of Pelops, came originally from Pisidus, and the former left behind him the city which was named after him, and the latter succeeded him and reigned as king. But Anthes, who previously had possession of the place, set sail and founded Helicarnassus, but concerning this I shall speak in my description of Caria and Troy. 6.15 Epidaurus used to be called Epicurus, for Aristotle says that Carians took possession of it, as also of Hermione, but that after the return of the Heraclati the Ionians who had accompanied the Heraclati from the Attic Tetrapolis to Argos took up their abode with these Carians. Epidaurus, too, is an important city, and particularly because of the fame of Asclepius, who is believed to cure diseases of every kind and always has his sanctuary full of the sick, and also of the votive tablets on which the treatments are recorded, just as at Cousin Trikes. The city lies in the recess of the Saronic Gulf, has a circular coast of fifteen stadia, and faces the summer risings of the sun. It is enclosed by high mountains which reach as far as the sea, so that on all sides it is naturally fitted for a stronghold. Between Treason and Epidaurus there was a stronghold called Methana, and also a peninsula of the same name. In some copies of Thucydides the name is spelled Methoni, the same as the Macedonian city in which Philip, in the siege, had his eye knocked out. And it is on this account, in the opinion of Demetrius of Skepsis, that some writers, being deceived, suppose that it was the Methoni and the territory of treason against which the men sent by Agamemnon to collect sailors are said to have uttered the imprecation that its citizens might never cease from their wall building, since, in his opinion, it was not these citizens that refused, but those of the Macedonian city, as Theopompus says, and it is not likely, he adds, that these citizens who were near to Agamemnon disobeyed him. 6.16 Aena is the name of a place in Epidoria, and it is also the name of an island lying off this part of the mainland the Aena of which the poet means to speak in the verses just cited, and it is on this account that some write the island Aena instead of who held Aena, thus distinguishing between places of the same name. Now what need have I to say that the island is one of the most famous? For it is said that both Aeacus and his subjects were from there. And this is the island that was once actually mistress of the sea and disputed with the Athenians for the prize of valour in the sea fight at Salamis at the time of the Persian War. The island is said to be 180 stadia in circuit, and it has a city of the same name that faces southwest, and it is surrounded by Attica, Megaris, and the Peloponnesus as far as Epidaurus, being distant about 100 stadia from each, and its eastern and southern sides are washed by the Myrtoan and Cretan seas, and around it lie small islands, many of them near the mainland, though Belbina extends to the high sea. The country of Aena is fertile at a depth below the surface, but rocky on the surface, and particularly the level part, and therefore the whole country is bare, although it is fairly productive of barley. It is said that the Aegenetans were called Myrmidons, not as the myth has it, because, when a great famine occurred, the ants became human beings in answer to a prayer of Aeacus, but because they excavated the earth after the manner of ants and spread the soil over the rocks, so as to have ground to till, and because they lived in the dugouts, refraining from the use of soil for bricks. Long ago Aena was called Oing-1, the same name as that of two Demis in Attica, one near Eleuthery, to inhabit the plains that border on Oing-1 and Eleuthery, and another, one of the Demis of the Marathonian Tetrapolis, to which is applied the proverb, to Oing-1 the torrent. Aena was colonized successively by the Argives, the Cretans, the Epidorians, and the Dorians, but later the Athenians divided it by lot among settlers of their own, settling with the Mandans at Damascen in Illyria around the silver mines, which I discussed in the Illyrian section. The Lacedaemonians took the island away from the Athenians and gave it back to its ancient settlers. And colonists were sent forth by the Aegenetans both to Sidonia and Crete and to the country of the Ambersai. Ephorus says that silver was first coined in Aena, by Phidon, for the island, he adds, became a merchant centre, since, on account of the poverty of the soil, the people employed themselves at sea as merchants, and hence, he adds, petty wares were called Aegenetan merchandise. 6.17 The poet mentions some places in the order in which they are actually situated, and these dwelt in Heria and Aulis, and those who held Argos and Turins, Hermione and Asini, Treason and Iones, but at other times not in their actual order, Shonus and Scolus, Thespia and Gria, and he mentions the places on the mainland at the same time with the islands, those who held Ithaca and dwelt in Crocycalia, for Crocycalia is in the country of the Acarnanians. And so, also, he here connects Mises with Aena, although it is in Argolis on the mainland. Homer does not name Thyrii, although the others often speak of it, 
and it was concerning Thyri that a contest arose between the Argives and the Lacedaemonians, 300 against 300, but the Lacedaemonians under the generalship of Athriatas won the victory. Thucydides says that this place is in Sinuria on the common border of Argia and Laconia. And there are also Hisi, a well-known place in Argolis, and Sentri, which lies on the road that leads from Tegea to Argos through Mount Parthenius and Creopolis, but Homer does not know them. Nor yet does he know Lyrsium nor Ornii, which are villages in Argia, the former bearing the same name as the mountain near it and the latter the same as the Ornii which is situated between Corinth and Sicyon. 6.18 So then, of the cities in the Peloponnesus, Argos and Sparta proved to have been, and still are, the most famous, and, since they are much spoken of, there is all the less need for me to describe them at length, for if I did so I should seem to be repeating what has been said by all writers. Now in early times Argos was the more famous, but later and ever afterwards the Lacedaemonians excelled, and persisted in preserving their autonomy, except perhaps when they chanced to make some slight blunder. Now the Argives did not, indeed, admit Pyrrhus into their city, in fact, he fell before the walls, when a certain old woman, as it seems, dropped a tile upon his head, but they became subject to other kings, and after they had joined the Achaean League they came, along with the Achaeans, under the dominion of Rome, and their city persists to this day second in rank after Sparta. 6.19 But let me speak next of the places which are named in the catalogue of ships as subject to Mycenae and Menelaus. The words of the poet are as follows, and those who held Mycenae, well-built fortress, and wealthy Corinth and well-built Clenae, and dwelt in Ornei and lovely Arethyri and Sicyon, wherein Adrastus was king at the first, and those who held Hyperesi and steep Gonoessa and Pelini, and dwelt about Aegeum and through all the Aegilus and about broad Hellas. Now Mycenae is no longer in existence, but it was founded by Perseus, and Perseus was succeeded by Sthenelus, and Sthenelus by Eurystheus, and the same men ruled over Argos also. Now Eurystheus made an expedition to Marathon against Iolaus and the sons of Heracles, with the aid of the Athenians, as the story goes, and fell in the battle, and his body was buried at Gargadus, except his head, which was cut off by Iolaus, and was buried separately at Trichorinthus near the spring Macaria below the wagon road and the place is called Eurystheus' head. Then Mycenae fell to the Pelopidae who had set out from Pisidus, and then to the Heraclidae, who also held Argos. But after the naval battle at Salamis the Argives, along with the Clinaeans and Tejatans, came over and utterly destroyed Mycenae, and divided the country among themselves. Because of the nearness of the two cities to one another the writers of tragedy speak of them synonymously as though they were one city, and Euripides, even in the same drama, calls the same city, at one time Mycenae, at another Argos as, for example, in his Iphigenia and his Orestes. Clenae is a town situated by the road that leads from Argos to Corinth, on a hill which is surrounded by dwellings on all sides and is well fortified, so that in my opinion Homer's words, well-built Clenae, were appropriate. And here too, between Clenae and Phleas, are Nemea and the sacred precinct in which the Argives are wont to celebrate the Nemean games, and the scene of the myth of the Nemean lion, and the village Bimbana. Clenae is 120 stadia distant from Argos, and 80 from Corinth. I myself have beheld the settlement from Acrocorinthus. 6.20 Corinth is called wealthy because of its commerce, since it is situated on the Isthmus and is master of two harbours, of which the one leads straight to Asia, and the other to Italy, and it makes easy the exchange of merchandise from both countries that are so far distant from each other. And just as in early times the Strait of Sicily was not easy to navigate, so also the high seas, and particularly the sea beyond Malii, were not, on account of the contrary winds, and hence the proverb, but when you double Mali, forget your home. At any rate, it was a welcome alternative, for the merchants both from Italy and from Asia, to avoid the voyage to Mali and to land their cargoes here. And also the duties on what by land was exported from the Peloponnesus and what was imported to it fell to those who held the keys. And to later times this remained ever so. But to the Corinthians of later times still greater advantages were added, for also the Isthmian games, which were celebrated there, were wont to draw crowds of people. And the Bacchiati, a rich and numerous and illustrious family, became tyrants of Corinth, and held their empire for nearly two hundred years, and without disturbance reaped the fruits of the commerce, and when Sipsilus overthrew these, he himself became tyrant, and his house endured for three generations, and an evidence of the wealth of this house is the offering which Sipsilus dedicated at Olympia, a huge statue of beaten gold. Again, Demaratus, one of the men who had been in power at Corinth, fleeing from the seditions there, carried with him so much wealth from his home to Tyrrhenia that not only he himself became the ruler of the city that admitted him, but his son was made king of the Romans. And the sanctuary of Aphrodite was so rich that it owned more than a thousand temple slaves, courtesans, whom both men and women had dedicated to the goddess. 
and therefore it was also on account of these women that the city was crowded with people and grew rich, for instance, the ship captains freely squandered their money, and hence the proverb, not for every man is the voyage to Corinth. Moreover, it is recorded that a certain courtesan said to the woman who reproached her with the charge that she did not like to work or touch wool, yet, such as I am, in this short time I have taken down three webs. 6.21 The situation of the city, as described by Hieronymus and Eutyxus and others, and from what I myself saw after the recent restoration of the city by the Romans, is about as follows, a lofty mountain with a perpendicular height of three stadia and one half, and an ascent of as much as thirty stadia, ends in a sharp peak, it is called Acrocorinthus, and its northern side is the steepest, and beneath it lies the city in a level, trapezium-shaped place close to the very base of the Acrocorinthus. Now the circuit of the city itself used to be as much as forty stadia, and all of it that was unprotected by the mountain was enclosed by a wall, and even the mountain itself, the Acrocorinthus, used to be comprehended within the circuit of this wall wherever wall building was possible, and when I went up the mountain the ruins of the encircling wall were plainly visible. And so the whole perimeter amounted to about eighty-five stadia. On its other sides the mountain is less steep, though here too it rises to a considerable height and is conspicuous all round. Now the summit has a small temple of Aphrodite, and below the summit is the spring Perini, which, although it has no overflow, is always full of transparent, potable water. And they say that the spring at the base of the mountain is the joint result of pressure from this and other subterranean veins of water a spring which flows out into the city in such quantity that it affords a fairly large supply of water. And there is a good supply of wells throughout the city, as also, they say, on the Acrocorinthus, but I myself did not see the latter wells. At any rate, when Euripides says, I am come, having left Acrocorinthus that is washed on all sides, the sacred hill city of Aphrodite, one should take washed on all sides as meaning in the depths of the mountain, since wells and subterranean pools extend through it, or else should assume that in early times Perini was wont to rise over the surface and flow down the sides of the mountain. And here, they say, Pegasus, a winged horse which sprang from the neck of the Gorgon Medusa when her head was cut off, was caught while drinking by Bellerophon. And the same horse, it is said, caused Hippocrene to spring up on Helicon when he struck with his hoof the rock that lay below that mountain. And at the foot of Perini is the Sisyphium, which preserves no inconsiderable ruins of a certain sanctuary, or royal palace, made of white marble. And from the summit, looking towards the north, one can view Parnassus and Helicon lofty, snow-clad mountains and the Chrysian Gulf, which lies at the foot of the two mountains and is surrounded by Phocis, Boeotia, and Megaris, and by the parts of Corinthia and Sicyonia which lie across the gulf opposite to Phocis, that is, towards the west. And above all these countries lie the Ionian mountains, as they are called, which extend as far as Boeotia and Cathiron from the Scaronian rocks, that is, from the road that leads along these rocks towards Attica. 6.22 The beginning of the seaboard on the two sides is, on the one side, Lekion, and, on the other, Sentry, a village and a harbour distant about seventy stadia from Corinth. Now this latter they use for the trade from Asia, but Lekion for that from Italy. Lekion lies beneath the city, and does not contain many residences, but long walls about twelve stadia in length have been built on both sides of the road that leads to Lekion. The shore that extends from here to Pegae and Megaris is washed by the Corinthian Gulf, it is concave, and with the shore on the other side, at Shonus, which is near Sentry, it forms the Diolcus. In the interval between Lekion and Pegae there used to be, in early times, the oracle of the Acrian Hera, and here, too, is Olmi, the promontory that forms the gulf in which are situated Oino and Pegae, the latter a stronghold of the Megarians and Oino of the Corinthians. From century one comes to Shonus, where is the narrow part of the Isthmus, I mean the Diolcus, and then one comes to Cromionia. Off this shore lie the Saronic and Eleusinian gulfs, which in a way are the same, and border on the Hermionic Gulf. On the Isthmus is also the sanctuary of the Isthmian Poseidon, in the shade of a grove of pine trees, where the Corinthians used to celebrate the Isthmian games. Cromion is a village in Corinthia, though in earlier times it was in Megaris, and in it is laid the scene of the myth of the Cromionian So, which, it is said, was the mother of the Caledonian boar, and, according to tradition, the destruction of this sow was one of the labors of Theseus. Tania, also, is in Corinthia, and in it is a sanctuary of the Tenetan Apollo and it is said that most of the colonists who accompanied Archias, the leader of the colonists to Syracuse, set out from there, and that afterwards Tania prospered more than the other settlements, and finally even had a government of its own, and, revolting from the Corinthians, joined the Romans, and endured after the destruction of Corinth. And mention is also made of an oracle that was given to a certain man from Asia, who inquired whether it was better to change his home to Corinth, blessed is Corinth, but Tania for me. 
but in ignorance some pervert this as follows, but to Gia for me. And it is said that Polybus reared Oedipus here. And it seems, also, that there is a kinship between the peoples of Tenedos and Tenea, through Tenes the son of sickness, as Aristotle says, and the similarity in the worship of Apollo among the two peoples affords strong indications of such kinship. 6.23 The Corinthians, when they were subject to Philip, not only sided with him in his quarrel with the Romans, but individually behaved so contemptuously towards the Romans that certain persons ventured to pour down filth upon the Roman ambassadors when passing by their house. For this and other offences, however, they soon paid the penalty, for a considerable army was sent thither, and the city itself was razed to the ground by Lucius Mummius, and the other countries as far as Macedonia became subject to the Romans, different commanders being sent into different countries, but the Sicyonians obtained most of the Corinthian country. Polybius, who speaks in a tone of pity of the events connected with the capture of Corinth, goes on to speak of the disregard shown by the army for the works of art and votive offerings, for he says that he was present and saw paintings that had been flung to the ground and saw the soldiers playing dice on these. Among the paintings he names that of Dionysus by Aristides, to which, according to some writers, the saying, nothing in comparison with the Dionysus, referred, and also the painting of Heracles in torture in the robe of Deianera. Now I have not seen the latter, but I saw the Dionysus, a most beautiful work, on the walls of the sanctuary of Ceres in Rome, but when recently the temple was burned, the painting perished with it. And I may almost say that the most and best of the other dedicatory offerings at Rome came from there and the cities in the neighborhood of Rome also obtained some, for Mummius, being magnanimous rather than fond of art, as they say, readily shared with those who asked. And when Lucullus built the sanctuary of good fortune and a portico, he asked Mummius for the use of the statues which he had, saying that he would adorn the sanctuary with them until the dedication and then give them back. However, he did not give them back, but dedicated them to the goddess, and then bade Mummius to take them away if he wished. But Mummius took it lightly, for he cared nothing about them so that he gained more repute than the man who dedicated them. Now after Corinth had remained deserted for a long time, it was restored again, because of its favorable position, by the deified Caesar, who colonized it with people that belonged for the most part to the freedmen class. And when these were removing the ruins and at the same time digging open the graves, they found numbers of terracotta reliefs, and also many bronze vessels. And since they admired the workmanship they left no grave unransacked, so that, well supplied with such things and disposing of them at a high price, they filled Rome with Corinthian mortuaries, for thus they called the things taken from the graves, and in particular the earthenware. Now at the outset the earthenware was very highly prized, like the bronzes of Corinthian workmanship, but later they ceased to care much for them, since the supply of earthen vessels failed and most of them were not even well executed. The city of the Corinthians, then, was always great and wealthy, and it was well equipped with men skilled both in the affairs of state and in the craftsmen's arts, for both here and in Siki in the arts of painting and modeling and all such arts of the craftsmen flourished most. The city had territory, however, that was not very fertile, but rifted and rough, and from this fact all have called Corinth beetling, and use the proverb, Corinth is both beetle-browed and full of hollows. 6.24 Ornii is named after the river that flows past it. It is deserted now, although formerly it was well peopled, and had a sanctuary of Priapus that was held in honor, and it was from Ornii that the Euphronius who composed the Priapia calls the god Priapus the Orniaton. Ornii is situated above the plain of the Sicyonians, but the country was possessed by the Argives. Erytheria is the country which is now called Phliasia, and near the mountain Salasa it had a city of the same name as the country, but the inhabitants later emigrated from here, and at a distance of thirty stadia founded a city which they called Phlius. A part of the mountain Salasa is Mount Carniates, whence the Aesopus takes its beginning the river that flows past Sicyonia, and forms the Aesopian country, which is a part of Sicyonia. There is also an Aesopus that flows past Thebes and Plataea and Tanagra, and there is another in the Trachinian Heraclea that flows past a village which they call Parasapii, and there is a fourth in Paros. Phlius is situated in the center of a circle formed by Sicyonia, Argia, Clenai, and Stymphalus. In Phlius and Sicyon the sanctuary of Dia is held in honor, and Dia is their name for Hebe. 6.25 In earlier times Sicyon was called Mkon, and in still earlier times E. July, but Demetrius rebuilt it upon a hill strongly fortified by nature about twenty stadia, others say twelve, from the sea, and the old settlement, which has a harbour, is a naval station. The river Nemea forms the boundary between Sicyonia and Corinthia. Sicyon was ruled by tyrants most of the time, but its tyrants were always reasonable men, among whom the most illustrious was Aratus, who not only set the city free, but also ruled over the Achaeans, who voluntarily gave him the authority, and he increased the league by adding to it both his native Sicyon and the other cities near it. 
but Hyperesia and the cities that come in their order after it, which the poet mentions, and the Aegilus as far as Dime and the boundaries of Elia already belong to the Achaeans. 7.1 Achaea In antiquity this country was under the mastery of the Ionians, who were sprung from the Athenians, and in antiquity it was called Aegilia, and the inhabitants Aegilians, but later it was called Ionia after the Ionians, just as Attica also was called Ionia after Ion the son of Zuthus. They say that Helen was the son of Deucalion, and that he was lord of the people between the Peneus and the Asopus in the region of Thyia and gave over his rule to the eldest of his sons, but that he sent the rest of them to different places outside, each to seek a settlement for himself. One of these sons, Doris, united the Dorians about Parnassus into one state, and at his death left them named after himself, another, Zuthus, who had married the daughter of Erechtheus, founded the Tetrapolis of Attica, consisting of Oino, Marathon, Probolinthus, and Tricorinthus. One of the sons of Zuthus, Achaeus, who had committed involuntary manslaughter, fled to Lacedaemon and brought it about that the people there were called Achaeans, and Ion conquered the Thracians under Eumolpus, and thereby gained such high repute that the Athenians turned over their government to him. At first Ion divided the people into four tribes, but later into four occupations, four he designated as farmers, others as artisans, others as sacred officers, and a fourth group as the guards. And he made several regulations of this kind, and at his death left his own name to the country. But the country had then come to be so populous that the Athenians even sent forth a colony of Ionians to the Peloponnesus, and caused the country which they occupied to be called Ionia after themselves instead of Aegilus, and the men were divided into twelve cities and called Ionians instead of Aegilians. But after the return of the Heraclade they were driven out by the Achaeans and went back again to Athens, and from there they sent forth with the Cadrade the Ionian colony to Asia, and these founded twelve cities on the seaboard of Caria and Lydia thus dividing themselves into the same number of parts as the cities they had occupied in the Peloponnesus. Now the Achaeans were Thyatian race, but they lived in Lacedaemon, and when the Heraclade prevailed, the Achaeans were won over by Tesaminus, the son of Orestes, as I have said before, attacked the Ionians, and proving themselves more powerful than the Ionians drove them out and took possession of the land themselves, and they kept the division of the country the same as it was when they received it. And they were so powerful that, although the Heraclade, from whom they had revolted, held the rest of the Peloponnesus, still they held out against one and all, and named the country Achaea. Now from Tesaminus to Ogyges they continued under the rule of kings, then, under a democratic government, they became so famous for their constitutions that the Italiotes, after the uprising against the Pythagoreans, actually borrowed most of their usages from the Achaeans. And after the battle at Lectra the Thebans turned over to them the arbitration of the disputes which the cities had with one another, and later, when their league was dissolved by the Macedonians, they gradually recovered themselves. When Pyrrhus made his expedition to Italy, four cities came together and began a new league, among which were Patri and Dime, and then they began to add some of the twelve cities, except Alinus and Hellas, the former having refused to join and the latter having been wiped out by a wave from the sea. 7.2 For the sea was raised by an earthquake and it submerged Hellas, and also the sanctuary of the Heliconian Poseidon, whom the Ionians worship even to this day, offering there the pan-Ionian sacrifices. And, as some suppose, Homer recalls this sacrifice when he says, but he breathed out his spirit and bellowed, as when a dragged bull bellows round the altar of the Heliconian lord. And they infer that the poet lived after the Ionian colonization, since he mentions the pan-Ionian sacrifice, which the Ionians perform in honor of the Heliconian Poseidon in the country of the Prenians, for the Prenians themselves are also said to be from Hellas, and indeed as king for this sacrifice they appoint a Prenian young man to superintend the sacred rites. But still more they base the supposition in question on what the poet says about the bull, for the Ionians believe that they obtain omens in connection with this sacrifice only when the bull bellows while being sacrificed. But the opponents of the supposition apply the above-mentioned inferences concerning the bull and the sacrifice to Hellas, on the ground that these were customary there and that the poet was merely comparing the rites that were celebrated there. Hellas was submerged by the sea two years before the battle at Lectra. And Eratosthenes says that he himself saw the place, and that the ferrymen say that there was a bronze Poseidon in the strait, standing erect, holding a hippocampus in his hand, which was perilous for those who fished with nets. And Heraclides says that the submersion took place by night in his time, and, although the city was twelve stadia distant from the sea, this whole district together with the city was hidden from sight, and two thousand men who had been sent by the Achaeans were unable to recover the dead bodies, and they divided the territory of Hellas among the neighbours, and the submersion was the result of the anger of Poseidon, for the Ionians who had been driven out of Hellas sent men to ask the inhabitants of Hellas particularly for the statue of Poseidon, or, if not that, for a likeness of the sacred object, and when the inhabitants refused to give either, 
the Ionians sent word to the general council of the Achaeans, but although the assembly voted favorably, yet even so the inhabitants of Hellas refused to obey, and the submersion resulted the following winter, but the Achaeans later gave the likeness to the Ionians. Hesiod mentions still another Hellas, in Thessaly. 7.3 Now for twenty years the Achaeans continued to have a general secretary and two generals, elected annually, and with them a common council was convened at one place, it was called Amerium, in which these, as did the Ionians before them, dealt with affairs of common interest, then they decided to elect only one general. And when Aratus was general he took the Acre Corinthus away from Antigonus and added the city of Corinth to the Achaean League, just as he had added his native city, and he also took over the Megarians, and breaking up the tyrannies in the several cities he made the peoples who were thus set free members of the Achaean League. And he set the Peloponnesus free from its tyrannies, so that Argos, Hermion, Phleas, and Megalopolis, the largest city in Arcadia, were added to the League, and it was at this time that the League reached the height of its power. It was the time when the Romans, after their expulsion of the Carthaginians from Sicily, made their expedition against the Galati who lived in the region of the Patus River. But although the Achaean League persisted rather firmly until the time of the generalship of Philippoimen, yet it was gradually dissolved, since by this time the Romans were in possession of the whole of Greece, and they did not deal with the several states in the same way, but wished to preserve some and to destroy others. Then he tells the cause of his enlarging upon the subject of the Achaeans, saying that, although they increased in power to the point of surpassing even the Lacedaemonians, they are not as well known as they deserve to be. 7.4 The order of the places in which the Achaeans settled, after dividing the country into twelve parts, is as follows, first after Sikian lies Polini, then, second, Egera, third, Egi, which has a sanctuary of Poseidon, fourth, Bora, after Bora, Hellas, whither the Ionians fled for refuge after they were conquered in battle by the Achaeans, and whence at last they were expelled, and, after Hellas, Aegeum and Ripes and Patri and Ferry, then Alenus, past which flows the Perus, a large river, then Dime and Tritia. Now the Ionians lived in villages, but the Achaeans founded cities, and to certain of these they later united others, transferring them from the other divisions, as, for example, Egi to Egera, the inhabitants, however, were called Aegeans, and Alenus to Dime. Traces of the old settlement of the Alenians are shown between Patri and Dime, and here, too, is the notable sanctuary of Asclepius, which is forty stadia distant from Dime and eighty from Patri. Of the same name as this Egi is the Egi in Euboea, and of the same name as Alenus is the settlement, Olenos, in Aetolia, this too preserving only traces of its former self. Now the poet does not mention the Alenus in Achaea, just as he does not mention several other inhabited places in the region of the Aegilus, although he speaks of them in a rather general way, and through all the Aegilus and about broad Hellas. But he mentions the Aetolian Alenus, when he says, those who dwelt in Pluron and Alenus. And he speaks of both places called Egi, the Achaean Egi, when he says, yet they bring up gifts for thee into both Hellas and Egi but when he says, Egi, where is his famous palace in the deeps of the Mir, where Poseidon halted his horses, it is better to take him as meaning the Egi in Euboea, from which it is probable that also the Aegean Sea got its name, and here too the poet has placed the activities of Poseidon in connection with the Trojan War. Close to the Achaean Egi flows the Crathes River, which is increased by the waters of two other rivers, and it gets its name from the fact that it is a mixture, as does also the Crathes in Italy. 7.5 Each of the twelve divisions consisted of seven or eight communities, so populous was the country. Polini is situated sixty stadia above the sea, and it is a strong fortress. But there is also a village Polini, from which come the Pelinic cloaks, which they were also wont to set up as prizes at the games, it lies between Aegeum and Polini. But Pelana is different from these two, it is a Laconian place, and its territory inclines, approximately, towards the territory of Megalopolis. Egera is situated on a hill. Bora, which was swallowed up in an earthquake, is situated above the sea at a distance of about 40 stadia, and they say that it was from the spring Sybaris in Bora that the river in Italy got its name. Ega, for Egi is also called thus, is now uninhabited, and the city is in the possession of the people of Aegeum. But Aegeum has a considerable population. The story is told that Zeus was nursed by a goat there, just as Aratus says, sacred goat, which, in story, didst hold thy breast or Zeus, and he goes on to say that the interpreters call her the Alenian goat of Zeus, thus clearly indicating that the place is near Olean. Here too is Serenia, which is situated on a high rock. These places belong to the people of Aegeum, and so does Hellas, and the grove of Zeus, the Amerium, where the Achaeans met to deliberate on affairs of common interest. And the Salinas River flows through the territory of Aegeum, 
It bears the same name as the river that flows in Ephesus past the Artemisium, and also the river in the Elia of today that flows past the plot of land which Xenophon says he bought for Artemis in accordance with an oracle. And there is another Salinas, it flows past the territory of the Hyblian Megarians, whom the Carthaginians forced to migrate. As for the remaining cities, or divisions, of the Achaeans, one of them, Ripes, is uninhabited, and the territory called Ripus was held by the people of Egeum and the people of Ferry. Aeschylus, too, says somewhere, sacred Bora and thunder smitten Ripes. Miscalus, the founder of Croton, was from Ripes. And Leuctrum too, a deme of Ripes, belonged to the district of Ripus. After Ripes comes Patri, a noteworthy city, between the two, however, is Rheum, also Antrium, which is forty stadia distant from Patri. And recently the Romans, after their victory at Actium, settled a considerable part of the army at Patri, and it is exceptionally populous at present, since it is a Roman colony, and it has a fairly good anchoring place. Next comes Dime, a city without a harbour, the farthest of all towards the west, a fact from which it takes its name. But in earlier times it was called Stratos. The boundary between it and the Elian country, Buprasium, is formed by the Larissus River, which flows from a mountain. Some writers call this mountain Scalus, but Homer calls it the Elenian rock. When Antimachus calls Dime Cauconian, some interpret Cauconian as an epithet derived from the Cauconians, since the Cauconians extended as far as Dime, as I have already said above, but others as derived from a river Caucon, just as Thebes is called Durkian and Aesopian, Argos and Achaean, and Troy Simeon. But shortly before my time Dime received as colonists a mixed group of people whom Pompey still had left over from the crowd of pirates, after he broke up all piracy and settled some of the pirates at Soli and Cilicia and others in other places and in particular at Dime. Farah borders on the territory of Dime. The people of this Farah are called Pharaes, but those of the Messenian city Fariati, and in the territory of Farah is a spring Dursi which bears the same name as the spring at Thebes. But Alinus is deserted, it lies between Patri and Dime and its territory is held by the people of Dime. Then comes Araxis, the promontory of the Elian country, 1030 stadia from the Isthmus. 8.1 Arcadia Arcadia lies in the middle of the Peloponnesus, and most of the country which it includes is mountainous. The greatest mountain in it is Selene, at any rate some say that its perpendicular height is 20 stadia, though others say about 15. The Arcadian tribes the Azanes, the Parasians, and other such peoples are reputed to be the most ancient tribes of the Greeks but on account of the complete devastation of the country it would be inappropriate to speak at length about these tribes, for the cities, which in earlier times had become famous, were wiped out by the continuous wars, and the tillers of the soil have been disappearing even since the times when most of the cities were united into what was called the Great City. But now the Great City itself has suffered the fate described by the comic poet, the Great City is a great desert. But there are ample pastures for cattle, particularly for horses and asses that are used as stallions and the Arcadian breed of horses, like the Argolic and the Epidorian, is most excellent. And the deserted lands of the Aetolians and Acarnanians are also well adapted to horse raising no less so than Thessaly. 8.2 Now Mantinea was made famous by Epmenondas, who conquered the Lacedaemonians in the second battle, in which he himself lost his life. But Mantinea itself, as also Orchomenos, Horea, Cleater, Phineas, Stymphalus, Menelus, Methodrium, Capiais, and Sinetha, no longer exist, or else traces or signs of them are scarcely to be seen. But Tegea still endures fairly well, and so does the sanctuary of the Elena Athene, and the sanctuary of Zeus Lycaea situated near Mount Lycaon is also honoured to a slight extent. But three of the cities mentioned by the poet, Ripe and Strati, and Windy and Isp, are not only hard to find, but are of no use to any who find them, because they are deserted. 8.3 Famous mountains, in addition to Selene, are Philoe, Lycaon, Menelus, and the Parthenium, as it is called, which extends from the territory of Tegea down to the Argive country. 8.4 I have already mentioned the marvellous circumstances pertaining to the Alpius and the Eurotus, and also to the Eurasinus, which now flows underground from the Stymphalian lake, and issues forth into the Argive country, although in earlier times it had no outlet, since the Berythra, which the Arcadians call Zerithra, were stopped up and did not admit of the waters being carried off so that the city of the Stymphalians is now fifty stadia distant from the lake, although then it was situated on the lake. But the contrary was the case with the Leyden, since its stream was once checked because of the blocking up of its sources, for the Berythra near Phineas, through which it flowed, fell in as the result of an earthquake and checked the stream as far down into the depths of the earth as the veins which supplied its source. Thus some writers tell it. But Eratosthenes says that near Phineas the river Aeneas, as it is called, 
makes a lake of the region in front of the city and flows down into sinkholes, which are called Zarethra, and when these are stopped up the water sometimes overflows into the plains, and when they are again opened up it rushes out of the plains all at once and empties into the Leyden and the Alpias, so that even at Olympia the land around the sanctuary was once inundated, while the lake was reduced, and the Eresinus, which flows past Stymphalus, sinks and flows beneath the mountain and reappears in the Argive land, and it was on this account, also, that Iphicrates, when he was besieging Stymphalus and accomplishing nothing, tried to block up the sink with a large quantity of sponges with which he had supplied himself, but desisted when Zeus sent an omen from the sky. And near Phineas is also the water of the Styx, as it is called a small stream of deadly water which is held to be sacred. So much may be said concerning Arcadia. 8.5 Polybius states that the distance from Malii towards the north as far as the Ister is about 10,000 stadia, but Artemidorus corrects the statement in an appropriate manner by saying that from Malii to Aegium is a journey of 1400 stadia, and thence to Syra a voyage of 200, and thence through Heraclea to Thaumasi a journey of 500, and then to Larissa and the Peneus 340, and then through Tempe to the outlets of the Peneus 240, and then to Thessalonicea 660, and thence through Idomeni and Stobi and Dardania to the Ister 3200. According to Artemidorus, therefore, the distance from the Ister to Malii amounts to 6,540 stadia. The cause of this success is that he does not give the measurement of the shortest route, but of the chance route which one of the generals took. And it is not out of place, perhaps, to add also the colonizers, mentioned by Ephorus, of the peoples who settled in the Peloponnesus after the return of the Heraclati, Alatus, the colonizer of Corinth, Phalsus of Sicyon, Tisaminus of Achaea, Oxalus of Elis, Crisphanes of Messene, Eurysthenes and Procles of Lacedaemon, Temenus and Sissus of Argos, and Aegeus and Defontes of the region about Oct. Book 9. 1.1 Attica Now that I have completed my circuit of the Peloponnesus, which, as I have said, was the first and the smallest of the peninsulas of which Greece consists, it will be next in order to traverse those that are continuous with it. The second peninsula is the one that adds Megaris to the Peloponnesus, so that Cromion belongs to the Megarians and not to the Corinthians. The third is the one which, in addition to the second, comprises Attica and Boeotia and a part of Phocis and of the Epignomidian Locrians. I must therefore describe these two. Eutyxus says that if one should imagine a straight line drawn in an easterly direction from the Ciraunian mountains to Sunio, the promontory of Attica, it would leave on the right, towards the south, the whole of the Peloponnesus, and on the left, towards the north, the continuous coastline from the Ciraunian mountains to the Chrysian Gulf and Megaris, and the coastline of all Attica. And he believes that the shore which extends from Sunio to the Isthmus would not be so concave as to have a great bend, if to this shore were not added the districts continuous with the Isthmus which form the Hermionic Gulf and Oct, and, in the same way, he believes that the shore which extends from the Ciraunian mountains to the Corinthian Gulf would not, viewed by itself alone, have so great a bend as to be concave like a gulf if Rium and Anarium did not draw closely together and afford this appearance, and the same is true of the shores that surround the recess of the gulf, where the sea in this region comes to an end. 1.2 Since this is the description given by Eutyxus, a mathematician and an expert both in geometrical figures and in climata, and acquainted with these places, one must conceive of this side of Attica together with Megaris the side extending from Sunio to the Isthmus as concave, though only slightly so. Now here, at about the center of the aforesaid line, is the Piraeus, the seaport of Athens. It is distant from Shonus, at the Isthmus, about 350 stadia, and from Sunio 330. The distance from the Piraeus to Pegae also is nearly the same as to Shonus, though the former is said to exceed the latter by 10 stadia. After doubling Sunio one's voyage is towards the north, but with an inclination towards the west. 1.3 Oct is washed by two seas, it is narrow at first, and then it widens out into the interior, though nonetheless it takes a crescent-like bend towards Oropus and Boeotia, with the convex side towards the sea, and this is the second, the eastern side of Attica. Then comes the remaining side, which faces the north and extends from the European country towards the west as far as Megaris I mean the mountainous part of Attica, which has many names and separates Boeotia from Attica, so that, as I have said before, Boeotia, since it has a sea on either side, becomes an isthmus of the third peninsula above mentioned, an isthmus comprising within it the parts that lie towards the Peloponnesus, that is, Megaris and Attica. And it is on this account, they say, that the country which is now, by a slight change of letters, called Attica, was in ancient times called Oct and Actus, because the greatest part of it lies below the mountains, stretches flat along the sea, is narrow, and has considerable length, projecting as far as Sunio. I shall therefore describe these sides, resuming again at that point of the seaboard where I left off. 1.4 After Cromion, and situated above Attica, are the Scaronian rocks. 
they leave no room for a road along the sea, but the road from the Isthmus to Megara and Attica passes above them. However, the road approaches so close to the rocks that in many places it passes along the edge of precipices, because the mountain situated above them is both lofty and impracticable for roads. Here is the setting of the myth about Scaron and the Pitiocamps, the robbers who infested the above-mentioned mountainous country and were killed by Theseus. And the Athenians have given the name Scaron to the Argestes, the violent wind that blows down on the travellers left from the heights of this mountainous country. After the Scaronian rocks one comes to Cape Manoa, which projects into the sea and forms the harbour at Nisaea. Nisaea is the naval station of the Megarians, it is 18 stadia distant from the city and is joined to it on both sides by walls. The naval station, too, used to be called Manoa. 1.5 In early times this country was held by the same Ionians who held Attica. Megara, however, had not yet been founded, and therefore the poet does not specifically mention this region, but when he calls all the people of Attica Athenians he includes these two under the general name, considering them Athenians. Thus, when he says in the catalogue, and those who held Athens, well-built city, we must interpret him as meaning the people now called Megarians as well, and assume that these also had a part in the expedition. And the following is proof, in early times Attica was called Ionia and Ias, and when the poet says, they're the Boeotians and the Ionians, he means the Athenians, and Megaris was a part of this Ionia. 1.6 Furthermore, since the Peloponnesians and Ionians were having frequent disputes about their boundaries, on which, among other places, Cromionia was situated, they made an agreement and erected a pillar in the place agreed upon, near the Isthmus itself, with an inscription on the side facing the Peloponnesus reading, this is Peloponnesus, not Ionia, and on the side facing Megara, this is not Peloponnesus, but Ionia. And though the writers of the histories of the land of Athes are at variance on many things, they all agree on this, at least all writers who are worth mentioning that Pandion had four sons, Aegis, Lycus, Pallas, and the fourth, Nisus, and that when Attica was divided into four parts, Nisus obtained Megaris as his portion and founded Nisaea. Now, according to Philochorus, his rule extended from the Isthmus to the Pythium, but according to Andron, only as far as Eleusis and the Thriasian plain. Although different writers have stated the division into four parts in different ways, it suffices to take the following from Sophocles. Aegis says that his father ordered him to depart to the shorelands, assigning to him as the eldest the best portion of this land. Then to Lycus he assigns Eubea's garden that lies side by side therewith, and for Nisus he selects the neighboring land of Scaron shore, and the southerly part of the land fell to this rugged palace, breeder of giants. These, then, are the proofs which writers use to show that Megaris was a part of Attica. 1.7 But after the return of the Heraclidae and the partitioning of the country, it came to pass that many of the former inhabitants were driven out of their homelands into Attica by the Heraclidae and the Dorians who came back with them. Among these was Melanthus, the king of Messene. And he reigned also over the Athenians, by their consent, after his victory in single combat over Xanthus, the king of the Boeotians. But since Attica was now populous on account of the exiles, the Heraclidae became frightened and at the instigation chiefly of the people of Corinth and the people of Messene of the former because of their proximity and of the latter because Cadrus, the son of Melanthus, was at that time king of Attica they made an expedition against Attica. But being defeated in battle they retired from the whole of the land except the Megarian territory, this they occupied and not only founded the city Megara but also made its population Dorians instead of Ionians. And they also destroyed the pillar which was the boundary between the Ionians and the Peloponnesians. 1.8 The city of the Megarians has experienced many changes, but nevertheless it has endured until the present time. It once even had schools of philosophers who were called the Megarian sect, these being the successors of Euclides, the Socratic philosopher, a Megarian by birth, just as the Elian sect, to which Pyrrhon belonged, were the successors of Fate on the Elian, who was also a Socratic philosopher, and just as the Eritrean sect were the successors of Menedemus the Eritrean. The country of the Megarians, like Attica, has rather poor soil, and the greater part of it is occupied by the Onean Mountains, as they are called a kind of ridge, which extends from the Scaronian rocks to Boeotia and Cathiron, and separates the sea at Nisaea from the Alcyonian Sea, as it is called, at Pegae. 1.9 On the voyage from Nisaea to Attica one comes to five small islands. Then to Salamis, which is about 70 stadia in length, though some say 80. It contains a city of the same name, the ancient city, now deserted, faces towards Aena and the south wind just as Aeschylus has said, and Aena here lies towards the blasts of the south wind, but the city of today is situated on a gulf, on a peninsula-like place which borders on Attica. In early times it was called by different names, for example, Scyrus and Sycorea, after certain heroes. 
it is from one of these heroes that Athena is called Skiras, and that a place in Attica is called Syra, and that a certain sacred rite is performed in honor of Cyrus, and that one of the months is called Syrophorion. And it is from the other hero that the serpent Sishrides took its name the serpent which, according to Hesiod, was fostered by Sicrius and driven out by Eurylochus because it was damaging the island, and was welcomed to Eleusis by Demeter and made her attendant. And the island was also called Pityessa, from the tree. But the fame of the island is due to the Iacidae, who ruled over it, and particularly to Aeus, the son of Telamon, and also to the fact that near this island Xerxes was defeated by the Greeks in a naval battle and fled to his homeland. And the Aegeanetans also shared in the glory of this struggle, since they were neighbors and furnished a considerable fleet. And there is in Salamis a river Bocorus, which is now called Bocalia. 1.10 At the present time the island is held by the Athenians, although in early times there was strife between them and the Megarians for its possession. Some say that it was Pesistratus, others Solon, who inserted in the catalogue of ships immediately after the verse, and Aeus brought twelve ships from Salamis, the verse, and, bringing them, halted them where the battalions of the Athenians were stationed, and then used the poet as a witness that the island had belonged to the Athenians from the beginning. But the critics do not accept this interpretation, because many of the verses bear witness to the contrary. For why is Aeus found in the last place in the ship camp, not with the Athenians, but with the Thessalians under Protesilaus? Here were the ships of Aeus and Protesilaus. And in the visitation of the troops, Agamemnon found Menesthus the charioteer, son of Petios, standing still, and about him were the Athenians, masters of the battle cry. And nearby stood Odysseus of many wiles, and about him, at his side, the ranks of the Cephalenians. And back again to Aeus and the Salaminians, he came to the Aeons, and near them, Idomeneus on the other side, not Menesthus. The Athenians, then, are reputed to have cited alleged testimony of this kind from Homer, and the Megarians to have replied with the following parody, Aeus brought ships from Salamis, from Polycton, from Agirissa, from Nisaea, and from Tripods, these four are Megarian places, and, of these, Tripods is called Tripodicium, near which the present marketplace of the Megarians is situated. 1.11 Some say that Salamis is foreign to Attica, citing the fact that the priestess of Athena Polios does not touch the fresh cheese made in Attica, but eats only that which is brought from a foreign country, yet uses, among others, that from Salamis. Wrongly, for she eats cheese brought from the other islands that are admittedly attached to Attica, since those who began this custom considered as foreign any cheese that was imported by sea. But it seems that in early times the present Salamis was a separate state, and that Megara was a part of Attica. And it is on the seaboard opposite Salamis that the boundaries between the Megarian country and Athes are situated two mountains which are called Serata. 1.12 Then one comes to the city Eleusis, in which is the sanctuary of the Eleusinian Demeter, and the mystic chapel which was built by Ichnus, a chapel which is large enough to admit a crowd of spectators. This Ichnus also built the Parthenon on the Acropolis in honor of Athena, Pericles superintending the work. Eleusis is numbered among the Demis. 1.13 Then one comes to the Thriasian plain, and the shore and Deme bearing the same name, Thria. Then to Cape Amphale and the quarry that lies above it, and to the passage to Salamis, about two stadia wide, across which Xerxes attempted to build a mole, but was forestalled by the naval battle and the flight of the Persians. Here, too, are the Pharmacasi, two small islands, on the larger of which is to be seen the tomb of Circe. 1.14 Above this shore is the mountain called Corydalus, and also the Deme Corydalus. Then one comes to the harbour Foron, and to Citalia, a small, deserted, rocky island, which some have called the eyesore of the Piraeus. And nearby, too, is Atalanta, which bears the same name as the island near Euboea and the Locrians, and another island similar to Citalia. Then one comes to the Piraeus, which also is classed among the Demis, and to Munyakia. 1.15 Munyakia is a hill which forms a peninsula, and it is hollowed out and undermined in many places, partly by nature and partly by the purpose of man, so that it admits of dwellings, and the entrance to it is by means of a narrow opening and beneath the hill lie three harbours. Now in early times Munyakia was walled, and covered with habitations in a manner similar to the city of the Rhodians, including within the circuit of its walls both the Piraeus and the harbours, which were full of ship sheds, among which was the arsenal, the work of Philone and the naval station was sufficient for the 400 ships, for no fewer than this the Athenians were wont to dispatch on expeditions. With this wall were connected the legs that stretched down from the city, these were the long walls, 40 stadia in length, which connected the city with the Piraeus. But the numerous wars caused the ruin of the wall and of the fortress of Munyakia, and reduced the Piraeus to a small settlement, round the harbours and the sanctuary of Zeus Soter. 
the small roofed colonnades of the sanctuary have admirable paintings, the works of famous artists, and its open court has statues. The long walls, also, are torn down, having been destroyed at first by the Lacedaemonians, and later by the Romans, when Sulla took both the Piraeus and the city by siege. 1.16 The city itself is a rock situated in a plain and surrounded by dwellings. On the rock is the sacred precinct of Athena, comprising both the old temple of Athena Polius, in which is the lamp that is never quenched, and the Parthenon built by Ichnus, in which is the work in ivory by Phidias, the Athena. However, if I once began to describe the multitude of things in this city that are lauded and proclaimed far and wide, I fear that I should go too far, and that my work would depart from the purpose I have in view. For the words of Hegesias occur to me, I see the Acropolis, and the mark of the huge trident there. I see Eleusis, and I have become an initiate into its sacred mysteries, yonder is the Leocorium, here is the Theseum, I am unable to point them all out one by one, for Attica is the possession of the gods, who seized it as a sanctuary for themselves, and of the ancestral heroes. So this writer mentioned only one of the significant things on the Acropolis, but Polemon the Paragete wrote four books on the dedicatory offerings on the Acropolis alone. Hegesias is proportionately brief in referring to the other parts of the city and to the country, and though he mentions Eleusis, one of the 170 Demis, or 174, as the number is given, he names none of the others. 1.17 Most of the Demis, if not all, have numerous stories of a character both mythical and historical connected with them, Aphidna, for example, has the rape of Helen by Theseus, the sacking of the place by the Dioscuri and the recovery of their sister, Marathon has the Persian battle, Ramnus has the statue of Nemesis, which by some is called the work of Diodotus and by others of Agaracritus the Parian, a work which both in grandeur and in beauty is a great success and rivals the works of Phidias, and so with Decelia, the base of operations of the Peloponnesians in the Decelian War, and File, whence Thrasybulus brought the popular party back to the Piraeus and then to the city. And so, also, in the case of several other Demis there are many historical incidents to tell, and, further, the Leocorium and the Theseum have myths connected with them and so has the Lyceum, and the Olympicum, the Olympium is the same thing, which the king who dedicated it left half finished at his death. And in like manner also the Academy, and the Gardens of the Philosophers, and the Odium, and the Colonnade called Poesol, and the Sanctuaries in the city containing very many marvellous works of different artists. 1.18 The account would be much longer if one should pass and review the early founders of the settlement, beginning with Cecrops, for all writers do not agree about them, as is shown even by the names. For instance, Actis, they say, was derived from Actaean, and Athes and Attica from Athes, the daughter, or son, of Cranius, after whom the inhabitants were also called Crani, and Mopsopia from Mopsopus, and Ionia from Ion, the son of Zeuthus, and Poseidonia and Athens from the gods after whom they were named. And, as has already been said, the race of the Pulaski clearly sojourned here too, and on account of their wanderings were called Pelargi. 1.19 The greater men's fondness for learning about things that are famous and the greater the number of men who have talked about them, the greater the censure, if one is not master of the historical facts. For example, in his collection of the rivers, Callimachus says that it makes him laugh if anyone makes bold to write that the Athenian virgins draw pure liquid from the Eridanus, from which even cattle would hold aloof. Its sources are indeed existent now, with pure and potable water, as they say, outside the gates of Diochores, as they are called, near the Lyceum but in earlier times there was also a fountain near by which was constructed by man, with abundant and excellent water, and even if the water is not so now, why should it be a thing to wonder at, if in early times the water was abundant and pure, and therefore also potable, but in later times underwent a change. However, it is not permitted me to linger over details, since they are so numerous, nor yet, on the other hand, to pass by them all in silence without even mentioning one or another of them in a summary way. 1.20 It suffices, then, to add thus much, according to Philochorus, when the country was being devastated, both from the sea by the Carians, and from the land by the Boeotians, who were called Onians, Cecrops first settled the multitude in twelve cities, the names of which were Scropia, Tetrapolis, Hippocria, Decelia, Eleusis, Aphidna, also called Aphidni, in the plural, Thoricus, Broron, Scytherus, Sphetus, Cephasia and at a later time Theseus is said to have united the twelve into one city, that of today. Now in earlier times the Athenians were ruled by kings, and then they changed to a democracy, but tyrants assailed them, Pesistratus and his sons, and later an oligarchy arose, not only that of the four hundred, but also that of the thirty tyrants, who were set over them by the Lacedaemonians, of these they easily rid themselves, and preserved the democracy until the Roman conquest. 
for even though they were molested for a short time by the Macedonian kings, and were even forced to obey them, they at least kept the general type of their government the same. And some say that they were actually best governed at that time, during the ten years when Cassander reigned over the Macedonians. For although this man is reputed to have been rather tyrannical in his dealings with all others, yet he was kindly disposed towards the Athenians, once he had reduced the city to subjection, for he placed over the citizens Demetrius of Philirum, one of the disciples of Theophrastus the philosopher, who not only did not destroy the democracy but even improved it, as is made clear in the memoirs which Demetrius wrote concerning this government. But the envy and hatred felt for oligarchy was so strong that, after the death of Cassander, Demetrius was forced to flee to Egypt, and the statues of him, more than three hundred, were pulled down by the insurgents and melted, and some writers go on to say that they were made into chamber pots. Be that as it may, the Romans, seeing that the Athenians had a democratic government when they took them over, preserved their autonomy and liberty. But when the Mithridatic War came on, tyrants were placed over them, whomever the king wished. The most powerful of these, Aristian, who violently oppressed the city, was punished by Sulla the Roman commander when he took this city by siege, though he pardoned the city itself, and to this day it is free and held in honor among the Romans. 1.21 After the Piraeus comes the Deme fail race, on the seaboard next to it, then Halimus I, Ixenice, Alias, Exonasi, and Anagyrage. Then Thorace, Lamptrace, Aegileice, Anaphlastae, Atenace. These are the Demis as far as the Cape of Sunio. Between the aforesaid Demis is a long cape, the first cape after Ixenice, Zoster, then another after Thorace, I mean Ostipalea. Off the former of these lies the island Fabra, and off the latter the island Elusa, and also opposite Ixoniais is Hydrusa. And in the neighborhood of Anaphwistus is also the shrine of Pan, and the sanctuary of Aphrodite Coleus, at which place, they say, were cast forth by the waves the last wreckage of the ships after the Persian naval battle near Salamis, the wreckage concerning which Apollo predicted the women of Coleus will cook food with the oars. Off these places, too, is the island Belbina, at no great distance, and also Patroclu Cherax but most of these islands are uninhabited. 1.22 On doubling the Cape of Sunyo one comes to Sunyo, a noteworthy Deme, then to Thoricus, then to a Deme called Potamus, whose inhabitants are called Potami, then to Prasia, to Styria, to Broron, where is the sanctuary of the Artemis Brauronia, to Haliarophenides, where is the sanctuary of Artemis Toropolos, to Murinus, to Probolinthus, and to Marathon, where Multiades utterly destroyed the forces under Datis the Persian, without waiting for the Lacedaemonians, who came too late because they wanted the full moon. Here, too, is the scene of the myth of the Marathonian bull, which was slain by Theseus. After Marathon one comes to Trichorinthus, then to Ramnus, the sanctuary of Nemesis, then to Sophus, the land of the Europeans. In the neighborhood of Sophus is the Amphiarium, an oracle once held in honor, wherein is flight Amphiaraeus, as Sophocles says, with four-horse chariot, armor and all, was received by a cleft that was made in the Theban dust. Oropus has often been disputed territory, for it is situated on the common boundary of Attica and Boeotia. Off this coast are islands, off Thoricus and Sunio lies the island Helene, it is rugged and deserted, and in its length of about sixty stadia extends parallel to the coast. This island, they say, is mentioned by the poet where Alexander says to Helen, not even when first I snatched thee from lovely Lacedaemon and sailed with thee on the seafaring ships, and in the island Cronai joined with thee in love and couch, for he calls Cronai the island now called Helene from the fact that the intercourse took place there. And after Helene comes Euboea, which lies off the next stretch of coast, it likewise is narrow and long and in length lies parallel to the mainland, like Helene. The voyage from Sunyo to the southerly promontory of Euboea, which is called Lusoct, is 300 stadia. However, I shall discuss Euboea later, but as for the Demis in the interior of Attica, it would be tedious to recount them because of their great number. 1.23 of the mountains, those which are most famous are Hymetus, Brylasus, and Lycabetus, and also Parnes and Corydalus. Near the city are most excellent quarries of marble, the Hymetian and Pentelic. Hymetus also produces the best honey. The silver mines in Attica were originally valuable, but now they have failed. Moreover, those who worked them, when the mining yielded only meager returns, melted again the old refuse, or dross, and were still able to extract from it pure silver since the workmen of earlier times had been unskillful in heating the ore in furnaces. But though the Attic honey is the best in the world, that in the country of the silver mines is said to be much the best of all, the kind which is called Akabnistan, from the mode of its preparation. 1.24 The rivers of Attica are the Sophisus, which has its source in the Demetrinimase, it flows through the plain, 
hence the allusions to the bridge and the bridge railleries and then through the legs of the walls which extend from the city to the Piraeus, it empties into the Phaleric Gulf, being a torrential stream most of the time, although in summer it decreases and entirely gives out. And such is still more the case with the Elysis, which flows from the other part of the city into the same coast, from the region above Agra and the Lyceum, and from the fountain which is lauded by Plato in the Phaedrus. So much for Attica. 2.1 Boeotia next in order is Boeotia, and when I discuss this country and the tribes that are continuous with it, I must, for the sake of clearness, call to mind what I have said before. As I have said, the seaboard from Sunio to Thessalonicea extends towards the north, slightly inclining towards the west and keeping the sea on the east, and that the parts above this seaboard lie towards the west ribbon-like stretches of country extending parallel to one another through the whole country. The first of these parts is Attica together with Megaris a ribbon-like stretch of country, having as its eastern side the seaboard from Sunio to Oropus and Boeotia, and as its western side the Isthmus and the Alcyonian Sea, which extends from Pegae to the boundaries of Boeotia near Creusa, and as its remaining two sides, the seaboard from Sunio to the Isthmus and the mountainous country approximately parallel thereto which separates Attica from Boeotia. The second of these parts is Boeotia, extending ribbon-like from the east towards the west, from the Euboean Sea to the sea at the Chrysian Gulf, and it is about equal in length to Attica or perhaps less, in the fertility of its soil, however, it is far superior. 2.2 Ephorus declares that Boeotia is superior to the countries of the bordering tribes, not only in fertility of soil, but also because it alone has three seas and has a greater number of good harbours, in the Chrysian and Corinthian Gulf as it receives the products of Italy and Sicily and Libya, while in the part which faces Euboea, since its seaboard branches off on either side of the Euripus, on one side towards Aulis and the territory of Tanagra and on the other towards Salganius and Anthedon, the sea stretches unbroken in the one direction towards Egypt and Cyprus and the islands, and in the other direction towards Macedonia and the regions of the Propontis and the Hellespont. And he adds that Euboea has, in a way, been made a part of Boeotia by the Euripus, since the Euripus is so narrow and is spanned by a bridge to Euripus only two plethora long. Now he praises the country on account of these things, and he says that it is naturally well suited to hegemony, but that those who were from time to time its leaders neglected careful training and education, and therefore, although they at times achieved success, they maintained it only for a short time, as is shown in the case of Epmenondas, for after he died the Thebans immediately lost the hegemony, having had only a taste of it, and that the cause of this was the fact that they belittled the value of learning and of intercourse with mankind, and cared for the military virtues alone. Ephorus should have added that these things are particularly useful in dealing with Greeks, although force is stronger than reason in dealing with the barbarians. And the Romans too, in ancient times, when carrying on war with savage tribes, needed no training of this kind, but from the time that they began to have dealings with more civilized tribes and races, they applied themselves to this training also, and so established themselves as lords of all. 2.3b That as it may, Boeotia in earlier times was inhabited by barbarians, the Ones and the Temeses, who wandered thither from Sunio, and by the Leliges and the Hyats. Then the Phoenicians occupied it, I mean the Phoenicians with Cadmus, the man who fortified the Cadmia and left the dominion to his descendants. Those Phoenicians founded Thebes in addition to the Cadmia, and preserved their dominion, commanding most of the Boeotians until the expedition of the Epigoni. On this occasion they left Thebes for a short time, but came back again. And, in the same way, when they were ejected by the Thracians and the Pelasgians, they established their government in Thessaly along with the Arnii for a long time, so that they were all called Boeotians. Then they returned to the homeland, at the time when the Aeolian fleet, near Aulis in Boeotia, was now ready to set sail, I mean the fleet which the sons of Orestes were dispatching to Asia. After adding the Orchomenian country to Boeotia, for in earlier times the Orchomenians were not a part of the Boeotian community, nor did Homer enumerate them with the Boeotians, but as a separate people, for he called them Minyi, they, with the Orchomenians, drove out the Pelasgians to Athens. It was after these that a part of the city was named Pelasgicon, though they took up their abode below Hymettus, and the Thracians to Parnassus, and the Hyants founded a city Hyas in Phocis. 2.4 Ephorus says that the Thracians, after making a treaty with the Boeotians, attacked them by night when they, thinking that peace had been made, were encamping rather carelessly, and when the Boeotians frustrated the Thracians, at the same time making the charge that they were breaking the treaty, the Thracians asserted that they had not broken it, for the treaty said by day, whereas they had made the attack by night, whence arose the proverb, Thracian pretense, and the Pelasgians, when the war was still going on, went to consult the oracle, as did also the Boeotians. Now Ephorus is unable, he says, to tell the oracular response that was given to the Pelasgians, but the prophetess replied to the Boeotians that they would prosper if they committed sacrilege, and the messengers who were sent to consult the oracle, 
suspecting that the prophetess responded thus out of favor to the Pelasgians, because of her kinship with them, indeed, the sanctuary also was from the beginning Pelasgian, seized the woman and threw her upon a burning pile, for they considered that, whether she had acted falsely or had not, they were right in either case, since, if she uttered a false oracle, she had her punishment, whereas, if she did not act falsely, they had only obeyed the order of the oracle. Now those in charge of the sanctuary, he says, did not approve of putting to death without trial and that too in the sanctuary the men who did this, and therefore they brought them to trial, and summoned them before the priestesses, who were also the prophetesses, being the two survivors of the three, but when the Baoshans said that it was nowhere lawful for women to act as judges, they chose an equal number of men in addition to the women. Now the men, he says, voted for acquittal, but the women for conviction, and since the votes cast were equal, those for acquittal prevailed, and in consequence of this prophecies are uttered at Dodona by men to Baoshans only. The prophetesses, however, explain the oracle to mean that the god ordered the Baoshans to steal the tripods and take one of them to Dodona every year, and they actually do this, for they always take down one of the dedicated tripods by night and cover it up with garments, and secretly, as it were, carry it to Dodona. 2.5 After this the Baoshans cooperated with Penthilus and his followers in forming the Aeolian colony, sending with him most of their own people, so that it was also called a Boeotian colony. A long time afterwards the country was thoroughly devastated by the Persian war that took place near Platy. Then they recovered themselves to such an extent that the Thebans, having conquered the Lacedaemonians in two battles, laid claim to supremacy over the Greeks. But Epmenondas fell in the battle, and consequently they were disappointed in this hope, but still they went to war on behalf of the Greeks against the Phocians, who had robbed their common sanctuary. And after suffering loss from this war, as also from the Macedonians when these attacked the Greeks, they lost their city, which was razed to the ground by these same people, and then received it back from them when rebuilt. From that time on the Thebans have fared worse and worse down to our own time, and Thebes today does not preserve the character even of a respectable village, and the like is true of other Boeotian cities, except Tanagra and Thespiae, which, as compared with Thebes, have held out fairly well. 2.6 Next in order I must make a circuit of the country, beginning at that part of the coastline opposite Euboea which joins Attica. The beginning is Oropus, and the sacred harbour, which is called Delphinium, opposite which is the ancient Eritrea in Euboea, the distance across being 60 stadia. After Delphinium, at a distance of 20 stadia, is Oropus, and opposite Oropus is the present Eritrea, and to it the passage across the strait is 40 stadia. 2.7 Then one comes to Delium, the sanctuary of Apollo, which is a reproduction of that in Delos. It is a small town of the Tanagrians, thirty stadia distant from Aulis. It was to this place that the Athenians, after their defeat in battle, made their headlong flight, and in the flight Socrates the philosopher, who was serving on foot, since his horse had got away from him, saw Xenophon the son of Gryllus lying on the ground, having fallen from his horse, and took him up on his shoulders and carried him in safety for many stadia, until the flight ceased. 2.8 Then one comes to a large harbour, which is called Bathys Lyman, then to Aulis, a rocky place and a village of the Tanagrians. Its harbour is large enough for only fifty boats, and therefore it is reasonable to suppose that the naval station of the Greeks was in the large harbour. And nearby, also, is the Euripus at Chalcis, to which the distance from Sunio is 670 stadia, and over it is a bridge two plethora long, as I have said, and a tower stands on each side, one on the side of Chalcis, and the other on the side of Boeotia, and tube-like passages have been constructed into the towers. Concerning the refluent currents of the Euripus it is enough to say only thus much, that they are said to change seven times each day and night, but the cause of the changes must be investigated elsewhere. 2.9 Near the Euripus, upon a height, is situated a place called Salganius. It is named after Salganius, a Boeotian, who was buried there the man who guided the Persians when they sailed into this channel from the Maliac Gulf. It is said that he was put to death before they reached the Euripus by Megabates, the commander of the fleet, because he was considered a villain, on the ground that he had deceitfully rushed the fleet into a blind alley of the sea, but that the barbarian, when he perceived that he himself was mistaken, not only repented, but deemed worthy of burial the man who had been put to death without cause. 2.10 Near Oropus is a place called Gria, and also the sanctuary of Amphiraeus, and the monument of Narcissus the Eritrean, which is called Segalus's, because people pass it in silence. Some say that Gria is the same as Tanagra. The Poemandrian territory is the same as the Tanagrian, and the Tanagrians are also called Gepharians. The sanctuary of Amphiraeus was transferred hither in accordance with an oracle from the Theban Knopia. 2.11 Also Mycalysis, a village, is in the Tanagrian territory. It is situated on the road that leads from Thebes to Chalcis, and in the Boeotian dialect it is called Mycaletus. 
and Harma is likewise in the Tanagrian territory, it is a deserted village near Mycoletus, and received its name from the chariot of Amphureus, and is a different place from the Harma in Attica, which is near Phile, a deme of Attica bordering on Tanagra. Here originated the proverb, when the lightning flashes through Harma, for those who are called the Pythashti look in the general direction of Harma, in accordance with an oracle, and note any flash of lightning in that direction, and then, when they see the lightning flash, take the offering to Delphi. They would keep watch for three months, for three days and nights each month, from the altar of Zeus Astropaeus, this altar is within the walls between the Pythium and the Olympium. In regard to the Harma and Boeotia, some say that Amphureus fell in the battle out of his chariot near the place where his sanctuary now is, and that the chariot was drawn empty to the place which bears the same name, others say that the chariot of Adrastus, when he was in flight, was smashed to pieces there, but that Adrastus safely escaped on Orion. But Philochorus says that Adrastus was saved by the inhabitants of the village, and that on this account they obtained equal rights of citizenship from the Argives. 2.12 To anyone returning from Thebes to Argos, Tanagra is on the left, and, is situated on the right. And Heria, also, belongs to the Tanagrian territory now, though in earlier times it belonged to the Theban territory. Heria is the scene of the myth of Herius, and of the birth of Orion, of which Pindar speaks in his Dithyrams, it is situated near Aulis. Some say that Hisi is called Heria, belonging to the Parasopian country below Cathiron, near Erythri, in the interior, and that it is a colony of the Hyraeans and was founded by Nictus, the father of Antiope. There is also a Hisi in the Argive territory, a village, and its inhabitants are called Hisidae. The Erythri in Ionia is a colony of this Erythri. And Helion, also, is a village belonging to Tanagra, having been so named from the Hele. 2.13 After Salganius I comes to Anthedon, a city with a harbour, and it is the last city on that part of the Boeotian seaboard which is opposite to Euboea, as the poet says, Anthedon at the extremity. As one proceeds a little farther, however, there are still two small towns belonging to the Boeotians, Larimna, near which the Sophisus empties, and, still farther on, Halli, which bears the same name as the Attic Demis. Opposite this seaboard is situated, it is said, the Aegean Euboea, in which is the sanctuary of the Aegean Poseidon, which I have mentioned before. The distance across the strait from Anthedon to Ege is 120 stadia, but from the other places it is much less. The sanctuary is situated on a high mountain, where there was once a city. And Orbi also is near Ege. In the Anthedonian territory is Mount Mesopius, named after Mesopus, who, when he came into Iapogea, called the country Mesopia. Here, too, is the scene of the myth of Glaucus, the Anthedonian, who is said to have changed into a sea monster. 2.14 Near Anthedon and belonging to Boeotia, is a place that is esteemed sacred, and contains traces of a city, Isus, as it is called, with the first syllable pronounced short. Some, however, think that the verse should be written, sacred Isus and Anthedon at the extremity, lengthening the first syllable by poetic license on account of the meter, instead of sacred Nisa, for Nisa is nowhere to be seen in Boeotia, as Apollodorus says in his work on ships, so that Nisa could not be the correct reading, unless by Nisa the poet means Isus for there was a city Nisa bearing the same name in the territory of Megara, whose inhabitants emigrated to the foothills of Cathiron, but it has now disappeared. Some, however, think that we should write sacred Creusa, taking the poet to mean the Creusa of today, the naval station of the Thespians, which is situated in the Chrysian Gulf, but others think that we should read sacred Ferry. Ferry is one of the four united villages in the neighborhood of Tanagra, which are, Helion, Harma, Mycalysis, and Ferry. And still others write as follows sacred Nyssa. And Nyssa is a village in Helicon. Such, then, is the seaboard facing Euboea. 2.15 The plains in the interior, which come next in order, are hollows, and are surrounded everywhere on the remaining sides by mountains, by the mountains of Attica on the south, and on the north by the mountains of Phocis, and, on the west, Cathiron inclines, obliquely, a little above the Chrysian Sea, it begins contiguous with the mountains of Megara and Attica, and then bends into the plains, terminating in the neighborhood of Thebes. 2.16 Some of these plains are marshy, since rivers spread out over them, though other rivers fall into them and later find a way out, other plains are dried up, and on account of their fertility are tilled in all kinds of ways. But since the depths of the earth are full of caverns and holes, it has often happened that violent earthquakes have blocked up some of the passages, and also opened up others, some up to the surface of the earth and others through underground channels. The result for the waters, therefore, is that some of the streams flow through underground channels, whereas others flow on the surface of the earth, thus forming lakes and rivers. And when the channels in the depths of the earth are stopped up, 
It comes to pass that the lakes expand as far as the inhabited places, so that they swallow up both cities and districts, and that when the same channels, or others, are opened up, these cities and districts are uncovered, and that the same regions at one time are traversed in boats and at another on foot, and the same cities at one time are situated on the lake and at another far away from it. 2.17 One of two things has taken place, either the cities have remained unremoved, when the increase in the waters has been insufficient to overflow the dwellings because of their elevation, or else they have been abandoned and rebuilt elsewhere, when, being oftentimes endangered by their nearness to the lake, they have relieved themselves from fear by changing to districts farther away or higher up. And it follows that the cities thus rebuilt which have kept the same name, though at first called by names truly applying to them, derived from local circumstances, have names which no longer truly apply to them. For instance, it is probable that Platy was so called from the blade of the oars, and Platians were those who made their living from rowing, but now, since they live far away from the lake, the name can no longer truly apply to them. Helos and Helion and Hylesium were so called because they were situated near marshes, but now the case is different with these places, since they have been rebuilt elsewhere, or else the lake has been greatly reduced because of outflows that later took place, for this is possible. 2.18 This is best shown by the Sophisus, which fills Lake Copes, for when the lake had increased so much that Cope was in danger of being swallowed up, Cope is named by the poet, and from it the lake took its name, a rent in the earth, which was formed by the lake near Cope, opened up a subterranean channel about thirty stadia in length and admitted the river, and then the river burst forth to the surface near Larimna and Locris, I mean the upper Larimna, for there is another Larimna, which I have already mentioned, the Boeotian Larimna on the sea, to which the Romans annexed the upper Larimna. The place is called Ancho, and there is also a lake of the same name. And when it leaves this lake the Sophisus at last flows out to the sea. Now at that time, when the flooding of the lake ceased, there was also a cessation of danger to those who lived near it, except in the case of the cities which had already been swallowed up. And though the subterranean channels filled up again, Crates the mining engineer of Chalcis ceased clearing away the obstructions because of party strife among the Boeotians, although, as he himself says in the letter to Alexander, many places had already been drained. Among these places, some writers suppose, was the ancient site of Orcomenos, and others, those of Eleusis and Athens on the Triton River. These cities, it is said, were founded by Cecrops, when he ruled over Boeotia, then called Ogygia, but were later wiped out by inundations. And it is said that a fissure in the earth opened up near Orcomenos, also, and that it admitted the Melis River, which flowed through the territory of Haliartus and formed there the marsh which produces the reed that is used for flutes. But this river has completely disappeared, either because it is dispersed by the fissure into invisible channels or because it is used up beforehand by the marshes and lakes in the neighborhood of Haliartus, from which the poet calls the place grassy, when he says, and grassy Haliartus. 2.19 Now these rivers flow down from the Phocian mountains, and among them the Sophisus, which takes its beginning at Lilia, a Phocian city, as Homer says, and those who held Lilia, at the sources of Sophisus. And flowing through Elatia, the largest of the cities of Phocis, and through Peripotomy and Phonodius, which are likewise Phocian towns, it goes on into Cheronia and Boeotia, and then through the territories of Orcomenos and Coronia, and discharges into Lake Copes. And also the Permesis and the Olmaeus, flowing from Helicon, meet one another and fall into the same Lake Copes near Haliartus, and also other streams empty into it. Now it is a large lake, having a circuit of 380 stadia, but its outlets are nowhere to be seen, except for the fissure which admits the Sophisus, and for the marshes. 220 Among the neighboring lakes are Lake Trophia and the Cephician Lake, which is also mentioned by the poet, who dwelt in Heil, strongly intent upon wealth, on the shore of the Cephician Lake. For he does not mean Lake Copes, as some think, but Lake Hylis, accented on the last syllable like Lyris, which is named after the village nearby that is called Heil, accented like Lyra and Thyra, not Hyde, as some write, who dwelt in Hyde. For Hyde is in Lydia, below snowy Molus in the fertile land of Hyde, whereas Hyle is in Boeotia. At any rate, the poet appends to the words, on the shore of the Cephician Lake, the words, and near him dwelt the rest of the Boeotians. For Lake Copes is large, and not in the territory of Thebes, whereas the other is small, and is filled from Lake Copes through subterranean channels, and it is situated between Thebes and Anthodon. Homer, however, uses the word in the singular number, at one time making the first syllable long, as in the catalogue, and Hyle and Petian, by poetic license, and at another making it short, who dwelt in Hyle, and Tycheus, by far the best of leather workers, who had his home in Hyle. And certain critics are not correct in writing Hyde here, either, for Aeus was not sending to fetch his shield from Lydia. 2.21 These lakes suggest the order of the places that come next after them, 
so that nominally their positions are clearly determined, because the poet observes no order in naming the places, whether those that are worthy of mention or those that are not. But it is difficult, in naming so many places, most of them insignificant and situated in the interior, to avoid error in every case in the matter of their order. The seaboard, however, has a certain advantage with regard to this, the places there are better known, and, too, the sea more readily suggests the order of places. Therefore I, too, shall try to take my beginnings from the seaboard, although at present I shall disregard this intention, and following the poet shall make my enumeration of the places, adding everything taken from other writers, but omitted by him, that may be useful to us. He begins at Hyria and Aulis, concerning which I have already spoken. 2.22 Shonus is a district of the Theban territory on the road that leads from Thebes to Anthedon, and is about 50 stadia distant from Thebes, and there is also a river Shonus which flows through it. 2.23 Scolus is a village in the Parasopian country at the foot of Mount Cathiron, a place that is rugged and hardly habitable, whence the proverb, neither go to Scolus thyself nor follow another thither. And this is also said to be the place from which Pentheus was brought when he was torn to pieces. And there was another Scolus among the cities in the neighborhood of Olynthus bearing the same name as this village. And, as I have already said, there is also in the Trachinian Heraclea a village called Parasopii, past which flows a river Asopus, and in Sicyonia there is another Asopus river, and also the country Asopia, through which that Asopus flows, and there are also other rivers which bear this name. 2.24 The name Edionus was changed to Scarfi, and Scarfi too is in Parasopia, for the Asopus and the Isthmus flow through the plain which is in front of Thebes. And there is the spring called Dersi, and also Potnie, where is the scene of the myth of Glaucus of Potnie, who was torn to pieces by the Potnian mares near the city. Cathiron, also, ends not far from Thebes. The Asopus flows past it, washing its foothills and causing the division of the Parasopii into several settlements, and all the settlements are subject to Thebes, though another set of writers say that Scolus, Edionus, and Erythrae are in the territory of the Plataeans, for the river flows past Plataea, also, and empties near Tanagra. And in the territory of Thebes are also Therapne and Tumesis, which latter Antimachus has adorned with praise in many verses, although he enumerates goodly attributes which do not belong to it, as, for instance, there is a windy little hill, but the verses are well known. 2.25 The Thespiae of today is by Antimachus spelled Thespia, for there are many names of places which are used in both ways, both in the singular and in the plural, just as there are many which are used both in the masculine and in the feminine, whereas there are others which are used in either one or the other number only. Thespiae is a city near Mount Helicon, lying somewhat to the south of it, and both it and Helicon are situated on the Chrysian Gulf. It has a seaport Creusa, also called Creusus. In the Thespian territory, in the part lying towards Helicon, is Isker, the native city of Hesiod, it is situated on the right of Helicon, on a high and rugged place, and is about forty stadia distant from Thespiae. This city Hesiod himself has satirized in verses which allude to his father, because at an earlier time his father changed his abode to this place from the Aeolian Syme, saying, and he settled near Helicon in a wretched village, Usker, which is bad in winter, oppressive in summer, and pleasant at no time. Helicon is contiguous to Phocis in its northerly parts, and to a slight extent also in its westerly parts, in the region of the last harbour belonging to Phocis, the harbour which, from the fact in the case, is called Mycus, in most depth, for, speaking generally, it is above this harbour of the Chrysian Gulf that Helicon and Usker, and also Thespiae and its seaport Creusa, are situated. This is also considered the deepest recess of the Chrysian Gulf, and in general of the Corinthian Gulf. The length of the coastline from the harbour Mycus to Creusa is 90 stadia, and the length from Creusa as far as the promontory called Holmi is 120, and hence Pigae and Oino, of which I have already spoken, are situated in the deepest recess of the gulf. Now Helicon, not far distant from Parnassus, rivals it both in height and in circuit, for both are rocky and covered with snow, and their circuit comprises no large extent of territory. Here are the sanctuary of the Muses and Hippu Kreen and the cave of the nymphs called the Labeth Rides, and from this fact one might infer that those who consecrated Helicon to the Muses were Thracians, the same who dedicated Pyrus and Labethrum and Pimplia to the same goddesses. The Thracians used to be called peers, but, now that they have disappeared, the Macedonians hold these places. It has been said that Thracians once settled in this part of Boeotia, having overpowered the Boeotians, as did also Pelasgians and other barbarians. Now in earlier times Thespiae was well known because of the Eros of Praxiteles, which was sculptured by him and dedicated by Glycera the courtesan, she had received it as a gift from the artist, to the Thespians, since she was a native of the place. Now in earlier times travellers would go up to Thespia, a city otherwise not worth seeing, 
to see the Eros, and it presented in Tanagra are the only Boeotian cities that still endure, but of all the rest only ruins and names are left. 2.26 After Thespia Homer names Gria and Mycalysis, concerning which I have already spoken. He likewise says concerning the rest, and those who lived about Harma and Hylesium and Erythri, and those who held Elian and Hyle and Pedian. Pedian is a village in the Theban territory near the road to Anthedon. Akalia is midway between Haliartus and Alalcomenium, thirty stadia distant from each, and a river bearing the same name flows past it. The Phocian Midian is on the Chrysian Gulf, at a distance of 160 stadia from Boeotia, whereas the Boeotian Midian, which was named after it, is near in Kestis at the base of the mountain Phoenicius, and from this fact its name has been changed to Phoenicius. This mountain is also called a part of the Theban territory, but by some both Midian and Akalia are called a part of the territory of Haliartus. 2.27 Homer then goes on to say, Cope, and Eutrasus, and Thisbe abounding in doves. Concerning Cope I have already spoken. It lies towards the north on Lake Copes, and the others around the lake are these, Acraefi, Phoenice, Ancestus, Haliartus, Acalia, Alalcomeni, Tilfasium, Coronea. In early times, at least, the lake had no common name, but was called by different names corresponding to the several settlements lying on it, as, for instance, Copes from Cope, Haliartus from Haliartus, and so in the case of the rest of the settlements, but later the whole lake was called Copes, this name prevailing over all others, for the region of Cope forms the deepest recess of the lake. Pinder calls this lake Cephasus, at any rate, he places near it the spring Tilfasa, which flows at the foot of Mount Tilfasius near Haliartus and Alalcomeni, near which latter is the tomb of Tiresias, and here, too, is the sanctuary of the Tilfasan Apollo. 2.28 Next in order after Cope Homer names Eutrasus, a small village of the Thespians, where Zethus and Amphion are said to have lived before they reigned over Thebes. Thisbe is now called Thisbe, the place is inhabited and is situated slightly above the sea, bordering on the territory of the Thespians and on that of Coronea, and it, too, lies at the foot of Helicon on the south, and it has a seaport situated on a rocky place, which abounds in doves, in reference to which the poet says, Thisbe abounding in doves. From here to Sikian is a voyage of 160 stadia. 2.29 Next Homer names Coronea, Haliartus, Platyi, and Glissas. Now Coronea is situated on a height near Helicon. The Boeotians took possession of it on their return from the Thessalian army after the Trojan War, at which time they also occupied Orchomenos. And when they got the mastery of Coronea, they built in the plain before the city the sanctuary of the Etonian Athena, bearing the same name as the Thessalian sanctuary, and they called the river which flowed past Aquarius, giving it the same name as the Thessalian river. But Alcius calls it Coralius, when he says, Athena, warrior queen, who dost keep watch o'er the cornfields of Coronea before thy temple on the banks of the Coralius river. Here, too, the Pamboeotian festival used to be celebrated. And for some mystic reason, as they say, a statue of Hades was dedicated along with that of Athena. Now the people in Coronea are called Coronei, whereas those in the Messenian Coronea are called Coronais. 2.30 Haliartus is no longer in existence, having been raised to the ground in the war against Perseus, and the country is held by the Athenians, a gift from the Romans. It was situated in a narrow place, between the mountains situated above it and Lake Copes, near the Permessus and Olmeus rivers and the marsh that produces the flute reed. 2.31 Platy, which Homer speaks of in the singular number, is at the foot of Cathiron, between it and Thebes, along the road that leads to Athens and Megara, on the confines of Attica and Megaris, for Eleutheria is nearby, which some say belongs to Attica, others to Boeotia. I have already said that the Esopus flows past Platy. Here it was that the forces of the Greeks completely wiped out Mardonius and his 300,000 Persians, and they built a sanctuary of Zeus Eleutherius, and instituted the athletic games in which the victor received a crown, calling them the Eleutheria. And tombs of those who died in the battle, erected at public expense, are still to be seen. In Sicyonia, also, there is a deme called Platy, the home of Mnasels the poet, the tomb of Mnasels the Platean. Homer speaks of Glissas, a settlement in the mountain Hypatus, which is in the Theban country near Tumesis and Cadmia. The hillocks below which lies the Onian plain, as it is called, which extends from the Hypatus mountain to Thebes, are called Drea. 2.32 In these words of the poet, and those who held Hypothebs, some take him to mean some little city called Hypothebs, others Potnie, for Thebes, the latter say, was deserted because of the expedition of the Epigoni and had no part in the Trojan War. The former, however, say that the Thebans indeed had a part in the war, but that they were living in the level districts below Cadmia at that time, since they were unable to rebuild Cadmia, 
and since Cadmia was called Thebes, they add, the poet called the Thebans of that time Hypothebans instead of people who lived below Cadmia. 2.33 in Kestis is where the Amphictyonic Council used to convene, in the territory of Haliartus near Lake Copes and the Teneric Plain, it is situated on a height, is bare of trees, and has a sacred precinct of Poseidon, which is also bare of trees. But the poets embellish things, calling all sacred precincts sacred groves, even if they are bare of trees. Such, also, is the saying of Pindar concerning Apollo, stirred, he traversed both land and sea, and halted on great lookouts above mountains, and world great stones, laying foundations of sacred groves. But Alcaeus is wrong, for just as he perverted the name of the river Quarius, so he falsified the position of Ancestus, placing it near the extremities of Helicon, although it is at quite a distance from this mountain. 2.34 The Teneric Plain is named after Teneris. In myth he was the son of Apollo by Melia, and was a prophet of the oracle on the Toas mountain, which the same poet calls three-peaked, and once he took possession of the three-peaked hollow of Toas. And he calls Teneris temple minister, prophet, called by the same name as the plains. The Toas lies above the Teneric Plain and Lake Copes near Acraphium. Both the oracle and the mountain belong to the Thebans. And Acraphium itself also lies on a height. They say that this is called Arni by the poet, the same name as the Thessalian city. 2.35 Some say that Arni too was swallowed up by the lake, as well as Medea. Xenodotus, who writes and those who possessed a rich in vineyards, seems not to have read the statements of Hesiod concerning his native land, nor those of Eutyxus, who says much worse things concerning Asker. For how could anyone believe that such a place was called rich in vineyards by the poet? Wrong, also, are those who write Tarn instead of Arni, for not a single place named Tarn is pointed out among the Boeotians, though there is one among the Lydians, and this the poet mentions, Idomeneus then slew Festos, son of Boris the Meonian, who came from fertile Tarn. The remaining Boeotian cities concerning which it is worthwhile to make mention are, of those situated round the lake, Alalcamene and Tilfosium, and, of the rest, Cheronea, Lebedea, and Lectra. 2.36 Now as for Alalcamene, the poet mentions it, but not in the catalogue, Argive Hera and Alalcamenean Athena. It has an ancient sanctuary of Athena which is held in great honour, and they say, at least, that the goddess was born there, just as Hera was born in Argos, and that it was because of this that the poet named them both in this way, as natives of these places. And it was because of this, perhaps, that he did not mention in the catalogue the men of Alalcamene, since, being sacred, they were excused from the expedition. And in fact the city always continued unravaged, although it was neither large nor situated in a secure position, but in a plain. But all peoples, since they revered the goddess, held aloof from any violence towards the inhabitants, so that when the Thebans, at the time of the expedition of the Epigonoi, left their city, they are said to have fled for refuge to Alalcamene, and to Tilfosius, the mountain, a natural stronghold that lies above it, and at the base of this mountain is a spring called Tilfasa, and the monument of Tiresias, who died there at the time of the flight. 2.37 Cheronea is near Orchomenos. It was here that Philip the son of Amintas conquered the Athenians, Boeotians, and Corinthians in a great battle, and set himself up as lord of Greece. And here, too, are to be seen tombs of those who fell in the battle, tombs erected at public expense. And it was in the same region that the Romans so completely defeated the forces of Mithridates, many tens of thousands in number, that only a few escaped in safety to the sea and fled in their ships, whereas the rest either perished or were taken captive. 2.38 At Lebedea is situated an oracle of Trophonian Zeus. The oracle has a descent into the earth consisting of an underground chasm, and the person who consults the oracle descends into it himself. It is situated between Mount Helicon and Cheronea, near Cornea. 2.39 Lectra is the place where Epmenondas defeated the Lacedaemonians in a great battle and found a beginning of his overthrow of them, for after that time they were never again able to regain the hegemony of the Greeks which they formerly held and especially because they also fared badly in the second clash near Mantinea. However, although they had suffered such reverses, they continued to avoid being subject to others until the Roman conquest. And among the Romans, also, they have continued to be held in honour because of the excellence of their government. This place is to be seen on the road that leads from Plataea to Thespiae. 2.40 Next the poet gives the catalogue of the Orchomenians, whom he separates from the Boeotian tribe. He calls Orchomenos Minyaean, after the tribe of the Minyi. They say that some of the Minyi emigrated from there to Iolcus, and that from this fact the Argonauts were called Minyi. Clearly it was in early times both a rich and very powerful city. 
now to its wealth Homer also is a witness, for when enumerating the places that abounded in wealth he says, nor yet all that comes to Orchomenos nor all that comes to Egyptian Thebes. And of its power there is this proof, that the Thebans were wont to pay tribute to the Orchomenians and to Urgenus their tyrant, who is said to have been put to death by Heracles. Ateocles, one of those who reigned as king at Orchomenos, who founded a sanctuary of the Graces, was the first to display both wealth and power, for he honoured these goddesses either because he was successful in receiving graces, or in giving them, or both. For necessarily, when he had become naturally inclined to kindly deeds, he began doing honour to these goddesses, and therefore he already possessed this power, but in addition he also had to have money, for neither could anyone give much if he did not have much, nor could anyone have much if he did not receive much. But if he has both together, he has the reciprocal giving and receiving for the vessel that is at the same time being emptied and filled is always full for use, but he who gives and does not receive could not succeed in either, for he will stop giving because his treasury fails, also the givers will stop giving to him who receives only and grants no favours, and therefore he could not succeed in either way. And like things might be said concerning power. Apart from the common saying, money is the most valuable thing to men, and it has the most power of all things among men, we should look into the subject in detail. We say that kings have the greatest power, and on this account we call them potentates. They are potent in leading the multitudes whither they wish, through persuasion or force. Generally they persuade through kindness, for persuasion through words is not kingly, indeed, this belongs to the order, whereas we call it kingly persuasion when kings win and attract men whither they wish by kindly deeds. They persuade men, it is true, through kindly deeds, but they force them by means of arms. Both these things may be bought with money, for he has the largest army who is able to support the largest, and he who possesses the most means is also able to show the most kindness. They say that the place now occupied by Lake Copes was formerly dry ground, and that it was tilled in all kinds of ways when it was subject to the Orchomenians, who lived near it. And this fact, accordingly, is adduced as an evidence of their wealth. 2.41 Aspleden was by some called Spleden, without the first syllable. Then the name, both of it and of the country, was changed to Eudaelos, perhaps because, from its evening inclination, it offered a special advantage peculiar to its inhabitants, especially the mildness of its winters, for the two ends of the day are coldest, and of these the evening is colder than the morning, for as night approaches the cold is more intense, and as night retires it abates. But the sun is a means of mitigating the cold. The place, therefore, that is warmed most by the sun at the coldest time is mildest in winter. Eudaelos is twenty stadia distant from Orcomenos. And the river Melis is between them. 2.42 Above the Orchomenian territory lies Panopius, a Phocian city, and also Hyampolis. And bordering on these is Opus, the metropolis of the Epignomidian Locrians. Now in earlier times Orchomenos was situated on a plain, they say, but when the waters overflowed, the inhabitants migrated up to the mountain Acontius, which extends for a distance of sixty stadia to Peripotomy and Phocis. And they relate that the Achaeans in Pontus, as they are called, are a colony of Orchomenians who wandered there with Iolmenus after the capture of Troy. There was also an Orchomenos in the neighbourhood of Charistus. Those who have written concerning the ships have supplied us well with such materials, and are the writers we follow when they say things appropriate to the purpose of our work. 3.1 Phocis after Boeotia and Orchomenos 1 comes to Phocis, it stretches towards the north alongside Boeotia, nearly from sea to sea, it did so in early times, at least, for in those times Daphnis belonged to Phocis, splitting Locris into two parts and being placed by geographers midway between the Opentian Gulf and the coast of the Epignomidians. The country now belongs to the Locrians, the town has been raised to the ground, so that even here Phocis no longer extends as far as the Euboean Sea, though it does border on the Chrysian Gulf. For Chrysa itself belongs to Phocis, being situated by the sea itself and so do Sura and Antisyra and the places which lie in the interior and contiguous to them near Parnassus I mean Delphi, Surface, and Daulis and Parnassus itself which belongs to Phocis and forms its boundary on its western side. In the same way as Phocis lies alongside Boeotia, so also Locris lies alongside Phocis on either side, for Locris is double, being divided into two parts by Parnassus, the part on the western side lying alongside Parnassus and occupying a part of it, and extending to the Chrysian Gulf, whereas the part on the side towards the east ends at the UB and C. The westerners are called Locrians and Ozoli, and they have the star Hesperus engraved on their public seal. The other division of inhabitants is itself also divided, in a way, into two parts, the Opentians, named after their metropolis, whose territory borders on Phocis and Boeotia, and the Epignomidians, named after a mountain called Knemis, who are next to the Oetians and Malians. In the middle between both, 
I mean the Westerners and the other division, is Parnassus, extending lengthwise into the northerly part of the country, from the region of Delphi as far as the junction of the Oetian and the Aetolian mountains, and the country of the Dorians which lies in the middle between them. For again, just as Locris, being double, lies alongside Phocis, so also the country of the Oetians together with Aetolia and with certain places of the Dorian Tetrapolis, which lie in the middle between them, lie alongside either part of Locris and alongside Parnassus and the country of the Dorians. Immediately above these are the Thessalians, the northerly Aetolians, the Acarnanians, and some of the Aparod and Macedonian tribes. As I was saying before, one should think of the aforementioned countries as ribbon-like stretches, so to speak, extending parallel to one another from the west towards the east. The whole of Parnassus is esteemed as sacred, since it has caves and other places that are held in honor and deemed holy. Of these the best known and most beautiful is Corusium, a cave of the nymphs bearing the same name as that in Cilicia. Of the sides of Parnassus, the western is occupied by the Ozolian Locrians and by some of the Dorians and by the Aetolians who live near the Aetolian mountain called Corax, whereas the other side is occupied by Phocians and by the majority of the Dorians, who occupy the Tetrapolis, which in a general way lies round Parnassus, but widens out in its parts that face the east. Now the long sides of each of the aforementioned countries and ribbon-like stretches are all parallel, one side being towards the north and the other towards the south, but as for the remaining sides, the western are not parallel to the eastern, neither are the two coastlines, where the countries of these tribes end, I mean that of the Chrysian Gulf as far as Actium and that facing Euboea as far as Thessalonicea, parallel to one another. But one should conceive of the geometrical figures of these regions as though several lines were drawn in a triangle parallel to the base, for the figures thus marked off will be parallel to one another, and they will have their opposite long sides parallel, but as for the short sides this is no longer the case. This, then, is my rough sketch of the country that remains to be traversed and is next in order. Let me now describe each separate part in order, beginning with Phocis. 3.2 of Phocis' two cities are the most famous, Delphi and Alatia. Delphi, because of the sanctuary of the Pythian Apollo, and because of the oracle, which is ancient, since Agamemnon is said by the poet to have had an oracle given him from there, for the minstrel is introduced as singing the quarrel of Odysseus and Achilles, son of Peleus, how once they strove, and Agamemnon, lord of men, rejoiced at heart, for thus Phoebus Apollo, in giving response to him at Pytho, had told him that it should be. Delphi, I say, is famous because of these things, but Alatia, because it is the largest of all the cities there, and has the most advantageous position, because it is situated in the narrow passes and because he who holds this city holds the passes leading into Phocis and Boeotia. 4. First, there are the Oetian mountains, and then those of the Locrians and Phocians, which are not everywhere passable to invaders from Thessaly, but have passes, both narrow and separated from one another, which are guarded by the adjacent cities, and the result is, that when these cities are captured, their captors master the passes also. But since the fame of the sanctuary at Delphi has the priority of age, and since at the same time the position of its places suggests a natural beginning, for these are the most westerly parts of Phocis, I should begin my description there. 3.3 As I have already said, Parnassus is situated on the western boundaries of Phocis. Of this mountain, then, the side towards the west is occupied by the Ozolian Locrians, whereas the southern is occupied by Delphi, a rocky place, theatre-like, having the oracle and the city on its summit, and filling a circuit of sixteen stadia. Situated above Delphi is Lycoria, on which place, above the sanctuary, the Delphians were established in earlier times. But now they live close to the sanctuary, round the Castalian fountain. Situated in front of the city, toward the south, is Surfus, a precipitous mountain, which leaves in the intervening space a ravine, through which flows the Pleistus River. Below surface lies Sura, an ancient city, situated by the sea, and from it there is an ascent to Delphi of about 80 stadia. It is situated opposite Sikian. In front of Sura lies the fertile Chrysian plain, for again one comes next in order to another city, Chrysa, from which the Chrysian Gulf is named. Then to Antisyra, bearing the same name as the city on the Maliac Gulf near Oita. And, in truth, they say that it is in the latter region that the hellebore of fine quality is produced, though that produced in the former is better prepared, and on this account many people resort thither to be purged and cured, for in the Phocian Antisyra, they add, grows a sesame-like medicinal plant with which the Oetian hellebore is prepared. 3.4 Now Antisyra still endures, but Sura and Chrysa have been destroyed, the former earlier, by the Chryseans, and Chrysa itself later, by Eurylochus the Thessalian, at the time of the Chrysian War. For the Chryseans, already prosperous because of the duties levied on importations from Sicily and Italy, proceeded to impose harsh taxes on those who came to visit the sanctuary, 
even contrary to the decrees of the Amphictyons. And the same thing also happened in the case of the Amphysians, who belonged to the Ozolian Locrians. For these two, coming over, not only restored Chrysa and proceeded to put under cultivation again the plain which had been consecrated by the Amphictyons, but were worse in their dealings with foreigners than the Chryseans of old had been. Accordingly, the Amphictyons punished these two, and gave the territory back to the god, the sanctuary, too, has been much neglected, though in earlier times it was held in exceedingly great honour. Clear proofs of this are the treasure houses, built both by peoples and by potentates, in which they deposited not only money which they had dedicated to the god, but also works of the best artists, and also the Pythian games, and the great number of the recorded oracles. 3.5 They say that the seat of the oracle is a cave that is hollowed out deep down in the earth, with a rather narrow mouth, from which arises breath that inspires a divine frenzy, and that over the mouth is placed a high tripod, mounting which the Pythian priestess receives the breath and then utters oracles in both verse and prose, though the latter two are put into verse by poets who are in the service of the sanctuary. They say that the first to become Pythian priestess was Phimanoi, and that both the prophetess and the city were so called from the word Pythistai, though the first syllable was lengthened, as in Athanatos, Akamatos, and Diakonos. Now the following is the idea which leads to the founding of cities and to the holding of common sanctuaries in high esteem. Men came together by cities and by tribes, because they naturally tend to hold things in common, and at the same time because of their need of one another, and they met at the sacred places that were common to them for the same reasons, holding festivals and general assemblies, for everything of this kind tends to friendship, beginning with eating at the same table, drinking libations together, and lodging under the same roof, and the greater the number of the sojourners and the greater the number of the places whence they came, the greater was thought to be the use of their coming together. 3.6 Now although the greatest share of honour was paid to this sanctuary because of its oracle, since of all oracles in the world it had the repute of being the most truthful, yet the position of the place added something. For it is almost in the centre of Greece taken as a whole, between the country inside the isthmus and that outside it, and it was also believed to be in the centre of the inhabited world, and people called it the navel of the earth, in addition fabricating a myth, which is told by Pindar, that the two eagles, some say crows, which had been set free by Zeus met there, one coming from the west and the other from the east. There is also a kind of navel to be seen in the sanctuary, it is draped with fillets, and on it are the two likenesses of the birds of the myth. 3.7 Such being the advantages of the site of Delphi, the people easily came together there, and especially those who lived near it. And indeed the Amphictyonic League was organized from the latter, both to deliberate concerning common affairs and to keep the superintendents of the sanctuary more in common, because much money and many votive offerings were deposited there, requiring great vigilance and holiness. Now the facts of olden times are unknown, but among the names recorded Acrisius is reputed to have been the first to administer the Amphictyony and to determine the cities that were to have a part in the council and to give a vote to each city, to one city separately or to another jointly with a second or with several, and also to proclaim the Amphictyonic rites all the rights that cities have in their dealings with cities. Later there were several other administrations, until this organization, like that of the Achaeans, was dissolved. Now the first cities which came together are said to have been twelve, and each sent a Pylagoras, the assembly convening twice a year, in spring and in late autumn, but later still more cities were added. They called the assembly Pylia, both that of spring and that of late autumn, since they convened at Pyli, which is also called Thermopylae, and the Pylagoras sacrificed to Demeter. Now although at the outset only the people who lived nearby had a share both in these things and in the oracle, later the people living at a distance also came and consulted the oracle and sent gifts and built treasure houses, as, for instance, Croesus and his father Aliots, and some of the Italiots, and the Sicilians. 3.8 But wealth inspires envy, and is therefore difficult to guard, even if it is sacred. At present, certainly, the sanctuary at Delphi is very poor, at least so far as money is concerned but as for the votive offerings, although some of them have been carried off, most of them still remain. In earlier times the sanctuary was very wealthy, as Homer states, nor yet all the things which the stone threshold of the archer Phoebus Apollo enclosed in rocky Pytho. The treasure houses clearly indicate its wealth, and also the plundering done by the Phocians, which kindled the Phocian War, or Sacred War, as it is called. Now this plundering took place in the time of Philip, the son of Amentus, although writers have a notion of another and earlier plundering, in ancient times, in which the wealth mentioned by Homer was carried out of the sanctuary. For, they add, not so much as a trace of it was saved down to those later times in which Onomarchus and his army, and Phalus and his army, robbed the sanctuary, but the wealth then carried away was more recent than that mentioned by Homer, 
for there were deposited in treasure houses offerings dedicated from spoils of war, preserving inscriptions on which were included the names of those who dedicated them, for instance, Gygus, Croesus, the Sybarites, and the Spindi who lived near the Adriatic, and so with the rest. And it would not be reasonable to suppose that the treasures of olden times were mixed up with these, as indeed is clearly indicated by other places that were ransacked by these men. Some, however, taking a feeder to mean treasure house, and threshold of the ephedra to mean underground repository of the treasure house, say that that wealth was buried in the sanctuary, and that Onomarchus and his army attempted to dig it up by night, but since great earthquakes took place they fled outside the sanctuary and stopped their digging, and that their experience inspired all others with fear of making a similar attempt. 3.9 of the temples, the one with wings must be placed among the myths, the second is said to be the work of Trophonius and Agamedes, and the present temple was built by the Amphictyons. In the sacred precinct is to be seen the tomb of Neoptolemus, which was made in accordance with an oracle, Macarius, a Delphian, having slain him because, according to the myth, he was asking the god for redress for the murder of his father, but according to all probability it was because he had attacked the sanctuary. Brancus, who presided over the sanctuary at Didyma, is called a descendant of Macarius. 3.10 As for the contests at Delphi, there was one in early times between Site Herodes, who sang a paean in honor of the god, it was instituted by the Delphians. But after the Chrysian War, in the time of Eurylochus, the Amphictyons instituted equestrian and gymnastic contests in which the prize was a crown, and called them Pythian games. And to the site Herodes they added both flute players and sitarists who played without singing, who were to render a certain melody which is called the Pythian gnome. There are five parts of it, Onkrausis, Ampera, Catechelusmos, Iambi and Dactyli, and Syringes. Now the melody was composed by Timisthenes, the admiral of the second Ptolemy, who also compiled the harbors, a work in ten books, and through this melody he means to celebrate the contest between Apollo and the dragon, setting forth the prelude as Anacrousis, the first onset of the contest is Ampera, the contest itself is Catechelusmos, the triumph following the victory is Iambus and Dactylus, the rhythms being in two measures, one of which, the Dactyl, is appropriate to hymns of praise, whereas the other, the Iam, is suited to reproaches, compare the word iambis, and the expiration of the dragon as syrinxes, since with syrinx players imitated the dragon as breathing its last in hissings. 3.11 Ephorus, whom I am using more than any other authority because, as Polybius, a noteworthy writer, testifies, he exercises great care in such matters, seems to me sometimes to do the opposite of what he intended, and at the outset promised, to do. At any rate, after censuring those who love to insert myths in the text of their histories, and after praising the truth, he adds to his account of this oracle a kind of solemn promise, saying that he regards the truth as best in all cases, but particularly on this subject, for it is absurd, he says, if we always follow such a method in dealing with every other subject, and yet, when speaking of the oracle which is the most truthful of all, go on to use the accounts that are so untrustworthy and false. Yet, though he says this, he adds forthwith that historians take it for granted that Apollo, with Themis, devised the oracle because he wished to help our race, and then, speaking of the helpfulness of it, he says that Apollo challenged men to gentleness and inculcated self-control by giving out oracles to some, commanding them to do certain things and forbidding them to do other things, and by absolutely refusing admittance to other consultants. Men believe that Apollo directs all this, he says, some believing that the god himself assumes a bodily form, others that he transmits to human beings a knowledge of his own will. 3.12 A little further on, when discussing who the Delphians were, he says that in olden times certain Parnassians who were called indigenous inhabited Parnassus, and that at this time Apollo, visiting the land, civilized the people by introducing cultivated fruits and cultured modes of life, and that when he set out from Athens to Delphi he went by the road which the Athenians now take when they conduct the Pythias, and that when he arrived at the land of the Panopeans he destroyed Titius, a violent and lawless man who ruled there, and that the Parnassians joined him and informed him of another cruel man named Python and known as the Dragon and that when Apollo shot at him with his arrows the Parnassians shouted high paean to encourage him, the origin, Ephorus adds, of the singing of the paean which has been handed down as a custom for armies just before the clash of battle, and that the tent of Python was burnt by the Delphians at that time, just as they still burn it to this day in remembrance of what took place at that time. But what could be more mythical than Apollo shooting with arrows and punishing Titius's and Pythons, and travelling from Athens to Delphi and visiting the whole earth? But if Ephorus did not take these stories for myths, by what right did he call the mythological Themis a woman, and the mythological dragon a human being unless he wished to confound the two types, history and myth? Similar to these statements are also those concerning the Aetolians, for after saying that from all time their country had been unravaged, he at one time says that Aeolians took up their abode there, 
having ejected the barbarians who were in possession of it, and at another time that he told us together with the Ape from Elis took up their abode there, but that these were destroyed by the Aeolians, and that these latter were destroyed by Alcmean and Diomedes. But I return to the Phocians. 3.13 On the seacoast after Antisyra, one comes first to a town called Apisam Arathus, then to a cape called Phrygium, where there is an anchoring place, then to the harbour that is last, which, from the fact in the case, is called Mycus, and it lies below Helicon and Asker. And the oracle of Abi is not far from this region, nor Ambrysus, nor Midian, which bears the same name as the Boeotian Midian. Still farther in the interior, after Delphi, approximately towards the east, is a town Daulis, where Terius the Thracian is said to have held sway, the scene of the mythical story of Philomela and Procne is laid there, though Thucydides says at Megara. The place got its name from the thickets, for they call thickets Dali. Now Homer called it Dolus, but later writers call it Dahlia. And Saparasus, in the words held Saparasus, is interpreted by writers in two ways, by some as bearing the same name as the tree, and by others, by a slight change in the spelling, as a village below Lycoria. 3.14 Panopius, the Phenodius of today, borders on the region of Lebedea, and is the native land of Apias. And the scene of the myth of Titius is laid here. Homer says that the Phaeacians led Radamanthus into Euboea to see Titius, son of the earth. And a cave called Alarium is to be seen in the island, named after Alara the mother of Titius, and also a hero sanctuary of Titius, and certain honours which are paid to him. Near Lebedea, also, is Trachin, a Phocian town, which bears the same name as the Oitian city, and its inhabitants are called Trachinians. 3.15 Anamoria has been named from a circumstance connected with it. Squalls of wind sweep down upon it from Catopterius, as it is called, a beetling cliff extending from Parnassus. This place was a boundary between Delphi and the Phocians when the Lacedaemonians caused the Delphians to revolt from the common organization of the Phocians, and permitted them to form a separate state of their own. Some, however, call the place Anamalia. And then one comes to Hyampolis, later called Hya by some, to which, as I have said, the Hyants were banished from Boeotia. This city is very far inland, near Peripotomy, and is not the same as Hyampeia on Parnassus, also far inland is Alatia, the largest city of the Phocians, which is unknown by Homer, for it is more recent than the Homeric age, and it is advantageously situated in that it commands the passes from Thessaly. Demosthenes clearly indicates the natural advantage of its position when he speaks of the commotion that suddenly took place at Athens when a messenger came to the Prytanes with the report that Alatia had been captured. 3.16 Peripotomy is a settlement on the Cephissus River near Phenodius and Cheronia and Alatia. Theopompus says that this place is distant from Cheronia about 40 stadia and marks the boundary of the territories of the Ambrysians, the Panopeans and the Dalians, and that it lies on a moderately high hill at the pass which leads from Boeotia into Phocis, between the mountains Parnassus and Hadelius, between which is left a tract of about 5 stadia divided by the Cephissus River, which affords a narrow pass on each side. The river, he continues, has its beginnings in the Phocian city Lilia, just as Homer says, and those who held Lilia, at the fountains of Cephissus, and empties into Lake Copes, and the mountain Hadelius extends over a distance of sixty stadia as far as the mountain Acontius, where Orcomenos is situated. And Hesiod, too, describes at considerable length the river and the course of its flow, saying that it flows through the whole of Phocis in a winding and serpentine course, like a dragon it goes in tortuous courses out past Panopius and through strong Glecon and through Orcomenos. The narrow pass in the neighborhood of Peripotomy, or Peripotamia, for the name is spelled both ways, was an object of contention in the Phocian War, since the enemy had here their only entrance into Phocis. There are, besides the Phocian Cephissus, the river at Athens, the one in Salamis, a fourth and a fifth in Sikian and in Skiros, and a sixth in Argos, which has its sources in Mount Lyrsius, and at Apollonia near Epidamnus there is a fountain near the gymnasium which is called Cephissus. 3.17 Daphnis is now raised to the ground. It was at one time a city of Phocis, bordering on the Euboean Sea, it divided the Epignomidian Locrians into two parts, one part in the direction of Boeotia, and the other facing Phocis, which at that time reached from sea to sea. And evidence of this is the Schegeum in Daphnis, which, they say, is the tomb of Scedius, but as I have said, Daphnis split Locris on either side, so that the Epignomidian and Opentian Locrians nowhere bordered on one another but in later times the place was included within the boundaries of the Opentians. Concerning Phocis, however, I have said enough. 4.1 Locris Locris comes next in order, and therefore I must describe this country. It is divided into two parts, one part is that which is inhabited by the Locrians and faces Euboea, and, as I was saying, it was once split into two parts, 
one on either side of Daphnis. The Opentians were named after their metropolis, and the Epignomidians after a mountain called Knemis. The rest of Locris is inhabited by the Western Locrians, who are also called Ozolian Locrians. They are separated from the Opentians and the Epignomidians by Parnassus, which is situated between them, and by the Tetrapolis of the Dorians. But I must begin with the Opentians. 4.2 Next, then, after Halley, where that part of the Boeotian coast which faces Euboea terminates, lies the Opentian Gulf. Opus is the metropolis, as is clearly indicated by the inscription on the first of the five pillars in the neighborhood of Thermopylae, near the Polyandrium, Apis, metropolis of the Locrians of Righteous Laws, mourns for these who perished in defense of Greece against the Medes. It is about fifteen stadia distant from the sea, and sixty from the seaport. Sinus is the seaport, a cape which forms the end of the Opentian Gulf, the gulf being about forty stadia in extent. Between Opus and Sinus is a fertile plain, and Sinus lies opposite Edepsis in Euboea, where are the hot waters of Heracles, and is separated from it by a strait 160 stadia wide. Deucalion is said to have lived in Sinus, and the grave of Pyrrha is to be seen there, though that of Deucalion is to be seen at Athens. Sinus is about 50 stadia distant from Mount Knemis. The island Atalanta is also situated opposite Opus, and bears the same name as the island in front of Attica. It is said that a certain people in Elia are also called Opentians, but it is not worthwhile to mention them except to say that they are reviving a kinship which exists between them and the Opentians. Now Homer says that Patroclus was from Opus, and that after committing an involuntary murder he fled to Peleus, but that his father Menetius remained in his native land, for thither Achilles says that he promised Menetius to bring back Patroclus when Patroclus should return from the expedition. However, Menetius was not king of the Opentians, but Aeus the Locrian, whose native land, as they say, was Nericus. They call the man who was slain by Patroclus Aeans, and both a sacred precinct, the Enm, and a spring, Aeanus, named after him, are to be seen. 4.3 Next after Sinus, one comes to Alapi and to Daphnis, which latter, as I said, is raised to the ground, and here there is a harbour which is about 90 stadia distant from Sinus, and 120 stadia from Alatia, for one going on foot into the interior. We have now reached the Maliac Gulf, which is continuous with the Opentian Gulf. 4.4 After Daphnis one comes to Knemides, a natural stronghold, about twenty stadia by sea, and opposite it, in Euboea, lies Kenan, a cape facing the west and the Maliac Gulf, and separated from it by a strait about twenty stadia in width. At this point we have now reached the territory of the Epignomidian Locrians. Here, too, lying off the coast, are the three Lychades Islands, as they are called, named after Lycus, and there are also other islands along the coast, but I am purposely omitting them. After twenty stadia from Chemides one comes to a harbour, above which, at an equal distance in the interior, lies Thronium. Then one comes to the Boagrius River, which flows past Thronium and empties into the sea. They also call it Manes. It is a winter stream, so that at times one can cross it dry shod, though at other times it has a breadth of two plethora. After this one comes to Scarfia, which is situated ten stadia above the sea, thirty stadia distant from Thronium, and slightly less from the harbour itself. Then one comes to Nicaea and Thermopylae. 4.5 As for the remaining cities, it is not worthwhile to mention any of them except those which are mentioned by Homer. Kaleros is no longer inhabited, but is now a beautifully tilled plain, and they so call it from what is the fact in the case. Bessa, too, does not exist, it is a wooded place. Neither does Augei, whose territory is held by the Scarfians. Now this Bessa should be written with a double S, for it is named from its being a wooded place, being spelled the same way like Nape in the plain of Methymnae which Hellanicus ignorantly names Lape, whereas the Deme in Attica, whose inhabitants are accordingly called Bucciais, should be written with one S. 4.6 Tarfi is situated on a height, at a distance of 20 stadia from Thronium, its territory is both fruitful and well wooded, for already this place had been named from its being thickly wooded. But it is now called Phrygi, and here is situated a sanctuary of Phrygi and Hera, so called from the Hera in the Argive Phrygi, and, indeed, they say that they are colonists of the Argives. 4.7 However, Homer does not mention the Western Locrians, or at least not in express words, but only in that he seems by contrast to distinguish these from those other Locrians of whom I have already spoken, when he says, of the Locrians who dwell opposite sacred Euboea, implying that there was a different set of Locrians. But they have not been much talked about by many others either. The cities they held were Amphissa and Naupactus, of these, Naupactus survives, near Antrium, and it was named from the shipbuilding that was once carried on there, whether it was because the Heraclidae built their fleet there, or, 
as Ephorus says, because the Locrians had built ships there even before that time. It now belongs to the Aetolians, having been adjudged to them by Philip. 4.8 Here, also, is Chalcis, which the poet mentions in the Aetolian catalogue, it is below Caledon. Here, also, is the hill Taphiasis, on which are the tombs of Nessus and the other centaurs, from whose putrefied bodies, they say, flows forth at the base of the hill the water which is malodorous and clotted, and it is on this account, they add, that the tribe is also called Ozolian. Malikaria, an Aetolian town, is also near Antrium. The site of Amphissa is on the edge of the Chrysian plain, it was raised to the ground by the Amphictyons, as I have said. And both Oianthea and Eupalium belong to the Locrians. The whole voyage along the Locrian coast slightly exceeds 200 stadia in length. 4.9 There is a place named Alapi, not only here and among the Epicnomidian Locrians, but also in Thyatis. Now these are colonists of the Epicnomidian Locrians, but the Epizephrian Locrians are colonists of these. 4.10 The Aetolians border on the western Locrians, and the Aenianians who inhabit Mount Oita border on the Epicnomidian Locrians, and in the middle between them are Dorians. Now these Dorians are the people who inhabited the Tetrapolis, which, they say, was the metropolis of all the Dorians, and the cities they held were Araneus, Beum, Pindus, and Cytinium. Pindus is situated above Araneus, and a river bearing the same name flows past it, emptying into the Cephissus not very far from Lilia. By some, however, Pindus is called Asiphas. The king of these Dorians was Egemius, who was driven from his throne, but was brought back again, as the story goes, by Heracles. Accordingly, Egemius requited the favor to Heracles after the latter's death on Oita, for he adopted Hillus, the eldest of the sons of Heracles, and Hillus and his descendants became his successors on the throne. From here it was that the Heraclides set out on their return to the Peloponnesus. 4.11 Now for a time the cities in question were held in respect, although they were small and had poor soil, but afterwards they were lightly esteemed. During the Phocian War and the domination of the Macedonians, Aetolians, and Athamanians it is marvelous that even a trace of them passed to the Romans. And the Aenianians had the same experience, for they too were destroyed by the Aetolians and the Athamanians, by the Aetolians, when they waged war in conjunction with the Acarnanians, and were very powerful, and by the Athamanians, when they attained to distinction, the last of the Aperotes to do so, the other peoples having by this time been worn out, and under their king Aminander had acquired power. These Athamanians kept possession of Oita. 4.12 This mountain extends from Thermopylae in the east to the Ambracian Gulf in the west, and, in a way, it cuts at right angles the mountainous country which extends from Parnassus to Pindus and to the barbarians who are situated beyond Pindus. Of this mountain, the part which verges towards Thermopylae is called Oita, its length is 200 stadia, and it is rugged and high, but it is highest at Thermopylae, for there it rises into a peak, and ends at the sea in sharp and abrupt precipices, though it leaves a narrow pass for invasions from Thessaly into the country of the Locrians. 4.13 Now the pass is called not only Pylae and Narrows, but also Thermopylae, for there are hot waters near it that are held in honour as sacred to Heracles, and the mountain that lies above it is called Calidromus, but by some the remaining part of the mountain, which extends through Aetolia and Acarnania to the Ambracian Gulf, is also called Calidromus. Near Thermopylae, inside the Narrows, are Forts Nicaea, towards the Sea of the Locrians, and above it, Tychius and Heraclea, the latter in earlier times having been called Trachan, a settlement of Lacedaemonians. Heraclea is about six stadia distant from the old Trachan. Next one comes to Rodontia, a natural stronghold. 4.14 These places are rendered difficult of access both by the ruggedness of the country and by the number of streams of water which here form ravines through which they flow. For besides the Spercheius, which flows past Antisyra, there is the Dyra's River, which, they say, tried to quench the funeral pyre of Heracles, and also another Melus, which is five stadia distant from Trachan. To the south of Trachan, according to Herodotus, there is a deep gorge through which the Esopus, bearing the same name as the aforesaid Esopus rivers, empties into the sea outside Pylae after receiving the Phoenix River, which meets it from the south and bears the name of the hero Phoenix, whose tomb is to be seen near it. The distance from the Esopus to Thermopylae is fifteen stadia. 4.15 Now at that time these places were at the height of their fame when they held the mastery over the keys of the Narrows, and when there were struggles for the primacy between the peoples outside the Narrows and those inside them. For instance, Philip used to call Chalcis and Corinth the fetters of Greece, having Macedonia in view as his base of operations, and the men of later times called, not only these, but also the city Demetrius shackles, for Demetrius commanded the passes round Tempe, since it held both Pelion and Asa. But later, 
now that all peoples have been brought into subjection to a single power, everything is free from toll and open to all mankind. 4.16 It was at these narrows that Leonidas and his men, with a few who came from the neighborhood thereof, held out against all those forces of the Persians, until the barbarians, coming around the mountains through by paths, cut them down. And today their polyandrium is to be seen, and pillars, and the oft-quoted inscription on the pillar of the Lacedaemonians, which is as follows, Stranger, report to the Lacedaemonians that we lie here in obedience to their laws. 4.17 There is also a large harbour here, and a sanctuary of Demeter, in which at the time of every Pylian assembly the Amphictyons perform sacrificial rites. From the harbour to Heraclean Trach in the distance on foot is 40 stadia, and by boat to Kenan 70 stadia. The Spercheius empties immediately outside Pylae. The distance to Pylae from the Euripus is 530 stadia. And whereas Locris ends at Pylae, the parts outside Pylae towards the east and the Maliac Gulf belong to the Thessalians, and the parts towards the west belong to the Aetolians and the Acarnanians. As for the Athamanians, they are now extinct. 4.18 Now the largest and most ancient composite part of the Greeks is that of the Thessalians, who have been described partly by Homer and partly by several others. The Aetolians Homer always speaks of under one name, classing cities, not tribes, under them, except the Curetes, who should be classified as Aetolians. But I must begin with Thessaly, omitting such things as are very old and mythical and for the most part not agreed upon, as I have already done in all other cases, and telling such things as seem to me appropriate to my purpose. 5.1 Thessaly Thessaly comprises, first, on the sea, the coast which extends from Thermopylae to the outlet of the Peneus River and the extremities of Pelion, and faces the east and the northern extremities of Euboea. The parts that are near Euboea and Thermopylae are held by the Malians and the Achaean Thyate, and the parts near Pelion by the Magnetans. Let this side of Thessaly, then, be called the eastern or coastal side. As for the two sides of Thessaly, on one side, beginning at Pelion and the Peneus, Macedonia stretches towards the interior as far as Peonia and the Aparot tribes, and on the other side, beginning at Thermopylae, the Oetian and Aetolian mountains lie parallel to Macedonia, bordering on the country of the Dorians and on Parnassus. Let the former side, which borders on Macedonia, be called the northern side, and the latter the southern side. There remains the western side, which is surrounded by the Aetolians and Acarnanians and Amphilochians, and, of the Aparots, the Athamanians and Molossians in what was once called the land of the Ethuses, or, in a word, the land about Pindus. The land of Thessaly, as a whole, is a plain, except Pelion and Asa. These mountains rise to a considerable height, they do not, however, enclose much territory in their circuits, but end in the plains. 5.2 These plains are the middle parts of Thessaly, a country most blessed, except so much of it as is subject to inundations by rivers. For the Peneus, which flows through the middle of it and receives many rivers, often overflows, and in olden times the plain formed a lake, according to report, being hemmed in by mountains on all sides except in the region of the sea coast, and there too the region was more elevated than the plains. But when a cleft was made by earthquakes at Tempe, as it is now called, and split off Asa from Olympus, the Peneus poured out through it towards the sea and drained the country in question. But there remains, nevertheless, Lake Nessinus, which is a large lake, and Lake Bobase, which is smaller than the former and nearer to the seacoast. 5.3 Such being its nature, Thessaly was divided into four parts. One part was called Thyatus, another Hestiotus, another Thessalotus, and another Pelascotus. Thyatus occupies the southern parts which extend alongside Oita from the Maliac, or Palaic, gulf as far as Dolopia and Pindus, and widen out as far as Pharsalus and the Thessalian plains. Hestiotus occupies the western parts and the parts between Pindus and Upper Macedonia. The remaining parts of Thessaly are held, first, by the people who live in the plains below Hestiotus, they are called Pelasgiati and their country borders on Lower Macedonia, and, secondly, by the Thessaliati next in order, who fill out the districts extending as far as the Magnetan sea coast. Here, too, there will be an enumeration of famous names of cities, and especially because of the poetry of Homer, only a few of the cities preserve their ancient dignity, but Larissa most of all. 5.4 The poet, after dividing into ten parts, or dynasties, the whole of the country which we now call Thessaly, and after adding certain parts both of the Oetian and the Locrian countries, and likewise certain parts of the country now classed under Macedonia, intimates a fact which is common to, and true of, all countries, that whole regions and their several parts undergo changes in proportion to the power of those who hold sway. 5.5 Now the first peoples he names in the catalogue are those under Achilles, 
who occupied the southern side and were situated alongside Oita and the Epicnamidian Locrians, all who dwelt in the Pelasgian Argos and those who inhabited Alus and Alapi and Trachan, and those who held Thia and also Hellas the land of fair women, and were called Myrmidons and Hellenes and Achaeans. With these he joins also the subjects of Phoenix, and makes the expedition common to both leaders. It is true that the poet nowhere mentions the Dolopian army in connection with the battles round Ilium, for he does not represent their leader Phoenix as going forth into the perils of battle either, any more than he does Nestor, yet others so state, as Pindar, for instance, who mentions Phoenix and then says, who held a throng of Dolopians, bold in the use of the sling and bringing aid to the missiles of the Danaeans, tamers of horses. This, in fact, is the interpretation which we must give to the Homeric passage according to the principle of silence, as the grammarians are wont to call it, for it would be ridiculous if the king Phoenix shared in the expedition, I dwelt in the farthermost part of Thia, being lord over the Dolopians, without his subjects being present, for if they were not present, he would not have been regarded as sharing in the expedition with Achilles, but only as following him in the capacity of a chief over a few men and as a speaker, perhaps as a counsellor. Homer's verses on this subject mean also to make this clear, for such is the import of the words, to be a speaker of words and a doer of deeds. Clearly, therefore, he means, as I have already said, that the forces under Achilles and Phoenix are the same. But the aforesaid statements concerning the places subject to Achilles are themselves under controversy. Some take the Pelasgian Argos as a Thessalian city once situated in the neighborhood of Larissa but now no longer existent, but others take it, not as a city, but as the plain of the Thessalians, which is referred to by this name because Abbas, who brought a colony there from Argos, so named it. 5.6 As for Thia, some say that it is the same as Hellas and Achaea, and that these constitute the other, the southern, of the two parts into which Thessaly as a whole was divided, but others distinguish between Hellas and Achaea. The poet seems to make Thia and Hellas two different things when he says, and those who held Thia and Hellas, as though there were two, and when he says, and then, I fled, far away through spacious Hellas, and I came to Thia, and, there are many Achaean women throughout Hellas and Thia. So the poet makes them two, but he does not make it plain whether they are cities or countries. As for later authorities, some, speaking of Hellas as a country, say that it stretches from Pelipharsalus to Theotic Thebes. In this country also is the Thetidium, near both Pharsalus's, both the old and the new, and they infer from the Thetidium that this country too is a part of that which was subject to Achilles. As for those, however, who speak of Hellas as a city, the Pharsalians point out at a distance of sixty stadia from their own city a city in ruins which they believe to be Hellas, and also two springs near it, Messis and Hyperea, whereas the Melitians say that Hellas was situated about ten stadia distant from themselves on the other side of the Enipaeus, at the time when their own city was named Pyrrha, and that it was from Hellas, which was situated in a low-lying district, that the Hellenes migrated to their own city, and they cite as bearing witness to this the tomb of Helen, son of Deucalion and Pyrrha, situated in their marketplace. For it is related that Deucalion ruled over Thia, and, in a word, over Thessaly. The Enipaeus, flowing from Othrus past Pharsalus, turns aside into the Apidanus, and the latter into the Peneus. Thus much, then, concerning the Hellenes. 5.7 Theans is the name given to those who were subject to Achilles and Protesilaus and Philoctetes. And the poet is witness to this, for after mentioning in the catalogue those who were subject to Achilles and those who held Thia, he represents these, in the battle at the ships, as staying behind with Achilles in their ships and as being inactive, but those who were subject to Philoctetes as taking part in the battle, having met in as marshal, and those who were subject to Protesilaus as marshaled by Podarchus. Concerning these, speaking in a general way, he says, and there the Boeotians and Ionians with trailing tunics, the Locrians and Phthians and illustrious Epeans, and, in a specific way, and in front of the Phthians was Medon, and also Podarchus steadfast in war. These in their armor, in front of the great-hearted Phthians, were fighting along with the Boeotians in defense of the ships. Perhaps the men with Eurypolis also were called Phthians, since their country indeed bordered on Thia. Now, however, historians regard as belonging to Magnesia, not only the region round Ormenium, which belonged to the country that was subject to Eurypolis, but also the whole of the country that was subject to Philoctetes, but they regard the country that was subject to Protesilaus as a part of Thia, extending from Dolopia and Pindus as far as the Magneton Sea, whereas the land subject to Peleus and Achilles, beginning at the Trachinian and Oetian countries, is defined as extending in breadth as far as Antron, the city subject to Protesilaus, the name of which is now spelled in the plural number. And the Maliac Gulf has about the same length. 5.8 But as regards Halus and Alapi, historians are thoroughly in doubt, suspecting that the poet does not mean the places so named which now are classed in the Theotic domain, 
but those among the Locrians, since the dominion of Achilles extended thus far, just as it also extended as far as Trachan and the Oitian country, for there is both a Halus and a Halius on the seaboard of the Locrians, just as there is also an Alapi. Some substitute Halius for Alapi and write as follows, and those who dwelt in Halus and in Halius and in Trachan. The Theotic Halus is situated below the end of Othrus, a mountain situated to the north of Thyatus, bordering on Mount Tiphrestus and the country of the Dolopians, and extending from there to the region of the Maliac Gulf. Halus, either feminine or masculine, for the name is used in both genders, is about sixty stadia distant from Itonus. It was Athamas who founded Halus, but in later times, after it had been wiped out, the Pharsalians colonized the place. It is situated above the Crotian Plain, and the Amphrasus River flows close to its walls. Below the Crotian Plain lies Theotic Thebes. Halus is called both Theotic and Achean Halus, and it borders on the country of the Malians, as do also the spurs of Othrus Mountain. And just as the Phalas, which was subject to Protesilaus, is in that part of Thyatus which lies next to the country of the Malians, so also is Halus, it is about 100 stadia distant from Thebes, and it is midway between Pharsalus and the Thyate. However, Philip took it away from the Thyate and assigned it to the Pharsalians. And so it comes to pass, as I have said before, that the boundaries and the political organizations of tribes and places are always undergoing changes. So, also, Sophocles speaks of Trachinia as belonging to Thyatus. And Artemidorus places Halus on the seaboard, as situated outside the Maliac Gulf, indeed, but as belonging to Thyatus, for proceeding thence in the direction of the Peneus, he places Telium after Antron, and then Halus at a distance of 110 stadia from Telium. As for Trachin, I have already described it, and the poet mentions it by name. 5.9 Since the poet often mentions the Spercheius as a river of this country, and since it has its sources in Typhrestus, the Dryopian mountain which in earlier times was called, and empties near Thermopylae and between it and Lamia, he plainly indicates that both the region inside the gates, I mean in so far as it belonged to the Maliac Gulf, and the region outside the gates, were subject to Achilles. The Spercheius is about 30 stadia distant from Lamia, which is situated above a certain plain that extends down to the Maliac Gulf. And he plainly indicates that the Spercheius was a river of this country, not only by the assertion of Achilles that he fostered the growth of his hair as an offering to Spercheius, but also by the fact that Menestheus, one of his commanders, was called the son of Spercheius and the sister of Achilles. And it is reasonable to suppose that all the people, the subjects of Achilles and Patroclus, who had accompanied Peleus in his flight from Aena, were called Myrmidons. And all the Thyatae were called Achaeans. 5.10 Historians enumerate the settlements in the Phthiotic domain that was subject to Achilles, and they begin with the Malians. They name several, and among them Phthiotic Thebes, Echinus, Lamia, near which the Lamian war arose between the Macedonians, under Antipater, and the Athenians, and in this war Leosthenes, a general of the Athenians, fell, and also Leonidas, the comrade of King Alexander, and also Narthasium, Erinaeus, Coronea, bearing the same name as the Boeotian city, Melitia, Thaumaci, Proerna, Pharsalus, Eritrea, bearing the same name as the Euboean city, and Perishaloidi, this, too, bearing the same name as the Aetolian city, for here too, near Lamia, is a river Achelous, on whose banks live the Perishaloidi. This country bordered, in its stretch towards the north, on the country of the most westerly of the Asulpiidae, and on the country of Eurypolis, and also on that of Protesilaus, these countries inclining towards the east, and in its stretch towards the south, on the Oetian country, which was divided into fourteen demis, and also Heraclea and Dryopis, Dryopis having at one time been a tetrapolis, like Doris, and regarded as the metropolis of the Dryopians who lived in the Peloponnesus. To the Oetian country belong also Asiphas, Parasapias, Oeniidae, and Antisyra, which bears the same name as the city among the western Locrians. But I am speaking of these divisions of the country, not as having always remained the same, but as having undergone various changes. However, only the most significant divisions are particularly worthy of mention. 5.11 As for the Dolopians, the poet himself says clearly enough that they were situated in the farthermost parts of Thyia, and that both these and the Thyate were under the same leader, Peleus, for I dwelt, he says, in the farthermost part of Thyia, being lord over the Dolopians, whom Peleus gave me. The country borders on Pindus, and on the region round Pindus, most of which belongs to the Thessalians. For both on account of the fame and of the predominance of the Thessalians and the Macedonians, the countries of those Aperotes who were their nearest neighbours were made, some willingly and the others unwillingly, parts of Thessaly or Macedonia. For instance, the Athamanes, the Ethuses, and the Talaires were made parts of Thessaly, and the Oresti, the Pelagonians, and the Elimiadi of Macedonia. 
5.12 The Pindus Mountain is large, having the country of the Macedonians on the north, the Peribian immigrants on the west, the Dolopians on the south, and Hestiotis on the east, and this last is a part of Thessaly. The Talaires, a Molossan tribe, a branch of those who lived in the neighborhood of Mount Tomaris, lived on Mount Pindus itself, as did also the Ethuses, amongst whom, the poet says, the centaurs were driven by Perithus, but history now tells us that they are extinct. The term extinct is to be taken in one of two meanings, either the people vanished and their country has become utterly deserted, or else merely their ethnic name no longer exists and their political organization no longer remains what it was. When, therefore, any present political organization that survives from an earlier time is utterly insignificant, I hold that it is not worth mentioning, either itself or the new name it has taken, but when it affords a fair pretext for being mentioned, I must needs give an account of the change. 5.13 It remains for me to tell the order of the places on the coast that were subject to Achilles, beginning at Thermopylae, for I have already spoken of the Locrian and the Oitian countries. Thermopylae, then, is separated from Kenan by a straight 70 stadia wide, but, to one sailing along the coast beyond Pylae, it is about 10 stadia from the Spercheius, and thence to Phalara 20 stadia, and above Phalara, 50 stadia from the sea, is situated the city of the Lamians, and then next, after sailing 50 stadia along the coast, one comes to Echinus, which is situated above the sea, and in the interior from the next stretch of coast, 20 stadia distant from it, is Larissa Cremaste, it is also called Larissa Pelastia. 5.14 Then one comes to Myonesus, a small island, and then to Antron, which was subject to Protesilaus. So much, then, for the portion that was subject to Achilles. But since the poet, through naming both the leaders and the cities subject to them, has divided Thessaly into numerous well-known parts and arranged in order the whole circuit of it, I, following him again, as above, shall go on to complete the remainder of my geographical description of the country. Now he enumerates next in order after those who were subject to Achilles those who were subject to Protesilaus, and these are also the people who come next in order after the stretch of coast which was subject to Achilles as far as Antron. Therefore, the territory that was subject to Protesilaus is in the boundaries of the country that comes next in order, that is, it lies outside the Maliac Gulf, but still inside Thyatis, though not inside the part of Thyatis that was subject to Achilles. Now Phalas is near Phthiotic Thebes, which itself is subject to Protesilaus. And Halus, also, and Larissa Cremaste, and Demetrium, are subject to him, all being situated to the east of the Othrus mountain. Demetrium he speaks of as sacred precinct of Demeter, and calls it Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus was a city with a good harbour, at a distance of two stadia it had a sacred precinct and a holy sanctuary, and was twenty stadia distant from Thebes. Thebes is situated above Pyrrhus, but the Crotian plain is situated in the interior back of Thebes near the end of Othrus, and it is through this plain that the Amphrasus flows. Above this river are the Itonus, where is the sanctuary of the Etonian, after which the sanctuary in Boeotia is named, and the Quarius rivers. But I have already spoken of this river and of Arni in my description of Boeotia. These places are in Thessalatus, one of the four portions of all Thessaly, in which were not only the regions that were subject to Eurypolis, but also Phyllis, where is the sanctuary of Philly and Apollo, and Acne, where the Acne and Themis is held in honor. Cyrus, also, was tributary to it, and so was the rest of that region as far as Athamania. Near Antron, in the Euboean Strait, is a submarine reef called Ass of Antron, and then one comes to Telium and Halus, and then to the sanctuary of Demeter, and to Pyrrhus, which has been raised to the ground, and, above it, to Thebes, and then to Cape Pyrrha, and to two isles near it, one of which is called Pyrrha and the other Deucalion. And it is somewhere here that Thyatis ends. 5.15 Next the poet enumerates the peoples that were subject to Eumelus, that is, the adjacent seacoast, which from this point on belongs to Magnesia and the land of Pelasgotus. Now Phare is at the end of the Pelasgian plains on the side towards Magnesia, and these plains extend as far as Pelion, 160 stadia. The seaport of Phare is Pagasi, which is 90 stadia distant from Phare and 20 from Iolcus. Iolcus has indeed been raised to the ground from early times, but it was from there that Pelas dispatched Jason and the Argo. It was from the construction here of the ship Argo, according to mythology, that the place was called Pagasi, though some believe, more plausibly, that this name was given the place from its fountains, which are both numerous and of abundant flow. Nearby is Aphiti also, so named as being the Aphiterium of the Argonauts. Iolcus is situated above the sea seven stadia from Demetrius. Demetrius, which is on the sea between Nelia and Pagasi, was founded by Demetrius Polyrcides, who named it after himself, settling in it the inhabitants of the nearby towns, Nelia and Pagasi and Ormenium, and also Rises, 
Sepias, Olizone, Bibi, and Iolcus, which are now villages belonging to Demetrius. Furthermore, for a long time this was both a naval station and a royal residence for the kings of the Macedonians, and it held the mastery over both Tempe and the two mountains, Pelian and Asa, as I have already said. At present it is reduced in power, but still it surpasses all the cities in Magnesia. Lake Bobase is near Fure, and also borders on the foothills of Pelian and the frontiers of Magnesia, and Bibi is a place situated on the lake. Just as seditions and tyrannies destroyed Iolcus after its power had been greatly increased, so they reduced Fure also, which had once been raised to greatness by its tyrants and was then destroyed along with them. Near Demetrius flows the Anoris River, and the adjoining shore is also called Iolcus. Here, too, they used to hold the Palaic Festal Assembly. Artemidorus places the Pagasitic Gulf in the region subject to Philoctetes, farther away from Demetrius, and he says that the island Sisinethos and a town bearing the same name are in the Gulf. 5.16 The poet next enumerates the cities subject to Philoctetes. Now Methoni is different from the Thracian Methoni, which was raised to the ground by Philip. I have mentioned heretofore the change of the names of these places, and of certain places in the Peloponnesus. And the other places enumerated by the poet are Timatia and Olizone and Melibea, which are on the next stretch of seacoast. Off the country of the Magnetans lie numerous islands, but the only notable ones are Syathos, Peperithos, and Icos, and also Halinesos and Skiros, all having cities of the same name. But Skiros is the most notable, because of the family relation between Lycomedes and Achilles, and of the birth and nurture there of Neoptolemus the son of Achilles. In later times, when Philip had waxed powerful and saw that the Athenians dominated the sea and ruled over the islands, both these and the rest, he caused the islands that were near him to be most famous, for, since he was fighting for the hegemony, he always attacked those places which were close to him, and, just as he added to Macedonia most parts of the Magnetan country and of Thrace and of the rest of the land all round, so he also seized the islands off Magnesia and made those which were previously well known to nobody objects of contention and hence well known. Now Skiros is chiefly commended by the place it occupies in the ancient legends, but there are other things which cause it to be widely mentioned, as, for instance, the excellence of the Syrian goats, and the quarries of the Syrian variegated marble, which is comparable to the Charistian marble, and to the Dosimian or Synatic, and to the Hierapolitic. For at Rome are to be seen monolithic columns and great slabs of the variegated marble, and with this marble the city is being adorned both at public and at private expense, and it has caused the quarries of white marble to be of little worth. 5.17 However, the poet, after proceeding thus far on the Magnetan seacoast, returns to Upper Thessaly, for, beginning at Dolopia and Pindus, he recounts the parts that stretch alongside Thyatus, as far as Lower Thessaly, and those who held trikes and rocky them. These places belong in fact to Histiotus, though in earlier times Histiotus was called Doris, as they say, but when the Peribians took possession of it, who had already subdued Histiotus in Euboea and had forced its inhabitants to migrate to the mainland, they called the country Histiotus after these Histiaeans, because of the large number of these people who settled there. They call Histiotus and Dolopia Upper Thessaly, which is in a straight line with Upper Macedonia, as is Lower Thessaly with Lower Macedonia. Now Trikes, where is the earliest and most famous sanctuary of Asclepius, borders on the country of the Dolopians and the regions round Pindus. Itham, which is called by the same name as the Messenian city, ought not, they say, to be pronounced in this way, but without the first syllable, for thus, they add, it was called in earlier times, though now its name has been changed to Itham. It is a stronghold and is in reality a heap of stones, and it is situated between four strongholds, which lie in a square, as it were, Trikes, Metropolis, Pelennon, and Gompi. But Itham belongs to the territory of the Metropolitans. Metropolis in earlier times was a joint settlement composed of three insignificant towns, but later several others were added to it, among which was Itham. Now Callimachus, in his Iambics, says that, of all the Aphrodites, for there was not merely one goddess of this name, Aphrodite Casneti surpasses all in wisdom, since she alone accepts the sacrifice of swine. And surely he was very learned, if any other man was, and all his life, as he himself states, wished to recount these things. But the writers of later times have discovered that not merely one Aphrodite, but several, have accepted this right, and that among these was the Aphrodite at Metropolis, and that one of the cities included in the settlement transmitted to it the one Thurian right. Farcadon, also, is in Histiotus, and the Peneus and the Curulius flow through its territory. Of these rivers, the Curulius flows past the sanctuary of the Atonian Athena and empties into the Peneus, but the Peneus itself rises in Pindus, as I have already said, and after leaving Trikes and Pelennon and Farcadon on the left flows past both Atrax and Larissa, and after receiving the rivers in Thessalatus flows on through Tempe to its outlet. 
Historians place the Oihalia which is called the city of Eurydice not only in this region, but also in Euboea and in Arcadia, and they give its name in different ways, as I have already said in my description of the Peloponnesus. They inquire concerning these, and particularly in regard to what Oihalia it was that was captured by Heracles, and concerning what Oihalia was meant by the poet who wrote the capture of Oihalia. These places, then, were classed by Homer as subject to the Asulpiety. 5.18 Next he speaks of the country subject to Eurypolis, and those who held the fountain Hyperea, and those who held Asterium and the white summits of Titanus. Now at the present time Orminium is called Orminium, it is a village situated at the foot of Pelion near the Pagasitic Gulf, one of the cities included in the settlement of Demetrius, as I have said. And Lake Bobais, also, must be near, since Bibi, as well as Orminium itself, was one of the dependencies of Demetrius. Now Ormenium is distant by land 27 stadia from Demetrius, whereas the site of Iolcus, which is situated on the road, is distant 7 stadia from Demetrius and the remaining 20 stadia from Ormenium. The Skepsian says that Phoenix was from Ormenium, and that he fled thence from his father Amintor the son of Ormenus into Thia to Peleus the king, for this place, he adds, was founded by Ormenus the son of Circaphus the son of Elis, and he says that both Amintor and Euemon were sons of Ormenus, and that Phoenix was son of the former and Eurypolis of the latter but that the succession to the throne, to which both had equal right, was kept for Eurypolis, inasmuch as Phoenix had gone away from his homeland. Furthermore, the Skepsian writes thus, as when first I left Ormenium rich in flocks, instead of I left Hellas, land of fair women. But Crates makes Phoenix a Phocian, judging this from the helmet of Megas, which Odysseus used at the time of his night spying, concerning which the poet says, Atalicus filched it from Elian, from a mentor the son of Orminus, having broken into his close-built home. For Elian, he says, is a town of Parnassus, and a mentor, son of Orminus, means no other than the father of Phoenix, and Atolicus, who lived on Parnassus, must have broken into the house of a neighbor, as is the way of any housebreaker, and not into that of people far away. But the Skepsian says that there is no place called Elian to be seen on Parnassus, though there is a place called Neon, founded in fact after the Trojan War, and also that housebreakings are not confined to neighbors only. And there are other arguments which one might give, but I hesitate to spend further time on this subject. Others write from Helion, but Helion is a place in Tanagria, and this reading would increase the absurdity of the statement, then I fled afar off through Hellas and came to Thia. The fountain Hyperea is in the middle of the city of the Phereans, which belong to Eumelus. It is absurd, therefore, to assign the fountain to Eurypolis. Titanus was named from the fact in the case there, for the region near Arni and Aphidi has white soil. Asterium, also, is not far from these. 5.19 Continuous with this portion of Thessaly is the country of those who are called the subjects of Polypedes, and those who held Argissa and dwelt in Gertone, Orth, and alone in the white city Olusan. In earlier times the Peribians inhabited this country, dwelling in the part near the sea and near the Peneus, extending as far as its outlet in Girton, a Peribian city. Then the Lapiths humbled the Peribians and thrust them back into the river country in the interior, and seized their country I mean the Lapiths Ixion and his son Perithus the latter of whom also took possession of Pelion, forcing out the centaurs, a wild folk, who had seized it. Now these he thrust from Pelion and made them draw near to the Ethuses, and he gave over the plains to the Lapiths, though the Peribians kept possession of some of them, those near Olympus, and also in some places lived completely intermingled with the Lapiths. Now Argissa, the present Argura, is situated on the Peneus, and forty stadia above it lies Atrax, which also is close to the river, and the Peribians held the river country between the two places. Some have called Orth the Acropolis of the Phalanians, and Phalana is a Peribian city close to the Peneus near Tempe. Now the Peribians, being overpowered by the Lapiths, for the most part emigrated to the mountainous country about Pindus and to the countries of the Athamanians and Dolopians, but their country and all Peribians who were left behind there were seized by the Laracians, who lived near the Peneus and were their neighbours and dwelt in the most fertile parts of the plains, though not in the very low region near the lake called Nessinus, into which the river, when it overflowed, would carry away a portion of the arable soil belonging to the Laracians. Later, however, they corrected this by means of embankments. The Laracians, then, kept possession of Peribia and exacted tribute until Philip established himself as lord over the region. Larissa is also the name of a place on Asa, another is Larissa Cremaste, by some called Pelasgia, and in Crete is a city Larissa, now joined to Hyrapina, whence the plain that lies below is now called Larisian Plain, and, in the Peloponnesus both Larissa, the citadel of the Argives, and the Larissus River, which is the boundary between the Elian country and Dime. Theopompus speaks of another city Larissa situated on the same common boundary, 
and in Asia is a Larissa Freconis near Syme, and also the Larissa near Amaxides in the Trode, and there is the Ephesian Larissa, and the Larissa in Syria, and there are Larissa in rocks 50 stadia from Metalene on the road to Methymne, and there is a Larissa in Attica, and a village Larissa 30 stadia distant from Tralis, above the city, on the road which runs through messages towards the Caster Plain near the sanctuary of the Isodromian Mother, which in its topographical position and its goodly attributes is like Larissa Cremaced, for it has an abundance of water and of vineyards, and perhaps the Larissa and Zeus received his epithet from this place, and also on the left of the Pontus is a village called Larissa, between Nolacus and, near the end of Mount Hemus. And Olusan, called white from the fact that its soil is a white clay, and alone, and Gonnus are Peribian cities. But alone changed its name to Limon, and is now in ruins. Both are situated below Olympus, not very far from the Europus River, which the poet calls the Titeraceus. 5.20 The poet next mentions both Titeraceus and the Peribians, when he says, And Gunius led from Cyphus twenty-two ships. And there followed him the Aenianians, and the Peribians steadfast in war, who had established their homes round wintry Dodona, and dwelt in the fields about lovely Titeraceus. Now he speaks of these places as belonging to the Peribians, places which fell into their possession as a part of Hestiotus. And also the cities subject to Polypedes were in part Peribian. However, he assigned them to the Lapiths because the two peoples lived intermingled with one another, and also because, although the Lapiths held possession of the plains and the Peribian element there were for the most part subject to the Lapiths, the Peribians held possession of the more mountainous parts near Olympus and Tempe, as, for example, Cyphus, and Dodona, and the region about the Titeraceus, this river rises in the Titerius mountain, which connects with Olympus, and flows into the territory of Peribia which is near Tempe, and somewhere in that neighborhood unites with the Peneus. Now the water of the Peneus is pure, but that of the Titeraceus is oily, because of some substance or other, so that it does not mingle with that of the Peneus, but runs over it on the top like oil. Because of the fact that the two peoples lived intermingled, Simonides uses the terms Peribians and Lapiths of all the Pelasgiotes who occupy the region about Girton and the outlets of the Peneus and Mount Ossa and Mount Pelion, and the region about Demetrius, and the region in the plain, I mean Larissa, Cranon, Scotusa, Mopsium, Atrax, and the region about Lake Nessinus and Lake Bobase. Of these places the poet mentions only a few, because the rest of them had not yet been settled, or else were only wretched settlements, on account of the inundations which took place at various times. Indeed, he does not mention Lake Nessinus either, but Lake Bobase only, though it is much smaller, because the latter alone persisted, whereas the former, in all probability, was at times filled at irregular intervals and at times gave out altogether. Scotus I have already mentioned in my account of Dodona and of the Oracle in Thessaly, saying that originally it was near this place. In the territory of Scotusa there is a place called Cynocephaly, near which Titus Quintius and the Romans, along with the Aetolians, in a great battle conquered Philip the son of Demetrius, king of the Macedonians. 5.21 Magnetus, also, has been treated by Homer in about the same way. For although he has already enumerated many of the places in Magnetus, none of these are called Magneton by him except those two places, and even these are designated by him in a dim and indistinct way, who dwelt about Peneus and Pelion with its shaking foliage. Assuredly, however, about the Peneus and Pelion lived those who held Girton, whom he had already named, as also those who held Ormenium, and several other Peribian peoples, and yet farther away from Pelion there were still Magnetons, beginning with those subject to Eumelus, at least according to the writers of later times. These writers, however, on account of the continual migrations, changes of political administrations, and intermixture of tribes, seem to have confused both the names and the tribes, so that they sometimes present difficult questions for the writers of today. For example, this has proved true, in the first place, in the case of Cranon and Girton, for in earlier times the Girtonians were called Phlegi, from Phlegius, the brother of Ixion, and the Cranonians Ephri, so that it is a difficult question who can be meant by the poet when he says, Verily these twain, going forth from Thrace, arm themselves to pursue the Ephri, or to pursue the great-hearted Phlegi. 5.22 Again, the same thing is true in the case of the Peribians and Aenianians. For Homer connected the two, as living near one another, and in fact we are told by the writers of later times that for a long time the habitation of the Aenianians was in the Docian plain. This plain is near the Peribia just mentioned above, and Asa and Lake Bobase, and while it is situated in the middle of Thessaly, yet it is enclosed all round by hills of its own. Concerning this plain Hesiod has spoken thus, or as the unwedded virgin who, dwelling on the holy Didyman hills, in the Docian plain, in front of Amiris, bathed her foot in Lake Bobase. Now as for the Aenianians, 
most of them were driven into Oita by the Lapiths, and there too they became predominant, having taken away certain parts of the country from the Dorians and the Malians as far as Heraclea and Echinus, although some remained in the neighborhood of Cyphus, a Peribian mountain which had a settlement of the same name. As for the Peribians, some of them drew together round the western parts of Olympus and stayed there, being neighbors to the Macedonians, but the greater part of them were driven out of their country into the mountains round Athamania and Pindus. But today little or no trace of them is preserved. At any rate, the Magnetons mentioned last by the poet in the Thessalian catalogue should be regarded as those inside Tempe, extending from the Peneus and Asa as far as Pelion, and bordering on the Pyridae in Macedonia, who held the country on the far side of the Peneus as far as the sea. Now Homilium, or Homol, for it is spelled both ways, should be assigned to the Magnetons, as I have said in my description of Macedonia, it is close to Asa, situated where the Peneus begins to discharge its waters through Tempe. And if one were to proceed as far as the seacoast nearest to Homilium, there is reason for assigning to them Rises and Aramni, which were situated on that part of the seacoast which was subject to Philoctetes and on that which was subject to Eumelus. However, let this question remain undecided. And also the order of the places next thereafter as far as the Peneus is not plainly told by the poet, but since these places are without repute, neither should I myself regard the matter as of great importance. Cape Sepius, however, was afterwards celebrated both in tragedies and in hymns on account of the total destruction there of the Persian fleet. Sepius itself is a rocky cape, but between it and Castania, a village situated at the foot of Pelion, is a beach where the fleet of Xerxes was lying in wait when, a violent east wind bursting forth, some of the ships were immediately driven high and dry on the beach and broken to pieces on the spot, and the others were carried along the coast to Ipni, one of the rugged places in the region of Pelion, or to Melibea, or to Castania, and destroyed. The whole voyage along the coast of Pelion is rough, a distance of about 80 stadia, and that along the coast of Asa is equally long and rough. Between is a gulf more than 200 stadia in circuit, on which is Melibea. The whole voyage along the coast from Demetrius to the Peneus, following the sinuosities of the gulfs, is more than 1,000 stadia in length, and from the Sperchius 800 more, and from the Euripus 2,350. Hieronymus declares that the plain country of Thessaly and Magnetus is 3,000 stadia in circuit, and that it was inhabited by Pelusgians, and that these were driven out of their country by the Lapiths, and that the present Pelusgian plain, as it is called, is that in which are situated Larissa, Gertone, Phere, Mopsium, Bobase, Asa, Homol, Pelion, and Magnetus. Mopsium is named, not after Mopsus, the son of Monto the daughter of Tiresias, but after Mopsus the Lapith who sailed with the Argonauts. But Mopsippus, after whom the Attic Mopsipia is named, is a different person. 5.23 So much, then, for the several parts of Thessaly. But speaking of it as a whole, I may say that in earlier times it was called Pyria, after Pyrrha the wife of Deucalion, and Hemoniah after Heman, and Thessaly after Thessalus the son of Heman. But some writers, dividing it into two parts, say that Deucalion obtained the portion towards the south and called it Pandora after his mother, and that the other part fell to Heman, after whom it was called Hemoniah, but that the former name was changed to Hellas, after Helen the son of Deucalion, and the latter to Thessaly, after the son of Heman. Some, however, say that descendants of Antiphus and Phoedipus, the sons of Thessalus the son of Heracles, invaded the country from Thesprotian Ephra and named it after Thessalus, their own ancestor. And it has been said that the country too was once named Nessinus, like the lake, after Nessin the son of Thessalus. Book 10. 1.1 Since Eubia lies parallel to the whole of the coast from Sunio to Thessaly, with the exception of the ends on either side, it would be appropriate to connect my description of the island with that of the parts already described before passing on to Aetolia and Acarnania, which are the remaining parts of Europe to be described. 1.2 In its length, then, the island extends parallel to the coast for a distance of about 1,200 stadia from Kenan to Gerastos, but its breadth is irregular and generally only about 150 stadia. Now Kenan lies opposite to Thermopylae and, to a slight extent, to the region outside Thermopylae, whereas Gerastos and Patalia lie towards Sunio. Accordingly, the island lies across the strait and opposite Attica, Boeotia, Locris, and the Malians. Because of its narrowness and of the above-mentioned length, it was named Macris by the ancients. It approaches closest to the mainland at Chalcis, where it juts out in a convex curve towards the region of Aulis in Boeotia and forms the Euripus. Concerning the Euripus I have already spoken rather at length, as also to a certain extent concerning the places which lie opposite one another across the strait, both on the mainland and on the island, on either side of the Euripus, that is, the regions both inside and outside the Euripus. But if anything has been left out, I shall now explain more fully. 
And first, let me explain that the parts between Aulis and the region of Gerestos are called the hollows of Euboea, for the coast bends inwards, but when it approaches Chalcis it forms a convex curve again towards the mainland. 1.3 The island was called, not only Macris, but also Abantis, at any rate, the poet, although he names Euboea, never names its inhabitants Euboeans, but always Abantes, and those who held Euboea, the courage breathing Abantes, five and with him follow the Abantes. 7 Aristotle says that Thracians, setting out from the Phocian Abba, recolonized the island and renamed those who held it Abantes. Others derive the name from a hero, just as they derive Euboea from a heroine. But it may be, just as a certain cave on the coast which fronts the Aegean, where Io is said to have given birth to Epiphus, is called Bouz Aule, that the island got the name Euboea from the same cause. The island was also called Achi, and the largest of its mountains bears the same name. And it was also named Elopia, after Elops the son of Ion. Some say that he was the brother of Achilles and Cadus, and he is also said to have founded Elopia, a place in Oria, as it is called, in Histiotis near the mountain Telethrius, and to have added to his dominions Histia, Pyrias, Cerinthus, Edepsis, and Arobia. In this last place was an oracle most averse to falsehood, it was an oracle of Apollo Salinos, Salinicus in MS. The Elopians migrated to Histia and enlarged the city, being forced to do so by Philistides the tyrant, after the Battle of Lectra. Demosthenes says that Philistides was set up by Philip as tyrant of the Oredi II, for thus in later times the Histiaeans were named, and the city was named Aureus instead of Histiaea. But according to some writers, Histiaea was colonized by Athenians from the Deme of the Histiaeans, as Eritrea was colonized from that of the Eritreans. Theopompus says that when Pericles overpowered Euboea the Histiaeans by agreement migrated to Macedonia, and that 2,000 Athenians who formerly composed the Deme of the Histiaeans came and took up their abode in Aureus. 1.4 Aureus is situated at the foot of the mountain Telethrius in the Drymus, as it is called, on the river Callis, upon a high rock, and hence, perhaps, it was because the Elopians who formerly inhabited it were mountaineers that the name Aureus was assigned to the city. It is also thought that Orion was so named because he was reared there. Some writers say that the Oredi had a city of their own, but because the Elopians were making war on them they migrated and took up their abode with the Histiaeans, and that, although they became one city, they used both names, just as the same city is called both Lacedaemon and Sparta. As I have already said, Histiaeotis in Thessaly was also named after the Histiaeans who were carried off from here into the mainland by the Peribians. 1.5 Since Elopia induced me to begin my description with Histiaea and Aureus, let me speak of the parts which border on these places. In the territory of this Aureus lies, not only Kenan, near Aureus, but also, near Kenan, Diem, and Athene Diades, the latter founded by the Athenians and lying above that part of the strait where passage is taken across to Sinus, and Cani and Elis was colonized from Diem. Now these places are in the neighborhood of Histiaea, and so is Cerinthus, a small city by the sea, and near it is the Budorus River, which bears the same name as the mountain in Salamis which is close to Attica. 1.6 Charistus is at the foot of the mountain Achi, and near it are Styra and Marmarium, in which latter are the quarry of the Charistian columns and a sanctuary of Apollo Marmarinus, and from here there is a passage across the strait to Haliarophenides. In Charistus is produced also the stone which is combed and woven, so that the woven material is made into towels, and, when these are soiled, they are thrown into fire and cleansed, just as linens are cleansed by washing. These places are said to have been settled by colonists from the Marathonian Tetrapolis and by Styrians. Styra was destroyed in the Malian War by Phaedrus, the general of the Athenians, but the country is held by the Eritreans. There is also a Charistus in the Laconian country, a place belonging to Aegis, towards Arcadia, whence the Charistian wine of which Alcman speaks. 1.7 Gerastos is not named in the catalogue of ships, but still the poet mentions it elsewhere, and at night they landed at Gerastos and he plainly indicates that the place is conveniently situated for those who are sailing across from Asia to Attica, since it comes near to Sunyo. It has a sanctuary of Poseidon, the most notable of those in that part of the world, and also a noteworthy settlement. 1.8 After Gerastos 1 comes to Eritrea, the greatest city in Euboea except Chalcis, and then to Chalcis, which in a way is the metropolis of the island, being situated on the Euripus itself. Both are said to have been founded by the Athenians before the Trojan War. And after the Trojan War, Achilles and Cadus, setting out from Athens, settled inhabitants in them, the former in Eritrea and the latter in Chalcis. There were also some Aeolians from the army of Penthalus who remained in the island, and, in ancient times, some Arabians who had crossed over with Cadmus. Be this as it may, these cities grew exceptionally strong and even sent forth noteworthy colonies into Macedonia, 
for Eritrea colonized the cities situated round Pelini and Athos, and Chalcis colonized the cities that were subject to Olynthus, which later were treated outrageously by Philip. And many places in Italy and Sicily are also Chalcidian. These colonies were sent out, as Aristotle states, when the government of the Hippobati, as it is called, was in power, for at the head of it were men chosen according to the value of their property, who ruled in an aristocratic manner. At the time of Alexander's passage across, the Chalcidians enlarged the circuit of the walls of their city, taking inside them both Canathus and the Euripus, and fortifying the bridge with towers and gates and a wall. 1.9 Above the city of the Chalcidians is situated the Lelantine Plain. In this plain are fountains of hot water suited to the cure of diseases, which were used by Cornelius Sulla, the Roman commander. And in this plain was also a remarkable mine which contained copper and iron together, a thing which is not reported as occurring elsewhere. Now, however, both metals have given out, as in the case of the silver mines at Athens. The whole of Euboea is much subject to earthquakes, but particularly the part near the strait, which is also subject to blasts through subterranean passages, as are Boeotia and other places which I have already described rather at length. And it is said that the city which bore the same name as the island was swallowed up by reason of a disturbance of this kind. This city is also mentioned by Aeschylus in his Glaucus Pontius, Eubais, about the bending shore of Zeus Senius, near the very tomb of wretched Lycus. In Aetolia, also, there is a place called by the same name Chalcis, and Chalcis near the sea, and rocky Caledon, and in the present Elian country, and they went past Cruni and rocky Chalcis, that is, Telemachus and his companions, when they were on their way back from Nestor's to their homeland. 1.10 As for Eritrea, some say that it was colonized from Triphily and Mesistus by Eritreus, but others say from the Eritrea at Athens, which now is a marketplace. There is also an Eritrea near Pharsalus. In the Eritrean territory there was a city Tamini, sacred to Apollo, and the sanctuary, which is near the strait, is said to have been founded by Admetus, at whose house the gods served as an hireling for a year. In earlier times Eritrea was called Melanias and Erotria. The village Amarinthus, which is seven stadia distant from the walls, belongs to this city. Now the old city was raised to the ground by the Persians, who netted the people, as Herodotus says, by means of their great numbers, the barbarians being spread about the walls, the foundations are still to be seen, and the place is called Old Eritrea, but the Eritrea of today was founded on it. As for the power the Eritreans once had, this is evidenced by the pillar which they once set up in the sanctuary of Artemis Amarinthia. It was inscribed thereon that they made their festal procession with 3,000 heavy armed soldiers, 600 horsemen, and 60 chariots. And they ruled over the peoples of Andros, Teos, Ceos, and other islands. They received new settlers from Elis, hence, since they frequently use the letter R, not only at the end of words, but also in the middle, they have been ridiculed by comic writers. There is also a village Oihalia in the Eritrean territory, the remains of the city which was destroyed by Heracles, it bears the same name as the Trachinian Oihalia and that near Trikes, and the Arcadian Oihalia, which the people of later times called Andania, and that Oihalia in Aetolia in the neighborhood of the Eurytanians. 1.11 Now at the present time Chalcis by common consent holds the leading position and is called the metropolis of the Eubians, and Eritrea is second. Yet even in earlier times these cities were held in great esteem, not only in war, but also in peace, indeed, they afforded philosophers a pleasant and undisturbed place of abode. This is evidenced by the school of the Eritrean philosophers, Menedemus and his disciples, which was established in Eritrea, and also, still earlier, by the sojourn of Aristotle in Chalcis where he also ended his days. 1.12 Now in general these cities were in accord with one another, and when differences arose concerning the Lelantine plain they did not so completely break off relations as to wage their wars in all respects according to the will of each, but they came to an agreement as to the conditions under which they were to conduct the fight. This fact, among others, is disclosed by a certain pillar in the Amarinthium, which forbids the use of long-distance missiles. In fact among all the customs of warfare and of the use of arms there neither is, nor has been, any single custom, for some use long-distance missiles, as, for example, bowmen and slingers and javelin throwers, whereas others use close fighting arms, as, for example, those who use sword, or outstretched spear, for the spear is used in two ways, one in hand-to-hand -hand combat and the other for hurling like a javelin, just as the pike serves both purposes, for it can be used both in close combat and as a missile for hurling which is also true of the Sarisa and the Hesus. 1.13 The Eubians excelled in standing combat, which is also called close and hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they used their spears outstretched, as the poet says, spearmen eager with outstretched ashen spears to shatter corslets. Perhaps the javelins were of a different kind, such as probably was the Pelian ashen spear, 
which, as the poet says, Achilles alone knew how to hurl, and he who said, and the spear a hurl farther than any other man can shoot an arrow, means the javelin spear. And those who fight in single combat are first introduced as using javelin spears, and then as resorting to swords. And close fighters are not those who use the sword alone, but also the spear hand to hand, as the poet says, he pierced him with bronze-tipped polished spear, and loosed his limbs. Now he introduces the Ubians as using this mode of fighting, but he says the contrary of the Locrians, Thathi cared not for the tolls of close combat, but relying on bows and well-twisted slings of sheeps while they followed with him to Ilium. There is current, also, an oracle which was given out to the people of Aegeum, Thessalian horse, Lacedaemonian woman, and men who drink the water of sacred Arethusa, meaning that the Chalcidians are best of all, for Arethusa is in their territory. 1.14 There are now two rivers in Euboea, the Sirius and the Neleus, and the sheep which drink from one of them turn white, and from the other black. A similar thing takes place in connection with the Crathes River, as I have said before. 1.15 When the Euboeans were returning from Troy, some of them, after being driven out of their course to Illyria, set out for home through Macedonia, but remained in the neighborhood of Edessa, after aiding in war those who had received them hospitably, and they founded a city Eubo. There was also a Eubea in Sicily, which was founded by the Chalcidians of Sicily, but they were driven out of it by Galen, and it became a stronghold of the Syracusans. In Corsera, also, and in Limnos, there were places called Eubea, and in the Argive country a hill of that name. 1.16 Since the Aetolians, Acarnanians, and Athamanians, if these two are to be called Greeks, live to the west of the Thessalians and the Oetians, it remains for me to describe these three, in order that I may complete the circuit of Greece, I must also add the islands which lie nearest to Greece and are inhabited by the Greeks, so far as I have not already included them in my description. 2.1 Aetolians Acarnanians Now the Aetolians and the Acarnanians border on one another, having between them the Achelous River, which flows from the north and from Pindus on the south through the country of the Agrians, an Aetolian tribe, and through that of the Amphilochians, the Acarnanians holding the western side of the river as far as that part of the Ambracian Gulf which is near Amphilochia and the sanctuary of the Action Apollo, but the Aetolians the eastern side as far as the Ozolian Locrians and Parnassus and the Oetians. Above the Acarnanians, in the interior and the parts towards the north, are situated the Amphilochians, and above these the Dolopians and Pindus, and above the Aetolians are the Peribians and Athamanians and a part of the Aenianians who hold Oita. The southern side, of Acarnania and Aetolia alike, is washed by the sea which forms the Corinthian Gulf, into which empties the Achelous River, which forms the boundary between the coast of the Aetolians and that of Acarnania. In earlier times the Achelous was called Tos. The river which flows past Dime bears the same name as this, as I have already said, and also the river near Lamia. I have already stated, also, that the Corinthian Gulf is said to begin at the mouth of this river. 2.2 As for cities, those of the Acarnanians are in Actorium, which is situated on a peninsula near Actium and is a trading center of the Nicopolis of today, which was founded in our times, Stratus, where one may sail up the Achelous River more than 200 stadia, and Oeniidae, which is also on the river the Old City, which is equidistant from the sea and from Stratus, being uninhabited, whereas that of today lies at a distance of about 70 stadia above the outlet of the river. There are also other cities, Palirus, Elysia, Lucas, Argos Amphilochicum, and Ambracia, most of which, or rather all, have become dependencies of Nicopolis. Stratus is situated about midway of the road between Elysia and Anactorium. 2.3 The cities of the Aetolians are Caledon and Pleuron, which are now indeed reduced, though in early times these settlements were an ornament to Greece. Further, Aetolia has come to be divided into two parts, one part being called Old Aetolia and the other Aetolia Epictetus. The old Aetolia was the seacoast extending from the Achelous to Caledon, reaching for a considerable distance into the interior, which is fertile and level, here in the interior lie Stratus and Triconium, the latter having excellent soil. Aetolia Epictetus is the part which borders on the country of the Locrians in the direction of Naupactus and Eupalium, being a rather rugged and sterile country, and extends to the Oetian country and to that of the Athamanians and to the mountains and tribes which are situated next beyond these towards the north. 2.4 Aetolia also has a very large mountain, Corax, which borders on Oita, and it has among the rest of its mountains, and more in the middle of the country than Corax, Erisynthus, near which New Pleuron was founded by the inhabitants of the old, who abandoned their city, which had been situated near Caledon in a district both fertile and level, at the time when Demetrius, surnamed Aetolicus, laid waste the country, above Malikaria are Taphiasus and Chalcis, rather high mountains, on which were situated the small cities Macunia and Chalcis, the latter bearing the same name as the mountain, 
though it is also called hypocalces. Near old Pleuron is the mountain Curium, after which, as some have supposed, the Pleuronian Curides were named. 2.5 The Avenus River begins in the territory of those Bomians who live in the country of the Ophians, the Ophians being an Aetolian tribe, like the Eurytanians and Agrians and Curides and others, and flows at first, not through the Coretan country, which is the same as the Pleuronian, but through the more easterly country, past Chalcis and Caledon, and then, bending back towards the plains of Old Pleuron and changing its course to the west, it turns towards its outlets in the south. In earlier times it was called Lycormus. And their Nessus, it is said, who had been appointed ferryman, was killed by Heracles because he tried to violate Deianera when he was ferrying her across the river. 2.6 The poet also names Alenus and Pallene as Aetolian cities. Of these, the former, which bears the same name as the Achaean city, was raised to the ground by the Aeolians, it was near New Pleuron, but the Acarnanians claimed possession of the territory. The other, Pallene, the Aeolians moved to higher ground, and also changed its name, calling it Proscium. Hellanicus does not know the history of these cities either, but mentions them as though they too were still in their early status, and among the early cities he names Macunia and Malikaria, which were founded even later than the return of the Heraclati, almost everywhere in his writings displaying a most convenient carelessness. 2.7 Upon the whole, then, this is what I have to say concerning the country of the Acarnanians and the Aetolians, but the following is also to be added concerning the sea coast and the islands which lie off it, beginning at the mouth of the Ambracian Gulf the first place which belongs to the Acarnanians is Actium. The sanctuary of the Action Apollo bears the same name, as also the cape which forms the mouth of the gulf and has a harbour on the outer side. An Actorium, which is situated on the gulf, is 40 stadia distant from the sanctuary, whereas Lucas is 240. 2.8 In early times Lucas was a peninsula of Acarnania, but the poet calls it shore of the mainland, using the term mainland for the country which is situated across from Ithaca and Cephalonia, and this country is Acarnania. And therefore, when he says, shore of the mainland, one should take it to mean shore of Acarnania. And to Lucas also belonged, not only Nericus, which Laertes says he took, verily I took Nericus, well-built citadel, shore of the mainland, when I was lord over the Cephalenians, but also the cities which Homer names in the catalogue, and dwell in Crocycalia and rugged Egilips. But the Corinthians sent by Sipsilus and Gorgas took possession of this shore and also advanced as far as the Ambracian Gulf, and both Ambracia and Anactorium were colonized at this time, and the Corinthians dug a canal through the isthmus of the peninsula and made Lucas an island, and they transferred Nericus to the place which, though once an isthmus, is now a strait span by a bridge, and they changed its name to Lucas, which was named, as I think, after Lucatas, for Lucatas is a rock of white color jutting out from Lucas into the sea and towards Cephalonia, and therefore it took its name from its color. 2.9 It contains the sanctuary of Apollo Lucatas, and also the leap, which was believed to put an end to the longings of love. Where Sappho is said to have been the first, as Menander says, when through frantic longing she was chasing the haughty found, to fling herself with a leap from the far seen rock, calling upon thee in prayer, O Lord and Master. Now although Menander says that Sappho was the first to take the leap, yet those who are better versed than he in antiquities say that it was Cephalus, who was in love with Terylus the son of Dionysus. It was an ancestral custom among the Lucadians, every year at the sacrifice performed in honour of Apollo, for some criminal to be flung from this rocky lookout for the sake of averting evil, wings and birds of all kinds being fastened to him, since by their fluttering they could lighten the leap, and also for a number of men, stationed all round below the rock in small fishing boats, to take the victim in, and, when he had been taken on board, to do all in their power to get him safely outside their borders. The author of the Alcmione says that Icarius, the father of Penelope, had two sons, Elysius and Lucadius, and that these two reigned over Acarnania with their father. Accordingly, Ephorus thinks that the cities were named after these. 2.10 But though at the present time only the people of the island Cephalonia are called Cephalenians, Homer so calls all who were subject to Odysseus among whom are also the Acarnanians. For after saying, but Odysseus led the Cephalenians, who held Ithaca and Neridum with quivering foliage, Neridum being the famous mountain on this island, as also when he says, and those from Dulichium and the sacred Echinades, Dulichium itself being one of the Echinades, and those who dwelt in Buprasium and Elis, Buprasium being in Elis, and those who held Euboea and Chalcis and Eritrea, meaning that these cities were in Euboea, and Trojans and Lycians and Dardanians, meaning that the Lycians and Dardanians were Trojans, however, after mentioning Neridum, he says, and dwelt in Crocycalia and rugged Egilips, and those who held Zasynthos and those who dwelt about Samos, and those who held the mainland and dwelt in the parts over against the islands. By mainland, therefore, he means the parts over against the islands, 
wishing to include, along with Lucas, the rest of Akarnania as well, concerning which he also speaks in this way, twelve herd on the mainland, and as many flocks of sheep, perhaps because Aperotus extended thus far in early times and was called by the general name mainland. But by Samos he means the Cephalonia of today, as, when he says, in the strait between Ithaca and rugged Samos, for by the epithet he differentiates between the objects bearing the same name, thus making the name apply, not to the city, but to the island. For the island was a tetrapolis, and one of its four cities was the city called indifferently either Samos or Same, bearing the same name as the island. And when the poet says, for all the nobles who hold sway over the islands, Dulichium and Same and Woody Zasynthos, he is evidently making an enumeration of the islands and calling Same that island which he had formerly called Samos. But Apollodorus, when he says in one passage that ambiguity is removed by the epithet when the poet says and rugged Samos, showing that he meant the island, and then, in another passage, says that one should copy the reading, Dulichium and Samos, instead of Same, plainly takes the position that the city was called Same or Samos indiscriminately, but the island Samos only, for that the city was called Same is clear, according to Apollodorus, from the fact that, in enumerating the wooers from the several cities, the poet said, from Same came four and twenty men, and also from the statement concerning time, they then sent her to Same to wed. But this is open to argument, for the poet does not express himself distinctly concerning either Cephalonia or Ithaca and the other places nearby, and consequently both the commentators and the historians are at variance with one another. 2.11 For instance, when Homer says in regard to Ithaca, those who held Ithaca and Neritum with quivering foliage, he clearly indicates by the epithet that he means the mountain Neritum, and in other passages he expressly calls it a mountain, but I dwell in sunny Ithaca, wherein is a mountain, Neritum, with quivering leaves and conspicuous from afar. But whether by Ithaca he means the city or the island, is not clear, at least in the following verse, those who held Ithaca and Neritum, for if one takes the word in its proper sense, one would interpret it as meaning the city, just as though one should say Athens and Lycabetus, or Rhodes and Atabarus, or Lacedaemon and Tagetus, but if he takes it in a poetical sense the opposite is true. However, in the words, but I dwell in sunny Ithaca, wherein is a mountain, Neritum, his meaning is clear, for the mountain is in the island, not in the city. But when he says as follows, we have come from Ithaca below Nahum, it is not clear whether he means that Nahum is the same as Neritum or different, or whether it is a mountain or place. However, the critic who writes Neritum instead of Neritum, or the reverse, is utterly mistaken, for the poet refers to the latter as quivering with foliage, but to the former as well-built citadel, and to the latter as in Ithaca, but to the former as shore of the mainland. 2.12 The following verse also is thought to disclose a sort of contradiction. Now Ithaca itself lies Kthamali, Peniperate on the sea, for Kthamali means low, or on the ground, whereas Peniperate means high up, as Homer indicates in several places when he calls Ithaca rugged. And so when he refers to the road that leads from the harbour as rugged path up through the wooded place, and when he says for not one of the islands which lean upon the sea is Eudaelos or rich in meadows, and Ithaca surpasses them all. Now although Homer's phraseology presents incongruities of this kind, yet they are not poorly explained, for, in the first place, writers do not interpret Kthamali as meaning low-lying here, but lying near the mainland, since it is very close to it, and, secondly, they do not interpret Peniperate as meaning highest, but highest towards the darkness, that is, farthest removed towards the north beyond all the others, for this is what he means by towards the darkness, but the opposite by towards the south, as in but the other islands lie anithe towards the dawn and the sun, for the word anithe is at a distance, or apart, implying that the other islands lie towards the south and farther away from the mainland, whereas Ithaca lies near the mainland and towards the north. That Homer refers in this way to the southerly region is clear also from these words, whether they go to the right, towards the dawn and the sun, or yet to the left towards the misty darkness, and still more clear from these words, my friends, lo, now we know not where is the place of darkness, nor of dawn, nor where the sun, that gives light to men, goes beneath the earth, nor where he rises. For it is indeed possible to interpret this as meaning the four climata, if we interpret the dawn as meaning the southerly region, and this has some plausibility, but it is better to conceive of the region which is along the path of the sun as set opposite to the northerly region, for the poetic words are intended to signify a considerable change in the celestial phenomena, not merely a temporary concealment of the climata, for necessarily concealment ensues every time the sky is clouded, whether by day or by night, but the celestial phenomena change to a greater extent as we travel farther and farther towards the south or in the opposite direction. Yet this travel causes a hiding, not of the western or eastern sky, but only of the southern or northern, and in fact this hiding takes place when the sky is clear, for the pole is the most northerly point of the sky, 
but since the pole moves and is sometimes at our zenith and sometimes below the earth, the arctic circles also change with it and in the course of such travel sometimes vanish with it, so that you cannot know where the northern clima is, or even where it begins. And if this is true, neither can you know the opposite clima. The circuit of Ithaca is about 80 stadia. So much for Ithaca. 2.13 As for Cephalonia, which is a tetrapolis, the poet mentions by its present name neither it nor any of its cities except one, Same or Samos, which now no longer exists, though traces of it are to be seen midway of the passage to Ithaca, and its people are called Simeans. The other three, however, survive even to this day in the little cities Palais, Prinesis, and Cranii. And in our time Gaius Antonius, the uncle of Marcus Antonius, founded still another city, when, after his consulship, which he held with Cicero the Order, he went into exile, sojourned in Cephalonia, and held the whole island in subjection as though it were his private estate. However, before he could complete the settlement he obtained permission to return home, and ended his days amid other affairs of greater importance. 2.14 Some, however, have not hesitated to identify Cephalonia with Dulichium, and others with Tephos, calling the Cephalinians Taphians, and likewise Teleboans, and to say that Amphitryon made an expedition thither with Cephalus, the son of Dionysus, whom, an exile from Athens, he had taken along with him, and that when Amphitryon seized the island he gave it over to Cephalus, and that the island was named after Cephalus and the cities after his children. But this is not in accordance with Homer, for the Cephalenians were subject to Odysseus and Laertes, whereas Tephos was subject to Mentus. I declare that I am Mentus the son of wise Ancylus, and I am lord over the or loving Taphians. Tephos is now called Taphius. Neither is Hellanicus in accord with Homer when he identifies Cephalonia with Dulichium, for Homer makes Dulichium and the remainder of the Echinades subject to Megus, and their inhabitants were Apeans, who had come there from Elis, and it is on this account that he calls Otis the Silenian comrade of Philides and ruler of the high hearted Apeans, but Odysseus led the high hearted Cephalenians. According to Homer, therefore, neither is Cephalonia Dulichium nor is Dulichium a part of Cephalonia, as Andron says, for the Apeans held possession of Dulichium, whereas the Cephalenians held possession of the whole of Cephalonia and were subject to Odysseus, whereas the Apeans were subject to Megus. Neither is Palais called Dulichium by the poet, as Pharisides writes. But that writer is most in opposition to Homer who identifies Cephalonia with Dulichium, if it be true that 52 of the suitors were from Dulichium and 24 from Same for in that case would not Homer say that 52 came from the island as a whole and a half of that number less two from a single one of its four cities? However, if one grants this, I shall ask what Homer can mean by same in the passage, Dulichium and same in Woody's Asynthos. 2.15 Cephalonia lies opposite Akarnania, at a distance of about 50 stadia from Lucatas, some say 40, and about 180 from Chelonatas. It has a perimeter of about 300 stadia, is long, extending towards Eurus, and is mountainous. The largest mountain upon it is Enus, whereon is the sanctuary of Zeus Enesius, and where the island is narrowest it forms an isthmus so low-lying that it is often submerged from sea to sea. Both Palais and Cranii are on the gulf near the Narrows. 2.16 Between Ithaca and Cephalonia is the small island Asteria, the poet calls it Asterus, which the Skepsian says no longer remains such as the poet describes it, but in it are harbours safe for anchorage with entrances on either side, Apollodorus, however, says that it still remains so to this day, and mentions a town Alalkamini upon it, situated on the isthmus itself. 2.17 The poet also uses the name Samos for that Thrace which we now call Samothrace. And it is reasonable to suppose that he knows the Ionian Samos, for he also appears to know of the Ionian migration, otherwise he would not have differentiated between the places of the same name when referring to Samothrace, which he designates at one time by the epithet, high on the topmost summit of woody Samos, the Thracian, and at another time by connecting it with the islands near it, unto Samos and Imbros and inhospitable Limnos. And again, between Samos and rugged Imbros. He therefore knew the Ionian island, although he did not name it, in fact it was not called by the same name in earlier times, but Melampolis, then Anthemus, then Parthenia, from the river Parthenius, the name of which was changed to Imbrosus. Since, then, both Cephalonia and Samothrace were called Samos at the time of the Trojan War, for otherwise Hecabe would not be introduced as saying that he was for selling her children whom he might take captive unto Samos and unto Imbros, and since the Ionian Samos had not yet been colonized, it plainly got its name from one of the islands which earlier bore the same name. Whence that other fact is also clear, that those writers contradict ancient history who say that colonists came from Samos after the Ionian migration and the arrival of Tembrian and named Samothrace Samos, since this story was fabricated by the Samians to enhance the glory of their island. 
Those writers are more plausible who say that the island came upon this name from the fact that lofty places are called Sama, for thence all Ida was plain to see, and plain to see were the city of Priam and the ships of the Achaeans but some say that the island was called Samos after the Sai, the Thracians who inhabited it in earlier times, who also held the adjacent mainland, whether these Sai were the same people as the Sawe or Sinti, the poet calls them Sintis, or a different tribe. The Sai are mentioned by Archilochus, one of the Sai robbed me of my shield, which, a blameless weapon, I left behind me beside a bush, against my will. 2.18 of the islands classified as subject to Odysseus, Zasynthos remains to be described. It leans slightly more to the west of the Peloponnesus than Cephalonia and lies closer to the latter. The circuit of Zasynthos is 160 stadia. It is about 60 stadia distant from Cephalonia. It is indeed a woody island, but it is fertile, and its city, which bears the same name, is worthy of note. The distance thence to the Libyan Hesperides is 3,300 stadia. 2.19 To the east of Zasynthos and Cephalonia are situated the Echinades Islands, among which is Dulichium, now called Dalica, and also what are called the Oxai, which the poet called Thoi. Dalica lies opposite Oeniidae and the outlet of the Achaloas, at a distance of 100 stadia from Araxis, the promontory of the Elaeans, the rest of the Echinades, they are several in number, all poor soiled and rugged, lie off the outlet of the Achaloas the farthermost being fifteen stadia distant and the nearest five. In earlier times they lay out in the high sea, but the silt brought down by the Achaloas has already joined some of them to the mainland and will do the same to others. It was this silt which in early times caused the country called Parishloitus, which the river overflows, to be a subject of dispute, since it was always confusing the designated boundaries between the Acarnanians and the Aetolians, for they would decide the dispute by arms, since they had no arbitrators, and the more powerful of the two would win the victory and this is the cause of the fabrication of a certain myth, telling how Heracles defeated Achaloas and, as the prize of his victory, won the hand of Deianera, the daughter of Oinius, whom Sophocles represents as speaking as follows, For my suitor was a river god, I mean Achaloas, who would demand me of my father in three shapes, coming now as a bull in bodily form, now as a gleaming serpent in coils, now with trunk of man in front of ox. Some writers add to the myth, saying that this was the horn of Amalthea, which Heracles broke off from Achaloas and gave to Oinius as a wedding gift. Others, conjecturing the truth from the myths, say that the Achaloas, like the other rivers, was called like a bull from the roaring of its waters, and also from the bendings of its streams, which were called horns, and like a serpent because of its length and windings, and with front of ox for the same reason that he was called bull-faced, and that Heracles, who in general was inclined to deeds of kindness, but especially for Oinius, since he was to ally himself with him by marriage, regulated the irregular flow of the river by means of embankments and channels, and thus rendered a considerable part of Parish Loitus dry, all to please Oinius, and that this was the horn of Amalthea. Now, as for the Echinades, or the Oxai, Homer says that they were ruled over in the time of the Trojan War by Megas, who was begotten by the knightly Phileas, dear to Zeus, who once changed his abode to Dulichium because he was wroth with his father. His father was Augeus, the ruler of the Elian country and the Apaeans, and therefore the Apaeans who set out for Dulichium with Phileas held these islands. 2.20 The islands of the Taphians, or, in earlier times, of the Teleboans, among which was Tophos. Now called Tophius, were distinct from the Echinades, not in the matter of distances, for they lie near them, but in that they are classified as under different commanders, Taphians and Teleboans. Now in earlier times Amphitryon made an expedition against them with Cephalus the son of Dionysus, an exile from Athens, and gave over their government to him, but the poet says that they were marshalled under Mentis, calling them pirates, as indeed all the Teleboans are said to be pirates. So much, then, for the islands lying off Acarnania. 2.21 Between Lucas and the Ambracian Gulf is a salt lake, called Mertentium. Next after Lucas one comes to Palirus and Elysia, cities of Acarnania, of these, Elysia is fifteen stadia distant from the sea, where is a harbour sacred to Heracles and a sacred precinct. It is from this precinct that one of the commanders carried to Rome the labours of Heracles, works of Lysippus, which were lying out of place where they were, because it was a deserted region. Then one comes to Cape Crithote, and the Echinades, and the city Asticus, which bears the same name as the city near Nicomedia and Gulf Astacenus, the name being used in the feminine gender. Crithote also bears the same name as one of the little cities in the Thracian Chersonesus. All parts of the coast between these places have good harbours. Then one comes to Oinaidae and the Achaloas, then to a lake of the Oinaidae, called Melidi, which is thirty stadia in length and twenty in breadth, and to another lake, Sinia, which is twice the size of Melidi, both in length and in breadth, and to a third, Uria, which is much smaller than those. 
Now Sinya empties into the sea, but the others lie about half a stadium above it. Then one comes to the Avenus, to which the distance from Actium is 670 stadia. After the Avenus one comes to the mountain Chalcis, which Artemidorus has called Chalcia, then to Pluron, then to the village Halicirna, above which thirty stadia in the interior, lies Caledon, and near Caledon is the sanctuary of the Laprian Apollo. Then one comes to the mountain Taphiasis, then to the city Macunia, then to Malikaria and, nearby, to Antrium, the boundary between Aetolia and Locris, to which the distance from the Avenus is about 120 stadia. Artemidorus, indeed, does not give this account of the mountain, whether we call it Chalcis or Chalcia, since he places it between the Achelous and Pleuron, but Apollodorus, as I have said before, places both Chalcis and Taphiasis above Malikaria, and he also says that Caledon is situated between Pleuron and Chalcis. Perhaps, however, we should postulate two mountains, one near Pleuron called Chalcis, and the other near Malikaria called Chalcia. Near Caledon, also, is a lake, which is large and well supplied with fish, it is held by the Romans who live in Patri. 2.22 Apollodorus says that in the interior of Acarnania there is a people called Arasikians, who are mentioned by Alcman, nor yet an Arasikian nor shepherd, but from the heights of Sardis. But Alenus, which Homer mentions in the Aetolian catalogue, was in Aetolia, though only traces of it are left, near Pleuron at the foot of Aracynthus. Near it, also, was Lysmachia, this, too, has disappeared, it was situated by the lake now called Lysmachia, in earlier times Hydra, between Pleuron and the city Arsinoe. In earlier times Arsinoe was only a village, and was called Canapa, but it was first founded as a city by Arsinoe, who was both wife and sister of Ptolemy II, it was rather happily situated at the fort across the Achelous. Pauline has also suffered a fate similar to that of Alenus. When the poet calls Caledon both steep and rocky, one should interpret him as referring to the country, for, as I have said, they divided the country into two parts and assigned the mountainous part, or Epictetus, to Caledon and the level country to Pleuron. 2.23 At the present time both the Acarnanians and the Aetolians, like many of the other tribes, have been exhausted and reduced to impotence by their continual wars. However, for a very long time the Aetolians, together with the Acarnanians, stood firm, not only against the Macedonians and the other Greeks, but also finally against the Romans, when fighting for autonomy. But since they are often mentioned by Homer, as also both by the other poets and by historians, sometimes in words that are easy to interpret and about which there is no disagreement, and sometimes in words that are less intelligible, this has been shown in what I have already said about them. I should also add some of those older accounts which afford us a basis of fact to begin with, or are matters of doubt. 2.24 For instance, in the case of Acarnania, Laertes and the Cephalenians acquired possession of it, as I have said, but as to what people held it before that time, many writers have indeed given an opinion, but since they do not agree in their statements, which have, however, a wide currency, there is left for me a word of arbitration concerning them. They say that the people who were called both Taphians and Teleboans lived in Acarnania in earlier times, and that their leader Cephalus, who had been set up by Amphitryon as master over the islands about Tiphos, gained the mastery over this country too. And from this fact they go on to add the myth that Cephalus was the first to take the leap from Lucatas which became the custom, as I have said before. But the poet does not say that the Taphians were ruling the Acarnanians before the Cephalenians and Laertes came over, but only that they were friends to the Ithacans, and therefore, according to the poet, they either had not ruled over the region at all, or had yielded Acarnania to the Ithacans voluntarily, or had become joint occupants with them. It appears that also a colony from Lacedaemon settled in Acarnania, I mean Icarius, father of Penelope, and his followers, for in the Odyssey the poet represents both Icarius and the brothers of Penelope as living, who shrink from going to the house of her father, Icarius, that he himself may exact the bride gifts for his daughter, and, concerning her brothers, for already her father and her brothers bid her marry Eurymachus, for, in the first place, it is improbable that they were living in Lacedaemon, since in that case Telemachus would not have lodged at the home of Menelaus when he went to Lacedaemon, and, secondly, we have no tradition of their having lived elsewhere but they say that Tyndarius and his brother Icarius, after being banished by Hippocoon from their homeland, went to Thestius, the ruler of the Pleuronians, and helped him to acquire possession of much of the country on the far side of the Achelous on condition that they should receive a share of it, that Tyndarius, however, went back home, having married Leda, the daughter of Thestius, whereas Icarius stayed on, keeping a portion of Acarnania, and by Polycasti, the daughter of Ligaeus, begot both Penelope and her brothers. Now I have already set forth that the Acarnanians were enumerated in the catalogue of ships, that they took part in the expedition to Ilium, and that among these were named those who lived on the shore, 
and also those who held the mainland and dwelt in parts opposite. But as yet neither had the mainland been named Akarnania nor the shore Lucas. 2.25 Ephorus denies that they joined the Trojan expedition, for he says that Alcmean, the son of Amphuraeus, made an expedition with Diomedes and the other Epigoni, and had brought to a successful issue the war against the Thebans, and then joined Diomedes and with him took vengeance upon the enemies of Oinius, after which he himself, first giving over Aetolia to them, passed into Acarnania and subdued it, and meanwhile Agamemnon attacked the Argives and easily prevailed over them, since the most of them had accompanied the army of Diomedes, but a little later, when the expedition against Troy confronted him, he conceived the fear that, when he was absent on the expedition, Diomedes and his army might come back home, and in fact it was reported that a great army had gathered round him, and seized the empire to which they had the best right, for one was the heir of Adrastus and the other of his father, and accordingly, after thinking this all over, Agamemnon invited them both to resume possession of Argos and to take part in the war, and although Diomedes was persuaded to take part in the expedition, Alcmean was vexed and refused to heed the invitation, and for this reason the Acarnanians alone refused to share in the expedition with the Greeks. And it was probably by following this account that the Acarnanians tricked the Romans, as they are said to have done, and obtained from them their autonomy, urging that they alone had had no part in the expedition against the ancestors of the Romans, for they were named neither in the Aetolian catalogue nor separately, and in fact their name was not mentioned in the epic poems at all. 2.26 Ephorus, then, makes Acarnania subject to Alcmean even before the Trojan War, and he not only declares that the Amphilochian Argos was founded by him, but also says that Acarnania was named after Alcmean's son Acarnan, and the Amphilochians after Alcmean's brother Amphilochus, therefore his account is to be cast out amongst those contrary to Homeric history. But Thucydides and others say that Amphilochus, on his return from the Trojan expedition, was displeased with the state of affairs at Argos, and took up his abode in this country, some saying that he came by right of succession to the domain of his brother, others giving a different account. So much may be said of the Acarnanians specifically, I shall now speak of their history in a general way, in so far as their history is interwoven with that of the Aetolians, in so far as I have thought best to add to my previous narrative. 3.1 Aetolia Curetes As for the Curetes, some assign them to the Acarnanians, others to the Aetolians, and some assert that they originated in Crete, but others in Euboea, but since Homer mentions them, I should first investigate his account. It is thought that he means that they were Aetolians rather than Acarnanians, if indeed the sons of Portheon were Agrius and Melus, and, the third, Oinius the knight, and they lived in Pleuron and Steep Caledon. These are both Aetolian cities, and are referred to in the Aetolian catalogue, and therefore, since, even according to the poet, the Curetes obviously lived in Pleuron, they would be Aetolians. Those writers who oppose this view are misled by Homer's mode of expression when he says, the Curetes were fighting, and the Aetolians steadfast in battle, about the city of Caledon, for, they add, neither would he have spoken appropriately if he had said, the Boeotians and the Thebans were fighting against one another, or the Argives and the Peloponnesians. But, as I have shown heretofore, this habit of expression not only is Homeric, but is much used by the other poets also. This interpretation, then, is easy to defend, but let those writers explain how the poet could catalogue the Pleuronians among the Aetolians if they were not Aetolians or at least of the same race. 3.2 Ephorus, after saying that the Aetolians were a race which had never become subject to any other people, but throughout all time of which there is any record had remained undevastated, both because of the ruggedness of their country and because of their training in warfare, says at the outset that the Curetes held possession of the whole country, but when Aetolus, the son of Endymion, arrived from Elis and overpowered them in war, the Curetes withdrew to what is now called Acarnania, whereas the Aetolians came back with the Paeans and founded the earliest of the cities of Aetolia, and in the tenth generation after that Elis was settled by Oxalus the son of Heman, who had crossed over from Aetolia. And he cites as evidence of all this two inscriptions, the one at Therma in Aetolia, where it is their ancestral custom to hold their elections of magistrates, engraved on the base of the statue of Aetolus, founder of the country, once reared beside the eddies of the Alpius, neighbour of the racecourses of Olympia, son of Endymion, this Aetolus has been set up by the Aetolians as a memorial of his valour to behold, and the other inscription in the marketplace of the Eleans on the statue of Oxalus, Aetolus once left this octochthonous people, and through many a toil with the spear took possession of the land of Curatus, but the tenth scion of the same stock, Oxalus, the son of Heman, founded this city in early times. 3.3 Now through these inscriptions Ephorus correctly signifies the kinship of the Eleans and Aetolians with one another, since both inscriptions agree, not merely as to the kinship of the two peoples, but also that each people was the founder of the other, 
through which he successfully convicts of falsehood those who assert that, while the Eleans were indeed colonists of the Aetolians, the Aetolians were not colonists of the Eleans. But here, too, Ephorus manifestly displays the same inconsistency in his writing and his pronouncements as in the case of the oracle at Delphi, which I have already set forth, for, after saying that Aetolia has been undevastated throughout all times of which there is any record, and after saying also that in the beginning the Curetes held possession of this country, he should have added as a corollary to what he had already said that the Curetes continued to hold possession of the Aetolian land down to his own time, for only thus could it have been rightly said that the land had been undevastated and that it had never come under the power of others, and yet, utterly forgetting his promise, he does not add this, but the contrary, that when Aetolus arrived from Elis and overpowered the Curetes in war, they withdrew into Acarnania. What else, pray, is specifically characteristic of a devastation than being overpowered in war and abandoning the country? And this is evidenced also by the inscription among the Eleans, for Aetolus, it says, through many a toil with the spear took possession of the land of Curetus. 3.4 Perhaps, however, one might say that Ephorus means that Aetolia was undevastated from the time when it got this name, that is, after Aetolus arrived there, but Ephorus has deprived himself of the argument in support of this idea by saying in his next words that this, meaning the tribe of the Apeans, constituted the greatest part of the people who stayed on among the Aetolians, but that later, when Aeolians, who at the same time with Boeotians had been compelled to migrate from Thessaly, were intermingled with them, they in common with these held possession of the country. Is it credible, pray, that without war they invaded the country of a different people and divided it up with its possessors, when the latter had no need of such a partnership? Or, since this is not credible, is it credible that those who were overpowered by arms came out on an equality with the victors? What else, pray, is devastation than being overpowered by arms? Apollodorus, also, says that, according to history, the Hyants left Boeotia and settled among the Aetolians. But Ephorus, as though he had achieved success in his argument, adds, it is my want to examine such matters as these with precision, whenever any matter is either altogether doubtful or falsely interpreted. 3.5 But though Ephorus is such, still he is better than others. And Polybius himself, who praises him so earnestly, and says concerning the Greek histories that Eutyxus indeed gave a good account, but Ephorus gave the best account of the foundings of cities, kinships, migrations, and original founders, but I, he says, shall show the facts as they now are, as regards both the position of places and the distances between them, for this is the most appropriate function of choreography. But assuredly you, Polybius, who introduce popular notions concerning distances, not only in dealing with places outside of Greece, but also when treating Greece itself, must also submit to an accounting, not only to Poseidonius, and to Apollodorus, but to several others as well. One should therefore pardon me as well, and not be vexed, if I make any mistakes when I borrow from such writers most of my historical material, but should rather be content if in the majority of cases I improve upon the accounts given by others, or if I add such facts as have elsewhere, owing to lack of knowledge, been left untold. 3.6 Concerning the Curetes still further accounts, to the following effect, are given, some of them being more closely related to the history of the Aetolians and the Acarnanians, others more remotely. More closely related are such accounts as I have given before that the Curetes were living in the country which is now called Aetolia, and that the Aetolians came with Aetolus and drove them into Acarnania, and also accounts of this kind, that, when Pleuronia was inhabited by the Curetes and was called Curetus, Aeolians made an invasion and took it away from them, and drove out its occupants. Archimachus the Euboean says that the Curetes settled at Chalcis, but since they were continually at war for the Lelantine plain and the enemy would catch them by the front hair and drag them down, he says, they let their hair grow long behind but cut short the part in front, and because of this they were called Curetes, from the cut of their hair, and they then migrated to Aetolia, and, after taking possession of the region round Pleuron, called the people who lived on the far side of the Achaloas Acarnanians, because they kept their heads unshorn. But some say that each of the two tribes got its name from a hero, others, that the Curetes were named after the mountain Curium, which is situated about Pleuron, and also that this is an Aetolian tribe, like the Ophians and the Agrians and the Euritanians and several others. But, as I have already stated, when Aetolia was divided into two parts, the region round Caledon, they say, was in the possession of Oinius, whereas a certain part of Pleuronia was in the possession of the sons of Portheon, that is, Agrius and his followers, if it be true Thathi lived in Pleuron and steep Caledon, the mastery over Pleuronia, however, was held by Thestius, the father-in-law of Oinius and father of Althea, who was leader of the Curetes, but when war broke out between the sons of Thestius, on the one hand, and Oinius and Meliager, on the other, about the hog's head and skin, as the poet says, following the mythical story of the boar, 
but in all probability about the possession of a part of the territory, according to the words of the poet, the Curetes were fighting, as also the Aetolians steadfast in battle. So much for the accounts which are more closely related. 3.7 The accounts which are more remotely related, however, to the present subject, but are wrongly, on account of the identity of the names, brought into the same connection by the historians I mean those accounts which, although they are called Coretan history and history of the Curetes, just as if they were the history of those Curetes who lived in Aetolia and Acarnania, not only are different from that history, but are more like the accounts of the Satyri, Silani, Bacchae, and Tidiri, for the Curetes, like these, are called genii or ministers of gods by those who have handed down to us the Cretan and the Phrygian traditions, which are interwoven with certain sacred rites, some mystical, the others connected in part with the rearing of the child Zeus in Crete and in part with the orgies in honor of the mother of the gods which are celebrated in Phrygia and in the region of the Trojan Idaho but the variation in these accounts is so small that, whereas some represent the Corybants, the Kaberi, the Idaean Dactyli, and the Telkinis as identical with the Curetes, others represent them as all kinsmen of one another and differentiate only certain small matters in which they differ in respect to one another, but, roughly speaking and in general, they represent them, one and all, as a kind of inspired people and as subject to Bacchic frenzy, and, in the guise of ministers, as inspiring terror at the celebration of the sacred rites by means of war dances, accompanied by uproar and noise and cymbals and drums and arms, and also by flute and outcry, and consequently these rites are in a way regarded as having a common relationship, I mean these and those of the Samothracians and those in Lemnos and in several other places, because the divine ministers are called the same. However, every investigation of this kind pertains to theology, and is not foreign to the speculation of the philosopher. 3.8 But since also the historians, because of the identity of name of the Curetes, have classed together things that are unlike, neither should I myself shrink from discussing them at greater length, by way of digression, adding such account of their physical habits as is appropriate to history. And yet some historians even wish to assimilate their physical habits with those others, and perhaps there is something plausible in their undertaking. For instance, they say that the Curetes of Aetolia got this name because, like girls, they wore women's clothes, for, they add, there was a fashion of this kind among the Greeks, and the Ionians were called tunic trailing, and the soldiers of Leonidas were dressing their hair when they were to go forth to battle, so that the Persians, it is said, conceived a contempt for them, though in the battle they marveled at them. Speaking generally, the art of caring for the hair consists both in its nurture and in the way it is cut, and both are given special attention by girls and youths, so that there are several ways in which it is easy to derive an etymology of the word Curetes. It is reasonable to suppose, also, that the war dance was first introduced by persons who were trained in this particular way in the matter of hair and dress, these being called Curetes, and that this dance afforded a pretext to those also who were more warlike than the rest and spent their life under arms, so that they too came to be called by the same name, Curetes I mean the Curetes in Euboea, Aetolia, and Acarnania. And indeed Homer applied this name to young soldiers, choose thou the noblest young men from all the Achaeans, and bring the gifts from the swift ship, all that we promised yesterday to Achilles, and again, the young men of the Achaeans brought the gifts. So much for the etymology of the word Curetes. The war dance was a soldier's dance, and this is plainly indicated both by the Pyrrhic dance, and by Pyrrhicus, who is said to be the founder of this kind of training for young men, as also by the treatises on military affairs. 3.9 But I must now investigate how it comes about that so many names have been used of one and the same thing, and the theological element contained in their history. Now this is common both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to perform their sacred rites in connection with the relaxation of a festival, these rites being performed sometimes with religious frenzy, sometimes without it, sometimes with music, sometimes not, and sometimes in secret, sometimes openly. And it is in accordance with the dictates of nature that this should be so, for, in the first place, the relaxation draws the mind away from human occupations and turns the real mind towards that which is divine, and, secondly, the religious frenzy seems to afford a kind of divine inspiration and to be very like that of the soothsayer, and, thirdly, the secrecy with which the sacred rites are concealed induces reverence for the divine, since it imitates the nature of the divine, which is to avoid being perceived by our human senses, and, fourthly, music, which includes dancing as well as rhythm and melody, at the same time, by the delight it affords and by its artistic beauty, brings us in touch with the divine, and this for the following reason. For although it has been well said that human beings then act most like the gods when they are doing good to others, yet one might better say, when they are happy, and such happiness consists of rejoicing, celebrating festivals, pursuing philosophy, and engaging in music, for, if music is perverted when musicians turn their art to sensual delights at symposiums and in orchestric and scenic performances and the like, we should not lay the blame upon music itself, 
but should rather examine the nature of our system of education, since this is based on music. 3.10 And on this account Plato, and even before his time the Pythagoreans, called philosophy music, and they say that the universe is constituted in accordance with harmony, assuming that every form of music is the work of the gods. And in this sense, also, the muses are goddesses, and Apollo is leader of the muses, and poetry as a whole is laudatory of the gods. And by the same course of reasoning they also attribute to music the upbuilding of morals, believing that everything which tends to correct the mind is close to the gods. Now most of the Greeks assigned to Dionysus, Apollo, Hecate, the Muses, and above all to Demeter, everything of an orgiastic or bacchic or choral nature, as well as the mystic element in initiations, and they give the name Iacus not only to Dionysus but also to the leader-in-chief of the mysteries, who is the genius of Demeter. And branch-bearing, choral dancing, and initiations are common elements in the worship of these gods. As for the Muses and Apollo, the Muses preside over the choruses, whereas Apollo presides both over these and the rites of divination. But all educated men, and especially the musicians, are ministers of the Muses, and both these and those who have to do with divination are ministers of Apollo, and the initiated and torchbearers and hierophants, of Demeter, and the Silene and Satyri and Bacchae, and also the Linnae and Thyi and Mimalones and Nades and Nymphae and the beings called Tidiri, of Dionysus. 3.11 In Crete, not only these rites, but in particular those sacred to Zeus, were performed along with orgiastic worship and with the kind of ministers who were in the service of Dionysus, I mean the Satyri. These ministers they called Curides, young men who executed movements in armor, accompanied by dancing, as they set forth the mythical story of the birth of Zeus, in this they introduced Cronus as accustomed to swallow his children immediately after their birth, and Rhea as trying to keep her travail secret and, when the child was born, to get it out of the way and save its life by every means in her power, and to accomplish this it is said that she took as helpers the Curides, who, by surrounding the goddess with tambourines and similar noisy instruments and with war dance and uproar, were supposed to strike terror into Cronus and without his knowledge to steal his child away, and that, according to tradition, Zeus was actually reared by them with the same diligence, consequently the Curides, either because, being young, that is youths, they performed this service, or because they reared Zeus in his youth, for both explanations are given, were accorded this appellation, as if they were satyrs, so to speak. In the service of Zeus. Such, then, were the Greeks in the matter of orgiastic worship. 3.12 But as for the Beresints, a tribe of Phrygians, and the Phrygians in general, and those of the Trojans who live round Ida, they too hold Rhea in honour and worship her with orgies, calling her mother of the gods and Agdistis and Phrygia the great goddess, and also, from the places where she is worshipped, Idea and Dindemony and Cipolline and Pesinantis and Sibel and Sibibi. The Greeks use the same name Curides for the ministers of the goddess, not taking the name, however, from the same mythical story, but regarding them as a different set of Curides, helpers as it were, analogous to the Satyri, and the same they also call Corybants. 3.13 The poets bear witness to such views as I have suggested. For instance, when Pindar, in the Dithyram which begins with these words, in earlier times there marks the lay of the Dithyrams long drawn out, mentions the hymn sung in honour of Dionysus, both the ancient and the later ones, and then, passing on from these, says, to perform the prelude in thy honour, great mother, the whirling of cymbals is at hand, and among them, also, the clanging of castanets, and the torch that blazeth beneath the tawny pine trees, he bears witness to the common relationship between the rites exhibited in the worship of Dionysus among the Greeks and those in the worship of the mother of the gods among the Phrygians, for he makes these rites closely akin to one another. And Euripides does likewise, in his Bacchae, citing the Lydian usages at the same time with those of Phrygia, because of their similarity, but ye who left Mount Molus, fortress of Lydia, revel band of mine, women whom I brought from the land of barbarians as my assistants and travelling companions, uplift the tambourines native to Phrygian cities, inventions of mine and mother Rhea. And again, happy he who, blessed man, initiated in the mystic rites, is pure in his life, who, preserving the righteous orgies of the great mother Sibel, and brandishing the tharsis on high, and wreathed with ivy, doth worship Dionysus. Come, ye Bacchae, come, ye Bacchae, bringing down Bromius, God the child of God, out of the Phrygian mountains into the broad highways of Greece. And again, in the following verses he connects the Cretan usages also with the Phrygian, O thou hiding bower of the Curides, and sacred haunts of Crete that gave birth to Zeus, where for me the triple-crested Corybants in their caverns invented this hide-stretched circlet, and blend its bacchic revelry with the high-pitched, sweet-sounding breath of Phrygian flutes, and in Rhea's hands placed its resounding noise, to accompany the shouts of the Bacchae, 
and from mother Rhea frenzied satyrs obtained it and joined it to the choral dances of the Triaterides, in whom Dionysus takes delight. And in the Polymedes the chorus says, Thysa, daughter of Dionysus, who on Ida rejoices with his dear mother in the Iacic revels of tambourines. 3.14 And when they bring Silenus and Marsyas and Olympus into one and the same connection, and make them the historical inventors of flutes, they again, a second time, connect the Dionysiac and the Phrygian rites, and they often in a confused manner drum on Ida and Olympus as the same mountain. Now there are four peaks of Ida called Olympus, near Antandria, and there is also the Mesian Olympus, which indeed borders on Ida, but is not the same. At any rate, Sophocles, in his Polyxena, representing Menelaus as in haste to set sail from Troy, but Agamemnon is wishing to remain behind for a short time for the sake of propitiating Athena, introduces Menelaus as saying, But do thou, here remaining, somewhere in the Idaean land collect flocks of Olympus and offer them in sacrifice. 3.15 They invented names appropriate to the flute, and to the noises made by castanets, cymbals, and drums, and to their acclamations and shouts of Eva, and stampings of the feet and they also invented some of the names by which to designate the ministers, choral dancers, and attendants upon the sacred rites, I mean Kaberi and Koribons and Pans and Satyri and Tidiri, and they called the god Bacchus, and Rhea Sibel or Sai Bibi or Dindimini according to the places where she was worshipped. Sabazius also belongs to the Phrygian group and in a way is the child of the mother, since he too transmitted the rites of Dionysus. 3.16 Also resembling these rites are the Cottesian and the Benedian rites practiced among the Thracians, among whom the Orphic rites had their beginning. Now the Cotus who is worshipped among the Adonians, and also the instruments used in her rites, are mentioned by Aeschylus, for he says, O adorable Cotus among the Adonians, and ye who hold mountain-ranging instruments, and he mentions immediately afterwards the attendance of Dionysus, one, holding in his hands the Bomises, toilsome work of the Turner's chisel, fills full the fingered melody, the call that brings on frenzy, while another causes to resound the bronze-bound cotyle and again, stringed instruments raise their shrill cry, and frightful mimickers from some place unseen bellow like bulls, and the semblance of drums, as of subterranean thunder, rolls along, a terrifying sound, for these rites resemble the Phrygian rites, and it is at least not unlikely that, just as the Phrygians themselves were colonists from Thrace, so also their sacred rites were borrowed from there. Also when they identify Dionysus and the Adonian Lycurgus, they hint at the homogeneity of their sacred rites. 3.17 From its melody and rhythm and instruments, all Thracian music has been considered to be Asiatic. And this is clear, first, from the places where the Muses have been worshipped, for Pyria and Olympus and Pimplia and Labethrum were in ancient times Thracian places and mountains, though they are now held by the Macedonians, and again, Helicon was consecrated to the Muses by the Thracians who settled in Boeotia, the same who consecrated the cave of the nymphs called Labethrides. And again, those who devoted their attention to the music of early times are called Thracians, I mean Orpheus, Messias, and Thomaris, and Eumolpus, too, got his name from there. And those writers who have consecrated the whole of Asia, as far as India, to Dionysus, derive the greater part of music from there. And one writer says, striking the Asiatic Cythera, another calls flutes Baracunchen and Phrygian, and some of the instruments have been called by barbarian names, Nablus, Sambice, Barbatos, Magadha, and several others. 3.18 Just as in all other respects the Athenians continue to be hospitable to things foreign, so also in their worship of the gods, for they welcomed so many of the foreign rites that they were ridiculed therefore by comic writers, and among these were the Thracian and Phrygian rites. For instance, the Benedian rites are mentioned by Plato, and the Phrygian by Demosthenes, when he cast the reproach upon Iskenes mother and Iskenes himself that he was with her when she conducted initiations, that he joined her in leading the Dionysiac march, and that many a time he cried out Evoi Sabo, and highs Ates, Ates highs, for these words are in the ritual of Sabazius and the mother. 3.19 Further, one might also find, in addition to these facts concerning these genii and their various names, that they were called, not only ministers of gods, but also gods themselves. For instance, Hesiod says that five daughters were born to Hecaterus and the daughter of Pheronius, from whom sprang the mountain-ranging nymphs, goddesses, and the breed of satyrs, creatures worthless and unfit for work, and also the Curetes, sportive gods, dancers. And the author of Pharoni speaks of the Curetes as flute players and Phrygians, and others as earth-born and wearing brazen shields. Some call the Coribants, and not the Curetes, Phrygians, but the Curetes Cretes, and say that the Cretes were the first people to don brazen armor in Euboea, and that on this account they were also called Chalcidians. Still others say that the Coribants, who came from Bactriana, some say from among the Colchians, were given as armed ministers to Rhea by the Titans. 
but in the Cretan accounts the Curetes are called rearers of Zeus, and protectors of Zeus, having been summoned from Phrygia to Crete by Rhea. Some say that, of the nine Telkines who lived in Rhodes, those who accompanied Rhea to Crete and reared Zeus in his youth were named Curetes, and that Sirbas, a comrade of these, who was the founder of Hyrapina, afforded a pretext to the Prasians for saying among the Rhodians that the Corybants were certain genii, sons of Athena and Helios. Further, some call the Corybants sons of Cronus, but others say that the Corybants were sons of Zeus and Calliope and were identical with the Kaberi, and that these went off to Samothrace, which in earlier times was called Melite, and that their rites were mystical. 3.20 But though the Skepsian, who compiled these myths, does not accept the last statement, on the ground that no mystic story of the Kaberi is told in Samothrace, still he cites also the opinion of Stesimbrotus the Thasian that the sacred rites in Samothrace were performed in honor of the Kaberi, and the Skepsian says that they were called Kaberi after the mountain Kaberus in Barakuncha. Some, however, believe that the Curetes were the same as the Corybants and were ministers of Hecate. But the Skepsian again states, in opposition to the words of Euripides, that the rites of Rhea were not sanctioned or in vogue in Crete, but only in Phrygia and the Trode, and that those who say otherwise are dealing in myths rather than in history, though perhaps the identity of the place names contributed to their making this mistake. For instance, Ida is not only a Trojan, but also a Cretan, mountain, and Dicta is a place in Skepsia and also a mountain in Crete, and Pytna, after which the city Harapna was named, is a peak of Idaho and there is a Hippocorona in the territory of Audromedium and a Hippocoronium in Crete. And Simonium is the eastern promontory of the island and a plain in the territory of Neandria and in that of the Alexandrians. 3.21 Acusilos, the Argive, calls Cadmulus the son of Cabero and Hephaestus, and Cadmulus the father of three Caberi, and these the fathers of the nymphs called Caberides. Pharisides says that nine Serbants were sprung from Apollo and Risha, and that they took up their abode in Samothrace, and that three Caberi and three nymphs called Caberides were the children of Cabero the daughter of Proteus, and Hephaestus, and that sacred rites were instituted in honor of each triad. Now it has so happened that the Kaberi are most honored in Imbros and Limnos, but they are also honored in separate cities of the Trode. Their names, however, are kept secret. Herodotus says that there were sanctuaries of the Kaberi in Memphis, as also of Hephaestus, but that Cambyses destroyed them. The places where these deities were worshipped are uninhabited, both the Corybanteum in Amaxidia in the territory now belonging to the Alexandrians near Sminthium, and Corybissa in Skepsia in the neighborhood of the river Ureus and of the village which bears the same name and also of the winter torrent Ethelois. The Skepsian says that it is probable that the Curetes and the Corybants were the same, being those who had been accepted as young men, or youths, for the war dance in connection with the holy rites of the mother of the gods, and also as Corybants from the fact that they walked with a butting of their heads in a dancing way. These are called by the poet Batarmones, come now, all ye that are the best Batarmones of the Phaeacians. And because the Corybants are inclined to dancing and to religious frenzy, we say of those who are stirred with frenzy that they are Corybantizing. 3.22 Some writers say that the name Idaean Dactyly was given to the first settlers of the lower slopes of Mount Ida, for the lower slopes of mountains are called feet, and the summits heads, accordingly, the several extremities of Ida, all of which are sacred to the mother of the gods, were called Dactyly. Sophocles thinks that the first male Dactyly were five in number, who were the first to discover and to work iron, as well as many other things which are useful for the purposes of life, and that their sisters were five in number, and that they were called Dactyly from their number. But different writers tell the myth in different ways, joining difficulty to difficulty, and both the names and numbers they use are different, and they name one of them Selmus and others Damnomenius and Heracles and Achman. Some call them natives of Ida, others settlers, but all agree that iron was first worked by these on Ida, and all have assumed that they were wizards and attendants of the mother of the gods, and that they lived in Phrygia about Ida, and they use the term Phrygia for the Trode because, after Troy was sacked, the Phrygians, whose territory bordered on the Trode, got the mastery over it. And they suspect that both the Curetes and the Corybants were offspring of the Idaean Dactyly. At any rate, the first hundred men born in Crete were called Idaean Dactyly, they say, and as offspring of these were born nine Curetes, and each of these begot ten children who were called Idaean Dactyly. 3.23 I have been led on to discuss these people rather at length, although I am not in the least fond of myths, because the facts in their case border on the province of theology. And theology as a whole must examine early opinions and myths, since the ancients expressed enigmatically the physical notions which they entertained concerning the facts and always added the mythical element to their accounts. Now it is not easy to solve with accuracy all the enigmas, but if the multitude of myths be set before us, some agreeing and others contradicting one another, one might be able more readily to conjecture out of them what the truth is. 
For instance, men probably speak in their myths about the mountain roaming of religious zealots and of gods themselves, and about their religious frenzies, for the same reason that they are prompted to believe that the gods dwell in the skies and show forethought, among their other interests, for prognostication by signs. Now seeking for metals, and hunting, and searching for the things that are useful for the purposes of life, are manifestly closely related to mountain roaming, whereas juggling and magic are closely related to religious frenzies, worship, and divination. And such also is devotion to the arts, in particular to the Dionysiac and Orphic arts. But enough on this subject. 4.1 Crete Since I have already described the islands of the Peloponnesus in detail, not only the others, but also those in the Corinthian Gulf and those in front of it, I must next discuss Crete, for it, too, belongs to the Peloponnesus, and any islands that are in the neighborhood of Crete. Among these are the Cyclades and the Spirads, some worthy of mention, others of less significance. 4.2 But at present let me first discuss Crete. Now although Eutyxus says that it is situated in the Aegean Sea, one should not so state, but rather that it lies between Cyrenia and that part of Greece which extends from Sunio to Laconia, stretching lengthwise parallel with these countries from west to east, and that it is washed on the north by the Aegean and the Cretan seas, and on the south by the Libyan Sea, which borders on the Egyptian. As for its two extremities, the western is in the neighborhood of Phalazarna, it has a breadth of about 200 stadia and is divided into two promontories, of these the southern is called Cryomitopin, the northern Cimarus, whereas the eastern is Simonium, which falls toward the east not much farther than Sunio. 4.3 As for its size, Sosocrates, whose account of the island, according to Apollodorus, is exact, defines it as follows, in length, more than 2,300 stadia, and in breadth, so that its circuit, according to him, would amount to more than 5,000 stadia, but Artemidorus says it is 4,100. Hieronymus says that its length is 2,000 stadia and its breadth irregular, and therefore might mean that the circuit is greater than Artemidorus says. For about a third of its length, and then comes an isthmus of about 100 stadia, which, on the northern sea, has a settlement called Amphimala, and, on the southern, Phoenix, belonging to the Lampians. The island is broadest near the middle. And from here the shores again converge to an isthmus narrower than the former, about 60 stadia in width, which extends from Manoa, city of the Lycians, to Hyrapina and the Libyan Sea, the city is situated on the gulf. Then the island projects into a sharp promontory, Simonium, which slopes in the direction of Egypt and the islands of the Rhodians. 4.4 The island is mountainous and thickly wooded, but it has fruitful glens. Of the mountains, those towards the west are called Leuca, they do not fall short of Tegetus in height, extend in length about 300 stadia, and form a ridge which terminates approximately at the narrows. In the middle, in the most spacious part of the island, is Mount Ida, loftiest of the mountains of Crete and circular in shape, with a circuit of 600 stadia, and around it are the best cities. There are other mountains in Crete that are about as high as the Leuca, some terminating towards the south and others towards the east. 4.5 The voyage from Cyrenia to Cryomitopin takes two days and nights, and the distance from Cimarus to Tynarum is 700 stadia, Kathira lying between them, and the voyage from Simonium to Egypt takes four days and nights, though some say three. Some state that this is a voyage of 5,000 stadia, but others still less. Eratosthenes says that the distance from Cyrenia to Cryomitopin is 2,000, and from there to the Peloponnesus less. 4.6 But one tongue with others is mixed, the poet says, their dwell Achaeans, their Idiocretans proud of heart, their Sidonians and Dorians, too, of waving plumes, and goodly Pelasgians. Of these peoples, according to Staphylus, the Dorians occupy the part towards the east, the Sidonians the western part, the Idiocretans the southern, and to these last belongs the town Persis, where is the sanctuary of the Dictae and Zeus, whereas the other peoples, since they were more powerful, dwelt in the plains. Now it is reasonable to suppose that the Idiocretans and the Sidonians were octochthonous, and that the others were foreigners, who, according to Andron, came from Thessaly, from the country which in earlier times was called Doris, but is now called Hestiotis. It was from this country that the Dorians who lived in the neighborhood of Parnassus set out, as he says, and founded Araneus, Beum, and Cytinium, and hence by Homer are called Trichaeuses. However, writers do not accept the account of Andron at all, since he represents the Tetrapolis Doris as being a Tripolis, and the metropolis of the Dorians as a mere colony of Thessalians, and they derive the meaning of Trichaeuses either from the Trilophia, or from the fact that the crests were Trichini. 4.7 There are several cities in Crete, but the greatest and most famous are three, Knossos, Gortina, and Sidonia. The praises of Knossos are hymned above the rest both by Homer, who calls it great in the kingdom of Minos, and by the later poets. Furthermore, 
it continued for a long time to win the first honors, then it was humbled and deprived of many of its prerogatives, and its superior rank passed over to Gortna and Lyctus, but later it again recovered its old indignity as the metropolis. Knossos is situated in a plain, its original circuit being 30 stadia, between the Lyctian and Gortinan territories, being 200 stadia distant from Gortina, and 120 from Lytus, which the poet named Lyctus. Knossos is 25 stadia from the Northern Sea, Gortina is 90 from the Libyan Sea, and Lyctus itself is 80 from the Libyan. And Knossos has Heracleum as its seaport. 4.8 But Minos is said to have used as seaport Amnesis, where is the sanctuary of Ilithuia. In earlier times Knossos was called Caratus, bearing the same name as the river which flows past it. According to history, Minos was an excellent lawgiver, and also the first to gain the mastery of the sea, and he divided the island into three parts and founded a city in each part, Knossos in the, and it, too, lies to the north. As Ephorus states, Minos was an emulator of a certain Radamanthus of early times, a man most just and bearing the same name as Minos's brother, who is reputed to have been the first to civilize the island by establishing laws and by uniting cities under one city as metropolis and by setting up constitutions, alleging that he brought from Zeus the several decrees which he promulgated. So, in imitation of Radamanthus, Minos would go up every nine years, as it appears, to the cave of Zeus, tarry there, and come back with commandments drawn up in writing, which he alleged were ordinances of Zeus, and it was for this reason that the poet says, there Minos reigned as king, who held converse with great Zeus every ninth year. Such is the statement of Ephorus, but again the early writers have given a different account of Minos, which is contrary to that of Ephorus, saying that he was tyrannical, harsh, and an exactor of tribute, representing in tragedy the story of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth, and the adventures of Theseus and Daedalus. 4.9 Now, as for these two accounts, it is hard to say which is true, and there is another subject that is not agreed upon by all, some saying that Minos was a foreigner, but others that he was a native of the island. The poet, however, seems rather to advocate the second view when he says, Zeus first begot Minos, guardian or Crete. In regard to Crete, writers agree that in ancient times it had good laws, and rendered the best of the Greeks its emulators, and in particular the Lacedaemonians, as is shown, for instance, by Plato and also by Ephorus, who in his Europe has described its constitution. But later it changed very much for the worse, for after the Tyrrhenians, who more than any other people ravaged our sea, the Cretans succeeded to the business of piracy, their piracy was later destroyed by the Cilicians, but all piracy was broken up by the Romans, who reduced Crete by war and also the piratical strongholds of the Cilicians. And at the present time Knossos has even a colony of Romans. 4.10 So much for Knossos, a city to which I myself am not alien, although, on account of man's fortune and of the changes and issues therein, the bonds which at first connected me with the city have disappeared, Dorylos was a military expert and one of the friends of Mithridates Eurgetes. He, because of his experience in military affairs, was appointed to enlist mercenaries, and often visited not only Greece and Thrace, but also the mercenaries of Crete, that is, before the Romans were yet in possession of the island and while the number of mercenary soldiers in the island, from whom the piratical bands were also wont to be recruited, was large. Now when Dorylos was sojourning their war happened to break out between the Knossans and the Gortinans, and he was appointed general, finished the war successfully, and speedily won the greatest honours. But when, a little later, he learned that Eurgetes, as the result of a plot, had been treacherously slain in Sinope by his closest associates, and heard that the succession had passed to his wife and young children, he despaired of the situation there and stayed on at Knossos. There, by a Maketan woman, Sterope by name, he begot two sons, Logatas and Stratarchas, the latter of whom I myself saw when he was an extremely old man, and also one daughter. Now Eurgetes had two sons, one of whom, Mithridates, surnamed Eupater, succeeded to the rule when he was eleven years old. Dorylos, the son of Philoterus, was his foster brother, and Philoterus was a brother of Dorylos the military expert. And when the king Mithridates reached manhood, he was so infatuated with the companionship of his foster brother Dorylos that he not only conferred upon him the greatest honours, but also cared for his kinsmen and summoned those who lived at Knossos. These were the household of Logatas and his brother, their father having already died, and they themselves having reached manhood, and they quit Knossos and went home. My mother's mother was the sister of Logatas. Now when Logatas prospered, these others shared in his prosperity, but when he was ruined, for he was caught in the act of trying to cause the kingdom to revolt to the Romans, on the understanding that he was to be established at the head of the government, their fortunes were also ruined at the same time, and they were reduced to humility, and the bonds which connected them with the Knossans, who themselves had undergone countless changes, fell into neglect. But enough for my account of Knossos. 4.11 After Knossos, 
the city of the Gortonans seems to have ranked second in power, for when these two cooperated they held in subjection all the rest of the inhabitants, and when they had a quarrel there was dissension throughout the island. But Sidonia was the greatest addition to whichever side it attached itself. The city of the Gortonans also lies in a plain, and in ancient times, perhaps, it was walled, as Homer states, and well-walled Gortine, but later it lost its walls from their very foundations, and has remained unwalled ever since, for although Ptolemy Philopator began to build a wall, he proceeded with it only about eighty stadia, at any rate, it is worth mentioning that the settlement once filled out a circuit of about fifty stadia. It is ninety stadia distant from the Libyan Sea at Leban, which is its trading center, it also has another seaport, Madalum, from which it is a hundred and thirty stadia distant. The Lethaeus River flows through the whole of its territory. 4.12 From Leban came Leucocomus and his lover Euenthetus, the story of whom is told by Theophrastus in his treatise on love. Of the tasks which Leucocomus assigned to Euenthetus, one, he says, was this to bring back his dog from Persis. The country of the Prasians borders on that of the Libanians, being 70 stadia distant from the sea and 180 from Gortine. As I have said, Persis belonged to the Idiocretans, and the sanctuary of the Dictae and Zeus was there, for Dicta is near it, not close to the Idaean mountain. As Aratus says, for Dicta is a thousand stadia distant from Ida, being situated at that distance from it towards the rising sun, and a hundred from Simonium. Persis was situated between Simonium and the Cheronesus, sixty stadia above the sea, it was raised to the ground by the Hyrapetnians. And neither is Callimachus right, they say, when he says that Protomertus, in her flight from the violence of Minas, leapt from Dicta into fishermen's nets, and that because of this she herself was called Dictina by the Sidoniati, and the mountain Dicta for Sidonia is not in the neighborhood of these places at all, but lies near the western limits of the island. However, there is a mountain called Ty Tyrus in Sidonia, on which is a sanctuary, not the Dictaean, but the Dictinian. 4.13 Sidonia is situated on the sea, facing Laconia, and is equidistant, about 800 stadia, from the two cities Knossos and Gortine, and is 80 stadia distant from Aptera, and 40 from the sea in that region. The seaport of Aptera is Sasamus. The territory dot of the Polyrenians borders on that of the Sidoniati towards the west, and the sanctuary of Dictina is in their territory. They are about 30 stadia distant from the sea, and 60 from Phalazarna. They lived in villages in earlier times, and then Achaeans and Laconians made a common settlement, building a wall round a place that was naturally strong and faced towards the south. 4.14 of the three cities that were united under one metropolis by Minas, the third, which was Festos, was raised to the ground by the Gortonans, it is sixty stadia distant from Gortine, twenty from the sea, and forty from the seaport Madalum, and the country is held by those who raised it. Rhetium, also, together with Festos, belongs to the Gortonans, and Festos and Rhetium. Epimenides, who performed the purifications by means of his verses, is said to have been from Festos. And Lysan also is in the Festian territory. Of Lyctus, which I have mentioned before, the seaport is Cheronesis, as it is called, where is the sanctuary of Bertomertus. But the cities Miletus and Lycastus, which are catalogued along with Lyctus, no longer exist, and as for their territory, the Lycians took one portion of it and the Knossans the other, after they had raised the city to the ground. 4.15 Since the poet speaks of Crete at one time as possessing a hundred cities, and also at another as possessing ninety cities, Ephorus says that the ten were founded later than the others, after the Trojan War, by the Dorians who accompanied Althiomenes the Argive he adds that it was Odysseus, however, who called it Crete of the Ninety Cities. Now this statement is plausible, but others say that the ten cities were raised to the ground by the enemies of Idomeneus. However, in the first place, the poet does not say that Crete had one hundred cities at the time of the Trojan War, but rather in his own time, for he is speaking in his own person, although, if the statement was made by some person who was living at the time of the Trojan War, as is the case in the Odyssey, when Odysseus says of the Ninety Cities, then it would be well to interpret it accordingly. In the second place, if we should concede this, the next statement could not be maintained, for it is not likely that these cities were wiped out by the enemies of Idomeneus either during the expedition or after his return from Troy, for when the poet said, and all his companions Idomeneus brought to Crete, all who escaped from the war, and the sea robbed him of none, he would also have mentioned this disaster, for of course Odysseus could not have known of the obliteration of the cities, since he came in contact with no Greeks either during his wanderings or later and he who accompanied Idomeneus on the expedition to Troy and returned safely home at the same time could not have known what occurred in the homeland of Idomeneus either during the expedition or the return from Troy, nor yet even after the return, for if Idomeneus escaped with all his companions, he returned home strong, and therefore his enemies were not likely to be strong enough to take ten cities away from him. 
Such, then, is my description of the country of the Cretans. 4.16 As for their constitution, which is described by Ephorus, it might suffice to tell in a cursory way its most important provisions. The lawgiver, he says, seems to take it for granted that liberty is a state's greatest good, for this alone makes property belong specifically to those who have acquired it, whereas in a condition of slavery everything belongs to the rulers and not to the ruled, but those who have liberty must guard it. Now harmony ensues when dissension, which is the result of greed and luxury, is removed, for when all citizens live a self-restrained and simple life there arises neither envy nor arrogance nor hatred towards those who are like them. And this is why the lawgiver commanded the boys to attend the troops, as they are called, and the full-grown men to eat together at the public messes which they call the Andrea, so that the poorer, being fed at public expense, might be on an equality with the well-to-do, and in order that courage, and not cowardice, might prevail, he commanded that from boyhood they should grow up accustomed to arms and toils, so as to scorn heat, cold, marches over rugged and steep roads, and blows received in gymnasiums or regular battles, and that they should practice, not only archery, but also the war dance, which was invented and made known by the Curetes at first, and later, also, by the man who arranged the dance that was named after him, I mean the Pyrrhic dance, so that not even their sports were without a share in activities that were useful for warfare, and likewise that they should use in their songs the Cretic rhythms, which were very high-pitched, and were invented by Thales, to whom they ascribe, not only their paeans and other local songs, but also many of their institutions, and that they should use military dress and shoes, and that arms should be to them the most valuable of gifts. 4.17 It is said by some writers, Ephorus continues, that most of the Cretan institutions are Laconian, but the truth is that they were invented by the Cretans and only perfected by the Spartans, and the Cretans, when their cities, and particularly that of the Knossans, were devastated, neglected military affairs, but some of the institutions continued in use among the Lycians, Gortonans, and certain other small cities to a greater extent than among the Knossans. In fact, the institutions of the Lycians are cited as evidence by those who represent the Laconian as older. For, they argue, being colonists, they preserve the customs of the mother city, since even on general grounds it is absurd to represent those who are better organized and governed as emulators of their inferiors. But this is not correct, Ephorus says, for, in the first place, one should not draw evidence as to antiquity from the present state of things, for both peoples have undergone a complete reversal. For instance, the Cretans in earlier times were masters of the sea, and hence the proverb, the Cretan does not know the sea, is applied to those who pretend not to know what they do know although now the Cretans have lost their fleet, and, in the second place, it does not follow that, because some of the cities in Crete were Spartan colonies, they were under compulsion to keep to the Spartan institutions, at any rate, many colonial cities do not observe their ancestral customs, and many, also, of those in Crete that are not colonial have the same customs as the colonists. 4.18 Lycurgus the Spartan lawgiver, Ephorus continues, was five generations later than the Althiomenes who conducted the colony to Crete, for historians say that Althiomenes was son of the Sissus who founded Argos about the same time when Procles was establishing Sparta as metropolis, and Lycurgus, as is agreed by all, was sixth in descent from Procles, and copies are not earlier than their models, nor more recent things earlier than older things, not only the dancing which is customary among the Lacedaemonians, but also the rhythms and paeans that are sung according to law, and many other Spartan institutions, are called Cretan among the Lacedaemonians, as though they originated in Crete, and some of the public offices are not only administered in the same way as in Crete, but also have the same names, as, for instance, the office of the Gerontes, and that of the Hippies, except that the Hippies in Crete actually possessed horses, and from this fact it is inferred that the office of the Hippies in Crete is older, for they preserve the true meaning of the appellation, whereas the Lacedaemonian Hippies do not keep horses, but though the Ephors have the same functions as the Cretan Cosme, they have been named differently, and the public messes are, even today, still called Andrea among the Cretans, but among the Spartans they cease to be called by the same name as in earlier times. At any rate, the following is found in Alcman, in feasts and festive gatherings, amongst the guests who partake of the Andrea, tis meet to begin the paean. 4.19 It is said by the Cretans, Ephorus continues, that Lycurgus came to them for the following reason. Polydectes was the elder brother of Lycurgus, when he died he left his wife pregnant, now for a time Lycurgus reigned in his brother's place, but when a child was born he became the child's guardian, since the office of king descended to the child, but some man, railing at Lycurgus, said that he knew for sure that Lycurgus would be king, and Lycurgus, suspecting that in consequence of such talk he himself might be falsely accused of plotting against the child, and fearing that, if by any chance the child should die, he himself might be blamed for it by his enemies, sailed away to Crete, this, then, is said to be the cause of his sojourn in Crete, and when he arrived he associated with Thales, a melic poet and an expert in lawgiving, 
and after learning from him the manner in which both Radamanthus in earlier times and Minos in later times published their laws to men as from Zeus, and after sojourning in Egypt also and learning among other things their institutions, and, according to some writers, after meeting Homer, who was living in Chios, he sailed back to his homeland, and found his brother's son, Carolaeus the son of Polydectes, reigning as king, and then he set out to frame the laws, making visits to the god at Delphi, and bringing thence the god's decrees, just as Minos and his house had brought their ordinances from the cave of Zeus, most of his being similar to theirs. 4.20 The following are the most important provisions in the Cretan institutions as stated by Ephorus. In Crete all those who are selected out of the troop of boys at the same time are forced to marry at the same time, although they do not take the girls whom they have married to their own homes immediately, but as soon as the girls are qualified to manage the affairs of the house. A girl's dower, if she has brothers, is half of the brother's portion. The children must learn, not only their letters, but also the songs prescribed in the laws and certain forms of music. Now those who are still younger are taken to the public messes, the Andrea, and they sit together on the ground as they eat their food, clad in shabby garments, the same both winter and summer, and they also wait on the men as well as on themselves. And those who eat together at the same mess join battle both with one another and with those from different messes. A boy director presides over each mess. But the older boys are taken to the troops, and the most conspicuous and influential of the boys assemble the troops, each collecting as many boys as he possibly can. The leader of each troop is generally the father of the assembler, and he has authority to lead them forth to hunt and to run races, and to punish anyone who is disobedient, and they are fed at public expense, and on certain appointed days troop contends with troop, marching rhythmically into battle, to the tune of flute and lyre, as is their custom in actual war, and they actually bear marks of the blows received, some inflicted by the hand, others by iron weapons. 4.21 They have a peculiar custom in regard to love affairs, for they win the objects of their love, not by persuasion, but by abduction. The lover tells the friends of the boy three or four days beforehand that he is going to make the abduction, but for the friends to conceal the boy, or not to let him go forth by the appointed road, is indeed a most disgraceful thing, a confession, as it were, that the boy is unworthy to obtain such a lover, and when they meet, if the abductor is the boy's equal or superior in rank or other respects, the friends pursue him and lay hold of him, though only in a very gentle way, thus satisfying the custom, and after that they cheerfully turn the boy over to him to lead away, if, however, the abductor is unworthy, they take the boy away from him. And the pursuit does not end until the boy is taken to the Andreium of his abductor. They regard as a worthy object of love, not the boy who is exceptionally handsome, but the boy who is exceptionally manly and decorous. After giving the boy presents, the abductor takes him away to any place in the country he wishes, and those who were present at the abduction follow after them, and after feasting and hunting with them for two months, for it is not permitted to detain the boy for a longer time, they return to the city. The boy is released after receiving as presents a military habit, an ox, and a drinking cup, these are the gifts required by law, and other things so numerous and costly that the friends, on account of the number of the expenses, make contributions thereto. Now the boy sacrifices the ox to Zeus and feasts those who returned with him, and then he makes known the facts about his intimacy with his lover, whether, perchance, it has pleased him or not, the law allowing him this privilege in order that, if any force was applied to him at the time of the abduction, he might be able at this feast to avenge himself and be rid of the lover. It is disgraceful for those who are handsome in appearance or descendants of illustrious ancestors to fail to obtain lovers, the presumption being that their character is responsible for such a fate. But the Peristathans, for thus they call those who have been abducted, receive honours, for in both the dances and the races they have the positions of highest honour, and are allowed to dress in better clothes than the rest, that is, in the habit given them by their lovers, and not then only, but even after they have grown to manhood, they wear a distinctive dress, which is intended to make known the fact that each wearer has become Klinos, for they call the loved one Klinos and the lover Phileter. So much for their customs in regard to love affairs. 4.22 The Cretans choose ten archons. Concerning the matters of greatest importance they use as counsellors the Gerontes, as they are called. Those who have been thought worthy to hold the office of the Cosme and are otherwise adjudged men of approved worth are appointed members of this council. I have assumed that the constitution of the Cretans is worthy of description both on account of its peculiar character and on account of its fame. Not many, however, of these institutions endure, but the administration of affairs is carried on mostly by means of the decrees of the Romans, as is also the case in the other provinces. 5.1 Islands The islands near Crete are Thera, the metropolis of the Cyrenians, a colony of the Lacedaemonians, and, near Thera, Anaphi, where is the sanctuary of the Eagle Tan Apollo. Callimachus speaks in one place as follows, Eagle Tan Anaphi, neighbor to Laconian Thera, and in another, 
mentioning only Thera, mother of my fatherland, famed for its horses. Thera is a long island, being 200 stadia in perimeter, it lies opposite Dia, an island near the Knoss and Heracleum, but it is 700 stadia distant from Crete. Near it are both Anafi and their Asia. 100 stadia distant from the latter is the little island Ios, where, according to some writers, the poet Homer was buried. From Ios towards the west one comes to Sicinos and Lagusa and Folagendros, which Lasteratus calls Iron Island, because of its ruggedness. Near these is Similos, whence comes the Simolian earth. From Similos Siphnos is visible, in reference to which island, because of its worthlessness, people say Siphne and Knucklebone. And still nearer both to Similos and to Crete is Melos, which is more notable than these and is 700 stadia from the Hermionic promontory, the Silan, and almost the same distance from the Dictinan. The Athenians once sent an expedition to Melos and slaughtered most of the inhabitants from youth upwards. Now these islands are indeed in the Cretan Sea, but Delos itself and the Cyclades in its neighborhood and the Spirads which lie close to these, to which belong the aforesaid islands in the neighborhood of Crete, are rather in the Aegean Sea. 5.2 Now the city which belongs to Delos, as also the sanctuary of Apollo, and the Letum, are situated in a plain, and above the city lies Synthus, a bare and rugged mountain, and a river named Anapus flows through the island not a large river, for the island itself is small. From olden times, beginning with the times of the heroes, Delos has been revered because of its gods, for the myth is told that their Leto was delivered of her travail by the birth of Apollo and Artemis, for aforetime, says Pindar, it was tossed by the billows, by the blasts of all manner of winds, but when the daughter of Coius and the frenzied pangs of childbirth set foot upon it, then did four pillars, resting on adamant, rise perpendicular from the roots of the earth, and on their capitals sustain the rock. And there she gave birth to, and beheld, her blessed offspring. The neighboring islands, called the Cyclades, made it famous, since in its honor they would send at public expense sacred envoys, sacrifices, and choruses composed of virgins, and would celebrate great general festivals there. 5.3 Now at first the Cyclades are said to have been only twelve in number, but later several others were added. At any rate, Artemidorus enumerates fifteen, after saying of Helena that it stretches parallel to the coast from Thoricus to Sunio and is a long island, about sixty stadia in length, for it is from Helena, he says, that the Cyclades, as they are called, begin, and he names CEOs, the island nearest to Helena, and, after this island, Sithnos and Seraphos and Melos and Siphnos and Similos and Prepisanthos and Oliaros, and, in addition to these, Peros, Naxos, Syros, Mykonos, Tainos, Andros, and Gyaros. Now I consider all of these among the twelve except Prepisanthos, Oliaros, and Gyaros. When our ship anchored at one of these, Gyaros, I saw a small village that was settled by fishermen, and when we sailed away we took on board one of the fishermen, who had been chosen to go from there to Caesar as ambassador, Caesar was at Corinth, on his way to celebrate the triumph after the victory at Actium. While on the voyage he told inquirers that he had been sent as ambassador to request a reduction in their tribute, for, he said, they were paying 150 drachmas when they could only with difficulty pay 100. Aratus also points out the poverty of the island in his catalepton, O Leto, shortly thou wilt pass by me, who am like either iron fulagendros or worthless gyaros. 5.4 Now although Delos had become so famous, yet the raising of Corinth to the ground by the Romans increased its fame still more, for the importers changed their business to Delos because they were attracted both by the tax immunity the sanctuary enjoyed and by the convenient situation of the harbour for it is happily situated for those who are sailing from Italy and Greece to Asia. The general festival is a kind of commercial affair, and it was frequented by Romans more than by any other people, even when Corinth was still in existence. And when the Athenians took the island they at the same time took good care of the importers as well as of the religious rites. But when the generals of Mithridates, and the tyrant who caused it to revolt, visited Delos, they completely ruined it, and when the Romans again got the island, after the king withdrew to his homeland, it was desolate and it has remained in an impoverished condition until the present time. It is now held by the Athenians. 5.5 Rhenia is a desert isle within four stadia from Delos, and there the Delians bury their dead, for it is unlawful to bury, or even burn, a corpse in Delos itself, and it is unlawful even to keep a dog there. In earlier times it was called Ortigia. 5.6 CEOs was at first a tetrapolis, but only two cities are left, Ilus and Carthia, into which the remaining two were incorporated, Poaessa into Carthia and Caresha into Ilus. Both Simonides the Melic poet and his nephew Bacchylides were natives of Ilus, and also after their time Aristotus the physician, and Ariston the peripatetic philosopher and emulator of beyond the Boristhanite. It is reputed that there was once a law among these people, 
it is mentioned by Menander, Phineas, the law of the Seans is good, that he who is unable to live well should not live wretchedly, which appears to have ordered those who were over sixty years of age to drink hemlock, in order that the food might be sufficient for the rest. And it is said that once, when they were being besieged by the Athenians, they voted, setting a definite age, that the oldest among them should be put to death, but the Athenians raised the siege. The city lies on a mountain, about twenty-five stadia distant from the sea, and its seaport is the place on which Koresha was situated, which has not as great a population as even a village. Near Koresha, and also near Poaessa, is a sanctuary of Sminthi and Apollo, and between the sanctuary and the ruins of Poaessa is the sanctuary of Nadusian Athena, founded by Nestor when he was on his return from Troy. There is also a river Elixis in the neighborhood of Koresha. 5.7 After CEOs 1 comes to Naxos and Andros, notable islands, and to Paros. Archilochus the poet was a native of Paros. Thassos was founded by the Parians, as also Parium, a city on the Propontis. Now the altar in this city is said to be a spectacle worth seeing, its sides being a stadium in length, and so is the Parian stone, as it is called, in Paros, the best for sculpture in marble. 5.8 And there is Syros, the first syllable is pronounced long, where Pharisides the son of babies was born. The Athenian Pharisides is later than he. The poet seems to mention this island, though he calls it Syria, there is an island called Syria, above Ortigia. 5.9 And there is Mykonos, beneath which, according to the myth, lie the last of the giants that were destroyed by Heracles. Whence the proverb, all beneath Mykonos alone, applied to those who bring under one title even those things which are by nature separate. And further, some call bald men Myconians, from the fact that baldness is prevalent in the island. 5.10 And there is Seraphos, the scene of the mythical story of Dictus, who with his net drew to land the chest in which were enclosed Perseus and his mother Danae, who had been sunk in the sea by Acrisius the father of Danae, for Perseus was reared there, it is said, and when he brought the Gorgon's head there, he showed it to the Seraphians and turned them all into stone. This he did to avenge his mother, because Polydectes the king, with their cooperation, intended to marry his mother against her will. The island is so rocky that the comedians say that it was made thus by the Gorgon. 5.11 Tainos has no large city, but it has the sanctuary of Poseidon, a large one and a sacred grove outside the city, a spectacle worth seeing. In it have been built great banquet halls an indication of the multitude of neighbors who congregate there and take part with the inhabitants of Tainos in celebrating the Poseidonian festival. 5.12 And there is Amorgos, one of the Sparads, the home of Simonides the iambic poet, and also Lebenthos, and Leros, and so says Facilities, the Lyrians are bad, not one, but every one, all except Procles, and Procles is Illyrian. For the natives of the island were reproached with being unprincipled. 5.13 Nearby are both Patmos and the Karassi, these are situated to the west of Ikaria, and Ikaria to the west of Samos. Now Ikaria is deserted, though it has pastures, which are used by the Samians. But although it is such an isle as it is, still it is famous, and after it is named the sea that lies in front of it, in which are itself and Samos and Kaz and the islands just mention the Karassi and Patmos and Leros. Famous, also, is the mountain in it, Circidius, more famous than the Ampelus, which is situated above the city of Samians. The Icarian Sea connects with the Carpathian Sea on the south, and the Carpathian with the Egyptian, and on the west with the Cretan and the Libyan. 5.14 In the Carpathian Sea, also, are many of the Sparads, and in particular between Kez and Rhodes and Crete. Among these are Ostipalaea, Telos, Chalcia, and those which Homer names in the catalogue, and those who held the islands Nisiros and Crapathos and Kassos and Kuz, the city of Eurypolis, and the Calydnian islands, for, excepting Kuz and Rhodes, which I shall discuss later, I place them all among the Sparads, and in fact, even though they are near Asia and not Europe, I make mention of them here because my argument has somehow impelled me to include the Sparads with Crete and the Cyclades. But in my geographical description of Asia I shall add a description of such islands that lie close to it as are worthy of note, Cyprus, Rhodes, Kuz, and those that lie on the seaboard next thereafter, Samos, Chios, Lesbos, and Tenedos. But now I shall traverse the remainder of the Sparads that are worth mentioning. 5.15 Now Ostipalaea lies far out in the high sea and has a city. Telos extends alongside Cnidia, is long, high, narrow, has a perimeter of about 140 stadia and has an anchoring place. Chalcia is 80 stadia distant from Telos, 400 from Carpathos, about twice as far from Ostipalaea, and is also a settlement of the same name and an Apollo sanctuary and a harbour. 5.16 Nisiros lies to the north of Telos, and is about 60 stadia distant both from it and from Kuz. 
It is round and high and rocky, the rock being that of which millstones are made, at any rate, the neighboring peoples are well supplied with millstones from there. It is also a city of the same name and a harbor and hot springs and a sanctuary of Poseidon. Its perimeter is 80 stadia. Close to it are also isles called Isles of the Nicerians. They say that Nisiros is a fragment of Kos, and they add the myth that Poseidon, when he was pursuing one of the giants, Polybotes, broke off a fragment of Kos with his trident and hurled it upon him, and the missile became an island, Nisiros, with the giant lying beneath it. But some say that he lies beneath Kos. 5.17 Carpathos, which the poet calls Crapathos, is high, and has a circuit of 200 stadia. At first it was a tetrapolis, and it had a renown which is worth noting, and it was from this fact that the sea got the name Carpathian. One of the cities was called Nisiros, the same name as that of the island of the Nicerians. It lies opposite Lusakt in Libya, which is about 1,000 stadia distant from Alexandria and about 4,000 from Carpathos. 5.18 Kossos is 70 stadia from Carpathos, and 250 from Cape Simonium in Crete. It has a circuit of 80 stadia. In it there is also a city of the same name, and round it are several islands called Islands of the Cajuns. 5.19 They say that the poet calls the Spirads Calidnian Islands, one of which, they say, is Kalimna. But it is reasonable to suppose that, as the islands which are near, and subject to, Nisiros and Kossos are called Islands of the Nicerians and Islands of the Cajuns, so also those which lie round Kalimna were called Islands of the Kalimnians Kalimna at that time, perhaps, being called Kalidna. But some say that there are only two Kalidnian islands, Leros and Kalimna, the two mentioned by the poet. The Skepsian says that the name of the island was used in the plural, Kalimni, like Athene and Thebe, but, he adds, the words of the poet should be interpreted as a case of Hyperbaton, for he does not say, Kalidnian islands, but those who held the islands Nisiros and Crapathos and Kossos and Kuz, the city of Eurypolis, and Kalidni. Now all the honey produced in the islands is, for the most part, good, and rivals that of Attica, but the honey produced in the islands in question is exceptionally good, and in particular the Kalimnian. Book 11. 1.1 Overview of Asia. Asia is adjacent to Europe, bordering thereon along the Tanais River. I must therefore describe this country next, first dividing it, for the sake of clearness, by means of certain natural boundaries. That is, I must do for Asia precisely what Eratosthenes did for the inhabited world as a whole. 1.2 The Taurus forms a partition approximately through the middle of this continent, extending from the west towards the east, leaving one portion of it on the north and the other on the south. Of these portions, the Greeks call the one the cis Turan Asia and the other trans Turan. I have said this before, but let me repeat it by way of reminder. 1.3 Now the mountain has in many places as great a breadth as 3,000 stadia, and a length as great as that of Asia itself, that is, about 45,000 stadia, reckoning from the coast opposite roads to the eastern extremities of India and Scythia. 1.4 It has been divided into many parts with many names, determined by boundaries that circumscribe areas both large and small. But since certain tribes are comprised within the vast width of the mountain, some rather insignificant, but others extremely well known, as, for instance, the Parthians, the Medes, the Armenians, a part of the Cappadocians, the Cilicians, and the Pisidians, those which lie for the most part in its northerly parts must be assigned there, and those in its southern parts to the southern, while those which are situated in the middle of the mountain should, because of the likeness of their climate, be assigned to the north, for the climate in the middle is cold, whereas that in the south is hot. Further, almost all the rivers that rise in the Taurus flow in contrary directions, that is, some into the northern region and others into the southern, they do so at first, at least, although later some of them bend towards the east or west, and they therefore are naturally helpful in our use of these mountains as boundaries in the twofold division of Asia just as the sea inside the pillars, which for the most part is approximately in a straight line with these mountains, has proved convenient in the forming of two continents, Europe and Libya, it being the noteworthy boundary between the two. 1.5 As we pass from Europe to Asia in our geography, the northern division is the first of the two divisions to which we come, and therefore we must begin with this. Of this division the first portion is that in the region of the Tanais River, which I have taken as the boundary between Europe and Asia. This portion forms, in a way, a peninsula, for it is surrounded on the west by the Tanais River and Lake Meotis as far as the Bosporus and that part of the coast of the Euxine Sea which terminates at Colchis, and then on the north by the ocean as far as the mouth of the Caspian Sea, and then on the east by this same sea as far as the boundary between Albania and Armenia, where empty the rivers Cyrus and Arashis, the Arashis flowing through Armenia and the Cyrus through Iberia and Albania, and lastly, 
on the south by the tract of country which extends from the outlet of the Cyrus River to Caucasus, which is about 3,000 stadia from sea to sea, across the territory of the Albanians and the Iberians, and therefore is described as an isthmus. But those writers who have reduced the width of the isthmus as much as Cletarchus has, who says that it is subject to inundation from either sea, should not be considered even worthy of mention. Poseidonius states that the isthmus is 1500 stadia across, as wide as the isthmus from Pelusium to the Red Sea. And in my opinion, he says, the isthmus from Lake Meotis to the ocean does not differ much therefrom. 1.6 But I do not know how anyone can trust him concerning things that are uncertain if he has nothing plausible to say about them, when he reasons so illogically about things that are obvious, and this too, although he was a friend of Pompey, who made an expedition against the Iberians and the Albanians, from sea to sea on either side, both the Caspian and the Colchian seas. At any rate, it is said that Pompey, upon arriving at Rhodes on his expedition against the pirates, immediately thereafter he was to set out against both Mithridates and the tribes which extended as far as the Caspian Sea, happened to attend one of the lectures of Poseidonius, and that when he went out he asked Poseidonius whether he had any orders to give, and that Poseidonius replied, Ever bravest be, and preeminent are others. 12 Add to this that among other works he wrote also the history of Pompey. So for this reason he should have been more regardful of the truth. 1.7 The second portion would be that beyond the Hyrcanian Sea, which we call the Caspian Sea, as far as the Scythians near India. The third portion would consist of the part which is adjacent to the isthmus above mentioned and of those parts of the region inside Taurus and nearest Europe which come next after this isthmus and the Caspian Gates, I mean Media and Armenia and Cappadocia and the intervening regions. The fourth portion is the land inside the Elise River, and all the region in the Taurus itself and outside thereof which falls within the limits of the peninsula which is formed by the isthmus that separates the Pontic and the Cilician Seas. As for the other countries, I mean the trans tehran I place among them not only India, but also Ariana as far as the tribes that extend to the Persian Sea and the Arabian Gulf and the Nile and the Egyptian and Issac Seas. 2.1 Tenace of the portions thus divided, the first is inhabited, in the region toward the north and the ocean, by Scythian nomads and wagon dwellers, and south of these, by Sarmatians, these two being Scythians, and by Aorsi and Syracai, who extend towards the south as far as the Caucasian mountains, some being nomads and others tent dwellers and farmers. About Lake Meotis live the Miati. And on the sea lies the Asiatic side of the Bosporus, or the Syndic territory. After this latter, one comes to the Achaei and the Zygi and the Heniaki, and also the Circitae and the Macropogonies. And above these are situated the narrow passes of the Therophagi, and after the Heniaki the Colchian country, which lies at the foot of the Caucasian, or Moschian, mountains. But since I have taken the Tanais River as the boundary between Europe and Asia, I shall begin my detailed description therewith. 2.2 Now the Tanais flows from the northerly region not, however, as most people think, in a course diametrically opposite to that of the Nile, but more to the east than the Nile and like the Nile its sources are unknown. Yet a considerable part of the Nile is well known, since it traverses a country which is everywhere easily accessible and since it is navigable for a great distance inland. But as for the Tanais, although we know its outlets, they are two in number and are in the most northerly region of Lake Meotis, being sixty stadia distant from one another, yet but little of the part that is beyond its outlets is known to us, because of the coldness and the poverty of the country. This poverty can indeed be endured by the indigenous peoples, who, in nomadic fashion, live on flesh and milk, but people from other tribes cannot stand it. And besides, the nomads, being disinclined to intercourse with any other people and being superior both in numbers and in might, have blocked off whatever parts of the country are passable, or whatever parts of the river happen to be navigable. This is what has caused some to assume that the Tanais has its sources in the Caucasian mountains, flows in great volume towards the north, and then, making a bend, empties into Lake Meotis. Theophanes of Mytilene has the same opinion as these, and others to assume that it flows from the upper region of the Ister, although they produce no evidence of its flowing from so great a distance or from other climata, as though it were impossible for the river to flow both from a nearby source and from the north. 2.3 On the river and the lake is an inhabited city bearing the same name, Tanais, it was founded by the Greeks who held the Bosporus. Recently, however, it was sacked by King Polemon because it would not obey him. It was a common emporium, partly of the Asiatic and the European nomads, and partly of those who navigated the lake from the Bosporus, the former bringing slaves, hides, and such other things as nomads possess, and the latter giving in exchange clothing, wine, and the other things that belong to civilized life. At a distance of 100 stadia off the emporium lies an island called Alopecia, a settlement of promiscuous people. There are also other small islands nearby in the lake. The Tanais is 2,200 stadia distant from the mouth of Lake Meotis by a direct voyage towards the north, 
but it is not much farther by a voyage along the coast. 2.4 In the voyage along the coast, one comes first, at a distance of 800 stadia from Tanais, to the greater Rombites River, as it is called, where are made the greatest catches of the fish that are suitable for salting. Then, at a distance of 800 more, to the lesser Rombites and a cape, which latter also has fisheries, although they are smaller. The people who live about the greater Rombites have small islands as bases for their fishing, but the people who carry on the business at the lesser Rombites are the Miati themselves, for the Miati live along the whole of this coast, and though farmers, they are no less warlike than the nomads. They are divided into several tribes, those who live near the Tanais being rather ferocious, but those whose territory borders on the Bosporus being more tractable. It is 600 stadia from the lesser Rombites to Tiram and the Antisetes River, then 120 to the Sumerian village, which is a place of departure for those who navigate the lake, and on this coast are said to be some lookout places belonging to the Clasomenians. 2.5 Samiricum was in earlier times a city situated on a peninsula, and it closed the isthmus by means of a trench and a mound. The Sumerians once possessed great power in the Bosporus, and this is why it was named Sumerian Bosporus. These are the people who overran the country of those who lived in the interior on the right side of the Pontus as far as Ionia. However, these were driven out of the region by the Scythians, and then the Scythians were driven out by the Greeks who founded Panicope and in the other cities on the Bosporus. 2.6 Then, 20 stadia distant, one comes to the village Achilleum, where is the sanctuary of Achilles. Here is the narrowest passage across the mouth of Lake Meotis, about 20 stadia or more, and on the opposite shore is a village, Myrmiceum, and nearby are Heracleum and Parthenium. 2.7 Thence 90 stadia to the monument of Satyrus, which consists of a mound thrown up on a certain cape in memory of one of the illustrious potentates of the Bosporus. 2.8 Nearby is a village, Petraeus, from which the distance to a village Coracondum is 130 stadia, and this village constitutes the limit of the Sumerian Bosporus, as it is called. The narrows at the mouth of the Meotis are so called from the narrow passage at Achilleum and Myrmiceum, they extend as far as Coracondum and the small village named Acra, which lies opposite to it in the land of the Panticapians, this village being separated from it by a straight 70 stadia wide, for the ice, also, extends as far as this, the Meotis being so frozen at the time of frost that it can be crossed on foot. And these narrows have good harbours everywhere. 2.9 Above Coracondum lies a lake of considerable size, which derives its name, Coracondomitis, from that of the village. It empties into the sea at a distance of 10 stadia from the village. A branch of the Antiseats empties into the lake and forms a kind of island which is surrounded by this lake and the Meotis and the river. Some apply the name Hyponis to this river, just as they do to the river near the Baristhenes. 2.10 Sailing into Lake Coracondomitis 1 comes to Phinegeria, a noteworthy city, and to Kepoi, and to Hermonassa, and to Apaturum, the sanctuary of Aphrodite. Of these, Phinegeria and Kepoi are situated on the island above mentioned, on the left as one sails in, but the other cities are on the right, across the Hyponis, in the Syndic territory. There is also a place called Gorgipia in the Syndic territory, the royal residence of the Sindhi, near the sea, and also a place called Aborus. All the people who are subject to the potentates of the Bosporus are called Bosporians, and Panicopeian is the metropolis of the European Bosporians, while Phinegeraeum, for the name of the city is also spelled thus, is the metropolis of the Asiatic Bosporians. Phinegeria is reputed to be the emporium for the commodities that are brought down from the Meotis and the barbarian country that lies above it, and Panicopeian for those which are carried up thither from the sea. There is also in Phinegeria a notable sanctuary of Aphrodite Apaturus. Critics derive the etymology of the epithet of the goddess by adducing a certain myth, according to which the giants attacked the goddess there, but she called upon Heracles for help and hid him in a cave, and then, admitting the giants one by one, gave them over to Heracles to be murdered through treachery. 2.11 Among the Miati are the Sindhi themselves, Dandarai, Tariati, Agri, and Arechi, and also the Tarpetes, Abidiasini, Sitasini, Dasai, and several others. Among these belong also the Aspergiani, who live between Phinegeria and Gorgipia, within a stretch of 500 stadia. These were attacked by King Polemon under a pretense of friendship, but they discovered his pretense, outgeneraled him, and taking him alive killed him. As for the Asiatic Miati in general, some of them were subjects of those who possessed the Emporium on the Tanais, and the others of the Bosporians, but in those days different peoples at different times were wont to revolt. And often the rulers of the Bosporians held possession of the region as far as the Tanais, and particularly the latest rulers, Pharnaces, Asander, and Polemon. Pharnaces is said at one time actually to have conducted the Hyponis River over the country of the Dandarai through an old canal which he cleared out, and to have inundated the country. 
2.12 after the Sindic territory in Gorgipia, on the sea, one comes to the coast of the Achaei and the Zygi and the Heniaki, which for the most part is harborless and mountainous, being a part of the Caucasus. These peoples live by robberies at sea. Their boats are slender, narrow, and light, holding only about 25 people, though in rare cases they can hold 30 in all, the Greeks call them Chimeri. They say that the Phthiotic Achaei and Jason's crew settled in this Achaea, but the Laconians in Heniochia, the leaders of the latter being Rechus and Amphistratus, the Heniaki of the Dioscuri, and that in all probability the Heniaki were named after these. At any rate, by equipping fleets of Chimeri and sailing sometimes against merchant vessels and sometimes against a country or even a city, they hold the mastery of the sea. And they are sometimes assisted even by those who hold the Bosporus, the latter supplying them with mooring places, with market place, and with means of disposing of their booty. And since, when they return to their own land, they have no anchorage, they put the Chimeri on their shoulders and carry them to the forests where they live and where they till a poor soil. And they bring the Chimeri down to the shore again when the time for navigation comes. And they do the same thing in the countries of others, for they are well acquainted with wooded places, and in these they first hide their Chimeri and then themselves wander on foot night and day for the sake of kidnapping people. But they readily offer to release their captives for ransom, informing their relatives after they have put out to sea. Now in those places which are ruled by local chieftains the rulers go to the aid of those who are wronged, often attacking and bringing back the Chimeri, men and all. But the territory that is subject to the Romans affords but little aid, because of the negligence of the governors who are sent there. 2.13 Such is the life of these people. They are governed by chieftains called Skeptuchi, but the Skeptuchi themselves are subject to tyrants or kings. For instance, the Heniaki had four kings at the time when Mithridates Eupater, in flight from the country of his ancestors to the Bosporus, passed through their country, and while he found this country passable, yet he despaired of going through that of the Zygi, both because of the ruggedness of it and because of the ferocity of the inhabitants, and only with difficulty could he go along the coast, most of the way marching on the edge of the sea, until he arrived at the country of the Achaei, and, welcomed by these, he completed his journey from Phocis, a journey not far short of 4,000 stadia. 2.14 Now the voyage from Coracondum is straight towards the east, and at a distance of 180 stadia is the Syndic harbour and city, and then, at a distance of 400 stadia, one comes to Bata, as it is called, a village and harbour, at which place Sinope on the south is thought to lie almost directly opposite this coast, just as Karambis has been referred to as opposite Kriamitopin. After Bata Artemidorus mentions the coast of the Circite, with its mooring places and villages, extending thence about 850 stadia, and then the coast of the Achaei, 500 stadia, and then that of the Heniaki, 1000, and then Greater Piteus, extending 360 stadia to Dioscurius. The more trustworthy historians of the Mithridatic Wars name the Achaei first, then the Zygi, then the Heniaki, and then the Circite and Mosci and Colchi, and the Therophagi who live above these three peoples, and the Sones, and other small tribes that live in the neighborhood of the Caucasus. Now at first the coast, as I have said, stretches towards the east and faces the south, but from Bata it gradually takes a turn, and then faces the west and ends at Piteus and Dioscurius, for these places border on the above-mentioned coast of Colchis. After Dioscurius comes the remaining coast of Colchis and the adjacent coast of Trapezus, which makes a considerable bend, and then, extending approximately in a straight line, forms the right-hand side of the Pontus, which faces the north. The whole of the coast of the Achaei and of the other peoples as far as Dioscurius and of the places that lie in a straight line towards the south and the interior lie at the foot of the Caucasus. 2.15 This mountain lies above both seas, both the Pontic and the Caspian, and forms a wall across the isthmus that separates the two seas. It marks the boundary, on the south, of Albania and Iberia, and, on the north, of the plains of the Sarmati. It is well wooded with all kinds of timber, and especially the kind suitable for shipbuilding. According to Eratosthenes, the Caucasus is called Caspius by the natives, the name being derived perhaps from the Caspii. Branches of it project towards the south, and these not only comprise the middle of Albania but also join the mountains of Armenia and the Moscian Mountains, as they are called, and also the Sidises and the Periadres Mountains. All these are parts of the Taurus, which forms the southern side of Armenia, parts broken off, as it were, from that mountain on the north and projecting as far as the Caucasus and that part of the coast of the Euxin which stretches from Colchis to Themysira. 2.16 Be this as it may, since Dioscurias is situated in such a gulf and occupies the most easterly point of the whole sea, it is called not only the recess of the Euxin, but also the farthermost voyage. And the proverbial verse, to Phocis, where for ships is the farthermost run, must be interpreted thus, not as though the author of the iambic verse meant the river, 
much less the city of the same name situated on the river, but as meaning by a part of Caucasus the whole of it, since from the river and the city of that name there is left a straight voyage into the recess of not less than 600 stadia. The same Dioscurias is the beginning of the isthmus between the Caspian Sea and the Euxine, and also the common emporium of the tribes who are situated above it and in its vicinity, at any rate, seventy tribes come together in it, though others, who care nothing for the facts, actually say three hundred. All speak different languages because of the fact that, by reason of their obstinacy and ferocity, they live in scattered groups and without intercourse with one another. The greater part of them are Sarmati, but they are all Caucasian. So much, then, for the region of Dioscurias. 2.17 Further, the greater part of the remainder of Caucasus is on the sea. Through it flows the Phasis, a large river having its sources in Armenia and receiving the waters of the Glaucus and the Hippus, which issue from the neighboring mountains. It is navigated as far as Serapana, a fortress capable of admitting the population even of a city. From here people go by land to the Cyrus in four days by a wagon road. On the Phasis is situated a city bearing the same name, an emporium of the Colchi, which is protected on one side by the river, on another by a lake, and on another by the sea. Thence people go to Amesis and Sinope by sea, a voyage of two or three days, because the shores are soft and because of the outlets of the rivers. The country is excellent both in respect to its produce except its honey, which is generally bitter and in respect to everything that pertains to shipbuilding, for it not only produces quantities of timber but also brings it down on rivers. And the people make linen in quantities, and hemp, wax, and pitch. Their linen industry has been famed far and wide for they used to export linen to outside places, and some writers, wishing to show forth a kinship between the Colchians and the Egyptians, confirm their belief by this. Above the aforesaid rivers in the Moschian country lies the sanctuary of Leucothea, founded by Phrixus, and the oracle of Phrixus, where a ram is never sacrificed, it was once rich, but it was robbed in our time by Pharnaces, and a little later by Mithridates of Pergamum. For when a country is devastated, things divine are in sickly plight and want not even to be respected, says Euripides. 2.18 The great fame this country had in early times is disclosed by the myths, which refer in an obscure way to the expedition of Jason as having proceeded as far even as Media, and also, before that time, to that of Phrixus. After this, when kings succeeded to power, the country being divided into Skeptuches, they were only moderately prosperous, but when Mithridates Eupater grew powerful, the country fell into his hands, and he would always send one of his friends as sub-governor or administrator of the country. Among these was Moaferns, my mother's uncle on her father's side. And it was from this country that the king received most aid in the equipment of his naval forces. But when the power of Mithridates had been broken up, all the territory subject to him was also broken up and distributed among many persons. At last Polemon got Colchis, and since his death his wife Pythodorus has been in power, being queen, not only of the Colchians, but also of Trapezus and Pharnacia and of the barbarians who live above these places, concerning whom I shall speak later on. Now the Moschian country, in which is situated the sanctuary, is divided into three parts, one part is held by the Colchians, another by the Iberians, and another by the Armenians. There is also a small city in Iberia, the city of Phrixus, the present Idiessa, well fortified, on the confines of Colchis. And near Dioscurias flows the Caris River. 2.19 Among the tribes which come together at Dioscurias are the Therophagi, who have received their name from their squalor and their filthiness. Near them are the Sones, who are no less filthy, but superior to them in power, indeed, one might almost say that they are foremost in courage and power. At any rate, they are masters of the peoples around them, and hold possession of the heights of the Caucasus above Dioscurius. They have a king and a council of three hundred men, and they assemble, according to report, an army of two hundred thousand, for the whole of the people are a fighting force, though unorganized. It is said that in their country gold is carried down by the mountain torrents, and that the barbarians obtain it by means of perforated troughs and fleecy skins, and that this is the origin of the myth of the golden fleece unless they call them Iberians, by the same name as the western Iberians, from the gold mines in both countries. The Sones use remarkable poisons for the points of their missiles, and even people who are not wounded by the poisoned missiles suffer from their odor. Now in general the tribes in the neighborhood of the Caucasus occupy barren and cramped territories, but the tribes of the Albanians and the Iberians, which occupy nearly all the isthmus above mentioned, might also be called Caucasian tribes, and they possess territory that is fertile and capable of affording an exceedingly good livelihood. 3.1 Iberia Furthermore, the greater part of Iberia is so well built up in respect to cities and farmsteads that their roofs are tiled, and their houses as well as their marketplaces and other public buildings are constructed with architectural skill. 
3.2 parts of the country are surrounded by the Caucasian mountains, for branches of these mountains, as I said before, project towards the south, they are fruitful, comprise the whole of Iberia, and border on both Armenia and Caucasus. In the middle is a plain intersected by rivers, the largest being the Cyrus. This river has its beginning in Armenia, flows immediately into the plain above mentioned, receives both the Aragus, which flows from the Caucasus, and other streams, and empties through a narrow valley into Albania, and between the valley and Armenia it flows in great volume through plains that have exceedingly good pasture, receives still more rivers, among which are the Alazonius, Sandobanes, Roetuses, and Chains, all navigable, and empties into the Caspian Sea. It was formerly called Chorus. 3.3 Now the plain of the Iberians is inhabited by people who are rather inclined to farming and to peace, and they dress after both the Armenian and the Median fashion, but the major, or warlike, portion occupy the mountainous territory, living like the Scythians and the Sarmatians, of whom they are both neighbors and kinsmen, however, they engage also in farming. And they assemble many tens of thousands, both from their own people and from the Scythians and Sarmatians, whenever anything alarming occurs. 3.4 There are four passes leading into their country, one through Serapana, a Colchian stronghold, and through the narrow defiles there. Through these defiles the Phasis, which has been made passable by 120 bridges because of the windings of its course, flows down into Caucasus with rough and violent stream, the region being cut into ravines by many torrents at the time of the heavy rains. The Phasis rises in the mountains that lie above it, where it is supplied by many springs, and in the plains it receives still other rivers, among which are the Glaucus and the Hippus. Thus filled and having by now become navigable, it issues forth into the Pontus, and it has on its banks a city bearing the same name, and near it is a lake. Such, then, is the pass that leads from Caucasus into Iberia, being shut in by rocks, by strongholds, and by rivers that run through ravines. 3.5 From the country of the nomads on the north there is a difficult ascent into Iberia requiring three days' travel, and after this ascent comes a narrow valley on the Aragus River, with a single file road requiring a four days' journey. The end of the road is guarded by a fortress which is hard to capture. The pass leading from Albania into Iberia is at first hewn through rock, and then leads through a marsh formed by the river Alazonius, which falls from the Caucasus. The passes from Armenia into Iberia are the defiles on the Cyrus and those on the Aragus. 4. Before the two rivers meet, they have on their banks fortified cities that are situated upon rocks, these being about 16 stadia distant from each other I mean Harmazus on the Cyrus and Susamora on the other river. These passes were used first by Pompey when he set out from the country of the Armenians, and afterwards by Canidius. 3.6 There are also four castes among the inhabitants of Iberia. One, and the first of all, is that from which they appoint their kings, the appointee being both the nearest of kin to his predecessor and the eldest, whereas the second in line administers justice and commands the army. The second caste is that of the priests, who among other things attend to all matters of controversy with the neighboring peoples. The third is that of the soldiers and the farmers. And the fourth is that of the common people, who are slaves of the king and perform all the services that pertain to human livelihood. Their possessions are held in common by them according to families, although the eldest is ruler and steward of each estate. Such are the Iberians in their country. 4.1 Albanians The Albanians are more inclined to the shepherd's life than the Iberians and closer akin to the nomadic people, except that they are not ferocious, and for this reason they are only moderately warlike. They live between the Iberians and the Caspian Sea, their country bordering on the sea towards the east and on the country of the Iberians towards the west. Of the remaining sides the northern is protected by the Caucasian mountains, for these mountains lie above the plains, though their parts next to the sea are generally called Syraunian, whereas the southern side is formed by Armenia, which stretches alongside it, and much of Armenia consists of plains, though much of it is mountainous, like Cambyzine, where the Armenians border on both the Iberians and the Albanians. 4.2 The Cyrus, which flows through Albania, and the other rivers by which it is supplied, contribute to the excellent qualities of the land, and yet they thrust back the sea, for the silt, being carried forward in great quantities, fills the channel, and consequently even the adjacent isles are joined to the mainland and form shoals that are uneven and difficult to avoid, and their unevenness is made worse by the backwash of the flood tides. Moreover, they say that the outlet of the river is divided into twelve mouths, of which some are choked with silt, while the others are altogether shallow and leave not even a mooring place. At any rate, they add, although the shore is washed on all sides by the sea and the rivers for a distance of more than 60 stadia, every part of it is inaccessible, and the silt extends even as far as 500 stadia, making the shore sandy. Nearby is also the mouth of the Arashis, a turbulent stream that flows down from Armenia. But the silt which this river pushes before it, thus making the channel passable for its stream, 
is compensated for by the Cyrus. 4.3 Now perhaps a people of this kind have no need of a sea, indeed, they do not make appropriate use of their land either, which produces, not only every kind of fruit, even the most highly cultivated kind, but also every plant, for it bears even the evergreens. It receives not even slight attention, yet all things spring up for them without sowing and plowing, according to those who have made expeditions there, who describe the mode of life there as Cyclopean. In many places, at any rate, they say, the land when sown only once produces two crops or even three, the first a crop of even fiftyfold, and that two without being ploughed between crops, and even when it is ploughed, it is not ploughed with an iron share, but with a wooden plough shaped by nature. The plain as a whole is better watered by its rivers and other waters than the Babylonian and the Egyptian plains, consequently it always keeps a grassy appearance, and therefore is also good for pasturage. In addition to this, the climate here is better than there. And the people never dig about the vines, although they prune them every fifth year, the new vines begin to produce fruit the second year, and when mature they yield so much that the people leave a large part of the fruit on the branches. Also the cattle in their country thrive, both the tame and the wild. 4.4 The inhabitants of this country are unusually handsome and large. And they are frank in their dealings, and not mercenary, for they do not in general use coin money, nor do they know any number greater than 100, but carry on business by means of barter, and otherwise live an easy-going life. They are also unacquainted with accurate measures and weights, and they take no forethought for war or government or farming. But still they fight both on foot and on horseback, both in light armor and in full armor, like the Armenians. 4.5 They send forth a greater army than that of the Iberians, for they equip 60,000 infantry and 22,000 horsemen, the number with which they risk their all against Pompey. Against outsiders the nomads join with the Albanians in war, just as they do with the Iberians, and for the same reasons, and besides, they often attack the people, and consequently prevent them from farming. The Albanians use javelins and bows, and they wear breastplates and large oblong shields, and helmets made of the skins of wild animals, similar to those worn by the Iberians. To the country of the Albanians belongs also the territory called Caspian, which was named after the Caspian tribe, as was also the sea, but the tribe has now disappeared. The pass from Iberia into Albania leads through Cambyzine, a waterless and rugged country, to the Alazonius River. Both the people and their dogs are surpassingly fond of hunting, engaging in it not so much because of their skill in it as because of their love for it. 4.6 Their kings, also, are excellent. At the present time, indeed, one king rules all the tribes, but formerly the several tribes were ruled separately by kings of their own according to their several languages. They have 26 languages, because of the fact that they have no easy means of intercourse with one another. The country produces also certain of the deadly reptiles, and scorpions and phalangia. Some of the phalangia cause people to die laughing, while others cause people to die weeping over the loss of their deceased kindred. 4.7 As for gods, they honor Helios, Zeus, and Selene, but especially Selene, her sanctuary is near Iberia. The office of priest is held by the man who, after the king, is held in highest honor, he is charge of the sacred land, which is extensive and well populated, and also of the temple slaves, many of whom are subject to religious frenzy and utter prophecies. And any one of those who, becoming violently possessed, wanders alone in the forests, is by the priest arrested, bound with sacred fetters, and sumptuously maintained during that year, and then led forth to the sacrifice that is performed in honor of the goddess, and, being anointed, is sacrificed along with other victims. The sacrifice is performed as follows, some person holding a sacred lance, with which it is the custom to sacrifice human victims, comes forward out of the crowd and strikes the victim through the side into the heart, he being not without experience in such a task, and when the victim falls, they draw auguries from his fall and declare them before the public, and when the body is carried to a certain place, they all trample upon it, thus using it as a means of purification. 4.8 The Albanians are surpassingly respectful to old age, not merely to their parents, but to all other old people. And when people die it is impious to be concerned about them or even to mention them. Indeed, they bury their money with them, and therefore live in poverty, having no patrimony. So much for the Albanians. It is said that Jason, together with Arminus the Thessalian, on his voyage to the country of the Colchians, pressed on from there as far as the Caspian Sea, and visited, not only Iberia and Albania, but also many parts of Armenia and Media, as both the Jasonia and several other memorials testify. And it is said that Arminus was a native of Armenium, one of the cities on Lake Bobase between Furay and Larissa, and that his followers took up their abode in Asilocene and Suspiritus, occupying the country as far as Calacane and Adiabene, and indeed that he left Armenia named after himself. 5.1 Amazons The Amazons, 
also, are said to live in the mountains above Albania. Now Theophanes, who made the expedition with Pompey and was in the country of the Albanians, says that the Jeli and the Legi, Scythian people, live between the Amazons and the Albanians, and that the Mermaid Ali's river flows there, midway between these people and the Amazons. But others, among whom are Metrodorus of Skepsis and Hypsicrates, who themselves, likewise, were not unacquainted with the region in question, say that the Amazons live on the borders of the Gargarians, in the northerly foothills of those parts of the Caucasian mountains which are called Syraunian, that the Amazons spend the rest of their time off to themselves, performing their several individual tasks, such as plowing, planting, pasturing cattle, and particularly in training horses, though the bravest engage mostly in hunting on horseback and practice warlike exercises, that the right breasts of all are seared when they are infants, so that they can easily use their right arm for every needed purpose, and especially that of throwing the javelin, that they also use bow and sagaris and light shield, and make the skins of wild animals serve as helmets, clothing, and girdles, but that they have two special months in the spring in which they go up into the neighboring mountain which separates them and the Gargarians. The Gargarians also, in accordance with an ancient custom, go up thither to offer sacrifice with the Amazons and also to have intercourse with them for the sake of begetting children, doing this in secrecy and darkness, any Gargarian at random with any Amazon, and after making them pregnant they send them away, and the females that are born are retained by the Amazons themselves, but the males are taken to the Gargarians to be brought up, and each Gargarian to whom a child is brought adopts the child as his own, regarding the child as his son because of his uncertainty. 5.2 The Mermodas dashes down from the mountains through the country of the Amazons and through Cyrocene and the intervening desert and then empties into Lake Meotis. It is said that the Gargarians went up from Themysira into this region with the Amazons, then revolted from them and in company with some Thracians and Eubians who had wandered thus far carried on war against them, and that they later ended the war against them and made a compact on the conditions above mentioned, that is, that they should have dealings with one another only in the matter of children, and that each people should live independent of the other. 5.3 A peculiar thing has happened in the case of the account we have of the Amazons, for our accounts of other peoples keep a distinction between the mythical and the historical elements, for the things that are ancient and false and monstrous are called myths, but history wishes for the truth, whether ancient or recent, and contains no monstrous element, or else only rarely. But as regards the Amazons, the same stories are told now as in early times, though they are marvelous and beyond belief. For instance, who could believe that an army of women, or a city, or a tribe, could ever be organized without men, and not only be organized, but even make inroads upon the territory of other people, and not only overpower the peoples near them to the extent of advancing as far as what is now Ionia, but even send an expedition across the sea as far as Attica. For this is the same as saying that the men of those times were women and that the women were men. Nevertheless, even at the present time these very stories are told about the Amazons, and they intensify the peculiarity above mentioned and our belief in the ancient accounts rather than those of the present time. 5.4 At any rate, the founding of cities and the giving of names to them are ascribed to the Amazons, as, for instance, Ephesus and Smyrna and Simon Myrene, and so are tombs and other monuments, and Themysira and the plains about Thermoden and the mountains that lie above them are by all writers mentioned as having belonged to the Amazons, but they say that the Amazons were driven out of these places. Only a few writers make assertions as to where they are at the present time, but their assertions are without proof and beyond belief, as in the case of Philestria, queen of the Amazons, with whom, they say, Alexander associated in Hyrcania and had intercourse for the sake of offspring, for this assertion is not generally accepted. Indeed, of the numerous historians, those who care most for the truth do not make the assertion, nor do those who are most trustworthy mention any such thing, nor do those who tell the story agree in their statements. Cletarchus says that Philestria set out from the Caspian gates and Thermodon and visited Alexander, but the distance from the Caspian country to Thermodon is more than 6,000 stadia. 5.5 The stories that have been spread far and wide with a view to glorifying Alexander are not accepted by all, and their fabricators were men who cared for flattery rather than truth. For instance, they transferred the Caucasus into the region of the Indian mountains and of the eastern sea which lies near those mountains from the mountains which lie above Colchis and the Euxine, for these are the mountains which the Greeks named Caucasus, which is more than 30,000 stadia distant from India, and here it was that they laid the scene of the story of Prometheus and of his being put in bonds, for these were the farthermost mountains towards the east that were known to writers of that time. And the expedition of Dionysus and Heracles to the country of the Indians looks like a mythical story of later date, because Heracles is said to have released Prometheus 1,000 years later. And although it was a more glorious thing for Alexander to subdue Asia as far as the Indian mountains than merely to the recess of the Euxine and to the Caucasus, yet the glory of the mountain, and its name, 
and the belief that Jason and his followers had accomplished the longest of all expeditions, reaching as far as the neighborhood of the Caucasus, and the tradition that Prometheus was bound at the ends of the earth on the Caucasus, led writers to suppose that they would be doing the king a favor if they transferred the name Caucasus to India. 5.6 Now the highest parts of the real Caucasus are the most southerly those next to Albania, Iberia, and the Colchians, and the Heniotians. They are inhabited by the peoples who, as I have said, assemble at Dioscurias, and they assemble there mostly in order to get salt. Of these tribes, some occupy the ridges of the mountains, while the others have their abodes in glens and live mostly on the flesh of wild animals, and on wild fruits and milk. The summits of the mountains are impassable in winter, but the people ascend them in summer by fastening to their feet broad shoes made of raw ox hide, like drums, and furnished with spikes, on account of the snow and the ice. They descend with their loads by sliding down seated upon skins, as is the custom in Atropatian media and on Mount Massius in Armenia, there, however, the people also fasten wooden discs furnished with spikes to the soles of their shoes. Such, then, are the heights of the Caucasus. 5.7 As one descends into the foothills, the country inclines more towards the north, but its climate is milder, for there it borders on the plains of the Cirruses. And here are also some troglodyte, who, on account of the cold, live in caves, but even in their country there is plenty of barley. After the troglodyte one comes to certain Chamakiti and Polyphagi, as they are called, and to the villages of the Isatasai, who are able to farm because they are not altogether exposed to the north. 5.8 The next peoples to which one comes between Lake Meotis and the Caspian Sea are nomads, the Nabiani and the Pankani, and then next the tribes of the Cirruses and the Aorsi. The Aorsi and the Cirruses are thought to be fugitives from the upper tribes of those names and the Aorsi are more to the north than the Cirruses. Now Abicus, king of the Cirruses, sent forth 20,000 horsemen at the time when Pharnaces held the Bosporus, and Spadines, king of the Aorsi, 200,000, but the upper Aorsi sent a still larger number, for they held dominion over more land, and, one may almost say, ruled over most of the Caspian coast, and consequently they could import on camels the Indian and Babylonian merchandise, receiving it in their turn from the Armenians and the Medes, and also, owing to their wealth, could wear golden ornaments. Now the Aorsi live along the Tanais, but the Cirruses live along the Acardaeus, which flows from the Caucasus and empties into Lake Meotis. 6.1 Caspian Sea The second portion begins at the Caspian Sea, at which the first portion ends. The same sea is also called Hyrcanian. But I must first describe this sea and the tribes which live about it. This sea is the gulf which extends from the ocean towards the south, it is rather narrow at its entrance, but it widens out as it advances inland, and especially in the region of its recess, where its width is approximately 5,000 stadia. The length of the voyage from its entrance to its recess might be slightly more than that, since its entrance is approximately on the borders of the uninhabited world. Eratosthenes says that the circuit of this sea was known to the Greeks, that the part along the coast of the Albanians and the Cadusians is 5,400 stadia, and that the part along the coast of the Inariachi and Marti and Harkani to the mouth of the Oxus River is 4,800, and thence to the Ixerts, 2,400. But we must understand in a more general sense the accounts of this portion and the regions that lie so far removed, particularly in the matter of distances. 6.2 On the right, as one sails into the Caspian Sea, are those Scythians, or Sarmatians, who live in the country contiguous to Europe between the Tanais River and the sea, the greater part of them are nomads, of whom I have already spoken. On the left are the eastern Scythians, also nomads, who extend as far as the eastern sea in India. Now all the peoples towards the north were by the ancient Greek historians given the general name Scythians or Celtocythians, but the writers of still earlier times, making distinctions between them, called those who lived above the Euxin and the Ister and the Adriatic Hyperboreans, Sormatians, and Aramaspians, and they called those who lived across the Caspian Sea in part Satians and in part Massagians, but they were unable to give any accurate account of them, although they reported a war between Cyrus and the Massagians. However, neither have the historians given an accurate and truthful account of these peoples, nor has much credit been given to the ancient history of the Persians or Medes or Syrians, on account of the credulity of the historians and their fondness for myths. 6.34 Seeing that those who were professedly writers of myths enjoyed repute, they thought that they too would make their writings pleasing if they told in the guise of history what they had never seen, nor even heard or at least not from persons who knew the facts with this object alone in view, to tell what afforded their hearers pleasure and amazement. One could more easily believe Hesiod and Homer in their stories of the heroes than Tegeus, Herodotus, Hellanicus, and other writers of this kind. 6.4 Neither is it easy to believe most of those who have written the history of Alexander, for these toy with facts, 
both because of the glory of Alexander and because his expedition reached the ends of Asia, far away from us, and statements about things that are far away are hard to refute. But the supremacy of the Romans and that of the Parthians has disclosed considerably more knowledge than that which had previously come down to us by tradition, for those who write about those distant regions tell a more trustworthy story than their predecessors, both of the places and of the tribes among which the activities took place, for they have looked into the matter more closely. 7.1 Those nomads, however, who live along the coast on the left as one sails into the Caspian Sea are by the writers of today called Dae, I mean, those who are surnamed Aparni, then, in front of them, intervenes a desert country, and next comes Hyrcania, where the Caspian resembles an open sea to the point where it borders on the Median and Armenian mountains. The shape of these mountains is crescent-like along the foothills, which end at the sea and form the recess of the gulf. This side of the mountains, beginning at the sea, is inhabited as far as their heights for a short stretch by a part of the Albanians and the Armenians, but for the most part by Jeli, Kadizi, Amarti, Vishii, and Anariaki. They say that some of the Parasii took up their abode with the Anariaki, who, they say, are now called Parsii, and that the Inyans built a walled city in the Vishan territory, which, they say, is called Iniana, and that Greek armor, brazen vessels, and burial places are to be seen there, and that there is also a city in Arius there, in which, they say, is to be seen an oracle for sleepers, and some other tribes that are more inclined to brigandage and war than to farming, but this is due to the ruggedness of the region. However, the greater part of the seaboard round the mountainous country is occupied by Cadizzi, for a stretch of almost 5,000 stadia, according to Patrocles, who considers this sea almost equal to the Pontic Sea. Now these regions have poor soil. 7.2 But Hyrcania is exceedingly fertile, extensive, and in general level, it is distinguished by notable cities, among which are Talibris, Samarian, Carta, and the royal residence Tape, which, they say, is situated slightly above the sea and at a distance of 1,400 stadia from the Caspian Gates. And because of its particular kind of prosperity writers go on to relate evidences thereof, the vine produces one metrets of wine, and the fig tree sixty medimni, the grain grows up from the seed that falls from the stalk, bees have their hives in the trees, and honey drips from the leaves, and this is also the case in Matian and Media, and in Sacacene and Araxene in Armenia. However, neither the country itself nor the sea that is named after it has received proper attention, the sea being both without vessels and unused. There are islands in this sea which could afford a livelihood, and, according to some writers, contain gold ore. The cause of this lack of attention was the fact that the first governors of the Hyrcanians, I mean the Medes and Persians, as also the last, I mean the Parthians, who were inferior to the former, were barbarians, and also the fact that the whole of the neighboring country was full of brigands and nomads and deserted regions. The Macedonians did indeed rule over the country for a short time, but they were so occupied with wars that they could not attend to their remote possessions. According to Aristobulus, Hyrcania, which is a wooded country, has the oak, but does not produce the torch pine or fir or stone pine, though India abounds in these trees. Nessia, also, belongs to Hyrcania, though some writers set it down as an independent district. 7.3 Hyrcania is traversed by the rivers Ocus and Oxus to their outlets into the sea, and of these, the Ocus flows also through Nessia, but some say that the Ocus empties into the Oxus. Aristobulus declares that the Oxus is the largest of the rivers he has seen in Asia, except those in India. And he further says that it is navigable, both he and Eratosthenes taking this statement from Patrocles, and that large quantities of Indian wares are brought down on it to the Hyrcanian Sea and thence on that sea are transported to Albania and brought down on the Cyrus River and through the region that comes next after it to the Euxin. The Ocus is not mentioned at all by the ancient writers. Apollodorus, however, who wrote the Parthica, names it continually, implying that it flows very close to the country of the Parthians. 7.4 Many false notions were also added to the account of this sea because of Alexander's love of glory, for, since it was agreed by all that the Tanais separated Asia from Europe, and that the region between the sea and the Tanais, being a considerable part of Asia, had not fallen under the power of the Macedonians, it was resolved to manipulate the account of Alexander's expedition so that in fame at least he might be credited with having conquered those parts of Asia too. They therefore united Lake Meotis, which receives the Tanais, with the Caspian Sea, calling this too a lake and asserting that both were connected with one another by an underground passage and that each was a part of the other. Polycletus goes on to adduce proofs in connection with his belief that the sea is a lake, for instance, he says that it produces serpents, and that its water is Swedish, and that it is no other than Meotis he judges from the fact that the Tanais empties into it. From the same Indian mountains, where the Ocus and the Oxus and several other rivers rise, flows also the Ixerts, 
which, like those rivers, empties into the Caspian Sea and is the most northerly of them all. This river, accordingly, they named Tanais, and in addition to so naming it they gave as proof that it was the Tanais mentioned by Polyclitus that the country on the far side of this river produces the fir tree and that the Scythians in that region use arrows made of firwood, and they say that this is also evidence that the country on the far side belongs to Europe and not to Asia, for, they add, Upper and Eastern Asia does not produce the fir tree. But Eratosthenes says that the fir tree grows also in India and that Alexander built his fleet out of firwood from there. Eratosthenes tries to reconcile many other differences of this kind, but as for me, let what I have said about them suffice. 7.5 This too, among the marvelous things recorded of Hyrcania, is related by Eutyxus and others, that there are some cliffs facing the sea with caverns underneath, and between these and the sea, below the cliffs, is a low-lying shore, and that rivers flowing from the precipices above rush forward with so great force that when they reach the cliffs they hurl their waters out into the sea without wetting the shore, so that even armies can pass underneath sheltered by the stream above, and the natives often come down to the place for the sake of feasting and sacrifice, and sometimes they recline in the caverns down below and sometimes they enjoy themselves basking in the sunlight beneath the stream itself, different people enjoying themselves in different ways, having in sight at the same time on either side both the sea and the shore, which latter, because of the moisture, is grassy and abloom with flowers. 8.1 Saka as one proceeds from the Hyrcanian Sea towards the east, one sees on the right the mountains that extend as far as the Indian Sea, which by the Greeks are named the Taurus. Beginning at Pamphylia and Cilicia they extend thus far in a continuous line from the west and bear various different names. In the northerly parts of the range dwell first the Jelly and Cadizi and Amarti, as I have said, and certain of the Hyrcanians, and after them the tribe of the Parthians and that of the Margianians and the Arians, and then comes the desert which is separated from Hyrcania by the Sarnius River as one goes eastwards and towards the Ocus River. The mountain which extends from Armenia to this point, or a little short of it, is called Parashothras. The distance from the Hyrcanian Sea to the country of the Arians is about 6,000 stadia. Then comes Bactriana, and Sogdiana, and finally the Scythian nomads. Now the Macedonians gave the name Caucasus to all the mountains which follow in order after the country of the Arians, but among the barbarians the extremities on the north were given the separate names Peropamesis and Emota and Emmaus, and other such names were applied to separate parts. 8.2 On the left and opposite these peoples are situated the Scythian or nomadic tribes, which cover the whole of the northern side. Now the greater part of the Scythians, beginning at the Caspian Sea, are called Dia, but those who are situated more to the east than these are named Masajdi and Saka, whereas all the rest are given the general name of Scythians, though each people is given a separate name of its own. They are all for the most part nomads. But the best known of the nomads are those who took away Bactriana from the Greeks, I mean the Asai, Pagani, Takari, and Sakarali, who originally came from the country on the other side of the Iaxerts river that adjoins that of the Saka and the Sogdiani and was occupied by the Saka. And as for the Dae, some of them are called Aparni, some Xanthai, and some Pishuri. Now of these the Aparni are situated closest to Hyrcania and the part of the sea that borders on it, but the remainder extend even as far as the country that stretches parallel to Arya. 8.3 Between them and Hyrcania and Parthia and extending as far as the Arians is a great waterless desert, which they traversed by long marches and then overran Hyrcania, Nessia, and the plains of the Parthians. And these people agreed to pay tribute, and the tribute was to allow the invaders at certain appointed times to overrun the country and carry off booty. But when the invaders overran their country more than the agreement allowed, war ensued, and in turn their quarrels were composed and new wars were begun. Such is the life of the other nomads also, who are always attacking their neighbors and then in turn settling their differences. 8.4 The Saka, however, made raids like those of Sumerians and Traers, some into regions close to their own country, others into regions farther away. For instance, they occupied Bactriana, and acquired possession of the best land in Armenia, which they left named after themselves, Sacacene, and they advanced as far as the country of the Cappadocians, particularly those situated close to the Euxin, who are now called the Ponisai. But when they were holding a general festival and enjoying their booty, they were attacked by night by the Persian generals who were then in that region and utterly wiped out. And these generals, heaping up a mound of earth over a certain rock in the plain, completed it in the form of a hill, and erected on it a wall, and established the sanctuary of Anitus and the gods who share her altar Omanus and Anadatus, Persian deities, and they instituted an annual sacred festival, the Sassia, which the inhabitants of Zela, for thus the place is called, continue to celebrate to the present day. It is a small city belonging for the most part to the temple slaves. But Pompey added considerable territory to it, settled the inhabitants thereof within the walls, and made it one of the cities which he organized after his overthrow of Mithridates. 
8.5 Now this is the account which some writers give of the Saka. Others say that Cyrus made an expedition against the Saka, was defeated in the battle, and fled, but that he encamped in the place where he had left behind his supplies, which consisted of an abundance of everything and especially of wine, rested his army a short time, and set out at nightfall, as though he were in flight, leaving the tents full of supplies, and that he proceeded as far as he thought best and halted, and that the Saka pursued, found the camp empty of men but full of things conducive to enjoyment, and filled themselves to the full, and that Cyrus turned back, and found them drunk and crazed, so that some were slain while lying stupefied and asleep, whereas others fell victims to the arms of the enemy while dancing and reveling naked, and almost all perished, and Cyrus, regarding the happy issue as of divine origin, consecrated that day to the goddess of his fathers and called it Sassia, and that wherever there is a sanctuary of this goddess, there the festival of the Sassia, a kind of Bacchic festival, is the custom, at which men, dressed in the Scythian garb, pass day and night drinking and playing one only with one another, and also with the women who drink with them. 8.6 The Massage to disclose their valour in their war with Cyrus, to which many writers refer again and again, and it is from these that we must get our information. Statements to the following effect are made concerning the Masajdi, that some of them inhabit mountains, some plains, others marshes which are formed by the rivers, and others the islands and the marshes. But the country is inundated most of all, they say, by the Arashus River, which splits into numerous branches and empties by its other mouths into the other sea on the north, though by one single mouth that reaches the Hyrcanian Gulf. They regard Helios alone as God, and to him they sacrifice horses. Each man marries only one wife, but they use also the wives of others, not in secret, however, for the man who is to have intercourse with the wife of another hangs up his quiver on the wagon and has intercourse with her openly. And they consider it the best kind of death when they are old to be chopped up with the flesh of cattle and eaten mixed up with that flesh. But those who die of disease are cast out as impious and worthy only to be eaten by wild beasts. They are good horsemen and foot soldiers, they use bows, short swords, breastplates, and cigars made of brass, and in their battles they wear headbands and belts made of gold. And their horses have bits and girths made of gold. Silver is not found in their country, and only a little iron, but brass and gold in abundance. 8.7 Now those who live in the islands, since they have no grain to sow, use roots and wild fruits as food, and they clothe themselves with the bark of trees, for they have no cattle either, and they drink the juice squeezed out of the fruit of the trees. Those who live in the marshes eat fish, and clothe themselves in the skins of the seals that run up thither from the sea. The mountaineers themselves also live on wild fruits, but they have sheep also, though only a few, and therefore they do not butcher them, sparing them for their wool and milk, and they variegate the color of their clothing by staining it with dyes whose colors do not easily fade. The inhabitants of the plains, although they possess land, do not till it, but in the nomadic or Scythian fashion live on sheep and fish. Indeed, there not only is a certain mode of life common to all such peoples, of which I often speak, but their burials, customs, and their way of living as a whole, are alike, that is, they are self-assertive, uncouth, wild, and warlike, but, in their business dealings, straightforward and not given to deceit. 8.8 .8 Belonging to the tribe of the Masajdi and the Saka are also the Atagii and the Karasmi, to whom Spitamines fled from the country of the Bactriani and the Sogdiani. He was one of the Persians who escaped from Alexander, as did also Bessus, and later Arsaces, when he fled from Seleucus Callinicus, withdrew into the country of the Apagiki. Eratosthenes says that the Arachodi and Masajdi are situated alongside the Bactrians towards the west along the Oxus River, and that the Saka and the Sogdiani, with the whole of their lands, are situated opposite India, but the Bactriani only for a slight distance, for, he says, they are situated for the most part alongside the Paropamesis, and the Saka and the Sogdiani are separated from one another by the Ixerts River, and the Sogdiani and the Bactriani by the Oxus River, and the Tapiri live between the Hyrcanians and the Arians, and in a circuit round the sea after the Hyrcanians one comes to the Amarti, Anariaki, Cadizi, Albani, Caspii, Vicii, and perhaps also other peoples, until one reaches the Scythians, and on the other side of the Hyrcanians are Derbuses, and the Cadizi border on the Medi and Mashini below the Parashothrus. 8.9 Eratosthenes gives the distances as follows, from Mount Caspius to the Cyrus River, about 1,800 stadia, thence to the Caspian Gates, 5,600, then to Alexandria in the country of the Arians, 6,400, then to the city Bactra, also called Zariaspa, 3,870, then to the Ixerts River, to which Alexander came, about 5,000, a distance all told of 22,670 stadia. He gives also the distance from the Caspian Gates to India as follows, to Hecatompolis, 1,960 stadia, to Alexandria in the country of the Arians, 
4,530, then to Prophasia in Drange, 1,600, others say 1,500, then to the city of Rakoti, 4,120, then to Ordespana, to the junction of the three roads leading from Bactra, 2,000, then to the borders of India, 1,000, a distance all told of 15,300 stadia. We must conceive of the length of India, reckoned from the Indus River to the Eastern Sea, as continuous with this distance in a straight line. So much for the Saka. 9.1 Parthia as for the Parthian country, it is not large, at any rate, it paid its tribute along with the Hyrcanians in the Persian times, and also after this, when for a long time the Macedonians held the mastery. And, in addition to its smallness, it is thickly wooded and mountainous, and also poverty-stricken, so that on this account the kings send their own throngs through it in great haste, since the country is unable to support them even for a short time. At present, however, it has increased in extent. Parts of the Parthian country are Comacene and Corine, and, one may almost say, the whole region that extends as far as the Caspian Gates and Ragi and the Tapirai, which formerly belonged to Media. And in the neighborhood of Ragi are the cities Apamea and Heraclea. The distance from the Caspian Gates to Ragi is 500 stadia, as Apollodorus says, and to Hecatompolis, the royal seat of the Parthians, 1260. Ragi is said to have got its name from the earthquakes that took place in that country, by which numerous cities and 2,000 villages, as Poseidonius says, were destroyed. The Tapirai are said to live between the Derbises and the Hyrcanians. It is reported of the Tapirai that it was a custom of theirs to give their wives in marriage to other husbands as soon as they had had two or three children by them, just as in our times, in accordance with an ancient custom of the Romans, Cato gave Marcia in marriage to Hortensius at the request of the latter. 9.2 But when revolutions were attempted by the countries outside the Taurus, because of the fact that the kings of Syria and Media, who were in possession also of these countries, were busily engaged with others, those who had been entrusted with their government first caused the revolt of Bactriana and of all the country near it, I mean Euthydemus and his followers, and then Arsaces, a Scythian, with some of the Dae, I mean the Aparnians, as they were called, nomads who lived along the Ocus, invaded Parthia and conquered it. Now at the outset Arsaces was weak, being continually at war with those who had been deprived by him of their territory, both he himself and his successors, but later they grew so strong, always taking the neighboring territory, through successes in warfare, that finally they established themselves as lords of the whole of the country inside the Euphrates. And they also took a part of Bactriana, having forced the Scythians, and still earlier Eucratides and his followers, to yield to them, and at the present time they rule over so much land and so many tribes that in the size of their empire they have become, in a way, rivals of the Romans. The cause of this is their mode of life, and also their customs, which contain much that is barbarian and Scythian in character, though more that is conducive to hegemony and success in war. 9.3 They say that the Aparnian Dae were emigrants from the Dae above Lake Meotis, who are called Zandii or Parai. But the view is not altogether accepted that the Dae are a part of the Scythians who live about Meotis. At any rate, some say that Arsaces derives his origin from the Scythians, whereas others say that he was a Bactrian, and that when in flight from the enlarged power of Diotetus and his followers he caused Parthia to revolt. But since I have said much about the Parthian usages in the sixth book of my historical sketches and in the second book of my history of events after Polybius, I shall omit discussion of that subject here, lest I may seem to be repeating what I have already said, though I shall mention this alone, that the council of the Parthians, according to Poseidonius, consists of two groups, one that of kinsmen, and the other that of wise men and magi, from both of which groups the kings were appointed. 10.1 Margiana, Aria and Margiana are the most powerful districts in this part of Asia, these districts in part being enclosed by the mountains and in part having their habitations in the plains. Now the mountains are occupied by tent dwellers, and the plains are intersected by rivers that irrigate them, partly by the Arius and partly by the Margus. Aria borders on Margiana and, Bactriana, it is about 6,000 stadia distant from Hyrcania. Andrangiana, as far as Carmania, was joined with Aria in the payment of tribute Dragiana, for the most part, lying below the southern parts of the mountains, though some parts of it approach the northern region opposite Aria. But Arachasia, also, is not far away, this country too lying below the southern parts of the mountains and extending as far as the Indus River, being a part of Ariana. The length of Aria is about 2,000 stadia, and the breadth of the plain about 300. Its cities are Artakina and Alexandria and Achaia, all named after their founders. The land is exceedingly productive of wine, which keeps good for three generations in vessels not smeared with pitch. 10.2 Margiana is similar to this country, although its plain is surrounded by deserts. Admiring its fertility, 
Antiochus Soter enclosed a circuit of 1500 stadia with a wall and founded a city Antiochia. The soil of the country is well suited to the vine, at any rate, they say that a stock of the vine is often found which would require two men to girth it, and that the bunches of grapes are two cubits. 11.1 Bactria, as for Bactria, a part of it lies alongside Aria towards the north, though most of it lies above Aria and to the east of it. And much of it produces everything except oil. The Greeks who caused Bactria to revolt grew so powerful on account of the fertility of the country that they became masters, not only of Ariana, but also of India, as Apollodorus of Artemida says, and more tribes were subdued by them than by Alexander by Menander in particular, at least if he actually crossed the Hypanes towards the east and advanced as far as the Emmaus, for some were subdued by him personally and others by Demetrius, the son of Euthydemus the king of the Bactrians, and they took possession, not only of Patalina, but also, on the rest of the coast, of what is called the kingdom of Seriostus and Sigides. In short, Apollodorus says that Bactriana is the ornament of Ariana as a whole, and, more than that, they extended their empire even as far as the seers and the Phrenae. 11.2 Their cities were Bactra, also called Zeriaspa, through which flows a river bearing the same name and emptying into the Oxus, and Doropsa, and several others. Among these was Eucratidia, which was named after its ruler. The Greeks took possession of it and divided it into satrapies, of which the satrapy Turava and that of Aspinus were taken away from Eucratides by the Parthians. And they also held Sogdiana, situated above Bactriana towards the east between the Oxus River, which forms the boundary between the Bactrians and the Sogdians, and the Ixerts River. And the Ixerts forms also the boundary between the Sogdians and the Nomads. 11.3 Now in early times the Sogdians and Bactrians did not differ much from the Nomads in their modes of life and customs, although the Bactrians were a little more civilized, however, of these, as of the others, one Zecritus does not report their best traits, saying, for instance, that those who have become helpless because of old age or sickness are thrown out alive as prey to dogs kept expressly for this purpose, which in their native tongue are called undertakers, and that while the land outside the walls of the metropolis of the Bactrians looks clean, yet most of the land inside the walls is full of human bones, but that Alexander broke up the custom. And the reports about the Caspians are similar, for instance, that when parents live beyond seventy years they are shut in and starved to death. Now this latter custom is more tolerable, and it is similar to that of the Sians, although it is of Scythian origin, that of the Bactrians, however, is still more like that of the Scythians. And so, if it was proper to be in doubt as to the facts at the time when Alexander was finding such customs there, what should one say as to what sort of customs were probably in vogue among them in the time of the earliest Persian rulers and the still earlier rulers? 11.4 Be this as it may, they say that Alexander founded eight cities in Bactriana and Sogdiana, and that he raised certain cities to the ground, among which was Caridi and Bactriana, in which Callisthenes was seized and imprisoned, and Maraconda and Syra in Sogdiana, Syra being the last city founded by Cyrus and being situated on the Ixerts River, which was the boundary of the Persian Empire and that although this settlement was fond of Cyrus, he raised it to the ground because of its frequent revolts, and that through a betrayal he took also two strongly fortified rocks, one in Bactriana, that of Sisimithers, where Oxyarts kept his daughter Roxana, and the other in Sogdiana, that of Oxus, though some call it the rock of Ariamazes. Now writers report that that of Sisimithers is fifteen stadia in height and eighty in circuit, and that on top it is level and has a fertile soil which can support five hundred men and that here Alexander met with sumptuous hospitality and married Roxana, the daughter of Oxyarts, but the rock in Sogdiana, they say, is twice as high as that in Bactriana. And near these places, they say, Alexander destroyed also the city of the Branchidae, whom Xerxes had settled their people who voluntarily accompanied him from their homeland because of the fact that they had betrayed to him the riches and treasures of the god at Didymi. Alexander destroyed the city, they add, because he abominated the sacrilege and the betrayal. 11.5 Aristobulus calls the river which flows through Sogdiana Polytimtus, a name imposed by the Macedonians, just as they impose names on many other places, giving new names to some and slightly altering the spelling of the names of others, and watering the country it empties into a desert and sandy land, and is absorbed in the sand, like the Arius which flows through the country of the Arians. It is said that people digging near the Ocus River found oil. It is reasonable to suppose that, just as nitrous and astringent and bituminous and sulfurous liquids flow through the earth, so also oily liquids are found, but the rarity causes surprise. According to some, the ochus flows through Bactriana, according to others, alongside it. And according to some, it is a different river from the Oxus as far as its mouths, being more to the south than the Oxus, although they both have their outlets into the Caspian Sea and Hyrcania, whereas others say that it is different at first, but unites with the Oxus, being in many places as much as six or seven stadia wide. 
The Ixerts, however, from beginning to end, is a different river from the Oxus, and although it ends in the same sea, the mouths of the two, according to Patrocles, are about 80 parasangs distant from one another. The Persian parasong, according to some, is 60 stadia, but according to others 30 or 40. When I was sailing up the Nile, they used different measures when they named the distance in Shoni from city to city, so that in some places the same number of Shoni meant a longer voyage and in others a shorter, and thus the variations have been preserved to this day as handed down from the beginning. 11.6 Now the tribes one encounters in going from Hyrcania towards the rising sun as far as Sogdiana became known at first to the Persians I mean the tribes inside Taurus and afterwards to the Macedonians and to the Parthians, and the tribes situated on the far side of those tribes and in a straight line with them are supposed, from their identity and kind, to be Scythian, although no expeditions have been made against them that I know of, any more than against the most northerly of the nomads. Now Alexander did attempt to lead an expedition against these when he was in pursuit of Bessus and Spitamines, but when Bessus was captured alive and brought back, and Spitamines was slain by the barbarians, he desisted from his undertaking. It is not generally agreed that persons have sailed around from India to Hyrcania, but Patrocles states that it is possible. 11.7 It is said that the last part of the Taurus, which is called Amaius and borders on the Indian Sea, neither extends eastwards farther than India nor into it, but that, as one passes to the northern side, the sea gradually reduces the length and breadth of the country, and therefore causes to taper towards the east the portion of Asia now being sketched, which is comprehended between the Taurus and the ocean that fills the Caspian Sea. The maximum length of this portion from the Hyrcanian Sea to the ocean that is opposite the Amaius is about 30,000 stadia, the route being along the mountainous tract of the Taurus, and the breadth less than 10,000, for, as has been said, the distance from the Gulf of Isos to the eastern sea at India is about 40,000 stadia, and to Isis from the western extremity at the pillars of Heracles 30,000 more. The recess of the Gulf of Isos is only slightly, if at all, farther east than Amesis, and the distance from Amesis to the Hyrcanian land is about 10,000 stadia, being parallel to that of the above-mentioned distance from Isis to India. Accordingly, there remain 30,000 stadia as the above-mentioned length towards the east of the portion now described. Again, since the maximum breadth of the inhabited world, which is clamish-shaped, is about 30,000 stadia, this distance would be measured near the meridian line drawn through the Hyrcanian and Persian seas, if it be true that the length of the inhabited world is 70,000 stadia. Accordingly, if the distance from Hyrcania to Artemida and Babylonia is 8,000 stadia, as is stated by Apollodorus of Artemida, and the distance from there to the mouth of the Persian sea another 8,000, and again 8,000, or a little less, to the places that lie on the same parallel as the extremities of Ethiopia, there would remain of the above-mentioned breadth of the inhabited world the distance which I have already given, from the recess of the Hyrcanian Sea to the mouth of that sea. Since this segment of the earth tapers towards the eastern parts, its shape would be like a cook's knife, the mountain being in a straight line and conceived of as corresponding to the edge of the knife, and the coast from the mouth of the Hyrcanian Sea to Tamarum as corresponding to the other side of the knife, which ends in a line that curves sharply to the point. 11.8 I must also mention some strange customs, everywhere talked about, of the utterly barbarous tribes, for instance, the tribes round the Caucasus and the mountainous country in general. What Euripides refers to is said to be a custom among some of them, to lament the newborn babe, in view of all the sorrows it will meet in life, but on the other hand to carry forth from their homes with joy and benedictions those who are dead and at rest from their troubles, and it is said to be a custom among others to put to death none of the greatest criminals, but only to cast them and their children out of their borders a custom contrary to that of the Derbises, for these slaughter people even for slight offences. The Derbises worship Mother Earth, and they do not sacrifice, or eat, anything that is female, and when men become over seventy years of age they are slaughtered, and their flesh is consumed by their nearest of kin, but their old women are strangled and then buried. However, the men who die under seventy years of age are not eaten, but only buried. The Sigini imitate the Persians in all their customs, except that they use ponies that are small and shaggy, which, though unable to carry a horseman, are yoked together in a four-horse team and are driven by women trained thereto from childhood, and the woman who drives best cohabits with whomever she wishes. Others are said to practice making their heads appear as long as possible and making their foreheads project beyond their chins. It is a custom of the Tapiri for the men to dress in black and wear their hair long, and for the women to dress in white and wear their hair short. They live between the Derbises and the Hyrcanians. And he who is a judge the bravest marries whomever he wishes. The Caspians starve to death those who are over seventy years of age and place their bodies out in the desert, and then they keep watch from a distance, and if they see them dragged from their beers by birds, they consider them fortunate, and if by wild beasts or dogs, less so, but if by nothing, they consider them cursed by fortune. 
12.1 Taurus Since the northern parts of Asia are formed by the Taurus, I mean the parts which are also called cis Tehran Asia, I have chosen to describe these first. These include all or most of the regions in the mountains themselves. All that lie farther east than the Caspian Gates admit of a simpler description because of the wildness of their inhabitants, and it would not make much difference whether they were named as belonging to this clima or that, whereas all that lie to the west afford abundant matter for description, and therefore I must proceed to the parts which are adjacent to the Caspian Gates. Adjacent to the Caspian Gates on the west is Media, a country at one time both extensive and powerful, and situated in the midst of the Taurus, which is split into many parts in the region of Media and contains large valleys, as is also the case in Armenia. 12.2 For this mountain has its beginning in Caria and Lycia, there, indeed, it has neither any considerable breadth nor height, but it first rises to a considerable height opposite the Chelidoniae, which are islands at the beginning of the coast of Pamphylia, and then stretching towards the east in close long valleys, those in Cilicia, and then on one side the Amanus mountain splits off it and on the other the Antitaurus mountain, in which latter is situated Kamana, in Upper Cappadocia, as it is called. Now the Antitaurus ends in Cataonia, whereas the mountain Amanus extends to the Euphrates River in Melitina where Comagene lies adjacent to Cappadocia. And it is succeeded in turn by the mountains on the far side of the Euphrates, which are continuous with those aforementioned, except that they are cleft by the river that flows through the midst of them. Here its height and breadth greatly increase and its branches are more numerous. At all events, the most southerly part is the Taurus proper, which separates Armenia from Mesopotamia. 12.3 Thence flow both rivers, I mean the Euphrates and the Tigris, which encircle Mesopotamia and closely approach each other in Babylonia and then empty into the Persian Sea. The Euphrates is not only the larger of the two rivers, but also, with its winding stream, traverses more country, having its sources in the northerly region of the Taurus, and flowing towards the west through Greater Armenia, as it is called, to Lesser Armenia, having the latter on its right and a Cilicene on the left. It then bends towards the south, and at its bend joins the boundaries of Cappadocia, and leaving these in the region of Comagene on the right, and a Cilicene and Sophene in Greater Armenia on the left, it runs on to Syria and again makes another bend into Babylonia and the Persian Gulf. The Tigris, running from the southerly part of the same mountain to Seleucia, approaches close to the Euphrates and with it forms Mesopotamia, and then flows into the same gulf as the Euphrates. The sources of the Euphrates and the Tigris are about 2,500 stadia distant from each other. 12.4 Now the Taurus has numerous branches towards the north, one of which is that of the Antitaurus, as it is called, for there too the mountain which encloses Sophene in a valley situated between itself and the Taurus was so named. On the far side of the Euphrates, near Lesser Armenia and next to the Antitaurus towards the north, there stretches a large mountain with many branches, one of which is called Periadres, another the Moschian Mountains, and another which is called by various names, and these comprehend the whole of Armenia as far as Iberia and Albania. Then other mountains rise towards the east, I mean those which lie above the Caspian Sea, extending as far as Media, not only the Atropatian Media but also the Greater Media. Not only all these parts of the mountains are called Parashothras, but also those which extend to the Caspian Gates and those which extend still farther towards the east, I mean those which border on Arya. The mountains on the north, then, bear these names, whereas those on the south, on the far side of the Euphrates, in their extent towards the east from Cappadocia and Comagene, are, at their beginning, called Taurus proper, which separates Sophene and the rest of Armenia from Mesopotamia, by some, however, these are called the Gordian Mountains, and among these belongs also Masius, the mountain which is situated above Nisibis and Tigranocerta. Then the Taurus rises higher and bears the name Niphates, and somewhere here are the sources of the Tigris, on the southern side of the mountainous country. Then from the Niphates the mountain chain extends still farther and farther and forms the mountain Zagros which separates Media and Babylonia. After the Zagros there follows, above Babylonia, the mountainous country of the Elimii and that of the Peritaceni, and also, above Media, that of the Kasa'e. In the middle are Media and Armenia, which comprise many mountains, many plateaus, and likewise many low plains and large valleys, and also numerous tribes that live round among the mountains and are small in numbers and range the mountains and for the most part are given to brigandage. Thus, then, I am placing inside the Taurus both Media, to which the Caspian Gates belong, and Armenia. 12.5 According to the way in which I place them, then, these tribes would be towards the north, since they are inside the Taurus, but Eratosthenes, who is the author of the division of Asia into Southern Asia and Northern Asia and into Sphragides, as he calls them, calling some of the Sphragides Northern and others Southern, represents the Caspian Gates as a boundary between the two climata reasonably, therefore, he might represent as Southern the parts that are more southerly, stretching towards the east, than the Caspian Gates, 
among which are Media and Armenia, and the more northerly is Northern, since this is the case no matter what distribution into parts is otherwise made of the country. But perhaps it did not strike Eratosthenes that no part either of Armenia or of Media lay outside the Taurus. 13.1 Media Media is divided into two parts. One part of it is called Greater Media, of which the metropolis is Ekbatana, a large city containing the royal residence of the Median Empire, the Parthians continue to use this as a royal residence even now, and their kings spend at least their summers there, for Media is a cold country, but their winter residence is at Seleucia, on the Tigris near Babylon. The other part is Atropatian Media, which got its name from the commander Atropates, who prevented also this country, which was a part of Greater Media, from becoming subject to the Macedonians. Furthermore, after he was proclaimed king, he organized this country into a separate state by itself, and his succession of descendants is preserved to this day, and his successors have contracted marriages with the kings of the Armenians and Syrians and, in later times, with the kings of the Parthians. 13.2 This country lies east of Armenia and Matian, west of Greater Media, and north of both, and it lies adjacent to the region round the recess of the Hyrcanian Sea and to Matian on the south. It is no small country, considering its power, as Apollonides says, since it can furnish as many as 10,000 horsemen and 40,000 foot soldiers. It has a harbour, Kapata, in which salts effloresce and solidify. These salts cause itching and are painful, but this effect is relieved by olive oil, and the water restores weathered garments, if perchance through ignorance one should dip them in it to wash them. They have powerful neighbours in the Armenians and the Parthians, by whom they are often plundered. But still they hold out against them and get back what has been taken away from them, as, for example, they got back Symbus from the Armenians when the latter became subject to the Romans, and they themselves have attained to friendship with Caesar. But they are also paying court to the Parthians at the same time. 13.3 Their royal summer palace is situated in a plain at Gazica, and their winter palace in a fortress called Vera, which was besieged by Antony on his expedition against the Parthians. This fortress is distant from the Arashis, which forms the boundary between Armenia and Atropine, 2400 stadia, according to Delius, the friend of Antony, who wrote an account of Antony's expedition against the Parthians, on which he accompanied Antony and was himself a commander. All regions of this country are fertile except the part towards the north, which is mountainous and rugged and cold, the abode of the mountaineers called Cadizi, Amarti, Tapirai, Circii, and other such peoples, who are migrants and predatory, for the Zagros and Niphates fountains keep these tribes scattered, and the Circii in Persis, and the Marti, for the Amarti are also thus called, and those in Armenia who to this day are called by the same name, are of the same character. 13.4 The Cadizi, however, are but little short of the Ariani in the number of their foot soldiers, and their javelin throwers are excellent, and in rugged places foot soldiers instead of horsemen do the fighting. It was not the nature of the country that made the expedition difficult for Antony, but his guide Artavosts, the king of the Armenians, whom, though plotting against him, Antony rashly made his counsellor and master of decisions respecting the war. Antony indeed punished him, but too late, when the latter had been proved guilty of numerous wrongs against the Romans, not only he himself, but also that other guide, who made the journey from the Zugma on the Euphrates to the borders of Atropine 8000 stadia long, more than twice the direct journey, guiding the army over mountains and roadless regions and circuitous routes. 13.5 In ancient times Greater Armenia ruled the whole of Asia, after it broke up the empire of the Syrians, but later, in the time of Astyages, it was deprived of that great authority by Cyrus and the Persians, although it continued to preserve much of its ancient dignity, and Ekbatna was winter residence for the Persian kings, and likewise for the Macedonians who, after overthrowing the Persians, occupied Syria, and still today it affords the kings of the Parthians the same advantages and security. 13.6 Greater Media is bounded on the east by Parthia and the mountains of the Kasa'e, a predatory people, who once supplied the Elimii, with whom they were allies in the war against the Susians and Babylonians, with 13,000 bowmen. Nearchus says that there were four predatory tribes and that of these the Marti were situated next to the Persians, the Uxii and Elimii next to the Marti and the Susians, and the Kasa'e next to the Medians, and that whereas all four exacted tribute from the kings, the Kasa'e also received gifts at the times when the king, after spending the summer in Ekbatna, went down into Babylonia, but that Alexander put an end to their great audacity when he attacked them in the winter time. So then, Greater Media is bounded on the east by these tribes, and also by the Peridiceni, who border on the Persians and are themselves likewise mountaineers and predatory, on the north by the Cadizi who live above the Hyrcanian Sea, and by the other tribes which I have just described, on the south by Apollonius, which the ancients called Cytosine, and by the mountain Zagros, at the place where Massabatus is situated, which belongs to Media, though some say that it belongs to Elimia, 
and on the west by the Atropatai and certain of the Armenians. There are also some Greek cities in Media, founded by the Macedonians, among which are Laodicea, Apamea and the city near Ragi, and Raga itself, which was founded by Nicator. By him it was named Europus, but by the Parthians Asatia, it lies about 500 stadia to the south of the Caspian Gates, according to Apollodorus of Artemida. 13.7 Now most of the country is high and cold, and such, also, are the mountains which lie above Ekbatna and those in the neighborhood of Ragi and the Caspian Gates, and in general the northerly regions extending thence to Matian and Armenia. But the region below the Caspian Gates, consisting of low-lying lands and hollows, is very fertile and productive of everything but the olive, and even if the olive is produced anywhere, it is dry and yields no oil. This, as well as Armenia, is an exceptionally good horse-pasturing country, and a certain meadow there is called horse-pasturing, and those who travel from Persis and Babylon to Caspian Gates pass through it, and in the time of the Persians it is said that 50,000 mares were pastured in it and that these herds belonged to the kings. As for the Nessian horses, which the kings used because they were the best and the largest, some writers say that the breed came from here, while others say from Armenia. They are characteristically different in form, as are also the Parthian horses, as they are now called, as compared with the Helladic and the other horses in our country. Further, we call the grass that makes the best food for horses by the special name Medic, from the fact that it abounds there. The country also produces silphium, whence the Medic juice, as it is called, which in general is not much inferior to the Cyrenaic juice, but sometimes is even superior to it, either owing to regional differences, or because of a variation in the species of the plant, or even owing to the people who extract and prepare the juice in such a way as to conserve its strength for storage and for use. 13.8 Such is the nature of the country. As for its size, its length and breadth are approximately equal. The greatest breadth of media seems to be that from the pass that leads over the Zagros, which is called Medic Gate, to the Caspian Gates through Sigrian, 4,100 stadia. The reports on the tributes paid agree with the size and the power of the country, for Cappadocia paid the Persians yearly, in addition to the silver tax, 1,500 horses, 2,000 mules, and 50,000 sheep, whereas Media paid almost twice as much as this. 13.9 As for customs, most of theirs and of those of the Armenians are the same, because their countries are similar. The Medes, however, are said to have been the originators of customs for the Armenians, and also, still earlier, for the Persians, who were their masters and their successors in the supreme authority over Asia. For example, their Persian stole, as it is now called, and their zeal for archery and horsemanship, and the court they pay to their kings, and their ornaments, and the divine reverence paid by subjects to kings, came to the Persians from the Medes. And that this is true is particularly clear from their dress, for tiara, sitaris, pilas, tunics with sleeves reaching to the hands, and trousers, are indeed suitable things to wear in cold and northerly regions, such as the Medes wear, but by no means in southerly regions, and most of the settlements possessed by the Persians were on the Red Sea, farther south than the country of the Babylonians and the Susians. But after the overthrow of the Medes the Persians acquired in addition certain parts of the country that reached to Media. However, the customs even of the conquered looked to the conquerors so august and appropriate to royal pomp that they submitted to wear feminine robes instead of going naked or lightly clad, and to cover their bodies all over with clothes. 13.10 Some say that Medea introduced this kind of dress when she, along with Jason, held dominion in this region, even concealing her face whenever she went out in public in place of the king, and that the Jasonian hero chapels, which are much revered by the barbarians, are memorials of Jason, and above the Caspian gates on the left is a large mountain called Jasonium, whereas the dress and the name of the country are memorials of Medea. It is said also that Medus her son succeeded to the empire and left his own name to the country. In agreement with this are the Jasonia of Armenia and the name of that country and several other things which I shall discuss. 13.12 This, too, is a Medic custom to choose the bravest man as king, not, however, among all Medes, but only among the mountaineers. More general is the custom for the kings to have many wives, this is the custom of the mountaineers of the Medes, and all Medes, and they are not permitted to have less than five. Likewise, the women are said to account it an honorable thing to have as many husbands as possible and to consider less than five a calamity. But though the rest of Media is extremely fertile, the northerly mountainous part has poor soil, at any rate, the people live on the fruits of trees, making cakes out of apples that are sliced and dried, and bread from roasted almonds, and they squeeze out a wine from certain roots, and they use the meat of wild animals, but do not breed tame animals. Thus much I add concerning the Medes. As for the institutions in common use throughout the whole of Media, since they prove to have been the same as those of the Persians because of the conquest of the Persians, I shall discuss them in my account of the latter. Book 12. 
1.1 Cappadocia, also, is a country of many parts and has undergone numerous changes. However, the inhabitants who speak the same language are, generally speaking, those who are bounded on the south by the Cilician Taurus, as it is called, and on the east by Armenia and Caucasus and by the intervening peoples who speak a different group of languages, and on the north by the Euxin as far as the outlets of the Elise River, and on the west both by the tribe of the Paplagonians and by those Galati who settled in Phrygia and extended as far as the Lycaonians and those Cilicians who occupy Cilicia Trachea. 1.2 Now as for the tribes themselves which speak the same language, the ancients set one of them, the Cataonians, by themselves, contradistinguishing them from the Cappadocians, regarding the latter as a different tribe, and in their enumeration of the tribes they place Cataonia after Cappadocia, and then place the Euphrates and the tribes beyond it so as to include in Cataonia Melitene, which lies between Cataonia and the Euphrates, borders on Comagene, and, according to the division of Cappadocia into ten prefectures, is a tenth portion of the country. Indeed, it was in this way that the kings in my time who preceded Archelaus held their several prefectures over Cappadocia. And Cataonia, also, is a tenth portion of Cappadocia. In my time each of the two countries had its own prefect, but since, as compared with the other Cappadocians, there is no difference to be seen either in the language or in any other usages of the Cataonians, it is remarkable how utterly all signs of their being a different tribe have disappeared. At any rate, they were once a distinct tribe, but they were annexed by Ariarathes, the first man to be called king of the Cappadocians. 1.3 Cappadocia constitutes the Isthmus, as it were, of a large peninsula bounded by two seas, by that of the Issian Gulf as far as Cilicia Trachea and by that of the Euxin as far as Sinope and the coast of the Tiberini. I mean by peninsula all the country which is west of Cappadocia this side the Isthmus, which by Herodotus is called the country this side the Elise River, for this is the country which in its entirety was ruled by Croesus, whom Herodotus calls the tyrant of the tribes this side the Elise River. However, the writers of today give the name of Asia to the country this side the Taurus, applying to this country the same name as to the whole continent of Asia. This Asia comprises the first nations on the east, the Paplagonians and Phrygians and Lycaonians, and then the Bithynians and Mysians and the Epictetus, and, besides these, the Trode and Hellespontia, and after these, on the sea, the Aeolians and Ionians, who are Greeks, and, among the rest, the Carians and Lycians, and, in the interior, the Lydians. As for the other tribes, I shall speak of them later. 1.4 Cappadocia was divided into two satrapies by the Persians at the time when it was taken over by the Macedonians. The Macedonians willingly allowed one part of the country, but unwillingly the other, to change to kingdoms instead of satrapies, and one of these kingdoms they named Cappadocia proper and Cappadocia near Taurus, and even greater Cappadocia, and the other they named Pontus, though others named it Cappadocia Pontica. As for greater Cappadocia, we at present do not yet know its administrative divisions, for after the death of King Archelaus, Caesar and the Senate decreed that it was a Roman province. But when, in the reign of Archelaus and of the kings who preceded him, the country was divided into ten prefectures, those near the Taurus were reckoned as five in number, I mean Melitene, Cataonia, Cilicia, Tyanitis, and Garsoritis, and Laviancene, Sargerazine, Seravine, Chamanine, and Mormony as the remaining five. The Romans later assigned to the predecessors of Archelaus an eleventh prefecture, taken from Cilicia, I mean the country round Castabala and Sibistra, extending to Derbe, which last had belonged to Antipater the pirate, and to Archelaus they further assigned the part of Cilicia Trachea round Eleusa, and also all the country that had organized the business of piracy. 2.1 Melitene, Melitene is similar to Comagene, for the whole of it is planted with fruit trees, the only country in all Cappadocia of which this is true, so that it produces, not only the olive, but also the monorite wine, which rivals the Greek wines. It is situated opposite to Sophene, and the Euphrates River flows between it and Comagene, which latter borders on it. On the far side of the river is a noteworthy fortress belonging to the Cappadocians, Tamiza by name. This was sold to the ruler of Sophene for 100 talents, but later was presented by Lucullus as a meat of valor to the ruler of Cappadocia who took the field with him in the war against Mithridates. 2.2 Cataonia is a broad hollow plain, and produces everything except evergreen trees. It is surrounded on its southern side by mountains, among others by the Amanus, which is a branch of the Cilician Taurus, and by the Antitaurus, which branches off in the opposite direction, for the Amanus extends from Cataonia to Cilicia and the Syrian Sea towards the west and south, and in this intervening space it surrounds the whole of the Gulf of Esos and the intervening plains of the Cilicians which lie towards the Taurus. But the Antitaurus inclines to the north and takes a slightly easterly direction, and then terminates in the interior of the country. 
2.3 In this Antitaurus are deep and narrow valleys, in which are situated Kamana and the sanctuary of Enyo, whom the people there call Ma. It is a considerable city, its inhabitants, however, consist mostly of the divinely inspired people and the temple servants who live in it. Its inhabitants are Kataonians, who, though in a general way classed as subject to the king, are in most respects subject to the priest. The priest is master of the sanctuary, and also of the temple servants, who on my sojourn there were more than six thousand in number, men and women together. Also, considerable territory belongs to the sanctuary, and the revenue is enjoyed by the priest. He is second in rank in Cappadocia after the king, and in general the priests belong to the same family as the kings. It is thought that Orestes, with his sister Iphigenia, brought these sacred rites here from the Tauric Scythia, the rites in honor of Artemis Tauropolis, and that here they also deposited the hair of mourning, whence the city's name. Now the Saris River flows through this city and passes out through the gorges of the Taurus to the plains of the Cilicians and to the sea that lies below them. 2.4 But the Pyramus, a navigable river with its sources in the middle of the plain, flows through Cataonia. There is a notable pit in the earth through which one can see the water as it runs into a long hidden passage underground and then rises to the surface. If one lets down a javelin from above into the pit, the force of the water resists so strongly that the javelin can hardly be immersed in it. But although it flows in great volume because of its immense depth and breadth, yet, when it reaches the Taurus, it undergoes a remarkable contraction, and remarkable also is the cleft of the mountain through which the stream is carried, for, as in the case of rocks which have been broken and split into two parts, the projections on either side correspond so exactly to the cavities on the other that they could be fitted together, so it was in the case of the rocks I saw there, which, lying above the river on either side and reaching up to the summit of the mountain at a distance of two or three plethora from each other, had cavities corresponding with the opposite projections. The whole intervening bed is rock, and it has a cleft through the middle which is deep and so extremely narrow that a dog or hare could leap across it. This cleft is the channel of the river, is full to the brim, and in breadth resembles a canal, but on account of the crookedness of its course and its great contraction in width and the depth of the gorge, a noise like thunder strikes the ears of travellers long before they reach it. In passing out through the mountains it brings down so much silt to the sea, partly from Cataonia and partly from the Cilician plains, that even an oracle is reported as having been given out in reference to it, as follows, men that are yet to be shall experience this at the time when the Pyramus of the Silver Eddy shall silt up its sacred sea beach and come to Cyprus. Indeed, something similar to this takes place also in Egypt, since the Nile is always turning the sea into dry land by throwing out silt. Accordingly, Herodotus calls Egypt the gift of the Nile, while Homer speaks of Pharos as being out in the open sea, since in earlier times it was not, as now, connected with the mainland of Egypt. 2.514 The third in rank is the priesthood of Zeus Dacius, which, though inferior to that of Enyo, is noteworthy. At this place there is a reservoir of salt water which has the circumference of a considerable lake, it is shut in by brows of hills so high and steep that people go down to it by ladder-like steps. The water, they say, neither increases nor anywhere has a visible outflow. 2.6 Neither the plain of the Cataonians nor the country Melitene has a city, but they have strongholds on the mountains, I mean Azamora and Dastercom, and round the latter flows the Carmelis River. It contains also a sanctuary, that of the Cataonian Apollo, which is held in honor throughout the whole of Cappadocia, the Cappadocians having made it the model of sanctuaries of their own. Neither do the other prefectures, except two, contain cities, and of the remaining prefectures, Sargerazine contains a small town Herpa, and also the Carmelis River, this too emptying into the Cilician Sea. In the other prefectures are Argos, a lofty stronghold near the Taurus, and Nora, now called Neroesis, in which Eumenes held out against a siege for a long time. In my time it served as the treasury of Cezines, who made an attack upon the empire of the Cappadocians. To him belonged also Cadena, which had the royal palace and had the aspect of a city. Situated on the borders of Lycaonia is also a town called Garsoira. This too is said once to have been the metropolis of the country. In Mormoni, at Venassa, is the sanctuary of the Venetian Zeus, which has a settlement of almost 3,000 temple servants and also a sacred territory that is very productive, affording the priest a yearly revenue of 15 talents. He, too, is priest for life, as is the priest at Kamana, and is second in rank after him. 2.7 Only two prefectures have cities, Tyanitis the city Tiana, which lies below the Taurus at the Cilician gates, wherefore all is the easiest and most commonly used pass into Cilicia and Syria. It is called Eusebia near the Taurus, and its territory is for the most part fertile and level. Tiana is situated upon a mound of Semiramis, which is beautifully fortified. Not far from this city are Castabala and Sibistra, towns still nearer to the mountain. 
At Castabala is the sanctuary of the Parasian Artemis, where the priestesses, it is said, walk with naked feet over hot embers without pain. And here, too, some tell us over and over the same story of Orestes and Toropolis, asserting that she was called Parasian because she was brought from the other side. So then, in the prefecture Tyanitis, one of the ten above mentioned is Tiana, I am not enumerating along with these prefectures those that were acquired later, I mean Castabala and Sibistra and the places in Cilicia Trachea, where is Eleusa, a very fertile island, which was settled in a noteworthy manner by Archelaus, who spent the greater part of his time there, whereas Mazica, the metropolis of the tribe, is in the Cilician prefecture, as it is called. This city, too, is called Eusebia, with the additional words near the Argaeus, for it is situated below the Argaeus, the highest mountain of all, whose summit never fails to have snow upon it, and those who ascend it, those are few, say that in clear weather both seas, both the Pontus and the Issean Sea, are visible from it. Now in general Mazica is not naturally a suitable place for the founding of a city, for it is without water and unfortified by nature, and, because of the neglect of the prefects, it is also without walls, perhaps intentionally so, in order that people inhabiting a plain, with hills above it that were advantageous and beyond range of missiles, might not, through too much reliance upon the wall as a fortification, engage in plundering. Further, the districts all round are utterly barren and untilled, although they are level, but they are sandy and are rocky underneath. And, proceeding a little farther on, one comes to plains extending over many stadia that are volcanic and full of fire pits, and therefore the necessaries of life must be brought from a distance. And further, that which seems to be an advantage is attended with peril, for although almost the whole of Cappadocia is without timber, the Argaeus has forests all round it, and therefore the working of timber is close at hand, but the region which lies below the forests also contains fires in many places and at the same time has an underground supply of cold water, although neither the fire nor the water emerges to the surface, and therefore most of the country is covered with grass. In some places, also, the ground is marshy, and at night flames rise therefrom. Now those who are acquainted with the country can work the timber, since they are on their guard, but the country is perilous for most people, and especially for cattle, since they fall into the hidden fire pits. 2.8 There is also a river in the plain before the city, it is called Melus, is about 40 stadia distant from the city, and has its sources in a district that is below the level of the city. For this reason, therefore, it is useless to the inhabitants, since its stream is not in a favorable position higher up, but spreads abroad into marshes and lakes, and in the summertime vitiates the air around the city, and also makes the stone quarry hard to work, though otherwise easy to work for there are ledges of flat stones from which the Mazzacini obtain an abundant supply of stone for their buildings, but when the slabs are concealed by the waters they are hard to obtain. And these marshes, also, are everywhere volcanic. Ariah raids the king, since the Melus had an outlet into the Euphrates by a certain narrow defile, dammed this and converted the neighboring plain into a sea-like lake, and there, shutting off certain all like the Cyclades from the outside world, passed his time there in boyish diversions. But the barrier broke all at once, the water streamed out again, and the Euphrates, thus filled, swept away much of the soil of Cappadocia, and obliterated numerous settlements and plantations, and also damaged no little of the country of the Galatians who held Phrygia. In return for the damage the inhabitants, who gave over the decision of the matter to the Romans, exacted a fine of three hundred talents. The same was the case also in regard to Herpa, for there too he dammed the stream of the Carmelis River, and then, the mouth having broken open and the water having ruined certain districts in Cilicia in the neighborhood of Malos, he paid damages to those who had been wronged. 2.9 However, although the district of the Mazzacini is in many respects not naturally suitable for habitation, the king seemed to have preferred it, because of all places in the country this was nearest to the center of the region which contained timber and stone for buildings, and at the same time provender, of which, being cattle breeders, they needed a very large quantity, for in a way the city was for them a camp and as for their security in general, both that of themselves and of their slaves, they got it from the defences in their strongholds, of which there are many, some belonging to the king and others to their friends. Mazica is distant from Pontus about 800 stadia to the south, from the Euphrates slightly less than double that distance, and from the Cilician gates and the camp of Cyrus a journey of six days by way of Tiana. Tiana is situated at the middle of the journey and is 300 stadia distant from Sibistra. The Mazacini use the laws of Carindas, choosing also a nomadus, who, like the jurisconsults among the Romans, is the expounder of the laws. But Tigranes put the people in bad plight when he overran Cappadocia, for he forced them, one and all, to migrate into Mesopotamia, and it was mostly with these that he settled Tigranocerta. But later, after the capture of Tigranocerta, those who could return home. 2.10 The size of the country is as follows, in breadth, 
from Pontus to the Taurus, about 1,800 stadia, and in length, from Lycaonia and Phrygia to the Euphrates towards the east and Armenia, about 3,000. It is an excellent country, not only in respect to fruits, but particularly in respect to grain and all kinds of cattle. Although it lies farther south than Pontus, it is colder. Bagadania, though level and farthest south of all, for it lies at the foot of the Taurus, produces hardly any fruit-bearing trees, although it is grazed by wild asses, both it and the greater part of the rest of the country, and particularly that round Gar Sawira and Lycaonia and Mormony. In Cappadocia is produced also the ruddle called Sinopean, the best in the world, although the Iberian rivals it. It was named Sinopean because the merchants were wont to bring it down thence to Sinope before the traffic of the Ephesians had penetrated as far as the people of Cappadocia. It is said that also slabs of crystal and of onyx stone were found by the miners of Archelaus near the country of the Galatians. There was a certain place, also, which had white stone that was like ivory in color and yielded pieces of the size of small whetstones, and from these pieces they made handles for their small swords. And there was another place which yielded such large lumps of transparent stone that they were exported. The boundary of Pontus and Cappadocia is a mountain tract parallel to the Taurus, which has its beginning at the western extremities of Chaminan, where is situated Dasmenda, a stronghold with sheer ascent, and extends to the eastern extremities of Laviancene. Both Chaminan and Laviancene are prefectures in Cappadocia. 2.11 It came to pass, as soon as the Romans, after conquering Antiochus, began to administer the affairs of Asia and were forming friendships and alliances both with the tribes and with the kings, that in all other cases they gave this honour to the kings individually, but gave it to the king of Cappadocia and the tribe jointly. And when the royal family died out, the Romans, in accordance with their compact of friendship and alliance with the tribe, conceded to them the right to live under their own laws, but those who came on the embassy not only begged off from the freedom, for they said that they were unable to bear it, but requested that a king be appointed for them. The Romans, amazed that any people should be so tired of freedom, at any rate, they permitted them to choose by vote from their own number whomever they wished. And they chose Uriah Barzans, but in the course of the third generation his family died out, and Archelaus was appointed king, though not related to the people, being appointed by Antony. So much for Greater Cappadocia. As for Cilicia Trachea, which was added to Greater Cappadocia, it is better for me to describe it in my account of the whole of Cilicia. 3.1 Pontus As for Pontus, Mithridates Eupater established himself as king of it, and he held the country bounded by the Elise River as far as the Tiburani and Armenia, and held also, of the country this side the Elise, the region extending to Amastris and to certain parts of Paphlagonia. And he acquired, not only the sea coast towards the west afar as Heraclea, the native land of Heraclides the Platonic philosopher, but also, in the opposite direction, the sea coast extending to Colchis and Lesser Armenia, and this, as we know, he added to Pontus. And in fact this country was comprised within these boundaries when Pompey took it over, upon his overthrow of Mithridates. The parts towards Armenia and those round Colchis he distributed to the potentates who had fought on his side, but the remaining parts he divided into eleven states and added them to Bithynia, so that out of both there was formed a single province. And he gave over to the descendants of Pilimenes the office of king over certain of the Paplagonians situated in the interior between them, just as he gave over the Galatians to the hereditary tetrarchs. But later the Roman prefects made different divisions from time to time, not only establishing kings and potentates, but also, in the case of cities, liberating some and putting others in the hands of potentates and leaving others subject to the Roman people. As I proceed I must speak of things in detail as they now are, but I shall touch slightly upon things as they were in earlier times whenever this is useful. I shall begin at Heraclea, which is the most westerly place in this region. 3.2 Now as one sails into the Euxine Sea from the Propontis, one has on his left the parts which adjoin Byzantium, these belong to the Thracians, and are called the left-hand parts of the Pontus, and on his right the parts which adjoin Chalcedon. The first of these latter belong to the Bithynians, the next to the Marianani, by some also called Caucones, the next to the Paphlagonians as far as the Elise River, and the next to the Pontic Cappadocians and to the people next in order after them as far as Colchis. All these are called the right-hand parts of the Pontus. Now Eupater reigned over the whole of this sea coast, beginning at Colchis and extending as far as Heraclea, but the parts farther on, extending as far as the mouth of the Pontus and Chalcedon, remained under the rule of the king of Bithynia. But when the kings had been overthrown, the Romans preserved the same boundaries, so that Heraclea was added to Pontus and the parts farther on went to the Bithynians. 3.3 Now as for the Bithynians, it is agreed by most writers that, though formerly Mysians, they received this new name from the Thracians the Thracian Bithynians and Thynians who settled the country in question, and they put down as evidences of the tribe of the Bithynians that in Thrace certain people are to this day called Bithynians, and of that of the Thynian, 
that the coast near Apollonia and Samitasis is called Thynias. And the Bebrises, who took up their abode in Mysia before these people, were also Thracians, as I suppose. It is stated that even the Mysians themselves are colonists of those Thracians who are now called Mysians. Such is the account given of these people. 3.4 But all do not give the same account of the Marianani and the Caucones, for Heraclea, they say, is situated in the country of the Marianani, and was founded by the Milesians, but nothing has been said as to who they are or whence they came, nor yet do the people appear characterized by any ethnic difference, either in dialect or otherwise, although they are similar to the Bithynians. Accordingly, it is reasonable to suppose that this tribe also was at first Thracian. Theopompu says that Marianinus ruled over a part of Paphlagonia, which was under the rule of many potentates, and then invaded and took possession of the country of the Bebrises, but left the country which he had abandoned named after himself. This, too, has been said, that the Milesians who were first to found Heraclea forced the Marianani, who held the place before them, to serve as helots, so that they sold them, but not beyond the boundaries of their country, for the two peoples came to an agreement on this, just as the Minoan class, as it is called, were serfs of the Cretans and the Penesty of the Thessalians. 3.5 As for the Cauconians, who, according to report, took up their abode on the seacoast next to the Marianani and extended as far as the Parthenius River, with Tyum as their city, some say that they were Scythians, others that they were a certain people of the Macedonians, and others that they were a certain people of the Pelusgians. But I have already spoken of these people in another place. Callisthenes in his treatise on the marshalling of the ships was for inserting after the words Crumna, Aegilus, and lofty Arathene the words the Cauconians were led by the noble son of Polycles they who lived in glorious dwellings in the neighborhood of the Parthenius River, for, he adds, the Cauconians extended from Heraclea and the Marianani to the white Syrians, whom we call Cappadocians, and the tribe of the Cauconians round Tyum extended to the Parthenius River, whereas that of the Henidae, who held Sidorum, were situated next to them after the Parthenius River, and still today certain Cauconidae live in the neighborhood of the Parthenius River. 3.6 Now Heraclea is a city that has good harbors and is otherwise worthy of note, since, among other things, it has also sent forth colonies, for both Chersonesus and Calidus are colonies from it. It was at first an autonomous city, and then for some time was ruled by tyrants, and then recovered its freedom, but later was ruled by kings, when it became subject to the Romans. The people received a colony of Romans, sharing with them a part of their city and territory. But Adiatorix, the son of Domnacleus, tetrarch of the Galatians, received from Antony that part of the city which was occupied by the Heracleati, and a little before the battle of Actium he attacked the Romans by night and slaughtered them, by permission of Antony, as he alleged. But after the victory at Actium he was led in triumph and slain together with his son. The city belongs to the Pontic province which was united with Bithynia. 3.7 Between Chalcedon and Heraclea flow several rivers, among which are the Silas and the Calpas and the Singarius, which last is mentioned by the poet. The Singarius has its sources near the village Sangia, about 150 stadia from Pesinus. It flows through the greater part of Phrygia Epictetus, and also through a part of Bithynia, so that it is distant from Nicomedia a little more than 300 stadia, reckoning from the place where it is joined by the Gallus River, which has its beginnings at Madra in Phrygia on the Hellespont. This is the same country as Phrygia Epictetus, and it was formerly occupied by the Bithynians. Thus increased, and now having become navigable, though of old not navigable, the river forms a boundary of Bithynia at its outlets. Off this coast lies also the island Thynia. The plant called Aconite grows in the territory of Heraclea. This city is about 1,500 stadia from the Chalcedonian sanctuary and 500 from the Singarius River. 3.8 Tyum is a town that is nothing worthy of mention except that Philoterus, the founder of the family of Italic kings, was from there. Then comes the Parthenius River, which flows through flowery districts and on this account came by its name, it has its sources in Paphlagonia itself. And then comes Paphlagonia and the Aneti. Writers question whom the poet means by the Aneti, when he says, and the rugged heart of Pilimenes led the Paphlagonians, from the land of the Aneti, whence the breed of wild mules, for at the present time, they say, there are no Aneti to be seen in Paphlagonia, though some say that there is a village on the Aegilus ten Shoni distant from Amastris. But Xenodotus writes from Anete, and says that Homer clearly indicates the Amesis of today. And others say that a tribe called Aneti, bordering on the Cappadocians, made an expedition with the Sumerians and then were driven out to the Adriatic Sea. But the thing upon which there is general agreement is, that the Aneti, to whom Pilimenes belonged, were the most notable tribe of the Paphlagonians, and that, furthermore, these made the expedition with him in very great numbers, but, losing their leader, crossed over to Thrace after the capture of Troy, and on their wanderings went to the Anetian country, 
as it is now called. According to some writers, Antonor and his children took part in this expedition and settled at the recess of the Adriatic, as mentioned by me in my account of Italy. It is therefore reasonable to suppose that it was on this account that the Anetti disappeared and are not to be seen in Paphlagonia. 3.9 As for the Paphlagonians, they are bounded on the east by the Elise River, which, according to Herodotus, flows from the south between the Syrians and the Paphlagonians and empties into the Euxin Sea, as it is called, by Syrians, however, he means the Cappadocians, and in fact they are still today called White Syrians, while those outside the Taurus are called Syrians. As compared with those this side the Taurus, those outside have a tan complexion, while those this side do not, and for this reason receive the appellation white. And Pinder says that the Amazons swayed a Syrian army that reached afar with their spears, thus clearly indicating that their abode was in Themisira. Themisira is in the territory of the Amiseni, and this territory belongs to the white Syrians, who live in the country next after the Elise River. On the east, then, the Paplagonians are bounded by the Elise River, on the south by Phrygians and the Galatians who settled among them, on the west by the Bithynians and the Marianani, for the race of the Cauconians has everywhere been destroyed, and on the north by the Euxin. Now this country was divided into two parts, the interior and the part on the sea, each stretching from the Elise River to Bithynia, and Eupater not only held the coast as far as Heraclea, but also took the nearest part of the interior, certain portions of which extended across the Elise, and the boundary of the Pontic province has been marked off by the Romans as far as this. The remaining parts of the interior, however, were subject to potentates, even after the overthrow of Mithridates. Now as for the Paplagonians in the interior, I mean those not subject to Mithridates, I shall discuss them later, but at present I propose to describe the country which was subject to him, called the Pontus. 3.10 After the Parthenius River, then, one comes to Amastris, a city bearing the same name as the woman who founded it. It is situated on a peninsula and has harbours on either side of the isthmus. Amastris was the wife of Dionysius the tyrant of Heraclea and the daughter of Oxyathers, the brother of the Darius whom Alexander fought. Now she formed the city out of four settlements, Sesimus and Sidorum and Cromna, which Homer mentions in his marshalling of the Paplagonian ships, and, fourth, Tyim. This part, however, soon revolted from the united city, but the other three remained together, and, of these three, Sesimus is called the Acropolis of Amastris. Sidorum was once the emporium of the Sinopeans, it was named after Cytarus, the son of Phrixus, as Ephorus says. The most and the best boxwood grows in the territory of Amastris, and particularly round Sidorum. The Aegilus is a long shore of more than a hundred stadia, and it has also a village bearing the same name, which the poet mentions when he says, Cromna and Aegilus and the lofty Erythini, though some write, Cromna and Cobulus. They say that the Erythrini of today, from their color, used to be called Erythini, they are two lofty rocks. After Aegilus one comes to Carambes, a great cape extending towards the north and the Scythian Chersonese. I have often mentioned it, as also Cryamitop and which lies opposite it, by which the Euxin Pontus is divided into two seas. After Carambes one comes to Sinalus, and to Antisinalus, and to Abo Nuticus, a small town, and to Armine, to which pertains the proverb, whoever had no work to do walled Armine. It is a village of the Sinopeans and has a harbour. 3.11 Then one comes to Sinope itself, which is fifty stadia distant from Armine, it is the most noteworthy of the cities in that part of the world. This city was founded by the Milesians, and, having built a naval station, it reigned over the sea inside the Cyanii, and shared with the Greeks in many struggles even outside the Cyanii, and, although it was independent for a long time, it could not eventually preserve its freedom, but was captured by siege, and was first enslaved by Pharnaces and afterwards by his successors down to Eupater and to the Romans who overthrew Eupater. Eupater was both born and reared at Sinope, and he accorded it a special honour and treated it as the metropolis of his kingdom. Sinope is beautifully equipped both by nature and by human foresight, for it is situated on the neck of a peninsula, and has on either side of the isthmus harbours and roadsteads and wonderful Pelamids fisheries, of which I have already made mention, saying that the Sinopeans get the second catch and the Byzantians the third. Furthermore, the peninsula is protected all round by ridgy shores, which have hollowed out places in them, rock cavities, as it were, which the people call shonicides, these are filled with water when the sea rises, and therefore the place is hard to approach, not only because of this, but also because the whole surface of the rock is prickly and impassable for bare feet. Higher up, however, and above the city, the ground is fertile and adorned with diversified market gardens, and especially the suburbs of the city. The city itself is beautifully walled, and is also splendidly adorned with gymnasium and marked place and colonnades. But although it was such a city, still it was twice captured, first by Pharnaces, who unexpectedly attacked it all of a sudden, 
and later by Lucullus and by the tyrant who was garrisoned within it, being besieged both inside and outside at the same time. For, since Bacchides, who had been set up by the king as commander of the garrison, was always suspecting treason from the people inside, and was causing many outrages and murders, he made the people, who were unable either nobly to defend themselves or to submit by compromise, lose all heart for either course. At any rate, the city was captured, and though Lucullus kept intact the rest of the city's adornments, he took away the globe of Bilirus and the work of Sthenis, the statue of Autolycus, whom they regarded as founder of their city and honoured as God. The city had also an oracle of Autolycus. He is thought to have been one of those who went on the voyage with Jason and to have taken possession of this place. Then later the Milesians, seeing the natural advantages of the place and the weakness of its inhabitants, appropriated it to themselves and sent forth colonists to it. But at present it has received also a colony of Romans, and a part of the city and the territory belong to these. It is 3,500 stadia distant from the Ieran, 2,000 from Heraclea, and 700 from Carambes. It has produced excellent men, among the philosophers, Diogenes the Cynic and Timotheus Patrian, among the poets, Diphilus the comic poet, and, among the historians, Baton, who wrote the work entitled the Persica. 3.12 thence, next, one comes to the outlet of the Elise River. It was named from the Halley, past which it flows. It has its sources in Greater Cappadocia in Camasene near the Pontic country, and, flowing in great volume towards the west, and then turning towards the north through Galatia and Paphlagonia, it forms the boundary between these two countries and the country of the White Syrians. Both Sinopitus and all the mountainous country extending as far as Bithynia and lying above the aforesaid seaboard have shipbuilding timber that is excellent and easy to transport. Sinopitus produces also the maple and the mountain nut, the trees from which they cut the wood used for tables. And the whole of the tilled country situated a little above the sea is planted with olive trees. 3.13 After the outlet of the Elise comes Gazelanitis, which extends to Ceramene, it is a fertile country and is everywhere level and productive of everything. It is also a sheep industry, that of raising flocks clothed in skins and yielding soft wool, of which there is a very great scarcity throughout the whole of Cappadocia and Pontus. The country also produces gazelles, of which there is a scarcity elsewhere. One part of this country is occupied by the Amiseni, but the other was given to Deodorus by Pompey, as also the regions of Pharnacia and Trapezusia as far as Colchis and Lesser Armenia. Pompey appointed him king of all these, when he was already in possession of his ancestral Galatian Tetrarchy, the country of the Toilus de Bagiae. But since his death there have been many successors to his territories. 3.14 After Gazellan one comes to Ceramene, and to a notable city, Amesis, which is about 900 stadia from Sinope. Theopompus says that it was first founded by the Milesians, by a leader of the Cappadocians, and thirdly was colonized by Athenocles and Athenians and changed its name to Piraeus. The kings also took possession of this city, and Eupater adorned it with sanctuaries and founded an addition to it. This city too was besieged by Lucullus, and then by Pharnaces, when he crossed over from the Bosporus. After it had been set free by the deified Caesar, it was given over to kings by Antony. Then Straton the tyrant put it in bad plight. And then, after the battle of Actium, it was again set free by Augustus Caesar, and at the present time it is well organized. Besides the rest of its beautiful country, it possesses also Themisira, the abode of the Amazons, and Sidon. 3.15 Themisira is a plain, on one side it is washed by the sea and is about 60 stadia distant from the city, and on the other side it lies at the foot of the mountainous country, which is well wooded and coursed by streams that have their sources therein. So one river, called the Thermoden, being supplied by all these streams, flows out through the plain, and another river similar to this, which flows out of Phanaria, as it is called, flows out through the same plain, and is called the Iris. It has its sources in Pontus itself, and, after flowing through the middle of the city Camana and Pontus and through Dasimonitis, a fertile plain, towards the west, then turns towards the north past Gazura itself an ancient royal residence, though now deserted, and then bends back again towards the east, after receiving the waters of the Silax and other rivers, and after flowing past the very wall of Amasea, my fatherland, a very strongly fortified city, flows on into Phanaria. Here the Lycus River, which has its beginnings in Armenia, joins it, and itself also becomes the Iris. Then the stream is received by Themisira and by the Pontic Sea. On this account the plain in question is always moist and covered with grass and can support herds of cattle and horses alike and admits of the sowing of millet seeds and sorghum seeds in very great, or rather unlimited, quantities. Indeed, their plenty of water offsets any drought, so that no famine comes down on these people, never once, and the country along the mountain yields so much fruit, self-grown and wild, 
I mean grapes and pears and apples and nuts, that those who go out to the forest at any time in the year get an abundant supply the fruits at one time still hanging on the trees and at another lying on the fallen leaves or beneath them, which are shed deep and in great quantities. And numerous, also, are the catches of all kinds of wild animals, because of the good yield of food. 3.16 After Themyscira 1 comes to Sidon, which is a fertile plain, though it is not well watered like Themyscira. It has strongholds on the seaboard, side, after which Sidon was named, and Chabaca and Fabda. Now the territory of Amesis extends to this point, and the city has produced men noteworthy for their learning, Demetrius, the son of Rathenus, and Dionysodorus, the mathematicians, the latter bearing the same name as the Melian geometer, and Tyrrhenian the grammarian, of whom I was a pupil. 3.17 After Sidon 1 comes to Pharnacia, a fortified town, and afterwards to Trapezus, a Greek city, to which the voyage from Amesis is about 2,200 stadia. Then from here the voyage to Phasis is approximately 1,400 stadia, so that the distance from Yaron to Phasis is, all told, about 8,000 stadia, or slightly more or less. As one sails along this seaboard from Amesis, one comes first to the Heraclean Cape, and then to another cape called Iasonium, and to Genetes, and then to a town called Kotyra, from the inhabitants of which Pharnacia was settled, and then to Ishopolis, now in ruins, and then to a gulf, on which are both Saracis and Hermonassa, moderate-sized settlements, and then, near Hermonassa, to Trapezus, and then to Colchis. Somewhere in this neighborhood is also a settlement called Zygopolis. Now I have already described Colchis and the coast which lies above it. 3.18 Above Trapezus and Pharnacia are situated the Tiburani and Chaldan Sani, in earlier times called Macrones, and Lesser Armenia, and the Apati, in earlier times called the Circite, are fairly close to these regions. Two mountains cross the country of these people, not only the Sidizes, a very rugged mountain, which joins the Moschian mountains above Colchis, its heights are occupied by the Heptacomedy, but also the Periadres, which extends from the region of Sidon and Themyscira to Lesser Armenia and forms the eastern side of Pontus. Now all these peoples who live in the mountains are utterly savage, but the Heptacomedy are worse than the rest. Some also live in trees or turrets, and it was on this account that the ancients called them Mosinish, the turrets being called Mosini. They live on the flesh of wild animals and on nuts, and they also attack wayfarers, leaping down upon them from their scaffolds. The Heptacomedy cut down three maniples of Pompey's army when they were passing through the mountainous country, for they mixed bowls of the crazing honey which is yielded by the tree twigs, and placed them in the roads, and then, when the soldiers drank the mixture and lost their senses, they attacked them and easily disposed of them. Some of these barbarians were also called viziers. 3.19 The Chaldev today were in ancient times named Chalibes, and it is just opposite their territory that Pharnacia is situated, which, on the sea, has the natural advantages of Pelamids fishing, for it is here that this fish is first caught, and, on the land, has the mines, only iron mines at the present time, though in earlier times it also had silver mines. Upon the whole, the seaboard in this region is extremely narrow, for the mountains, full of mines and forests, are situated directly above it, and not much of it is tilled. But there remains for the miners their livelihood from the mines, and for those who busy themselves on the sea their livelihood from their fishing, and especially from their catches of pelamids and dolphins, for the dolphins pursue the schools of fish the corgile and the tunny fish and the pelamids themselves, and they not only grow fat on them, but also become easy to catch because they are rather eager to approach the land. These are the only people who cut up the dolphins, which are caught with bait, and use their abundance of fat for all purposes. 3.20 So it is these people, I think, that the poet calls Alizoni, mentioning them next the after Paplagonians in his catalogue. But the Halicines were led by Adias and Epistrophus, from Alibi far away, where is the birthplace of silver, since the text has been changed from Chalibi far away or else the people were in earlier times called Alibis instead of Chalibis, for at the present time it proves impossible that they should have been called Chalde, deriving their name from Chalibi, if in earlier times they could not have been called Chalibis instead of Alibis, and that too when names undergo many changes, particularly among the barbarians, for instance, certain of the Thracians were called Sintes, then Sinti and then Sai, in whose country Archilochus says he flung away his shield, one of the Sai robbed me of my shield, which, a blameless weapon, I left behind me beside a bush, against my will. These same people are now named Sawe, for all these have their abode round Abdera and the islands round Limnos. Likewise the Brygian Bryges and Phryges are the same people, and the Messian Meones and Myones are the same, but there is no use of enlarging on the subject. The Skepsian doubts the alteration of the name from Alibes to Chalibes, and, failing to note what follows and what accords with it, and especially why the poet calls the Chalibians Alizoni, he rejects this opinion. 
As for me, let me place his assumption and those of the other critics side by side with my own and consider them. 3.21 Some change the text and make it read Alazones, others Amazon, and for the words from Alibi they read from Alapi, or from Alob, calling the Scythians beyond the Baristhenes River Alazones, and also Calipidae and other names names which Hellenicus and Herodotus and Eutyxus have foisted on us and placing the Amazons between Mysia and Caria and Lydia near Syme, which is the opinion also of Ephorus, who was a native of Syme. And this opinion might perhaps not be unreasonable, for he may mean the country which was later settled by the Aeolians and the Ionians, but earlier by the Amazons. And there are certain cities, it is said, which got their names from the Amazons, I mean Ephesus, Smyrna, Syme, and Myrna. But how could Alibi, or, as some call it, Alipi or Alobe, be found in this region, and how about far away, and how about the birthplace of silver? 3.22 These objections Ephorus solves by his change of the text, for he writes thus, But the Halicines were led by Adias and Epistrophus, from Alipi far away, where is the race of Amazons? But in solving these objections he has fallen into another fiction, for Alipi is nowhere to be found in this region, and, further, his change of the text, with innovations so contrary to the evidence of the early manuscripts, looks like rashness. But the Skepsian apparently accepts neither the opinion of Ephorus nor of those who suppose them to be the Alizoni near Polini, whom I have mentioned in my description of Macedonia. He is also at loss to understand how anyone could think that an allied force came to help the Trojans from the nomads beyond the Baristhenes river, and he especially approves of the opinions of Hecateus of Miletus, and of Menecrates of Elea, one of the disciples of Xenocrates, and also of that of Palephatus. The first of these says in his circuit of the earth, near the city Alasia is the river Odrysus, which flows out of Lake Dasilitis from the west through the plain of Migdonia and empties into the Rindicus. But he goes on to say that Alasia is now deserted, and that many villages of the Alazones, through whose country the Odrysus flows, are inhabited, and that in these villages Apollo is accorded exceptional honor, and particularly on the confines of the Cyzacene. Menecrates in his work entitled The Circuit of the Hellespont says that above the region of Merlia there is an adjacent mountainous tract which is occupied by the tribe of the Halicines. One should spell the name with two L's, he says, but on account of the meter the poet spells it with only one. But Pelephatus says that it was from the Amazons who then lived in Alapi, but now in Zelia, that Adias and Epistrophus made their expedition. How, then, can the opinions of these men deserve approval? 4. Apart from the fact that these men also disturbed the early text, they neither show us the silver mines, nor where in the territory of Merlia Alapi is, nor how those who went from there to Ilium were from far away, even if one should grant that there actually was an Alapi or Alasia, for these, of course, are much nearer the Trode than the places round Ephesus. But still those who speak of the Amazons as living in the neighborhood of Pigala between Ephesus and Magnesia and Priene talk nonsense, Demetrius says, for, he adds, far away cannot apply to that region. How much more inapplicable, then, is it to the region of Mysia and Tuthrania? 3.23 Yes, by Zeus, but he goes on to say that some things are arbitrarily inserted in the text, for example, from Ascania far away, and Erneas was his name, for his revered mother had given him this name at his birth, and Penelope took the bent key in her strong hand. Now let this be granted, but those other things are not to be granted to which Demetrius assents without even making a plausible reply to those who have assumed that we ought to read from Chalibi far away for although he concedes that, even if the silver mines are not now in the country of the Chalabians, they could have been there in earlier times, he does not concede that other point, that they were both famous and worthy of note, like the iron mines. But, one might ask, what is there to prevent them from being famous like the iron mines? Or can an abundance of iron make a place famous but an abundance of silver not do so? And if the silver mines had reached fame, not in the time of the heroes, but in the time of Homer, could any person find fault with the assertion of the poet? How, pray, could their fame have reached the poet? How, pray, could the fame of the copper mine at Temesa in Italy have reached him? How the fame of the wealth of Thebes in Egypt, although he was about twice as far from Thebes as from the Chaldeans. But Demetrius is not even in agreement with those for whose opinions he pleads, for in fixing the sites round Skepsis, his birthplace, he speaks of Nia, a village, and of Argyria and Alazonia as near Skepsis and the Aesopus River. These places, then, if they really exist, would be near the sources of the Aesopus, but Hecateus speaks of them as beyond the outlets of it, and Palephatus, although he says that they formerly lived in Alapi, but now in Zelia, says nothing like what these men say. But if Menecrates does so, not even he tells us what kind of a place Alapi is or Alope, or however they wish to write the name, and neither does Demetrius himself. 3.24 As regards Apollodorus, 
who discusses the same subject in his marshalling of the Trojan forces, I have already said much in answer to him, but I must now speak again, for he does not think that we should take the Elysoni as living outside the Elise River, for, he says, no allied force came to the Trojans from beyond the Elise. First, therefore, we shall ask of him who are the Elysoni this side the Elise and from Alibi far away, where is the birthplace of silver? For he will be unable to tell us. And we shall next ask him the reason why he does not concede that an allied force came also from the country on the far side of the river, for, if it is the case that all the rest of the allied forces except the Thracians live this side the river, there was nothing to prevent this one allied force from coming from the far side of the Elise, from the country beyond the white Syrians. Or was it possible for peoples who fought the Trojans to cross over from these regions and from the regions beyond, as they say the Amazons and Traers and Sumerians did, and yet impossible for people who fought as allies with them to do so? Now the Amazons would not fight on Priam's side because of the fact that he had fought against them as an ally of the Phrygians, against the Amazons, peers of men, who came at that time, as Priam says, for I too, being their ally, was numbered among them, but since the peoples whose countries bordered on that of the Amazons were not even far enough away to make difficult the Trojan summons for help from their countries, and since, too, there was no underlying cause for hatred, there was nothing to prevent them, I think, from being allies of the Trojans. 3.25 Neither can Apollodorus impute such an opinion to the early writers, as though they, one and all, voiced the opinion that no peoples from the far side of the Elise River took part in the Trojan War. One might rather find evidence to the contrary, at any rate, Meandrius says that the Aneti first set forth from the country of the white Syrians and allied themselves with the Trojans, and that they sailed away from Troy with the Thracians and took up their abode round the recess of the Adrius, but that the Aneti who did not have a part in the expedition had become Cappadocians. The following might seem to agree with this account, I mean the fact that the whole of that part of Cappadocia near the Elise River which extends along Paphlagonia uses two languages which abound in Paphlagonian names, as Begas, Biases, Eniates, Retotes, Zardasas, Tibias, Gassus, Oligassus, and Manes, for these names are prevalent in Bamanitis, Pimelitis, Gazelanitis, Gazasene and most of the other districts. Apollodorus himself quotes the Homeric verse as written by Xenodotus, stating that he writes it as follows. From Anete, whence the breed of the wild mules, and he says that Hecateus takes Anete to be Amesis. But, as I have already stated, Amesis belongs to the white Syrians and is outside the Elise River. 3.26 Apollodorus somewhere states, also, that the poet got an account of those Paplagonians who lived in the interior from men who had passed through the country on foot, but that he was ignorant of the Paplagonian coast, just as he was ignorant of the rest of the Pontic coast, for otherwise he would have named them. On the contrary, one can retort and say, on the basis of the description which I have now given, that Homer traverses the whole of the coast and omits nothing of the things that were then worth recording, and that it is not at all remarkable if he does not mention Heraclea and Amastris and Sinope, cities which had not yet been founded, and that it is not at all strange if he has mentioned no part of the interior. And further, the fact that Homer does not name many of the known places is no sign of ignorance, as I have already demonstrated in the foregoing part of my work for he says that Homer was ignorant of many of the famous things round the Pontus, for example, rivers and tribes, for otherwise, he says, Homer would have named them. This one might grant in the case of certain very significant things, for example, the Scythians and Lake Meotis and the Ister River, for otherwise Homer would not have described the nomads by significant characteristics as Galactophagi and Abai and as men most just, and also as proud Hippomalgi, and yet fail to call the Scythians either Sorimati or Sarmati, if indeed they were so named by the Greeks, nor yet, when he mentions the Thracians and Mysians, pass by the Ister River in silence, greatest of the rivers, and especially when he is inclined to mark the boundaries of places by rivers, nor yet, when he mentions the Sumerians, omit any mention of the Bosporus or Lake Meotis. 3.27 But in the case of things not so significant, either not at that time or for the purposes of his work, how could anyone find fault with Homer for omitting them? For example, for omitting the Tanais River, which is well known for no other reason than that it is the boundary between Asia and Europe but the people of that time were not yet using either the name Asia or Europe, nor yet had the inhabited world been divided into three continents as now, for otherwise he would have named them somewhere because of their very great significance, just as he mentions Libya and also the Lips, the wind that blows from the western parts of Libya. But since the continents had not yet been distinguished, there was no need of mentioning the Tanais either. Many things were indeed worthy of mention, but they did not occur to him, for of course adventitiousness is much in evidence both in one's discourse and in one's actions. From all these facts it is clear that every man who judges from the poet's failure to mention anything that he is ignorant of that thing uses faulty evidence. And it is necessary to set forth several examples to prove that it is faulty, 
for many use such evidence to a great extent. We must therefore rebuke them when they bring forward such evidences, even though in so doing I shall be repeating previous argument. For example, in the case of rivers, if anyone should say that the poet is ignorant of some river because he does not name it, I shall say that his argument is silly, because the poet does not even name the Meles River, which flows past Smyrna, the city which by most writers is called his birthplace, although he names the Hermas and Hillis rivers, neither does he name the Pactolus River, which flows into the same channel as these two rivers and rises in Molus, a mountain which he mentions, neither does he mention Smyrna itself, nor the rest of the Ionian cities, nor the most of the Aeolian cities, though he mentions Miletus and Samos and Lesbos and Tenedos, nor yet the Lethaeus River, which flows past Magnesia, nor the Marsias River, which rivers empty into the Meander, which last he mentions by name, as also the Rhesus and Heptoporus and Choresus and Rhodius, and the rest, most of which are no more than small streams. And when he names both many countries and cities, he sometimes names with them the rivers and mountains, but sometimes he does not. At any rate, he does not mention the rivers in Aetolia or Attica, nor in several other countries. Besides, if he mentions rivers far away and yet does not mention those that are very near, it is surely not because he was ignorant of them, since they were known to all others. Nor yet, surely, was he ignorant of peoples that were equally near, some of which he names and some not, for example he names the Lycians and the Salome, but not the Milii, nor yet the Pamphylians or Pisidians, and though he names the Paplagonians, Phrygians, and Mysians, he does not name the Marianani, and he mentions the Amazons, but not the White Syrians, or Cappadocians, or Lycaonians, though he repeatedly mentions the Phoenicians and the Egyptians and the Ethiopians. And although he mentions the Aulian Plain and the Arimi, he is silent as to the tribe to which both belong. Such a test of the poet, therefore, is false, but the test is true only when it is shown that some false statement is made by him. But Apollodorus has not been proved correct in this case either, I mean when he was bold enough to say that the proud Hippomalgi and Galactophagi were fabrications of the poet. So much for Apollodorus. I now return to the part of my description that comes next in order. 3.28 Above the region of Pharnacia and Trapezus are the Tiberini and the Chalde, whose country extends to Lesser Armenia. This country is fairly fertile. Lesser Armenia, like Sophene, was always in the possession of potentates, who at times were friendly to the other Armenians and at times minded their own affairs. They held as subjects the Chalda and the Tiberini, and therefore their empire extended to Trapezus and Pharnacia. But when Mithridates Eupater had increased in power, he established himself as master, not only of Colchis, but also of all these places, these having been ceded to him by Antipater, the son of Sisus. And he cared so much for these places that he built seventy-five strongholds in them and therein deposited most of his treasures. The most notable of these strongholds were these, Hydara and Baskitariza and Sinoria. Sinoria was close to the borders of Greater Armenia, and this is why Theophanes changed its spelling to Sinoria. For as a whole the mountainous range of the Periadres has numerous suitable places for such strongholds, since it is well watered and woody, and is in many places marked by sheer ravines and cliffs, at any rate, it was here that most of his fortified treasuries were built, and at last, in fact, Mithridates fled for refuge into these farthermost parts of the kingdom of Pontus, when Pompey invaded the country, and having seized a well-watered mountain near Dastyra in Asilocene, nearby, also, was the Euphrates, which separates Asilocene from Lesser Armenia, he stayed there until he was besieged and forced to flee across the mountains into Colchis and from there to the Bosporus. Near this place, in Lesser Armenia, Pompey built a city, Nicopolis, which endures even to this day and is well peopled. 3.29 Now as for Lesser Armenia, it was ruled by different persons at different times, according to the will of the Romans, and finally by Archelaus. But the Tiberini and Chalde, extending as far as Colchis, and Pharnacia and Trapezus are ruled by Pythodorus, a woman who is wise and qualified to preside over affairs of state. She is the daughter of Pythodorus of Trelles. She became the wife of Polemon and reigned along with him for a time, and then, when he died in the country of the Aspergiani, as they are called, one of the barbarian tribes round Sindus, she succeeded to the rulership. She had two sons and a daughter by Polemon. Her daughter was married to Cotus the Sapian, but he was treacherously slain, and she lived in widowhood, because she had children by him, and the eldest of these is now in power. As for the sons of Pythodorus, one of them as a private citizen is assisting his mother in the administration of her empire, whereas the other has recently been established as king of Greater Armenia. She herself married Archelaus and remained with him to the end, but she is living in widowhood now, and is in possession not only of the places above mentioned, but also of others still more charming, which I shall describe next. 3.30 Sidon and Themisira are contiguous to Pharnacia. And above these lies Phanaria, 
which has the best portion of Pontus, for it is planted with olive trees, abounds in wine, and is all the other goodly attributes a country can have. On its eastern side it is protected by the Periadres mountain, in its length lying parallel to that mountain, and on its western side by the Lithrus and Ophlamus mountains. It forms a valley of considerable breadth as well as length, and it is traversed by the Lycus river, which flows from Armenia, and by the Iris, which flows from the narrow passes near Amasaya. The two rivers meet at about the middle of the valley, and at their junction is situated a city which the first man who subjugated it called Eupatoria after his own name, but Pompey found it only half finished and added to it territory and settlers, and called it Magnopolis. Now this city is situated in the middle of the plain, but Cabera is situated close to the very foothills of the Periadres Mountains about 150 stadia farther south than Magnopolis, the same distance that Amasaya is farther west than Magnopolis. It was at Cabera that the palace of Mithridates was built, and also the water mill, and here were the zoological gardens, and, nearby, the hunting grounds, and the mines. 3.31 Here, also, is Canaan Corian, as it is called, a rock that is sheer and fortified by nature, being less than 200 stadia distant from Cabera. It has on its summit a spring that sends forth much water, and at its foot a river and a deep ravine. The height of the rock above the neck is immense, so that it is impregnable, and it is enclosed by remarkable walls, except the part where they have been pulled down by the Romans. And the whole country around is so overgrown with forests, and so mountainous and waterless, that it is impossible for an enemy to encamp within 120 stadia. Here it was that the most precious of the treasures of Mithridates were kept, which are now stored in the Capitolium, where they were dedicated by Pompey. Pythodorus possesses the whole of this country, which is adjacent to the barbarian country occupied by her, and also Zelitis and Megalopolitis. As for Cabera, which by Pompey had been built into a city and called Diospolis, Pythodorus further adorned it and changed its name to Sebaste, and she uses the city as a royal residence. It is also the sanctuary of men of Pharnaces, as it is called, the village city Ameria, which has many temple servants, and also a sacred territory, the fruit of which is always reaped by the ordained priest. And the kings revered this sanctuary so exceedingly that they proclaimed the royal oath as follows, by the fortune of the king and by men of Pharnaces. And this is also the sanctuary of Selene, like that among the Albanians and those in Phrygia, I mean that of men in the place of the same name and that of men Ascaeus near the Antiochia that is near Pisidia and that of men in the country of the Antiochians. 3.32 Above Phanaria is the Pontic Kamana, which bears the same name as the Kamana in Greater Cappadocia, having been consecrated to the same goddess and copied after that city, and I might almost say that the courses which they have followed in their sacrifices, in their divine obsessions, and in their reverence for their priests, are about the same, and particularly in the times of the kings who reigned before this, I mean in the times when twice a year, during the exoduses of the goddess, as they are called, the priest wore a diadem and ranked second in honor after the king. 3.33 Heretofore I have mentioned Dorilos the tactician, who was my mother's great-grandfather, and also a second Dorilos, who was the nephew of the former and the son of Philaterus, saying that, although he had received all the greatest honors from Eupater and in particular the priesthood of Kamana, he was caught trying to cause the kingdom to revolt to the Romans, and when he was overthrown, the family was cast into disrepute along with him. But long afterwards Moaferns, my mother's uncle, came into distinction just before the dissolution of the kingdom, and again they were unfortunate along with the king, both Moaferns and his relatives, except some who revolted from the king beforehand, as did my maternal grandfather, who, seeing that the cause of the king was going badly in the war with Lucullus, and at the same time being alienated from him out of wrath at his recently having put to death his cousin Tibius and Tibius' son Theophilus, set out to avenge both them and himself, and, taking pledges from Lucullus, he caused fifteen garrisons to revolt to him, and although great promises were made in return for these services, yet, when Pompey, who succeeded Lucullus in the conduct of the war, went over, he took for enemies all who had in any way favoured Lucullus, because of the hatred which had arisen between himself and Lucullus, and when he finished the war and returned home, he won so completely that the Senate would not ratify those honours which Lucullus had promised to certain of the people of Pontus, for, he said, it was unjust, when one man had brought the war to a successful issue, that the prizes and the distribution of the reward should be placed in the hands of another man. 3.34 Now in the times of the kings the affairs of Kamana were administered in the manner already described, but when Pompey took over the authority, he appointed Archelaus priest and included within his boundaries, in addition to the sacred land, a territory of two shoni, that is, sixty stadia, in circuit and ordered the inhabitants to obey his rule. Now he was governor of these, and also master of the temple servants who lived in the city, except that he was not empowered to sell them. And even here the temple servants were no fewer in number than six thousand. 
This Archelaus was the son of the Archelaus who was honored by Sulla and the Senate, and was also a friend of Gabinius, a man of consular rank. When Gabinius was sent into Syria, Archelaus himself also went there in the hope of sharing with him in his preparations for the Parthian War, but since the Senate would not permit him, he dismissed that hope and found another of greater importance. For it happened at that time that Ptolemaeus, the father of Cleopatra, had been banished by the Egyptians, and his daughter, elder sister of Cleopatra, was in possession of the kingdom, and since a husband of royal family was being sought for her, Archelaus proffered himself to her agents, pretending that he was the son of Mithridates Eupater, and he was accepted, but he reigned only six months. Now this Archelaus was slain by Gabinius in a pitched battle, when the latter was restoring Ptolemaeus to his kingdom. 3.35 But his son succeeded to the priesthood, and then later, like Amedes, to whom was assigned an additional territory of 400 shoni, but now that he has been deposed, the office is held by Ditutus, son of Adiatorix, who is thought to have obtained the honor from Augustus Caesar because of his excellent qualities, for Caesar, after leading Adiatorix in triumph together with his wife and children, resolved to put him to death together with the eldest of his sons, for Ditutus was the eldest, but when the second of the brothers told the soldiers who were leading them away to execution that he was the eldest, there was a contest between the two for a long time, until the parents persuaded Ditutus to yield the victory to the younger, for he, they said, being more advanced in age, would be a more suitable guardian for his mother and for the remaining brother. And thus, they say, the younger was put to death with his father, whereas the elder was saved and obtained the honor of the priesthood. For learning about this, as it seems, after the men had already been put to death, Caesar was grieved, and he regarded the survivors as worthy of his favor and care, giving them the honor in question. 3.36 Now Kamana is a populous city and is a notable emporium for the people from Armenia, and at the times of the exoduses of the goddess people assemble there from everywhere, from both the cities and the country, men together with women, to attend the festival. And there are certain others, also, who in accordance with a vow are always residing there performing sacrifices in honor of the goddess. And the inhabitants live in luxury, and all their property is planted with vines, and there is a multitude of women who make gain from their persons, most of whom are dedicated to the goddess, for in a way the city is a lesser Corinth, for there too, on account of the multitude of courtesans, who were sacred to Aphrodite, outsiders resorted in great numbers and kept holiday. And the merchants and soldiers who went there squandered all their money so that the following proverb arose in reference to them, not for every man is the voyage to Corinth. Such, then, is my account of Kamana. 3.37 The whole of the country around is held by Pythodorus, to whom belong, not only Phanaria, but also Zelitus and Megalopolitus. Concerning Phanaria I have already spoken. As for Zelitus, it has a city Zela, fortified on a mound of Semiramis, with the sanctuary of Anitus, who is also revered by the Armenians. Now the sacred rites performed here are characterized by greater sanctity, and it is here that all the people of Pontus make their oaths concerning their matters of greatest importance. The large number of temple servants and the honors of the priests were, in the time of the kings, of the same type as I have stated before, but at the present time everything is in the power of Pythodorus. Many persons had abused and reduced both the multitude of temple servants and the rest of the resources of the sanctuary. The adjacent territory, also, was reduced, having been divided into several domains I mean Zelitis, as it is called, which has the city Zela on a mound, for in, early times the kings governed Zela, not as a city, but as a sacred precinct of the Persian gods, and the priest was the master of the whole thing. It was inhabited by the multitude of temple servants, and by the priest, who had an abundance of resources, and the sacred territory as well as that of the priest was subject to him and his numerous attendants. Pompey added many provinces to the boundaries of Zelitis, and named Zela, as he did Megalopolis, a city, and he united the latter and Kalupin and Camusene into one state the latter two border on both Lesser Armenia and Laviancene, and they contain rock salt, and also an ancient fortress called Camisa, now in ruins. The later Roman prefects assigned a portion of these two governments to the priests of Camana, a portion to the priest of Zela, and a portion to Aetporix, a dynast of the family of Tetrarchs of Galatia, but now that Aetporix has died, this portion, which is not large, is subject to the Romans, being called a province, and this little state is a political organization of itself the people having incorporated Karana into it, from which fact its country is called Karanitis, whereas the rest is held by Pythodorus and Ditutus. 3.38 There remain to be described the parts of the Pontus which lie between this country and the countries of the Amosenians and Sinopeans, which latter extend towards Cappadocia and Galatia and Paphlagonia. Now after the territory of the Amosenians, and extending to the Elise River, is Phasimonitis, which Pompey named Neapolites, proclaiming the settlement at the village Phasimon a city and calling it Neapolis. 
the northern side of this country is bounded by Gazelanitis and the country of the Amasenians, the western by the Elise River, the eastern by Fenaria, and the remaining side by my country, that of the Amasians, which is by far the largest and best of all. Now the part of Phasamanitis towards Fenaria is covered by a lake which is like a sea in size, is called Stefan, abounds in fish, and is all round and abundant pastures of all kinds. On its shores lies a strong fortress, Isizari, now deserted, and, nearby, a royal palace, now in ruins. The remainder of the country is in general bare of trees and productive of grain. Above the country of the Amasians are situated the hot springs of the Phasamonidae, which are extremely good for the health, and also Sagelium, with a stronghold situated on a high steep mountain that runs up into a sharp peak. Sagelium also has an abundant reservoir of water, which is now in neglect, although it was useful to the kings for many purposes. Here Arsaces, one of the sons of Pharnaces, who was playing the dynast and attempting a revolution without permission from any of the prefects, was captured and slain. He was captured, however, not by force, although the stronghold was taken by Polemon and Lycomedes, both of them kings, but by starvation, for he fled up into the mountain without provisions, being shut out from the plains, and he also found the wells of the reservoir choked up by huge rocks, for this had been done by order of Pompey who ordered that the garrisons be pulled down and not be left useful to those who wished to flee up to them for the sake of robberies. Now it was in this way that Pompey arranged Phasamonitis for administrative purposes, but the later rulers distributed also this country among kings. 3.39 My city is situated in a large deep valley, through which flows the Iris River. Both by human foresight and by nature it is an admirably devised city, since it can at the same time afford the advantage of both a city and a fortress, for it is a high and precipitous rock which descends abruptly to the river, and has on one side the wall on the edge of the river where the city is settled and on the other the wall that runs up on either side to the peaks. These peaks are two in number, are united with one another by nature, and are magnificently towered. Within this circuit are both the palaces and monuments of the kings. The peaks are connected by a neck which is altogether narrow, and is five or six stadia in height on either side as one goes up from the river banks and the suburbs, and from the neck to the peaks there remains another ascent of one stadium which is sharp and superior to any kind of force. The rock also has reservoirs of water inside it, a water supply of which the city cannot be deprived, since two tube-like channels have been hewn out, one towards the river and the other towards the neck. And two bridges have been built over the river, one from the city to the suburbs and the other from the suburbs to the outside territory, for it is at this bridge that the mountain which lies above the rock terminates. And there is a valley extending from the river which at first is not altogether wide, but it later widens out and forms the plain called Chiliocamum, and then comes the Diacopene and Pimolocene country, all of which is fertile, extending to the Elise River. These are the northern parts of the country of the Amasians, and are about 500 stadia in length. Then in order comes the remainder of their country, which is much longer than this, extending to Babanamas and Shmini, which latter itself extends as far as the Elise River. This, then, is the length of their country, whereas the breadth from the north to the south extends, not only to Zelitis, but also to Greater Cappadocia, as far as the Trachmi. In Shmini there are Halley of rock salt, after which the river is supposed to have been called Elise. There are several demolished strongholds in my country, and also much deserted land, because of the Mithridatic War. However, it is all well supplied with trees, a part of it affords pasturage for horses and is adapted to the raising of the other animals, and the whole of it is beautifully adapted to habitation. Amasea was also given to kings, though it is now a province. 3.40 There remains that part of the Pontic province which lies outside the Elise River, I mean the country round Mount Olgases, contiguous to Sinopus. Mount Olgases is extremely high and hard to travel. And sanctuaries that have been established everywhere on this mountain are held by the Paplagonians. And round it lies fairly good territory, both Blean and Demonitis, through which latter flows the Amnias River. Here Mithridates Eupater utterly wiped out the forces of Nicomedes the Bithynian not in person, however, since it happened that he was not even present, but through his generals. And while Nicomedes, fleeing with a few others, safely escaped to his homeland and from there sailed to Italy, Mithridates followed him and not only took Bithynia at the first assault but also took possession of Asia as far as Caria and Lycia. And here, too, a place was proclaimed a city, I mean Pompeiupolis and in this city is Mount Sandaracurgium, not far away from Pimeliza, a royal fortress now in ruins, after which the country on either side of the river is called Pimolacene. Mount Sandaracurgium is hollowed out in consequence of the mining done there, since the workmen have excavated great cavities beneath it. The mine used to be worked by publicans, who used as miners the slaves sold in the market because of their crimes, for, in addition to the painfulness of the work, 
they say that the air in the mines is both deadly and hard to endure on account of the grievous odor of the ore, so that the workmen are doomed to a quick death. What is more, the mine is often left idle because of the unprofitableness of it, since the workmen are not only more than 200 in number, but are continually spent by disease and death. So much be said concerning Pontus. 3.41 After Pompeiupolis comes the remainder of the interior of Paphlagonia, extending westwards as far as Bithynia. This country, small though it is, was governed by several rulers a little before my time, but, the family of kings having died out, it is now in possession of the Romans. At any rate, they give to the country that borders on Bithynia the names Timonitis, the country of Gesetorix, and also Marmalitis, Sanicene, and Potamia. There was also a Simiadine, in which was Simiata, a strong fortress situated at the foot of the mountainous country of the Olgases. This was used by Mithridates, surnamed Tests, as a base of operations when he established himself as Lord of Pontus, and his descendants preserved the succession down to Eupater. The last to reign over Paphlagonia was Deodorus, the son of Castor, surnamed Philadelphus, who possessed Gangra, the royal residence of Morzus, which was at the same time a small town and a fortress. 3.42 Eutyxus mentions fish that are dug up in Paphlagonia and dry places, but he does not distinguish the place, and he says that they are dug up in moist places round the Ascanian Lake Pelosius, without saying anything clear on the subject. Since I am describing the part of Paphlagonia which borders on Pontus and since the Bithynians border on the Paphlagonians towards the west, I shall try to go over this region also, and then, taking a new beginning from the countries of these people and the Paphlagonians, I shall interweave my description of their regions with that of the regions which follow these in order towards the south as far as the Taurus the regions that ran parallel to Pontus and Paphlagonia, for some such order and division is suggested by the nature of the regions. 4.1 Bithynia Bithynia is bounded on the east by the Paphlagonians and Marianani and some of the Epicteti, on the north by the Pontic Sea, from the outlets of the Singarius River to the mouth of the sea at Byzantium and Chalcedon, on the west by the Propontis, and towards the south by Mysia and by Phrygia Epictetus, as it is called, though the same is also called Hellespontiac Phrygia. 4.2 In this last country, at the mouth of the Pontus, are situated Chalcedon, founded by the Megarians, and Chrysopolis, a village, and the Chalcedonian sanctuary, and slightly above the sea the country has a spring called Azarisha, which breeds little crocodiles. Then the Chalcedonian shore is followed by the Astacene Gulf as it is called, a part of the Propontis, and it was on this gulf that Nicomedia was founded, being named after one of the Bithynian kings, who founded it. But many kings, for example the Ptolemies, were, on account of the fame of the first, given the same name. And on the gulf itself there was also a city Asticus, founded by the Megarians and Athenians and afterwards by Dodalsus, and it was after the city Asticus that the gulf was named. It was raised to the ground by Lysimachus, and its inhabitants were transferred to Nicomedia by the founder of the latter. 4.3 Continuous with the Astacene Gulf is another gulf, which runs more nearly towards the rising sun than the former does, and on this gulf is Prusias, formerly called Cius. Cius was raised to the ground by Philip, the son of Demetrius and father of Perseus, and given by him to Prusias the son of Zealous, who had helped him raise both this city and Merlia, which latter is a neighboring city and also is near Prusa. And Prusias restored them from their ruins and named the city Cius Prusias after himself and Merlia Apamea after his wife. This is the Prusias who welcomed Hannibal, when the latter withdrew thither after the defeat of Antiochus, and who retired from Phrygia on the Hellespont in accordance with an agreement made with the Italici. This country was in earlier times called Lesser Phrygia, but the Italici called it Phrygia Epictetus. Above Prusias lies a mountain called Arganthinium. And here is the scene of the myth of Hylas, one of the companions of Heracles who sailed with him on the Argo, and who, when he was going out to get water, was carried off by the nymphs. And when Cius, who was also a companion of Heracles and with him on the voyage, returned from Colchis, he stayed here and founded the city which was named after him. And still to this day a kind of festival is celebrated among the Prussians, a mountain-ranging festival, in which they march in procession and call Hylas, as though making their exodus to the forests in quest of him. And having shown a friendly disposition towards the Romans in the conduct of their government, the Prussians obtained freedom. Prusa is situated on the Mesian Olympus, it is a well-governed city, borders on the Phrygians and the Mysians, and was founded by the Prusias who made war against Croesus. 4.4 It is difficult to mark the boundaries between the Bithynians and the Phrygians and the Mysians, or even those between the Doliones round Sisychus and the Mygdonians and the Trojans. And it is agreed that each tribe is apart from the others, in the case of the Phrygians and Mysians, at least, there is a proverb, a part of the boundaries of the Mysians and Phrygians, but that it is difficult to mark the boundaries between them. 
The cause of this is that the foreigners who went there, being barbarians and soldiers, did not hold the conquered country firmly, but for the most part were wanderers, driving people out and being driven out. One might conjecture that all these tribes were Thracian because the Thracians occupy the other side and because the people on either side do not differ much from one another. 4.5 But still, as far as one is able to conjecture, one might put down Mysia as situated between Bithynia and the outlet of the Aesopus River, as touching upon the sea, and as extending as far as Olympus, along almost the whole of it, and Epictetus as lying in the interior round Mysia, but nowhere touching upon the sea, and as extending to the eastern parts of the Ascanian Lake and territory, for the territory was called by the same name as the lake. And a part of this territory was Phrygian and a part Mysian, but the Phrygian part was farther away from Troy. And in fact one should thus interpret the words of the poet when he says, And Phorcys and godlike Ascanius led the Phrygians from afar, from Ascania, that is, the Phrygian Ascania, since his words imply that another Ascania, the Mesian, near the present Nicaea, is nearer Troy, that is, the Ascania to which the poet refers when he says, And Pomis, and Ascanius, and Moris, son of Hippotion, who had come from deep-soiled Ascania to relieve their fellows. And it is not remarkable if he speaks of one Ascanius as a leader of the Phrygians and as having come from Ascania and also of another Ascanius as a leader of the Mysians and as having come from Ascania, for in Homer identity of names is of frequent occurrence, as also the surnaming of people after rivers and lakes and places. 4.6 And the poet himself gives the Aesopus as a boundary of the Mysians, for after naming the foothills of Troy above Ilium that were subject to Aeneas, which he calls Dardania, he puts down Lycia as next towards the north, the country that was subject to Pandarus, in which Zelia was situated, and he says, And they that dwelt in Zelia neath the nethermost foot of Mount Ida, wealthy men, Trojans, who drink the dark water of the Aesopus. Below Zelia, near the sea, and on this side of the Aesopus, are the plain of Adrastia, Mount Teria, and Pitya, that is, speaking generally, the present Cyzacene near Priapus, which the poet names next after Zelia and then he returns to the parts towards the east and those on the far side of the Aesopus, by which he indicates that he regards the country as far as the Aesopus as the northerly and easterly limit of the Troad. Assuredly, however, Mysia and Olympus come after the Troad. Now ancient tradition suggests some such position of the tribes as this, but the present differences are the result of numerous changes, since different rulers have been in control at different times, and have confounded together some tribes and sundered others. For both the Phrygians and the Mysians had the mastery after the capture of Troy, and then later the Lydians, and after them the Aeolians and the Ionians, and then the Persians and the Macedonians, and lastly the Romans, under whose reign most of the peoples have already lost both their dialects and their names, since a different partition of the country has been made. But it is better for me to consider this matter when I describe the conditions as they now are, at the same time giving proper attention to conditions as they were in antiquity. 4.7 In the interior of Bithynia are, not only Bithynium, which is situated above Tyam and holds the territory round Ceylon, where is the best pasturage for cattle and whence comes the Salonian cheese, but also Nicaea, the metropolis of Bithynia, situated on the Escanian lake, which is surrounded by a plain that is large and very fertile but not at all healthful in summer. Nicaea was first founded by Antigonus the son of Philip, who called it Antigonia, and then by Lysimachus, who changed its name to that of Nicaea's wife. She was the daughter of Antipater. The city is sixteen stadia in circuit and is quadrangular in shape, it is situated in a plain, and has four gates, and its streets are cut at right angles, so that the four gates can be seen from one stone which is set up in the middle of the gymnasium. Slightly above the Ascanian lake is the town Atria, situated just on the borders of Bithynia towards the east. It is surmised that Atria was so named after Atreus. 4.8 That Bithynia was a settlement of the Mysians will first be testified by Silax the Cariandian, who says that Phrygians and Mysians lived round the Ascanian lake, and next by the Dionysius who wrote on the foundings of cities, who says that the strait at Chalcedon and Byzantium, now called the Thracian Bosporus, was in earlier times called the Mesian Bosporus. And this might also be set down as an evidence that the Mesians were Thracians. Further, when Euphorion says, beside the waters of the Mesian Ascanius, and when Alexander the Aetolian says, who have their homes on the Ascanian streams, on the lips of the Ascanian lake, where dwelt Dolian the son of Silenus and Melia, they bear witness to the same thing since the Ascanian lake is nowhere to be found but here alone. 4.9 Bithynia has produced men notable for their learning, Xenocrates the philosopher, Dionysius the dialectician, Hipparchus, Theodosius and his sons the mathematicians, and also Cleocares the rhetorician of Merlia and Asclepiades the physician of Prusa. 4.10 To the south of the Bithynians are the missions round Olympus, who by some are called the Olympini and by others the Hellespontae, and the Hellespontian Phrygia, and to the south of the Paplagonians are the Galatae, 
and still to the south of these two is greater Phrygia, as also Lycaonia, extending as far as the Cilician and the Pisidian Taurus. But since the region continuous with Paphlagonia is adjacent to Pontus and Cappadocia and the tribes which I have already described, it might be appropriate for me first to give an account of the parts in the neighborhood of these and then set forth a description of the places that come next thereafter. 5.1 Galatia. The Galatians, then, are to the south of the Paphlagonians. And of these there are three tribes, two of them, the Trochmi and the Toilistabagii, are named after their leaders, whereas the third, the Tectosages, is named after the tribe in Celtica. This country was occupied by the Galati after they had wandered about for a long time, and after they had overrun the country that was subject to the Italid and the Bithynian kings, until by voluntary session they received the present Galatia, or Gallo Gratia, as it is called. Lenorius is generally reputed to have been the chief leader of their expedition across to Asia. The three tribes spoke the same language and differed from each other in no respect, and each was divided into four portions which were called tetrarchies, each tetrarchy having its own tetrarch and also one judge and one military commander, both subject to the Tetrarch, and two subordinate commanders. The council of the twelve Tetrarchs consisted of three hundred men, who assembled at Drynmedum, as it was called. Now the council passed judgment upon murder cases, but the Tetrarchs and the judges upon all others. Such, then, was the organization of Galatia long ago, but in my time the power has passed to three rulers, then to two, and then to one, Deodorus, and then to Amentus, who succeeded him but at the present time the Romans possess both this country and the whole of the country that became subject to Amentus, having united them into one province. 5.2 The Trochmi possess the parts near Pontus and Cappadocia. These are the most powerful of the parts occupied by the Galatians. They have three walled garrisons, Tavium, the emporium of the people in that part of the country, where are the colossal statue of Zeus in bronze and his sacred precinct, a place of refuge, and Mithridatium, which Pompey gave to Bogodiaterus having separated it from the kingdom of Pontus, and third, Danala, where Pompey and Lucullus had their conference, Pompey coming there as successor of Lucullus in the command of the war, and Lucullus giving over to Pompey his authority and leaving the country to celebrate his triumph. The Trochmi, then, possess these parts, but the Tectosages the parts near Greater Phrygia in the neighborhood of Pessinus and Orcaorsi. To the Tectosages belong the fortress Ankara, which bore the same name as the Phrygian town situated toward Lydia in the neighborhood of Blotus and the Toilistabagii border on the Bithynians and Phrygia Epictetus as it is called. Their fortresses are Blusium and Paeum, the former of which was the royal residence of Deodorus and the latter the place where he kept his treasures. 5.3 Pessinus is the greatest of the emporiums in that part of the world, containing a sanctuary of the mother of the gods, which is an object of great veneration. They call her Agdistes. The priests were in ancient times potentates, I might call them, who reaped the fruits of a great priesthood but at present the prerogatives of these have been much reduced, although the emporium still endures. The sacred precinct has been built up by the Italic kings in a manner befitting a holy place, with a sanctuary and also with porticos of white marble. The Romans made the sanctuary famous when, in accordance with oracles of the Sibyl, they sent for the statue of the goddess there, just as they did in the case of that of Asclepius at Epidaurus. There is also a mountain situated above the city, Dindimum, after which the country Dindimini was named, just as Sibel was named after Cybele. Nearby, also, flows the Singarius River, and on this river are the ancient habitations of the Phrygians, of Midas, and of Gordius, who lived even before his time, and of certain others, habitations which preserve not even traces of cities, but are only villages slightly larger than the others, for instance, Gordium and Gorbius, the royal residence of Castor the son of Saucandarius, where Deodorus, Castor's father-in-law, slew him and his own daughter and he pulled down the fortress and ruined most of the settlement. 5.4 After Galatia towards the south are situated Lake Tata, which lies alongside Greater Cappadocia near Mormini but is a part of Greater Phrygia, and the country continuous with this lake and extending as far as the Taurus, most of which was held by Amentus. Now Lake Tata is a natural salt pan, and the water so easily congeals round everything that is immersed in it, that when people let down into it rings made of rope they draw up wreaths of salt, and that, on account of the congealing of the salt, the birds which touch the water with their wings fall on the spot and are thus caught. 6.1 Lycaonia. Such, then, is Tata. And the regions round Orca Orsi and Pitnesis, as also the plateaus of the Lycaonians, are cold, bare of trees, and grazed by wild asses, though there is a great scarcity of water, and even where it is possible to find water, then wells are the deepest in the world, just as in Sodra, where the water is actually sold, this is a village city near Garsora. But still, Although the country is unwatered, it is remarkably productive of sheep, 
but the wool is coarse, and yet some persons have acquired very great wealth from this alone. Amintus had over 300 flocks in this region. There are also two lakes in this region, the larger being Lake Corallus and the smaller Lake Trogitus. In this neighborhood is also Iconium, a town that is well settled and has a more prosperous territory than the above-mentioned as grazing country. This place was held by Polemon. Here the region in question is near the Taurus, which separates Cappadocia and Lycaonia from Cilicia Trachea, which last lies above that region. The boundary between the Lycaonians and the Cappadocians lies between Corapassus, a village of the Lycaonians, and Garsora, a town of the Cappadocians. The distance between these strongholds is about 120 stadia. 6.2 to Lycaonia belongs also Isaurus, near the Taurus itself, which has the two Isauras, villages bearing the same name, one of which is called Old Isaura, and the other New Isaura, which is well fortified. Numerous other villages were subject to these, and they all were settlements of robbers. They were a source of much trouble to the Romans and in particular to Publius Servilius, surnamed Isauricus, with whom I was acquainted. He subjected these places to the Romans and also destroyed most of the strongholds of the pirates that were situated on the sea. 6.3 On the side of Isaurus lies Derbe, which lies closer to Cappadocia than to any other country and was the royal seat of the tyrant Antipater Derbetes. He also possessed Laranda. But in my time Derbe and also the two Isauras have been held by Amintus, who attacked and killed Derbetes, although he received Isaura from the Romans. And, indeed, after destroying the old Isaura, he built for himself a royal residence there. And though he was building a new wall in the same place, he did not live to complete it, but was killed by the Cilicians, when he was invading the country of the Hominidis and was captured by Ambuscade. 6.44, being in possession of the Antiochia near Pisidia and of the country as far as the Apollonias near Apamea Sibitus and of certain parts of the country alongside the mountain, and of Lycaonia, he was trying to exterminate the Cilicians and the Pisidians, who from the Taurus were overrunning this country which belonged to the Phrygians and the Cilicians, and he captured many places which previously had been impregnable, among which was Kremna. However, he did not even try to win Sandlium by force, which is situated between Kremna and Sigalassus. 6.5 Now Kremna is occupied by Roman colonists and Sigalassus is subject to the same Roman governor to whom the whole kingdom of Amintus was subject. It is a day's journey distant from Apamea, having a descent of about 30 stadia from the fortress. It is also called Selgesus. This city was also captured by Alexander. Now Amintus captured Kremna, and, passing into the country of the Hominidis, who were considered too strong to capture, and having now established himself as master of most of the places, having even slain their tyrant, was caught by treachery through the artifice of the tyrant's wife. And he was put to death by those people, but Serenius overthrew the inhabitants by starving them, and captured alive four thousand men and settled them in the neighboring cities, leaving the country destitute of all its men who were in the prime of life. In the midst of the heights of the Taurus, which are very steep and for the most part impassable, there is a hollow and fertile plain which is divided into several valleys. But though the people tilled this plain, they lived on the overhanging brows of the mountains or in caves. They were armed for the most part and were wont to overrun the country of others, having mountains that served as walls about their country. 7.1 Pisidia contiguous to these are the Pisidians, and in particular the Selgais, who are the most notable of the Pisidians. Now the greater part of them occupy the summits of the Taurus, but some, situated above Side and Aspendus, Pamphylian cities, occupy hilly places, everywhere planted with olive trees, and the region above this, we are now in the mountains, is occupied by the Catenais, whose country borders on that of the Selgais and the Hominidis, but the Sigalassis occupy the region this side the Taurus that faces Milius. 7.2 Artemidorus says that the cities of the Pisidians are Selgae, Sigalassus, Petnalissus, Adada, Timbriata, Kremna, Pityasus, Ambleda, Anabora, Sinda, Erisus, Tarbasis, and Termasus. Of these, some are entirely in the mountains, while others extend even as far as the foothills on either side, to both Pamphylia and Milias, and border on the Phrygians and the Lydians and the Carians, which are all peaceable tribes, although they are situated towards the north. But the Pamphylians, who share much in the traits of the Cilician stock of people, do not wholly abstain from the business of piracy, nor yet do they allow the peoples on their borders to live in peace, although they occupy the southern parts of the foothills of the Taurus. And on the borders of the Phrygians and Caria are situated Tabi and Sinda, and also Amblata, whence is exported the Amblatian wine, which is suitable for use in medicinal diets. 7.3 Now all the rest of the above-mentioned Pisidians who live in the mountains are divided into separate tribes governed by tyrants, like the Cilicians, and are trained in piracy. It is said that in ancient times certain Leliges, a wandering people, 
intermingled with them and on account of similarity of character stayed there. Selge was founded at first by the Lacedaemonians as a city, and still earlier by Kalkas, but later it remained an independent city, having waxed so powerful on account of the law-abiding manner in which its government was conducted that it once contained 20,000 men. And the nature of the region is wonderful, for among the summits of the Taurus there is a country which can support tens of thousands of inhabitants and is so very fertile that it is planted with the olive in many places, and with fine vineyards, and produces abundant pasture for cattle of all kinds, and above this country, all round it, lie forests of various kinds of timber. But it is the styrax tree that is produced in greatest abundance there, a tree which is not large but grows straight up, the tree from which the styracine javelins are made, similar to those made of cornell wood. And a species of wood-eating worm is bred in the trunk which eats through the wood of the tree to the surface, and at first pours out raspings like bran or sawdust, which are piled up at the root of the tree, and then a liquid substance exudes which readily hardens into a substance like gum. But a part of this liquid flows down upon the raspings at the root of the tree and mixes with both them and the soil, except so much of it as condenses on the surface of the raspings and remains pure, and except the part which hardens on the surface of the trunk down which it flows, this too being pure. And the people make a kind of substance mixed with wood and earth from that which is not pure, this being more fragrant than the pure substance but otherwise inferior in strength to it, a fact unnoticed by most people, which is used in large quantities as frankincense by the worshippers of the gods. And people praise also the Seljuk iris and the ointment made from it. The region round the city and the territory of the Seljans has only a few approaches, since their territory is mountainous and full of precipices and ravines, which are formed, among other rivers, by the Eurymedon and the Sistrus, which flow from the Seljuk mountains and empty into the Pamphylian Sea. But they have bridges on their roads. Because of their natural fortifications, however, the Seljans have never even once, either in earlier or later times, become subject to others, but unmolested have reaped the fruit of the whole country except the part situated below them in Pamphylia and inside the Taurus, for which they were always at war with the kings, but in their relations with the Romans, they occupied the part in question on certain stipulated conditions. They sent an embassy to Alexander and offered to receive his commands as a friendly country, but at the present time they have become wholly subject to the Romans and are included in the territory that was formerly subject to Amentus. 8.1 Phrygia bordering on the Bithynians towards the south, as I have said, are the Mysians and Phrygians who live round the Mysian Olympus, as it is called. And each of these tribes is divided into two parts. For one part of Phrygia is called Greater Phrygia, the part over which Midas reigned, a part of which was occupied by the Galatians, whereas the other is called Lesser Phrygia, that on the Hellespont and round Olympus, I mean Phrygia Epictetus, as it is called. Mysia is likewise divided into two parts, I mean Olympine, which is continuous with Bithynia and Phrygia Epictetus, which, according to Artemidorus, was colonized by the Mysians who lived on the far side of the Ister, and, secondly, the country in the neighborhood of the Caicus River and Pergamene, extending as far as Tuthrania and the outlets of the river. 8.2 But the boundaries of these parts have been so confused with one another, as I have often said, that it is uncertain even as to the country round Mount Cephalus, which the ancients called Phrygia, whether it was a part of Greater Phrygia or of Lesser Phrygia, where lived, they say, the Phrygian Tantalus and Pelops and Niobe. But no matter which of the two opinions is correct, the confusion of the boundaries is obvious, for Pergamene and Alades, where the Caicus empties into the sea, and Tuthrania, situated between these two countries, where Tuthrus lived and where Telephus was reared, lie between the Hellespont on the one side and the country round Cephalus and Magnesia, which lies at the foot of Cephalus, on the other, and therefore, as I have said before, it is a task to determine the boundaries, a part are the boundaries of the Mysians and Phrygians. 8.3 And the Lydians and the Meonians, whom Homer calls the Myones, are in some way confused both with these peoples and with one another, because some say that they are the same and others that they are different, and they are confused with these people because some say that the Mysians were Thracians but others that they were Lydians, thus concurring with an ancient explanation given by Xanthus the Lydian and Menocrates of Elea, who explain the origin of the name of the Mysians by saying that the Oxia tree is so named by the Lydians. And the Oxia tree abounds in the neighborhood of Mount Olympus, where they say that the decimated persons were put out and that their descendants were the Mysians of later times, so named after the Oxia tree, and that their language bears witness to this, for, they add, their language is, in a way, a mixture of the Lydian and the Phrygian languages, for the reason that, although they lived round Mount Olympus for a time, yet when the Phrygians crossed over from Thrace and slew a ruler of Troy and of the country near it, those people took up their abode there, whereas the Mysians took up their abode above the sources of the Caicus near Lydia. 8.4 Contributing to the creation of myths of this kind are the confusion of the tribes there and the fertility of the country this side the Elise River, particularly that of the seaboard, 
on account of which attacks were made against it from numerous places and continually by peoples from the opposite mainland, or else the people nearby would attack one another. Now it was particularly in the time of the Trojan War and after that time that invasions and migrations took place, since at the same time both the barbarians and the Greeks felt an impulse to acquire possession of the countries of others. But this was also the case before the Trojan War, for the tribe of the Pelusgians was then in existence, as also that of the Caconians and Lelages. And, as I have said before, they wandered in ancient times over many regions of Europe. These tribes the poet makes the allies of the Trojans, but not as coming from the opposite mainland. The accounts both of the Phrygians and of the Mysians go back to earlier times than the Trojan War. The existence of two groups of Lycians arouses suspicion that they were of the same tribe, whether it was the Trojan Lycians or those near Caria that colonized the country of the other of the two. And perhaps the same was also true in the case of the Cilicians, for these, too, were twofold. However, we are unable to get the same kind of evidence that the present tribe of Cilicians was already in existence before the Trojan War. Telephus might be thought to have come from Arcadia with his mother and having become related to Teuthras, to whom he was a welcome guest, by the marriage of his mother to that ruler, was regarded as his son and also succeeded to the rulership of the Mysians. 8.5 Not only the Carians, who in earlier times were islanders, but also the Lelages, as they say, became mainlanders with the aid of the Cretans, who founded, among other places, Miletus, having taken Sarpedon from the Cretan Miletos as founder, and they settled the Termoli in the country which is now called Lycia, and they say that these settlers were brought from Crete by Sarpedon a brother of Minos and Radamanthus, and that he gave the name Termoli to the people who were formerly called Milii, as Herodotus says, and were in still earlier times called Salome, but that when Lycus the son of Pandion went over there he named the people Lycians after himself. Now this account represents the Salome and the Lycians as the same people, but the poet makes a distinction between them. At any rate, Bulrafontes set out from Lycia and fought with the glorious Salome. And likewise his son Pisander was slain when fighting the Salome by Ares, as he says and he also speaks of Sarpedon as a native of Lycia. 8.6 But the fact that the fertility of the country of which I am speaking was set before the powerful as a common prize of war is confirmed by many things which have taken place even subsequent to the Trojan War, since even the Amazons took courage to attack it, against whom not only Priam, but also Bulrafontes, are said to have made expeditions, and the naming of ancient cities after the Amazons attests this fact. And in the Trojan plain there is a hill which by men is called Batia but by the immortals the tomb of the much-bounding Myrna, who, historians say, was one of the Amazons, inferring this from the epithet much-bounding, for they say that horses are called well-bounding because of their speed, and that Myrna, therefore, was called much-bounding because of the speed with which she drove her chariot. Myrna, therefore, is named after this Amazon. And the neighboring islands had the same experience because of their fertility, and Homer clearly testifies that, among these, Rhodes and Cos were already inhabited by Greeks before the Trojan War. 8.7 After the Trojan War the migrations of the Greeks and the Trarans, and the onsets of the Sumerians and of the Lydians, and, after this, of the Persians and the Macedonians, and, at last, of the Galatians, disturbed and confused everything. But the obscurity has arisen, not on account of the changes only, but also on account of the disagreements of the historians, who do not say the same things about the same subjects, calling the Trojans Phrygians, as do the tragic poets, and the Lycians Carians, and so in the case of other peoples. But the Trojans, having waxed so strong from a small beginning that they became kings of kings, afforded both the poet and his expounders grounds for inquiring what should be called Troy, for in a general way he calls Trojans the peoples, one and all, who fought on the Trojan side, just as he called their opponents both Danaeans and Achaeans, and yet, of course, we shall surely not speak of Paphlagonia as a part of Troy, nor yet Caria, nor the country that borders on Caria, I mean Lycia. I mean when the poet says, the Trojans advanced with clamor and with a cry like birds, and when he says of their opponents, but the Achaeans advanced in silence, breathing rage. And in many ways he uses terms differently. But still, although such is the case, I must try to arbitrate the several details to the best of my ability. However, if anything in ancient history escapes me, I must leave it unmentioned, for the task of the geographer does not lie in that field, and I must speak of things as they now are. 8.8 .8 Above the Propontis, then, there are two mountains, the Mesian Olympus and Mount Idaho now the region of the Bithynians lies at the foot of Olympus, whereas Troy is situated between Mount Ida and the sea and borders on the mountain. As for Troy, I shall describe it and the parts adjacent to it towards the south later on, but at present let me describe the country of Mount Olympus and the parts which come next in order thereafter extending as far as the Taurus and lying parallel to the parts which I have previously traversed. Mount Olympus, then, 
is not only well settled all round but also has on its heights immense forests and places so well fortified by nature that they can support bands of robbers, and among these bands there often arise tyrants who are able to maintain their power for a long time, for example, Cleon, who in my time was chieftain of the bands of robbers. 8.9 Cleon was from the village Gordium, which he later enlarged, making it a city and calling it Juliopolis, but from the beginning he used the strongest of the strongholds, Caladium by name, as retreat and base of operations for the robbers. And he indeed proved useful to Antony, since he made an attack upon those who were levying money for Labienus at the time when the latter held possession of Asia, and he hindered his preparations, but in the course of the action war, having revolted from Antony, he joined the generals of Caesar and was honoured more than he deserved, since he also received, in addition to what Antony had given him, what Caesar gave him, so that he was invested with the guise of dynast, from being a robber, that is, he was priest of Zeus of Bretenus, a Mesian god, and held subject a part of Maureen, which, like a Breton, is also Mesian, and received at last the priesthood of Camana and Pontus, although he died within a month's time after he went down to Camana. He was carried off by an acute disease, which either attacked him in consequence of excessive repletion or else, as the people round the sanctuary said, was inflicted upon him because of the anger of the goddess, for the dwelling of both the priest and the priestess is within the circuit of the sacred precinct, and the sacred precinct, apart from its sanctity in other respects, is most conspicuously free from the impurity of the eating of swine's flesh, in fact, the city as a whole is free from it, and swine cannot even be brought into the city. Cleon, however, among the first things he did when he arrived, displayed the character of the robber by transgressing this custom, as though he had come, not as priest, but as corrupter of all that was sacred. 8.10 Such, then, is Mount Olympus, and towards the north it is inhabited all round by the Bithynians and Migdonians and Doliones, whereas the rest of it is occupied by Mysians and Epicteti. Now the peoples round Sisychus, from the Aesopus River to the Rindicus River and Lake Dasolitis, are for the most part called Doliones, whereas the peoples who live next after these as far as the country of the Merlians are called Migdonians. Above Lake Dasolitis lie two other lakes, large ones, I mean Lake Apolloniatus and Lake Miltopolitis. Near Lake Dasolitis is the city the Scelium, and near Lake Miltopolitis Miltopolis, and near the third Lake Apollonia on Rindicus, as it is called. But at the present time most of these places belong to the Cyzacini. 8.11 Cyzicus is an island in the Propontis, being connected with the mainland by two bridges, and it is not only most excellent in the fertility of its soil, but in size has a perimeter of about 500 stadia. It has a city of the same name near the bridges themselves, and two harbours that can be closed, and more than 200 ship sheds. One part of the city is on level ground and the other is near a mountain called Arctonoros. Above this mountain lies another mountain, Dindymus, it rises into a single peak, and it has a sanctuary of Dindymene, mother of the gods, which was founded by the Argonauts. This city rivals the foremost of the cities of Asia in size, in beauty, and in its excellent administration of affairs both in peace and in war. And its adornment appears to be of a type similar to that of Rhodes and Massalia and ancient Carthage. Now I am omitting most details, but I may say that there are three directors who take care of the public buildings and the engines of war, and three who have charge of the treasure houses, one of which contains arms and another engines of war and another grain. They prevent the grain from spoiling by mixing calcitic earth with it. They showed in the Mithridatic War the advantage resulting from this preparation of theirs, for when the king unexpectedly came over against them with 150,000 men and with a large cavalry, and took possession of the mountain opposite the city, the mountain called Adrastia, and of the suburb, and then, when he transferred his army to the neck of land above the city and was fighting them, not only on land, but also by sea with 400 ships, the Cyzacini held out against all attacks, and, by digging a counter-tunnel, all but captured the king alive in his own tunnel, but he forestalled this by taking precautions and by withdrawing outside his tunnel, Lucullus, the Roman general, was able, though late, to send an auxiliary force to the city by night, and, too, as an aid to the Cyzacini, famine fell upon that multitudinous army, a thing which the king did not foresee, because he suffered a great loss of men before he left the island. But the Romans honoured the city, and it is free to this day, and holds a large territory, not only that which it has held from ancient times, but also other territory presented to it by the Romans, for, of the Trode, they possess the parts round Zelia on the far side of the Aesopus, as also the plain of Adrastia, and, of Lake Dasolitis, they possess some parts, while the Byzantines possess the others. And in addition to Doliones and Migdonis they occupy a considerable territory extending as far as Lake Miltopolitis and Lake Apolloniatus itself. It is through this region that the Rindicus River flows, this river has its sources in Azanitis, and then, receiving from Mysia a Breton, 
among other rivers, the Maestas, which flows from Ankara in Abaitis, empties into the Propontis opposite the island Bespicos. In this island of the Sizacini is a well wooded mountain called Artis, and in front of this mountain lies an all bearing the same name, and nearby is a promontory called Melanus, which one passes on a coasting voyage from Sisychus to Priapus. 8.12 to Phrygia Epictetus belong the cities Azani, Nicolia, Kosheum, Midam, and Dorylaean, and also Cadi, which, according to some writers, belongs to Mysia. Mysia extends in the interior from Olympine to Pergamene, and to the plain of Caicus, as it is called, and therefore it lies between Mount Ida and Catechecomeni, which latter is by some called Mysian and by others Meonian. 8.13 Above Phrygia Epictetus towards the south is Greater Phrygia, which leaves on the left Pessinus and the region of Orce Orsi and Lycaonia, and on the right the Meonians and Lydians and Carians. In Epictetus are Phrygia Peroia, as it is called, and the part of Phrygia that lies towards Pisidia, and the parts round Amorium and Eumenia and Sinnata, and then Apamea Sibitus, as it is called, and Laodicea, which two are the largest of the Phrygian cities. And in the neighborhood of these are situated towns, and, Aphrodisias, Colossi, Themisonium, Sonaus, Metropolis, and Apollonius, but still farther away than these are Peltae, Tabi, Eucarpia, and Lysias. 8.14 Now Phrygia Peroia has a kind of mountainous ridge extending from the east towards the west, and below it on either side lies a large plain. And there are cities near it, towards the north, Philomelium, and, on the other side, the Antiochia near Pisidia, as it is called, the former lying wholly in a plain, whereas the latter is on a hill and has a colony of Romans. The latter was settled by Magnetans who lived near the Meander River. The Romans set them free from their kings at the time when they gave over to Eumenes the rest of Asia this side the Taurus. Here there was also a priesthood of men Archaeus, which had a number of temple slaves and sacred places, but the priesthood was destroyed after the death of Amentus by those who were sent thither as his inheritors. Sinnata is not a large city, but there lies in front of it a plain planted with olives, about sixty stadia in circuit. And beyond it is Dosimia, a village, and also the quarry of Sinnatic marble, so the Romans call it, though the natives call it Dosimite or Dosimian. At first this quarry yielded only stones of small size, but on account of the present extravagance of the Romans great monolithic pillars are taken from it, which in their variety of colors are nearly like the alabastrite marble, so that, although the transportation of such heavy burdens to the sea is difficult, still, both pillars and slabs, remarkable for their size and beauty, are conveyed to Rome. 8.15 Apamea is a great emporium of Asia, I mean Asia in the special sense of that term, and ranks second only to Ephesus, for it is a common entrepot for the merchandise from both Italy and Greece. Apamea is situated near the outlets of the Marsias River, which flows through the middle of the city and has its sources in the city, it flows down to the suburbs, and then with violent and precipitate current joins the meander. The latter receives also another river, the Orgus, and traverses a level country with an easy-going and sluggish stream, and then, Having by now become a large river, the Meander flows for a time through Phrygia and then forms the boundary between Caria and Lydia at the plain of Meander, as it is called, where its course is so exceedingly winding that everything winding is called meandering. And at last it flows through Caria itself, which is now occupied by the Ionians, and then empties between Miletus and Priene. It rises in a hill called Selene, on which there is a city which hears the same name as the hill, and it was from Selene that Antiochus Soter made the inhabitants move to the present Apamea the city which he named after his mother Apama, who was the daughter of Artabazus and was given in marriage to Seleucus Nicator. And here is laid the scene of the myth of Olympus and of Marsias and of the contest between Marsias and Apollo. Above is situated a lake which produces the reed that is suitable for the mouthpieces of pipes, and it is from this lake that pour the sources of both the Marsias and the Meander. 8.16 Laodicea, though formerly small, grew large in our time and in that of our fathers, even though it had been damaged by siege in the time of Mithridates Eupater. However, it was the fertility of its territory and the prosperity of certain of its citizens that made it great, at first Yaron, who left to the people an inheritance of more than two thousand talents and adorned the city with many dedicated offerings, and later Zeno the rhetorician and his son Polemon, the latter of whom, because of his bravery and honesty, was thought worthy even of a kingdom, at first by Antony and later by Augustus. The country round Laodicea produces sheep that are excellent, not only for the softness of their wool, in which they surpass even the Malaysian wool, but also for its raven black color, so that the Laodiceans derive splendid revenue from it, as do also the neighboring Colossini from the color which bears the same name. And here the Capris River joins the Meander, as does also the Lycus, a river of good size, after which the city is called the Laodicea near Lycus. Above the city lies Mount Cadmus, 
whence the Lycus flows, as does also another river of the same name as the mountain. But the Lycus flows underground for the most part, and then, after emerging to the surface, unites with the other rivers, thus indicating that the country is full of holes and subject to earthquakes, for if any other country is subject to earthquakes, Laodicea is, and so is Karura in the neighboring country. 8.17 Karura forms a boundary between Phrygia and Caria. It is a village, and it has inns, and also fountains of boiling hot waters, some in the Meander River and some above its banks. Moreover, it is said that once, when a brothel keeper had taken lodging in the inns along with a large number of women, an earthquake took place by night, and that he, together with all the women, disappeared from sight. And I might almost say that the whole of the territory in the neighborhood of the Meander is subject to earthquakes and is undermined with both fire and water as far as the interior, for, beginning at the plains, all these conditions extend through that country to the Coronia, I mean the Coronium at Heropolis and that at Acarica in Nysis and that near Magnesia and Myus. In fact, the soil is not only friable and crumbly but is also full of salts and easy to burn out. And perhaps the meander is winding for this reason, because the stream often changes its course and, carrying down much silt, adds the silt at different times to different parts of the shore, however, it forcibly thrusts a part of the silt out to the high sea. And, in fact, by its deposits of silt, extending forty stadia, it has made Priene, which in earlier times was on the sea, an inland city. 8.18 Phrygia Catechecomini which is occupied by Lydians and Mysians, received its appellation for some such reason as follows, in Philadelphia, the city near it, not even the walls are safe, but in a sense are shaken and caused to crack every day. And the inhabitants are continually attentive to the disturbances in the earth and plan all structures with a view to their occurrence. And, among the other cities, Apamea was often shaken by earthquakes before the expedition of King Mithridates, who, when he went over to that country and saw that the city was in ruins, gave a hundred talents for its restoration and it is said that the same thing took place in the time of Alexander. And this, in all probability, is why Poseidon is worshipped in their country, even though it is in the interior, and why the city was called Selene, that is, after Selenus, the son of Poseidon by Selino, one of the daughters of Danaeus, or else because of the blackness of the stone, which resulted from the burnouts. And the story of Mount Sepalus and its ruin should not be put down as mythical, for in our own times Magnesia, which lies at the foot of it, was laid low by earthquakes, at the time when not only Sardis, but also the most famous of the other cities, were in many places seriously damaged. But the emperor restored them by contributing money, just as his father in earlier times, when the inhabitants of Tralice suffered their misfortune, when the gymnasium and other parts of the city collapsed, restored their city, as he also restored the city of the Laodiceans. 8.191 should also hear the words of the ancient historians, as, for example, those of Xanthus, who wrote the history of Lydia, when he relates the strange changes that this country often underwent, to which I have already referred somewhere in a former part of my work. And in fact they make this the setting of the mythical story of the Arimi and of the throes of Typhon, calling it the Catechecomini country. Also, they do not hesitate to suspect that the parts of the country between the Meander River and the Lydians are all of this nature, as well on account of the number of the lakes and rivers as on account of the numerous hollows in the earth. And the lake between Laodicea and Apamea, although like a sea, emits an effluvium that is filthy and of subterranean origin. And they say that lawsuits are brought against the god Meander for altering the boundaries of the countries on his banks, that is, when the projecting elbows of land are swept away by him, and that when he is convicted the fines are paid from the tolls collected at the ferries. 8.20 Between Laodicea and Karura is a sanctuary of men Charis, as it is called, which is held in remarkable veneration. In my own time a great Herophilian school of medicine has been established by Zeuxis, and afterwards carried on by Alexander Philolethes, just as in the time of our fathers the Erasistrachian school was established by Hesesius, although at the present time the case is not at all the same as it used to be. 8.21 Writers mention certain Phrygian tribes that are no longer to be seen, for example, the Beresins. And Alcman says, on the pipe he played the Serbsian, a Phrygian melody and a certain pit that emits deadly effluvia is spoken of as Serbsian. This, indeed, is to be seen, but the people are no longer called Serbsians. Aeschylus, in his Niobe, confounds things that are different, for example, Niobe says that she will be mindful of the house of Tantalus, those who have an altar of their paternal Zeus on the Idaean hill, and again, Sepalus in the Idaean land, and Tantalus says, I sow furrows that extend a ten days journey, Veracuntian land, where is the site of Adrastea, and where both Mount Ida and the whole of the Erechthian plain resound with the bleedings and bellowings of flocks. 